Mr. President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Welcome back, colleagues, on this historic day. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are, are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Mr President, committee, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, we will move on and I will call Senator Cortman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I move that the rules for remote participation of Senate uh, proceedings recommended by the Procedure Committee in its uh, first report of 2020 have effect during the sittings of the Senate from 24 August to 30 September 2020. Uh, Mr. President, um, this sitting fortnight will be the first time uh, that senators will be able to participate in proceedings remotely, and uh, this is um, obviously in the context of um, the ongoing effect uh, around Australia of the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic and a desire to ensure uh, that uh, our workplace uh, in the Senate uh, is as COVID safe as possible while facilitating participation uh, by uh, all senators uh, as appropriate. Uh, the rules that have been agreed to by the Procedure Committee uh, have been developed on the principle that the proceedings of the Senate are to be managed in the Senate uh, by uh, those uh, senators uh, present uh, in the Senate chamber. Um, importantly, uh, senators participating remotely can participate in any matter that is before the chair, but are limited to being able to only move amendments and requests for amendments to legislation and committee of the whole. So the general principle for remote participation uh, is uh, that those uh, colleagues uh, who are participating remotely uh, will be able to participate in relation to any uh, issue that is before the chair but can't themselves bring matters before the chair uh, with the exception of um, amendments to legislation in committee of the whole. So, uh, Mr. President, I think uh, the measures are well understood and I commend them uh, to the chamber. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'll have more to say subsequently, but I would just uh, make a couple of points. First, to thank the Procedure Committee for their work uh, in um, collaboratively preparing the rules uh, for participation uh, in the, these proceedings. Uh, I would emphasise that the rules reflect the principle of uh, the primacy of Parliament and that proceedings have to be managed in the Chamber, uh, and hence uh, the uh, parameters for remote participation. Uh, I would also uh, emphasise that uh, these are interim arrangements uh, and we would be keen to ensure that uh, the Procedure Committee review the operation of the order after the fortnight. And thank you for your, your assistance on this and in particular can I thank the Deputy President for shepherding this work through. Thank you. Senator Seward. Thank you. I rise to make a, uh, I'll seek leave to make a contribution to the, yeah. the debate. Um, the Greens have always said that the Parliament can and should proceed as long as the health advice says it's safe to do so. That's why we did not support the suspension of the Parliament effectively for six months back in March. It is our view that there, there remained other ways to manage Parliament sitting and that a suspension was not justified. The Greens have been calling on the government to allow for remote participation in Parliament for some time. We, we are disappointed that it has taken this long to get to the place that we are now. It is clear that, like other workplaces across Australia, the federal parliament 
can and should continue to operate. I will, of course, acknowledge that we have all uh, been very active and working very hard uh, remotely and in our offices and participating in endless uh, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, WebEx, whatever other uh, virtual, uh, sorry, Skype, whatever other virtual medium there is, we have been using. But the Parliament has been not has not been sitting. Other workplaces have been adopting uh, and adapting uh, since the beginning of the year. Yet the Parliament has taken this long to get to this place. Um, we should not have missed um, the two important weeks of Parliament at the beginning of the month simply because we didn't have this process in place. However, we are very pleased that it is now in place and, as you can see, um, some of our Green Senators are up there on the screen and I can't from here see who the other person is. Um, senators should be able to carry out their duties remotely. Things like moving motions are an important part of representing our constituencies. So the Greens, as noted in the Procedure Committee report that was tabled on Friday, um, are disappointed that senators and uh, are uh, excluded from participating in some of the processes that operate in this place. We do understand that meeting in parliament um, and uh, section 20 of the constitution is very important, but we are disappointed that some of the processes that are available when you are here in the Senate are not available to those participating remotely, except for um, uh, we do appreciate that people can participate and senators can participate in community of the whole, uh, sorry, committee of the whole. Um, that is very important, um, but we're disappointed that they can't participate in some of the other processes that are available uh, in the Senate. And we believe that um, we'd like to see during the review process that Senator Wong mentioned. We would like to ensure that we look at how we can uh, open the process up to uh, able to participate in some of the wider processes that are available to the senators in the chamber. Thank you. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Cormann be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. With that, I'd like to formally welcome our colleagues attending remotely for the first time. Now that the Senate has adopted the rules for remote attendance, rather than go through a series of procedures, I simply ask that those attending remotely strictly follow the advice of the chair. Senators will be very familiar with this system, having used it extensively for dozens of committee hearings since April. And I'd like to thank officials from the Department of Parliamentary Service for their extensive work over this period with officials of the Department of the Senate to ensure those committee hearings and now this remote attendance can function so smoothly. Senators, there are several issues I need to address to the Senate now that we have allowed the remote participation and commenced this sitting. First, the COVID safe measures adopted earlier this year regarding chamber operations remain in place. Other measures have been instituted regarding building operations, including recommendations about mask use in certain areas, and I urge senators to familiarise themselves with the statements made by the Speaker and I last Monday and last Friday. Second, the sittings are scheduled for earlier this month. On 18 July, I made a statement advising that the sittings scheduled for the weeks of 4 and 11 August would not take place. This followed my receipt of a request to that effect made by Senate leaders representing more than three quarters of senators. That request reflected the health situation then unfolding in Victoria and advice from the Commonwealth Acting Chief Medical Officer. I wrote to all senators on 20 July confirming my statement. This is the first time scheduled sitting sittings have been set aside in this way. After seeking advice, I took the view that the principles that had been applied by my predecessors in taking action to delay the commencement of sittings were also relevant here. There are numerous precedents for presidents altering the commencement of sittings in light of extraordinary circumstances or, as occurred on June 12 this year, for reasons connected to the conduct of Senate business. These have occurred with the concurrence of senators, demonstrating the principle that the Senate controls its own meetings. A key factor in my decision on this occasion was that the request was effectively made on behalf of more than three quarters of senators, so that, if the scheduled sitting had gone ahead, it would not be possible to establish or maintain a quorum. This particular point is critical, as despite different arrangements in the other place occasionally attracting disproportionate attention, it remains the case that the government cannot unilaterally cancel a sitting of the Senate. In my view, this high threshold of such action being taken only when a quorum would not be possible protects the autonomy of the Senate to determine its own meetings. I table the statement and the health advice. Finally, as I flagged in my statement of 6 August, when announcements were made specifically impacting senators and members from Victoria, 
When we next met, I would raise the issue of the effect of controls on movement of senators undertaking parliamentary business in the Senate. Let me say at the outset, this should not be seen in any way as a criticism of health officials who I and many others have worked with over this period. I would like to express my personal and professional thanks to them for the assistance they have provided senators and officials during this challenging time. A very difficult situation in dealing with the unique work of senators has been made more manageable by their professionalism and understanding. And I would particularly like to thank the officials in the ACT and Commonwealth Health Departments, with whom a number of us have worked very closely. However, these controls on movement raise and occasionally challenge an important principle, and I feel a responsibility to bring this directly to the Senate. It does not necessarily need to be addressed immediately, but to let it pass without mention risks a precedent being established through simple inertia or acceptance. The restrictions on movements currently in place under various state and territory health orders due to the COVID-19 pandemic are now clearly impacting the ability of senators to undertake undertake parliamentary work and, in some cases, even attend parliamentary proceedings. Earlier this year, there was an order in place in South Australia that affected South Australian senators by imposing requirements for quarantine upon return from a sitting of parliament. This directly impacted the ability of parliamentarians and office holders to undertake their work, in some cases directly related to parliamentary proceedings. This was imposed by officials of the Government of South Australia, that is, the executive. As part of our ongoing work to resolve this, legal advice was sought, but the issue was resolved after productive informal discussions without the need for the Speaker and myself to formally intervene. The recent announcement of Victorian parliamentarians being required to undergo a period of quarantine and testing, in some cases also for their families, as a condition of attending parliament represented a new imposition, notably one I am not aware has any precedent at the Commonwealth level. Again, this was an imposition of the executive, in this case both the Commonwealth and ACT levels. We have now seen officials of the executives of two states, Queensland and Tasmania, effectively impose new quarantine requirements upon senators returning from a sitting of parliament though th through the removal of exemptions or classifications previously in place. The Western Australian government has also removed a broad-based exemption applying to members of the Commonwealth parliament, although placing less onerous restrictions on returning parliamentarians than Queensland or Tasmania. These quarantine requirements do not prevent travel to attend a subsequent sitting of parliament, but they do restrict various other activities they may undertake. I also table the letter I received from the Queensland Chief Health Officer, which I circulated to senators last week, and copies of the letters sent by the Tasmanian State Controller to Senators for Tasmania and the Western Australian State Emergency Coordinator to Senators for Western Australia that have both been forwarded to me. These letters outline the changed arrangements for senators from those states. These are not normal times. We have both imposed and accepted controls placed on citizens that are unique in our own lifetimes. So many of our fellow Australians have had to find new ways to work. But even in my hometown of Melbourne, under stage four lockdown, at the moment it is accepted that some people must travel to work. There is an element of the work of parliament and parliamentarians that is unique and cannot entirely be replicated remotely. While some elements of this can now be addressed through remote attendance and participation, at this stage that is a limited facility in that a vote cannot be exercised, and surely exercising a vote is a key and fundamental element of participating as a member of parliament. The right of those elected to attend and participate in parliament is an ancient one. For good reason, the ability of others, including the executive, to restrict this has always been limited. The powers and immunities that enable and secure the work of the two Commonwealth Houses belong to the Houses themselves by constitutional design, a design which ensures that the Senate in particular can undertake its functions with an appropriate degree of independence. The ability to scrutinise the executive and participate in legislative acti activity is unarguably even more critical in times of crisis due to the extraordinary powers being delegated, granted and exercised by officials and the executive. In the current pandemic, an important principle is at stake notably the ability of the executive or its officers, no matter the jurisdiction, to control attendance at parliament or constrain the work of members of parliament when it is directly related to parliamentary proceedings. A further complicating factor is the claimed ability in some cases to use discretion to, term, to determine which senators or members are allowed to attend parliament or have burdens placed upon them. In the case of the ACT, permits were granted to ministers to attend events prior to the sitting of parliament but the attendance of senators and members to a session of parliament on the same basis was denied and claimed to be prohibited. 
In the case of Tasmania, the correspondence from the State Controller outlines consideration of exemption from the quarantine requirements on a case-by-case -case basis. This claimed discretion is particularly problematic on the grounds of differential treatment of members of the executive in the first instance and lack of transparency around the equality of treatment of senators in the second. The explanation that the medical risk posed by the entry of a single minister is lower and therefore allowable, as opposed to a group attending an actual session of parliament, is a circular one, with a dangerous consequence in that it establishes a preference for members of the executive attending events not directly related to parliamentary proceedings, but then effectively claims the power to control or prohibit parliamentarians' attendance at actual parliamentary proceedings. Unilateral action by executives, whether Commonwealth, state or territory, that impede the performance of Commonwealth parliamentary functions are problematic from a constitutional perspective. This remains the case even where, as is the case with border restrictions and quarantine requirements imposed at a state and territory level, that action is founded on or in aid of genuine public health advice and goals. However, these problems may be largely avoided where the requisite action, in this case the response to the public health advice, is developed cooperatively by the institutions concerned. The approach taken during this public health crisis will doubtless set precedents that will be looked to in the future. We all know and indeed support the public health messages that outline the need for caution as this pandemic will likely be with us for some time. But the National Parliament is a critical part of government, which we are relying on through various agencies and experts to manage our response and care for the health and interests of our fellow Australians. In my view, simple acquiescence to these new assertions of control by officials of the executive of Commonwealth, state or territories, including somewhat extraordinarily the territory established at the seat, as the seat of government and that we are constitutionally required to <coughs> assemble in, poses a risk in that we cannot envisage how it may be used or potentially even misused at a future time in circumstances we cannot imagine. I doubt any of us imagined the current circumstances only a year ago. Principles not defended in difficult times are in effect mere customs or conveniences. As I said earlier, this issue does not need to be addressed immediately, but in my view as your president, I must bring this issue to your attention so as not to inadvertently allow a precedent to be established by default. I lay the matter before the Senate for its consideration at a time of its choosing. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I <coughs> rise to speak briefly in relation to your statement. Uh, can I start at the outset by indicating that we appreciate that you have taken your responsibilities in this office as encompassing uh, some guardianship of this institution, and we, we respect that and we value it. We uh, endorse in particular the point you make that the ability to scrutinise the executive and participate in legislative activity is unarguably even more critical in time of crisis due to the extraordinary powers being delegated, granted and exercised by officials and the executive. Put simply, uh, Mr President, parliamentary democracy needs a parliament. It's not an optional extra. Uh, and ceding or untrammeled power to the executive is not who we are, and it's also risky. So I place on record our disappointment and concern as to some of how we have got here, and in particular uh, the way in which Mr Morrison sidelined a working group which was working towards resolving how it would be that this parliament could meet safely. As you might recall, the presiding officers, government and opposition managers of business, chief medical officers, were meeting to ensure this was done collaboratively and, regrettably, the Prime Minister unilaterally commissioned advice and signed on the working group. The parliament and the executive are separate institutions and we each have a separate and unique responsibility within our system of government. The executive ought not and cannot interfere with the parliament. Given this, and in light of your statement, the opposition invites the presiding officers to consider for the purposes of future sittings the merit of obtaining independent medical advice to enable the parliament to do its job. And we again reiterate that the procedure committee process by which the virtual parliament 
uh, aspects of the parliament for remote attendance uh, has been agreed demonstrates the capacity of this parliament to act collaboratively uh, in response to that advice. And as I said, Mr. President, we thank you for uh, your statement and acknowledge again your guardianship of this institution at these times. Thank senators. Senator, no, if no one else is seeking the call, we will move on, and I will call the clerk. Oh, Senator Patrick, sorry. Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave to make a statement about my new independent state, uh, status. Leave is granted. Uh, Mr. President, I inform the chamber that I now represent South Australia as an independent. Uh, I inform, also inform the chamber that I am designated as a whip for the purposes of Standing Order 24A, <laughs> relating to the membership of the select uh, selection of bills committee. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Call the clerk. Private Senators' Bills, Orders of the Day, number 52, Fair Work Amendment, COVID-19 Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Australian Greens' Fair Work Amendment, COVID-19 Bill 2020, um, that I introduced in the Senate during the last sitting. This bill will protect all workers during the crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are living through unprecedented times. I don't know how many people have said that how many times, but it is true. COVID-19 is drastically changing our way of life. This is a global health crisis with no one left untouched by its impacts. This is a difficult time for all of us, there's no doubt. This is a strange time. This is not a normal time. This is a crisis that touches every aspect of our lives, our well-being, our economy, our society, and our day-to-day -day lives. And that's why what we do, how we make sure that we do everything possible so we can keep our parliament going is absolutely important. People out there, Australians, are relying on their leaders to make sure that no one is left behind. As our country has responded to public health in this evolving situation, the unemployment rate hit 7.5% in July. And that particular survey was completed before the stage four lockdown in Victoria. In its mini budget update, the government predicted the rate could hit 9% by the end of the year. So what is clear is that too many people are being left behind during this crisis. And whilst JobKeeper provides some support, many people in precarious work, casual employment, or on a temporary working visa have been denied access to JobKeeper, and many do not have paid leave to rely on. This makes them some of the most vulnerable workers in Australia. We are on a cliff, and we need the government to make sure that no one falls off. This virus is going to be with us for a while. There is much uncertainty around when we will be able to relax restrictions or end shutdowns, reopen businesses. And amongst all this, we must make sure that we act to protect workers. This is our responsibility as elected members. And this is exactly what this bill that is in front of us will do. This bill will provide 14 days of paid COVID leave to all workers, including permanent, part-time, casual, and gig economy workers. This leave will be available in full for each 12-month period from the start of their employment, and the leave will not accrue year to year. Paid COVID-19 leave will be available for workers in any of the following scenarios. The employee has been diagnosed with COVID-19, or the employee is unable to attend work because the employee's workplace has been shut down because of COVID-19. The employee is subject to self-isolation or quarantine measures in accordance with the Commonwealth, state or territory government policy relating to COVID-19. The employee is caring for another person who has been diagnosed with COVID-19 or is subject to self-isolation or quarantine measures in accordance with Commonwealth, state or territory government policy relating to COVID-19. Paid COVID-19 leave is extended to gig economy workers and contractors via a COVID-19 leave order. Workers, unions, and corporations can apply for a COVID-19 leave order. In circumstances where the Fair Work 
Commission is issuing a COVID-19 leave order, the Fair Work Commission must make a determination within two days of the application being made, and the Fair Work Commission must make the order unless there are compelling reasons not to do so. For employees other than casual workers, payment will be made at the best rate of pay for the employee's ordinary hours of work in the period. For other workers, such as casuals and those in the gig economy, payment will be calculated at the daily rate of pay equal to the average of the daily rates of pay paid to the employee over the previous 12-month period. In addition to the above, I will be moving an amendment to this bill so that paid COVID-19 leave is funded by the government by amending the Coronavirus Economic Response Package Payments and Benefits Act 2020. Employers would be able to receive payments from the federal government for COVID-19 leave payments to their employees. And it's not just us that are saying this. The ACTU and Business Council on August 3rd urged the government to implement a national paid pandemic leave scheme funded by the federal government and where necessary state governments. Their letter to the Attorney General states that, and I quote, recent events in Victoria have demonstrated that there are insufficient measures in place to enable workers who should not be attending their workplaces to stay at home. And they go on to say, paid pandemic leave is now an essential public health measure. With unions, businesses, and public health experts all backing paid pandemic leave, it's time for the government to show that they are ready to treat workers' health and public health with the utmost seriousness that it deserves and vote for this bill. This bill is a vital piece of legislation that will protect workers, and it will protect our community. Every worker should be able to self-isolate when required without losing their income or their job. But right now, over 3.3 million Australians cannot access paid sick leave. This bill is about fairness. The public health crisis has only further highlighted the precarious nature of casual employment and the plight of those who work in casual employment and the gig economy. And they work largely without benefits, such as paid leave, sick leave, and other entitlements that are simply fundamental, basic to work rights. People should not be forced to choose between caring for their health and coming to work. Recent events in Victoria have shown the public health and economic crisis posed by precarity. Over 1,100 Victorian aged care workers have contracted coronavirus. One in four Melbourne nursing homes have had a coronavirus outbreak. Outbreaks in aged care homes have resulted in complete staff shutdowns at aged care facilities in Victoria resulting in the National Cabinet last week announcing an aged care preparedness plan with incentives for interstate workers to travel interstate to work in facilities experiencing staff shortages. It is telling that aged care workers were the first to be given paid pandemic leave during the second lockdown in Victoria. This highlights their exposure to the virus and the need to protect workers across Australia, no matter which sector they work in. The Victorian and federal government's responses in guaranteeing paid pandemic leave to workers in Victoria during the lockdown was an admission that granting workers access to this type of leave is vital to tackle the crisis. The federal government now needs to commit to giving all workers, permanent, part-time, casual, or in the gig economy, timely access to this essential support to avoid more outbreaks in future and to take care of the people who live here. The government will say that the purpose of this bill has been fulfilled by their pandemic leave disaster payment. This is not enough. This payment is only available to states and territories who have declared a state of disaster. Every worker, no matter where they live and work, should have access to paid pandemic leave. This will protect their health and their income. The government needs to support Australia's most vulnerable workers and provide a safety net to ensure that everyone has access to at least 14 days of paid pandemic leave, regardless of whether a state of disaster has been declared or not. We should be acting to prevent disasters now, before we see a repeat of the terrible events in Melbourne. The idea that we would wait until a disaster 
to support workers in crisis is really perverse. Workers are needing to self-isolate during testing and while they are infected. Now, the virus doesn't care whether a government has declared a state of disaster or not. In these difficult times, or really ever, it simply isn't fair that so many Australians are missing out on vital paid leave, left to fend for themselves in this once-in-a-century crisis. We must pass this bill today and look after all workers. This government must step in to support workers and their rights to fair conditions. When wages have been stagnant and the cost of living rising, literally going through the roof, it is absurd that this government denies support to workers who are facing weeks, if not months, of under or unemployment, brought on by a global pandemic that few could have predicted. This bill not only protects workers, it also protects the well-being of our community and our economy and advances public health. It's simple. When a worker has no access to paid leave, they are more likely to continue to work when they are unwell or experiencing symptoms of the virus. We must not push workers to the brink, many of whom have and will continue to be on the front line and in some of the most precarious working conditions. Deputy Chief Medical Officer Paul Kelly agreed with this logic back in May, stating there are a number of workplaces around Australia where there are disincentives for people to stay at home when they are sick. And so that can be financial, it can be a workplace culture. I just want to make this very clear. People coming to work when they are sick puts others at risk. We need to ensure that by self-isolating, we're not forcing workers into a situation where they cannot afford to keep a roof over their head and food on the table. The widespread downturn and shutdown of Australian businesses has caused millions of casual and gig economy workers to be pushed towards the poverty line. We must not stand by and let this continue to happen. The Prime Minister is abandoning casual gig economy, university workers and childcare workers. This bill is the government's chance to redeem themselves somewhat, stand up for working Australians and protect some of the most vulnerable during this very difficult time. We must emerge from this exceptionally hard times as a society which has shown without doubt that we care for each other, that we care for fairness, that we care for equality. The government must lead, support and reassure workers and their employers. Too many have been left behind and the pressures felt by people with reduced or no access to leave to go to work when the public health advice is to stay home will only continue. We need the government to step in and guarantee 14 days of paid COVID-19 leave to every worker, regardless of their visa status or if they are a member of the permanent part-time casual or gig economy workforce. This bill will save lives, and I call upon the government, upon labor, upon crossbenchers, to urgently make this bill law for the sake of workers and the sake of our communities. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, the government does not support this one-size-fits-all bill. Amending the Fair Work Act, as proposed, won't be effective, won't be scalable and it won't be quick. So the government will be opposing the Greens bill, the Fair Work Amendment COVID Bill 2020. And I'd like to start off with my contribution to, to this debate by, by talking a bit about how businesses and how Queenslanders have been working and, and coping with COVID uh, over these past few months. And, and one of the things that, that, I, that I've found as I've travelled around uh, Queensland, and I've been everywhere from out to Eramanga in the southwest corner up to Windora and up to the far north quite a few times, driving around my, my home state, is that, that when you speak and, and listen to Queenslanders, they are very much relieved that Scott Morrison is the Prime Minister and that the National Cabinet, under his leadership, has worked together and has worked to, to save lives and protect livelihoods. And in particular, businesses 
and those who work in the businesses are so appreciative of, of what the government has done through the, the, the job keeper program. It should not be ever underestimated or even overestimated, perhaps is a better way of putting it in terms of the positive impact that, that JobKeeper has had on, on protecting businesses and, and saving livelihoods in Queensland to make sure that, that, that when we get through coronavirus and when there is a vaccine and that, that Australia is safe, that there will be businesses standing up and there will be thousands and millions of people working in those businesses. And so for the JobKeeper program, is, is, is something I don't know who can take, take credit for it, whether it's Mr Morrison or Mr Frydenberg or it was a collective effort around the, the expenditure review uh, committee of cabinet, but what it has done to protect the economy of Australia is, is something that, that, that I'm grateful for and I know that many businesses and, and employees in Queensland are grateful for. And of course, We've got to not forget that the money that, that is being used to fund these programs is, is money that has been spent on behalf of the taxpayers of, of Australia. It is money that has been earned by those uh, working, whether as, as pay-as-you-go taxpayers or those working in, in businesses, that, that their, their blood, sweat and, and tears goes towards these taxes and that any government, whether at a territory, state or, or Commonwealth level, needs to make sure that the money we expend on behalf of, of the taxpayers of Australia is, is spent appropriately and, 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 and soberly. And we should not forget that the money that is being spent to, to save the Australian economy at the moment is money that is not sitting in a vault of the Reserve Bank. It's not sitting hidden in the Treasurer's office, it is money that we are borrowing. It is money that we are borrowing to, to, to ensure that we have a today, but it is money that will have to be repaid by, by the taxpayers of tomorrow and of next year in, in decades' time. And that's why sometimes it is, it is concerning, as, as someone who sits on the right of politics, to to, when you really do listen to what the left say, that they're very, very good at spending other people's money. They're very, very good at wanting to, to, spend, to spend, uh, spend money without recourse to what the achievement or, of those taxpayers has been in working to save that money. And this government, and I'll take those interjections. This government has made sure that the money that we have spent, and it is an eye-watering amount, is money that has been spent to ensure that there will be businesses and there will be employees standing up once we get through this uh, pandemic. However, I do fear that those on the left sometimes might think that this is a perfect opportunity in which to, to just spend and spend and spend and borrow and borrow and borrow. And, and the line sometimes does have, does have to be drawn because we do have to stand up for, for the taxpayers of Australia. We do have to stand up for those who are going to come after us and will have to pay off this, this quite large debt. But we've got to look at what has been the strategic objective of the Prime Minister and the National Cabinet since the coronavirus began. And it is all about being saving lives and protecting livelihoods and ensuring and ensuring that that when we deal with coronavirus that we suppress it as much as possible so we can ensure uh, that, that the economy keeps going until a vaccine a vaccine uh, is, is found and that, that, that Australians are vaccinated against the coronavirus. Now we're all aware that, that this this pandemic is taking a heavy toll on Australia, on, on individuals, on families and on communities. We are all aware of, of, of the impact, especially in my, my home state of Queensland, where uh, we have a, a, a Labor government who does, 
has not just one eye open on the upcoming state election in 68 days, 68 days time, but two days open on it. And everything that I see that our, our Premier does is through the context of how she's positioning herself uh, for this upcoming uh, coming state election. And that is disappointing, and especially how she is using uh, the politics of border wars to divide people. We have a situation in Queensland where those who live in border communities are, are facing immense stress. And, and I, I speak as someone who, who lives broadly uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the border communities. I, I live on, on the Southern Downs. And we've seen situations in Queensland where, where a mum has given birth in northern New South Wales but has been unable to, to visit her newborn baby who had to be uh, transported to hospital in, in Queensland. We've seen a situation in, in, in Queensland where children were unable to go and see their dying father. So in a situation where my mum texted me over the weekend that one of, one of her friends was unable to go to her own brother's funeral. Uh, this is the, the, the situation we're, we're facing in, in, in Queensland uh, where we have a, have a government who are quite happy to use coronavirus as an alibi to cover up uh, their, their failed record on the economy, their failed record in Queensland where we've got a state government who had, before coronavirus came along, the highest levels of, of business bankruptcies, the lowest levels of, of, of business confidence. And the only thing that has been saving Queensland actually has been the actions taken by this federal government in relation to the, the, the JobKeeper payments, the other payments that have been put out by the government, and also through the, the, job, the JobSeeker supplement. And it is it's somewhat ironic uh, that, that, um, that uh, in Queensland there are parts of Queensland calling out uh, for workers, calling out uh, for workers to come and, and work on, 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 the, on the farms, to go and pick the fruit. And it is something that, that I've picked up in the, in the travels that I've done around Queensland, that we do need, um, that there are jobs going in Queensland, uh, and, uh, but they are in regional Queensland. And I would encourage people to move to regional Queensland. Uh, I live there, my office is in a, in, in a different region. I love all of Queensland, but for some reason, sometimes people don't want to shift. And I'd say to them, there is work there. Go west, go north. Uh, it may not be work that you like, but it, that it is work. Um, so we are supporting people uh, through JobKeeper, through JobSeeker. Uh, and the government's pandemic leave disaster payment is another, is another such support measure. We've put it in place to support those who don't have paid leave entitlements remaining, yet have, yet have been directed to isolate for 14 days when they otherwise would have been working. We put this program in place quickly. It was announced on the 3rd of August. Uh, Service Australia started accepting pay claims on the 5th of August, and payments started fl flowing a day later on the 6th of August. And already more than almost 7,000 claims from residents and non-residents have been received, and over $8 million has been paid to those in need. We're doing everything we possibly can to support those who have been told to, to, to self-isolate or, or quarantine. Uh, workers with no paid leave entitlements, such as casuals and contractors, may, for financial, e financial reasons, decide to continue working. What we have also have done is we have allowed people to access their, their, their super early. And, and what has been interesting about the, the howls of outrage from those on the left is it is outrageous that this Liberal National Government has allowed workers to access super early. The howls of outrage from, from Paul Keating, that failed Prime Minister of this country, that Prime Minister who deliberately pushed this country into recession, this Prime Minister who tells the workers of Australia, you can't access your own money. I, I Paul Keating, know better than you. The arrogance of the left when it comes to dealing with other people's money. The super contributions that have been put into the super accounts are the, the monies that belong to the workers. And if people um, uh, wish to access that to assist themselves 
throughout this, this pandemic, throughout this, this crisis that is facing Australia, well, I say they should be allowed to do that. They should be allowed to access their own money to help themselves through this crisis. But, oh, no, 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 no. Those on the left don't want that to happen. Those on the left want the funds to stay in these, 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 these huge super funds. And, and, a, and a fun fact, Ms. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, there's about, um, my understanding is about $30 billion has been withdrawn from, from super funds uh, over the last few months, you know, capped out at $10,000 per, 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 per financial year. That's about the same amount as administration fees that are charged by these super funds. We've got these multi-billion, um, it's, it's a trillion dollar industry, these, these multi-billion super funds who are in the pockets of, of big unions, in the pockets of, of labour and big business, but it's the labour and the unions who do not want the workers to have access to their own funds. So the government is, 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 is doing everything possible from, from supporting those who wish to employ people, those who wish to continue employing people, supporting those who have found themselves sadly without work, through the jobs through the job seeker supplement but this this bill and 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 the amendment as proposed by the greens uh, will will not assist the situation we will, will not will not help people as, as the greens do think so the government will not be supporting the amendments uh, it is welcoming to see that employers' ability to bear any additional costs during an unprecedented pandemic is acknowledged by by, by the amendment so they, they get a, get a tick for that however that the amendment as proposed by the Greens creates a new obligation on employers and employees. The additional burden of administering payments and seeking reimbursement is not what businesses and individuals need at the moment, particularly those in Victoria, but anyone around the country who are struggling. It will exacerbate cash flow issues for, for many businesses. And this is what it comes down to, Madam Acting Deputy President. That, that on, on this side of the chamber and on my own party in Queensland, we have so many people who come from the, the business world uh, or who speak to the business world on such a regular basis that we understand the issues that are facing businesses in Australia and, as important, that we understand the issues that are facing workers in Australia and we understand what we need to do to make sure that, that, that Australia gets through this pandemic. And that's why the government's priority since day one has been about saving lives. It's been about protecting livelihoods. It's about embarking on a strategy of, of suppressing coronavirus so that our, our hospitals can, can cope with any clusters that may, may erupt. But it is all about making sure that Australia is fighting fit for when we get through this coronavirus and we get into whether it's the end of this year or into the new year to make sure that Australia is fit and fighting, ready, um, having fought and beaten coronavirus. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Acting uh, Deputy uh, President. And I rise to uh, speak uh, in respect of this, uh, this bill. <coughs> and, uh, make the point that Australia needs a universal paid pandemic leave scheme to protect workers, public health and the national economy, and we need it quickly. Labor and the unions have been calling for paid pandemic leave since the start of this health and economic crisis nearly six months ago. It was evident to Labor and the unions from the very beginning that with between one and every three workers in the country not having access to paid sick leave, there could be, and is, <coughs> a big problem. Uh, the problem being that the public health risk of people having to choose between foregoing their income and not being able to pay their bills and turning up to work sick. We know that an estimated uh, 3.7 million Australians don't have any access to paid sick leave or the other protections of permanent employment, including casuals, contractors, freelancers, sole traders and gig economy workers. And many permanent workers have exhausted their sick leave entitlements already. 
The obvious risk Labor foresaw from the beginning of this crisis was that without pandemic leave, many will continue to turn up to work when they're sick or should be isolating, thereby potentially spreading the virus to their work colleagues and the broader community. But just as they uh, did with the, uh, our early calls for a wage subsidy, the government rejected our calls for a universal paid pandemic leave for workers, such as casuals unable to access such arrangements. Despite being warned, the government stubbornly refused to even anticipate the problem, let alone act on the uh, problem, even when it was clear that Labor and the unions had predicted uh, what indeed has happened. Madam Acting Deputy President, there is still a very real risk of the second wave extending beyond Victoria. Although the good news today, of course, was that the numbers continue to fall in that state and uh, are getting close to uh, 100. And given what was originally feared has become reality, the government needs to act now and introduce a universal paid pandemic leave scheme to ensure that every Australian worker who needs to stay home knows that they will not be financially penalised for doing so. Not addressing this issue will only lead to the continuation of the community spread of the virus and its devastating impact on our community. Universal paid pandemic leave will help stop the spread of the virus and reduce the chances of a full second wave. If Mr Morrison had <coughs> um, listened six months ago, the second wave experienced by Victoria may have been far less severe. Paid pandemic leave is meant to prevent an, out, uh, an outbreak. We need a national scheme now to prevent a repeat of the Victorian outbreak in other states. Workers cannot be forced to choose between paying their bills and protecting their colleagues, customers and patients. That being said, while Labor supports the bill, uh, we cannot support the amendment. We take this position on the basis of previous advice that should this bill pass uh, this House <coughs> amended in this way, the other House would likely rule it out of order. Labor wants the government to introduce universal paid pan pandemic leave now. We also believe the government should contribute to the costs of such a scheme. Uh, we believe payments uh, should be wage-like, that is, paid by the employer as they normally would any other kind of leave. Unless we get a universal scheme, we will have more community transmission, leading to more outbreaks and an economy smashing lockdown. Uh, we cannot afford not to do this. Madam Acting Deputy President, <coughs> the bill before you isn't perfect. Nothing that the Greens ever do is. <coughs> um, <laughs> it, it isn't necessarily the way Labor uh, would do it. 14 days uh, does not uh, properly provide for the circumstances in which a worker may have to isolate several times. And given the economic circumstances in which businesses find themselves, we believe the Commonwealth should contribute to the cost of the paid pandemic leave. But as, as we've said all too frequently these days, we shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator Lambie, uh, Senator Lambie's not here. Senator O'Sullivan is next on the speaking list. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to speak on this bill. Um, <coughs> uh, the Fair Work Amendment COVID-19 bill brought before this chamber uh, by the Greens. And as I do, I acknowledge the contribution of the previous speakers and the passion that they have for this issue. Like many in this place, through the course of this challenge, my office has been assisted countless numbers of individuals and organisations who have been hit with the full force of the economic shock from this pandemic. Those who, through no fault of their own, found themselves in a tough position. Individuals who were suddenly without work and business owners who had tough decisions to make about their future 
and that of their employees. In my first speech in this place, I remarked that I wanted to ensure that all Western Australians have equitable access to our democracy through the course of this challenge, and that is what I've endeavoured to do. I've taken this opportunity uh, that I've had uh, to travel around my home state, finding out how this pandemic has impacted people on the ground. Only the week before, my last, uh, week before last, my team and I hopped in the car and embarked on a 6,500-kilometre listening tour from Perth oh, okay. to Western Australia's far north. And I've spoken with business owners, not-for-profits and charitable organisations, chambers of commerce and countless numbers of individuals, including those in the gig-sharing economies, in some of the most diverse and remote parts of WA. There are some tough stories, as I said, those hit by the full force of this economic shock. Uh, there are also some really inspiring stories of ingenuity, of reinvention and of adaption. But the message which consistently underpinned each conversation was that the Commonwealth Government backed them when they needed it most. JobKeeper was and continues to be a game changer for so many. It makes sure employees are able to maintain that connection with their employer. Incredibly an important uh, factor for those in regional and remote WA, where if you lose someone, it really is a challenge to rehire uh, for that position. Uh, and of course, for those not able to keep, uh, able to get or receive the JobKeeper payment, JobSeeker has been there for them, and it's available. This means that people can continue to provide for their families, pay their bills, and prepare to re-enter the workforce as the conditions allow. Now, I know many of my colleagues in this place have taken the opportunity to do the same in their own home states, uh, have listened to their stories, and will have. Uh, help them inform their position uh, in this issue, on this issue. And I know Senator McGrath did a very similar uh, trip, spent a lot of time travelling around Queensland speaking to people about these very issues and hearing first-hand accounts of the impact of the federal government's response to this coronavirus pandemic. As a government, we continue to provide the required support to Australians as they need it to reflect the economic challenges both the JobKeeper and JobSeeker payments will be extended, as has been announced. In addition to this, there is also a range of other support measures, such as allowing people to access their own money through their super fund and the pandemic disaster leave payment for those in Victoria who are unable to earn an income if they must quarantine or self-isolate. The programs the Commonwealth Government have put in place have been designed to be simple. They're implementable, scalable, delivered through existing mechanisms. Services Australia is able to have that relationship with so many Australians through their existing systems. And this was incredibly important. If we started in this process trying to create our own uh, a unique, uh, bo uh, um, bespoke, uh, implementation, then we'd probably still be in the process of designing it and there will be no doubt flaws involved. But we used existing systems to ensure that the support got to people where they needed it at the right time. The Australian Tax Office already have mechanisms in place to deliver payments to businesses. And the pandemic disaster leave payment follows a well-established process already in place for the worst natural disasters our nation has faced, like the bushfires and floods. This bill does not meet any of these principles. It seeks to work outside of what is achievable and what is workable. As such, the government does not support this bill. Amending the Fair Work Act, as proposed, will not be effective. We know all too well that the impacts of coronavirus vary widely across borders, regions, sectors, businesses and individuals. That means a targeted approach. A targeted approach is what is needed. And that's why the pandemic disaster leave payment has been put in place. This payment is available to support all Victorian workers, including casual workers, who are required to self-isolate and quarantine and cannot take personal leave. 
These $1,500 payments could not be any easier to access. They're available through Services Australia simply by picking up the phone and dialing 1800, uh, sorry, 180 2266. That's 180 2266. Payments can be claimed on multiple occasions as needed. In addition to this, the Prime Minister has also written to each of the states and territories offering similar commitments where a jurisdiction declares a state of disaster. The Greens bill, by contrast, doesn't adopt the same measured approach, commensurate with the need within each jurisdiction. No matter whether an employer operates in Western Australia or in Victoria, the bill will impose significant additional costs on those who are already dealing with the most significant impact, economic impact, in generations. The proposal to ask the Fair Work Commission to make COVID-19 leave orders on application will create tremendous complexity and ambiguity for everyone involved as they have to navigate the new application process and understand when an order might apply. Madam Acting Deputy President, some business and individuals are even more exposed to the risk of coronavirus than others and are affected on more occasions than others. The government's payment is available on multiple occasions if a worker needs to self-isolate under health order or get sick, but the bill only provides 14 days of leave, which may mean that in fact some workers could even miss out. The best the Greens can do while slamming us on this side, while claiming to have the monopoly on compassion, is to come into this place with a bill that could actually provide less support, less support for those that need it. Let's contrast this to what the government has already done and made available to other jurisdictions as they need it. Workers with no paid leave entitlements, such as casuals and contractors, may, for financial reasons, decide to continue working. The federal government's Pandemic Leave Disaster Plan grant program provides a lump sum payment to limit the financial hardship for eligible individuals who are directed to self-isolate or quarantine. We put this program in place quickly, in rapid time, record time possibly. It was announced on 3 August Services Australia started accepting claims on 5 August and payments started to flow the following day on the 6th of August. Already more than 6,800 claims from residents and non-residents have been received. Over 8 million has already been paid to those that need it. And this, was, and this is what's possible when you use an established process with systems that are already in place. If you try to do this through new systems, we would still be designing them, we would still be testing them, and, the, the, and importantly, the impact would not be where it's needed. The support would not be going to where it's needed. We would still would have IT people in back rooms designing a system, testing it, you know, robustly testing it, and it would just take forever. But we had to use existing systems to make it work. So the Greens cannot be trusted with the simplest of ideas. They cannot be trusted with managing a pandemic. They cannot be trusted with informing an economic response. They cannot even be trusted with supporting those that are actually most in need, hit by the worst effects of this economic shock. The government will not be supporting this bill because we believe the appropriate measures have been put in place and they encourage, they encourage individuals that are in that position of need, that are desperate, that need support. They've got a system that is there to support them, that's responsive, that's timely, that's right where it's needed. And so I encourage the chamber to vote against this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Lambie, you have the call. Thank you, Deputy. Chair, I can't get it out. I'd like to make a short statement about my position on this proposal from the Greens. We can't ask people to take leave if it means they're going to lose everything. A global pandemic is forcing people to not turn up to shifts. People who want to work aren't able to do it out of a commitment to public safety. We're asking them to go broke so that the rest of us don't get sick. Now, if you've been in contact with someone with COVID and you are required to self-isolate, you're losing money. 
by not turning up for your shifts. If you've got leave saved up, that's what it is there for. What about if you don't have any leave? You're on your own. You have to hope you've got some savings put away, away for a rainy day, because I can tell you now it is pouring and it's not going to stop for two straight weeks. The bill starts from the same place I do. It is all about helping people who are going broke to keep, to keep strangers safe from harm. If you're asked to self-isolate, it's not for your own benefit. It's to keep people safe, people you may never meet, but whose lives depend on what you are doing and what decisions you are making. Those who are doing the right thing are going broke for our own benefit and to keep us safe. And there's something that we can do to help them out. Then I want to be able to help them. My problem is that in order to help them, this bill throws a blank cheque at everybody. In its current form, this bill pays too much to the wrong people. And we have no idea how much that's going to cost, how much more it's going to cost our grandchildren in the future to repay. There are better ways to stop people from going to work sick. This bill will force the government to cover the cost of a person's wages when they have time off work because of COVID. People who earn more would get more. People with a steady job, annual leave and sick days would actually get more. The Commonwealth would end up paying thousands and thousands of dollars to what's already well-off people just so they don't have to dip into their leave or sick days when they take time off because of COVID. And that doesn't make any sense to me. Why should we pay the wages of a wealthy banker just so they can use their annual leave on a few days at their beach house? Why should we chip in so that a management consultant can still afford to chuck a sickie now and then? Why should we be paying for that? Those people can look after themselves, I reckon. The PM keeps saying that we're all in this together. Well, the lucky people in Australia who have a steady job right now can afford to do their bit. And you're going to have to do some heavy lifting. We all are. Because we're going to have to cover the others. They have the choice to do the right thing. They should give up a little on their end when it's good for their community and their country. Sometimes you just have to do that. I know it sucks, but guess what? That's life and that's just how it is right now under the circumstances that we're all living in. The other thing that scares me about this bill in its current form is that the Greens don't know how much it will cost. They're asking me to sign onto a blank cheque. And I can't do that in good conscience. I will never, ever do that. We could run up some big numbers pretty quickly. About 12 million people have a job in Australia at the moment. It would cost the Commonwealth over $16 billion, $16 billion if half of them took two weeks off at the average wage. There are a lot of people out there who could use that kind of support from the government. People who are on JobSeeker are facing a cut to their payments next month. People on JobKeeper will get that too. And we're running into the Christmas period. I don't want that to happen. It is not right. Victoria right now is in the middle of a second wave and they're still in lockdown. And we don't know how long that's going to continue for. Why would we cut hundreds of dollars out of JobSeeker when some states are in worse position than they've ever been in right now? Why would we cut JobKeeper when small businesses are on their knees? They are on their knees. Things have changed since the government announced those cuts. There's not a soul in this parliament that thinks we're all going to be hunky-dory four weeks from now, because if you do, you'd have to be delusional and you probably shouldn't be sitting in parliament. Those support payments have got to be extended until after Christmas. We can't be cutting people off from $1,500 a fortnight when everybody is saying we're yet to break the back of this economic depression that we are in. That's where my priorities are right now. That's where we should be spending our money. We shouldn't be paying, we shouldn't be paying that billions just to take away from the inconvenience of COVID restrictions people who have a job and earn good money. They're going to have to start doing the heavy lifting. Someone give them a warning. This is the problem. I don't think we've thought this through enough, and I don't think we've weighed the, tra we've weighed the trade offs. I'm on board with the idea that casual workers without leave entitlements or high income need more help. 
I agree that there should be government support in place for people who could lose their job or have to skip rent payments because they need to self-isolate. That's why I suggested to the Greens that we cap the payments at a sensible level. If you want something done in this place, you've got to compromise. The way I see it, we should set the cap at $1,500 a fortnight. That's the same amount as the current rate of JobKeeper. And maybe we can negotiate with the government at the same time to keep JobSeeker and JobKeeper at its rate it is now until after Christmas. Wouldn't that be a better way to do politics in this place? That way it's a win-win for everybody. It is $1,500 is a rate that has been broadly accepted as enough to get people through when their income has taken hit because of this virus. The beauty of it is that people on lower incomes would still get their whole wage. We know, we know the, they're the ones who have the most trouble staying home if they're sick because they can't afford to go without a penny. That's where we're at. They'd get the help that they need to stop that from happening. People earning more than that can, could top up their payments with their annual leave or sick leave or, sa or savings. Like I said, we're all having to do the heavy lifting. Tough. Suck it up. It's unprecedented times. It's a much fairer model. It's better targeted to people who need the most help. It also happens to be very similar to the model brought in by the Victorian government at the height of the second wave. It's working there and it should be expanded to other states before any new outbreaks get out of hand. We need to get one step, uh, uh, we need to get one step ahead. We need to start telling people what's coming down if the second or third waves hit. And you should be up to that by now as a coalition. You've now had your second wave in Victoria. There are no excuses anymore for having things in place when outbreaks happen in other states. No excuses. I want to get money out to the Australians who need it most. I want to stop people from having to choose between going to work sick or paying their rent. I know how hard that choice would be. Unfortunately, this bill in its current form gives more to people who need less help, and it isn't fair and it is not sensible. So here's what I proposed as a compromise. The Greens don't want to set the rate of COVID leave at any amount. They think it should be whatever you're earning before you get, you get now. I think it should be set at the rate of JobKeeper for everybody, except those on JobSeeker for obvious reasons. One of the biggest problems is that it's all getting cut off way too soon, and we need to balance fixing that against fixing this. So I've proposed to the Greens an amendment that I think strikes a reasonable balance, because the Greens don't want to see don't want it set at JobKeeper, and I don't want it set at an infinite amount where people like Clive Palmer and Twiggy Forrest can be forced to self-isolate. You think Western Australia is having problems right now? Give them 15 million bucks for the fortnight. Come on! This has not been done very well, this bill. So let's say it should be capped at something reasonable, and let's say that that cap should be set by the only ones in this debate able to say what the cost of each level of cap should be. My proposal is that the government be required to set a cap at the amount a person can receive for COVID paid leave. My amendment doesn't say what the cap should be. It just says you've got to draw the line somewhere, so let's draw a line. What I'm proposing is fairer, goes further, is more affordable and should be supported by the Senate. And if that's more reasonable and supported, then maybe you could look at extending the job seeker and job keeper at the current, arra at the current arrangement until after Christmas. And everybody's on a win-win. This is not something that we've seen going on when you set that amount two or three months ago when you decided you were going to change it. Well, things have not got better, and things aren't getting better tomorrow. And we need to think forward, and we need to think on our feet a little bit quicker than what we've been doing. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, has leave been granted? It has. Thank you, Senator Lambie. We will now move. Our oh, clerk, sorry. General business order of the day, number 55, Commonwealth Electoral Amendment, ensuring fair representation of the Northern Territory Bill 2020, second reading debate. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, this is a significant private senator's bill for the people of the Northern Territory. I stand here enormously proud, Madam Acting Deputy President, to represent the people of the Northern Territory here in the Senate. I stand just as proudly with my fellow Territorians, uh, Luke Gosling, the member for Solomon, and also Warren Snowden, the member for Lingiari. I thank very much 
the CLP Senator for the Northern Territory, Sam McMahon, for standing with us in putting this private senator's bill to the Senate and for debate today. The Constitution allows for five members of the House of Representatives for each original state, but leaves to Parliament to determine the number of seats in the territories. I wish in some ways that we didn't have to have this particular bill, Madam Acting Deputy President, but the Australian Electoral Commissioner has declared the Northern Territory will lose one of its two seats at the next federal election. This news has been met with great despair in the Northern Territory. We have only four voices in a parliament of over 220 parliamentarians. The Northern Territory is growing. The Parliament of Australia says let's develop the North. And when we talk about developing the North with the economy, with infrastructure, we must also talk about developing the North in terms of the voices of the people of the North. By removing a voice diminishes all of our voices. And I am urging senators to get behind this bill. The Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 provides for a minimum of one member each for the Northern Territory and the Australian Capital Territory. A single seat in the House of Representatives would mean one member of parliament representing more than 250,000 Territorians in an electorate of over 1.4 million square kilometres, an electorate that is 30 per cent First Nations people and which has a population undercounted in the census. I introduced this bill in the Senate along with my Labor colleague Don Farrell, our Shadow Special Minister of State, and it has been co-sponsored by fellow NT Senator Dr McMahon and all the national senators. We understand, Madam Acting Deputy President, the importance of fair representation for regional, rural and remote Australians. And we understand that the Northern Territory's 72 remote Indigenous communities, 500 homelands and 40 Indigenous languages—in fact, there's more than 40. They're the strong ones. There's actually over 100 Aboriginal languages in the Territory. The case for the two seats in the Northern Territory is about fairness for remote and regional Australians. It recognises the huge geographical area of the Northern Territory six times the size of Victoria and almost double the size of New South Wales. It recognises that with two seats, the population in each is still not far below the national average and is significantly more than the five seats in Tasmania. Now, this is by no means any disrespect to my colleagues in all of the other states, but it's important in terms of justice and fairness in terms of democracy. And that's what this bill is about. This bill has been referred to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, which gave us an opportunity to hear from those Territorians who will be affected by this change. The inquiry is considering more than 50 submissions on the issue and have heard from more than 20 witnesses. The overwhelming majority of these support maintaining our two seats in the Northern Territory. They included submissions and evidence from the Chamber of Commerce, Northern Territory, the Land Councils of the Northern Territory, the four of them, Central Land Council, Northern Land Council, Anandiliakwa Land Council and the Tiwi Land Council, Aboriginal Medical Services of the Northern Territory, Australian Nurses and Midwifery Foundation of the Northern Territory, the Chinese Literary Association of Christmas Island, the CPSU, the Multicultural Council of the NT, the Australian Greens and the leader of the Country Liberal Party in the Northern Territory, Leah Finocchiaro, and many more. Greg Ireland, the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce, who gave evidence, said, bringing in a floor of two members is what we're seeking. We'd actually love it to be law that would at least allow a stronger voice inside parliament to assist with those challenges that we face. Marion Scrimger, CEO of the Northern Land Council, said returning to a solitary seat would heighten 
the effective disenfranchisement amongst Aboriginal Territorians. Sarah Cook from the Isolated Children's Parents Association said a single electorate would undoubtedly limit the representation of remote communities and remote families in federal parliament. Sarah says Lingiari is a massive landmass. There are many, many layers of need and disadvantage. We're in, we are already competing for air in those factors, and we really think it's unreasonable to further limit us by reducing it to just a single person. Sarah Cook gave evidence over the phone from her car in Catherine and told the committee she was about to drive home, 10 hours sitting on an open highway. And from Christmas Island, let's not forget the most important Indian Ocean Territories that come under the Northern Territory, Christmas Island and Cocos Keeling Islands. From Christmas Island, Chris Sue wrote that travelling a single Northern Territory division would take more than two weeks and no less than four international airports and two ferries. He said the distance from the Cocos Keeling Islands to Alice Springs as the crow flies is 4,113 kilometres. Dublin to Cairo is 3,975 kilometres. 4,000 kilometres is one-tenth of the circumference of the earth. These are the passionate submissions coming from people right across the Northern Territory Lingiari electorate. Bawanunga Aboriginal Corporation, based in Manangreed or Arnhem Land, one of the most remote corners of the current electorate of Lingiari, put in a powerful submission. And I'd like to read quite a bit from their submission. They suggested redistribution of the NT electoral boundaries legitimately dis diminishes Indigenous Territorians' right to representation and ultimately justice. They described the idea that one MP could be an effective voice for the most disadvantaged Australians in an electorate spanning 1.4 million square kilometres makes a mockery of representation. The census data is not accurate and underestimates the number of people living in the region. Many local Aboriginal people are not registered to vote. Even when they are, voting rates are low compared to the rest of the country. This means that our local people are already disadvantaged when it comes to representation. I also want to share with the Senate the voices of individuals who have spoken to me about this issue, who have signed the Labor petition on this matter. I have certainly spent the past month travelling across vast areas of the Northern Territory. I have been speaking to people from Yirrkala, Baniala in North East Arnhem Land, to people from Timber Creek and Yarralan towards the West Australian border. I have been speaking to people in Darwin, in Alice Springs, Catherine and Tennant Creek, and in particular Kalgarinji, the home of the Gurindji the site of the 1966 Wave Hill walk-off, which at the weekend marked its 54th anniversary. Some of you may have seen an article in the Australian newspaper last week, a plea from the children, the grandchildren, of Vincent Lingiari to the Prime Minister. In a letter to Prime Minister Scott Morrison, the grandchildren of Vincent Lingiari, Deborah Vincent, Sonny Smiler, Rosie Smiler, Jocelyn Victor and Lisa Smiler called on the Prime Minister to support this bill in the Senate and in particular when it reaches the House of Representatives, which we seriously hope that it does. They wrote, in 2000, we gave permission for the Australian Electoral Commission to use our grandfather's name for the electorate of Lingiari. We were proud to see the achievements of Vincent Lingiari and the Gurindji people recognised in this way. Losing a seat will make our voices softer, not louder. Right now, we ask you to listen to our voice and help us to protect our voice. The voice of remote NT will be diminished without strong representation. It's really important for the Senate to recognise the significance of that letter in particular to the Prime Minister and the importance from a cultural perspective of First Nations people giving permission for a name like Vincent Lingiari to be used in the parliament for a seat in the House of Representatives. The families had no idea of what this decision meant in terms of the Australian Electoral Commission. No one had spoken to them. No one had explained as to why 
the name of Vincent Lingiari may not be going forward. In my travels, I do explain to Territorians what we're fighting for, fair representation in the Northern Territory, for a voice for remote and regional Territorians, for democracy, and they are absolutely quick to get behind me. And I say to the people of the Northern Territory, let's stay strong on this. We deserve to grow in every aspect of that word, grow in the economy, grow in our infrastructure, grow in our population, and most importantly, grow in our democratic rights here in the Australian Parliament. Labor has garnered over 3,000 signatures from across the Territory and Australia on its petition, and we're not stopping there. We will continue with that pet petition. I will table that petition to the Senate later in the year. Petitioners include Erin Lucas from Lajamanu, one representative to service the whole of the Northern Territory is unreasonable, unrealistic and put simply unfair. This is what John Boffer from Eastside Alice Springs and our public health medical officer at the Central Australian Aboriginal Health Congress says. The population counts are not accurate and marginalised people need to know their politicians if they're going to be motivated to vote. We must retain two seats. And this is what Raquel Nichols Skeen and Brinken says on the petition. The Northern Territory has the most disadvantaged people in Australia, and being further stripped of representation will only contribute further to their disadvantage. As a territory, not a state, we already currently miss full participation in our governance. That is, not even a full vote in a referendum. And Joanna Arren from Umbacumba on Groot Island says, the NT is already underrepresented with two seats. It's crucial to the Northern Territory to retain these two seats. Gregory Thompson from Stuart Park in Darwin said simply, one seat is an insult to democracy. Beverly Gannat from Pine Creek says, while population density is normally the primary consideration, geographical distance must also be given just and fair consideration. Werner Apple from Tennant Creek says, it's a disgrace. Anne Gradage in Darwin says, it's not all about population size, the complexity of the issues needs to play a part in decision making. I would absolutely love to go on and perhaps I will one day. And from interstate we've had Beth Cummings from Millbrook, Western Australia, who said we all need to stick together to do what's best for the Northern Territory. Barbara Greensmith from Port Pirie in South Australia says NT definitely needs two seats. It's such a huge area and it's totally unacceptable to believe that one person could possibly cover the whole area. There are so many. Go on my Facebook page, you will see all the comments. These people, these everyday Territorians and everyday Australians, they get it. They understand what federal representation is meant to do and they can't believe the Northern Territory could possibly be represented by one person. They get that a single electorate for the Territory would not give adequate recognition to the differing communities in the NT. They get that a single electorate for the Northern Territory would not recognise the strategic and economic importance of the Northern Territory to Australia as a whole. Labor gets it. The Nationals get it. I thank Senators Sam McMahon, Bridget McKenzie, Matt Canavan, Perrin Davy and Susan MacDonald for co-sponsoring this bill. The Greens get it. Independents, Senators Lambie, Patrick and Griff get it. Even the leader of the Northern Territory CLP gets it, and so does the Labor Northern Territory Party get it. With all of these senators supporting the bill, we're hopeful it can pass the Senate. Now I call on the Prime Minister to do the same. The only thing we need now, Prime Minister, is for you to get it, for you to support the voices of the people of the Northern Territory, for you to assist in this legislation to enable the Northern Territory, at a minimum, to have two seats in the lower house. Yamalu. Thank you, uh, Senator McCarthy. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to, to speak on the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment ensuring fair representation of the Northern Territory Bill 2020. But before I uh, do, I would like to acknowledge the, the great festival of democracy that was held on the weekend in, in, in the Northern Territory and, in particular, uh, thank and congratulate all the candidates who stood for election, but in particular acknowledge the, the work 
of, of Leah Nokiara, the leader of the country Liberals. I did work for the country Liberals back in, in 2012 as their campaign director, uh, when we were very fortunate to, to come to power after being in, in the wilderness for a number of years. And, and Leah is one of those, those brilliant politicians who has what I call, call the X factor. But congrat congratulations to her and Sally Ann Innes and everybody involved with that campaign. I'll have more about that to say at a, at a later time. Uh, this, this bill uh, introduced by uh, Senators Farrell and McCarthy on 11 June of this year would amend the Commonwealth Electoral Act to provide for a minimum of two divisions for the Northern Territory in the House of Representatives. The introduction of this bill was predicated on research that projected the possibility that the Northern Territory would lose one of its two seats in the House of Representatives caused by its population falling, uh, falling below the entitlement quota for the second seat. So on the, uh, the 12th of June of this year, uh, Minister Cormann, as Special Minister of State, uh, wrote to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters to ask it to inquire and report back on this bill early in, in, the, um, in the spring sittings to ensure timely deliberation before redistribution processes for the Northern Territory could become too far advanced. And for senators to hear from appropriate experts and from members of the community, uh, but also including government agencies on the administrative and legal uh, implications of, of this bill. So uh, as chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, I want to briefly update the Senate on this inquiry and on, on some of the evidence that, that has been received. So on the 17th of June, after receiving Minister Cormann's request, the committee resolved to adopt an inquiry into the bill, which was subsequently publicised by uh, uh, media releases and in the form of, of invitations to interested parties. Um, it was only during the inquiry, that, and this was on the 3rd of July, that the Australian Electoral Commissioner formally made the determination to increase the number of seats in Victoria uh, from 38 to 39, to decrease the number of seats in Western Australia from 16 to 15, and to decrease the number of seats in the Northern Territory from 2 to 1. And this was based on the most recent official population figures for the Commonwealth published by the Australian statistician. So what I will do um, is, is, is go into a bit of detail in terms of, of, of how this has come about. Um, so in terms of uh, the population quota uh, for, for one member uh, is about uh, 172,537 people to be precise, with partial quotas over 0.5 rounded up. Unlike the states, the territories are afforded an additional calculation process to account for the margin of error related to the population at the last census. This margin of error calculation was introduced by the Howard government through the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment representation in the House of Representatives Act 2004, following the recommendation of JSCAM's 2003 territory representation inquiry. The NT population shortfall for a second member was 11,526. This was more than its population margin error of 7,440. As such, it did not re retain its second seat. The ACT population shortfall for a third member was 1,784. This was less than its population margin of error of 10,694. As such, it retained its third seat. The 31 December 2019 estimated resident population data was published by the APS in, in June of this year. These were the most recent statistics required to be used by the Electoral Commissioner under the Electoral Act for the calculation of the entitlements ahead of the next election. The determination of reduced entitlement for the Northern Territory to one member only applies immediately for the purposes of enrolment. The members elected at the 2019 federal election, representing the division of Lingiari and the division of Solomon, will continue to represent those electorates up until uh, the next election. 
Part 3 of the Electoral Act specifies the process to be followed to determine the number of members of each state and territory, when it is to be conducted and by whom it is to be conducted. The number of members in the House of Representatives for a state or a territory is based on the population of that state or territory relative to the population of all other states and territories. Some margin of error adjustments are made to the territories to account for the accuracy of their census population data. So enrolment is not relevant to the entitlement to members in the House of Representatives. The allocation of members by jurisdiction involves a calculation that divides the population of the state or territory by a population quota. Partial quotas, as I indicated earlier, over 0.5 from this calculation are rounded up. So, in essence, the population quota equals the number of people of the Commonwealth as ascertained by the Electoral Commissioner, uh, divided by twice the number of senators for the, for the of for twice the number of senators for the states. In calculating this quota, the number of people of the Commonwealth does not include the people of the territories. The Electoral Act requires the Australian statistician to supply the Electoral Commissioner with the populations of the states and territories which have been compiled and published in a regular series under the Census and Statistics Act of 1905. The information to be supplied by the statistician is required to be published immediately prior to the day for the calculation, that is, one day after the House of Representatives has been sitting for 12 months following an election. The ABS also publishes the estimated resident population for each quarter. Now, adjustments may be made to the ACT and NT population as follows. The ACT to include the Jarvis Bay Territory and to include Norfolk Island, where the latter is not entitled to a member in its own right, and the Northern Territory to include the Christmas Island Territory and or the Cocos Islands Territory, when either or both of these territories are not entitled to a member in their own right. In both of these cases, the population of the smaller territory is added to the population of the ACT or the Northern Territory, and the number of members to which the ACT or the Northern Territory is entitled is recalculated. This is an additional calculation which is made where the entitlement for the ACT or the Northern Territory is a whole number and a remainder that is less than or equal to one half of the population quota. Depending on the outcome of this calculation, a further adjustment may be made to the population and the number of members recalculated. And this is the margin of error uh, calculation that was introduced in 2004. Now, uh, uh, section 24 of the Constitution does specify that five members, at least, shall be chosen in each original state. And as has been pointed out uh, by, by speakers, Tasmania uh, is guaranteed a minimum of five members of the House of Representatives as an original state of, 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 the, uh, of the Commonwealth of Australia. And section 122 of the Constitution allows the Parliament to make laws for the territories and provides that the Parliament may allow the representation of such territory in either House of the Parliament to the extent of the terms which it thinks fit. Section, sub, sorry, subsection 48.2b of the Electoral Act requires at least one member of the House of Representatives should be chosen in the ACT and the Northern Territory at a general election. This provision was introduced through the Electoral and Referendum Amendment Act of 1989. Prior to the 1989 Act, the Commonwealth Electoral Legislation Amendment Act 1983 fixed two members for the ACT and one member for the Northern Territory. I think it's also important, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, that, that we, we sort of also look at the historical representation in, in the, Nor the Northern Territory. And uh, the NT, or the Northern Territory, was first represented by one member in the House of Representatives in 1922 through the Northern Territory Representation Act of 1922. But uh, it should be noted that the voting and participatory rights of the NT member were initially restricted. They could not uh, vote on any question, be counted in any situation where numbers mattered, for example, a quorum or an absolute majority, and they could not hold office as a Speaker of the House of Representatives or a Chair of a House of Representatives committee. In 1936, the Northern Territory member was granted the right to vote on any motion to disallow any Northern Territory ordinance and on any amendment to such motion. In 1959, the Northern Territory member's right to vote was extended to include any proposed law relating solely to the Northern Territory. In 1968, the Northern Territory members afforded the same rights, privileges and immunities as members for other, other states. 
The Northern Territory Representation Act was repealed and replaced by the Commonwealth Electoral Legislation Amendment Act of 1983, which transferred Northern Territory representation provisions in the Electoral Act and retained the Northern Territory's fixed entitlement to one member. So I think it's very important to, to be aware of, of the historical background of, of, of representation in the Northern Territory, but also, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, to be fully uh, uh, aware of, of the legal background upon which, upon which redistributions take place in Australia and the basis upon which redistributions do take place. Uh, and so since uh, the inquiry into this bill was established some months ago, the Joint Standing Committee on, on Electoral Matters has received written and ver verbal evidence from over 50 individuals and organisations. And while it was the committee's original hope to travel to the Northern Territory to hold in-person hearings, uh, uh, the committee uh, secretariat um, uh, uh, received advice that, 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 that this was probably not appropriate considering uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic that is currently uh, sweeping Australia. So the committee instead agreed to hold the hearing via teleconference on, on the 21st of July. And at the committee, at the hearing, uh, the committee heard from the Australian Bureau of Statistics um, and as Senator McCarthy indicated, we, we heard from Senator McCarthy along with the federal members for Solomon and Lingiari. Uh, we heard from the Australian Electoral Commission. Uh, we heard from uh, officers from the Department of Finance, uh, election analyst Malcolm McCarris, AO. Uh, for, for those who might be listening along at home, there's Professor McCarris who um, came up with the McCarris uh, pendulum. Uh, the ABC's Anthony Green, as well as um, a number of representatives from either the Chamber of Commerce or the Isolated Children's Parents Association, Indigenous organisations and other, vent, other, other individuals. Um, some were supportive of the bill, others called for amendments or, or changes uh, to the formula. In saying so, uh, responses to questions on notice arising from the hearing uh, were, were due uh, last week. And there are some uh, submissions that the committee still wishes and still needs to consider uh, before publication. And it is my understanding that the committee secretariat uh, is now working to, uh, through the evidence that we have received. And uh, the committee had agreed to consider the report in early October. However, it is my preference, and I'm looking across at my, 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 my Labor colleagues over there, that I'm subject to the view of other committee members and without wishing to step on their toes um, and considering the workload of the Secretariat, that I would hope that we can report back sooner than that, um, given the formal determination by the Australian Electoral Commission in July. In, in closing, um, we do need to consider the, the evidence uh, serious, um, soberly and, and with due consideration, Senator, Senator Farrell. And, um, uh, in closing, has been an important and long-standing convention that electoral legislation should generally be changed based on bipartisan consensus and after appropriate opportunity for scrutiny of, of legislation. And I do hope that the Senate considers the committee's forthcoming report and recommendations prior to any vote on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Waters, you have the call. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Um, and I acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the land that I'm dialing in from um, here in Mianjin or Brisbane, uh, the Turrbal, the Yagara, and the Yagara Pool people, and that sovereignty was never ceded, so we are on stolen land. Um, it's, it's, I'm very proud to be the first uh, Senator to be using our remote facilities as the Chamber finally enters the 21st century, and I hope that we can continue that trend to modernity with maybe some more women in Cabinet and uh, a more representative chamber. Um, and that's, of course, what the bill is about today. So the uh, uh, Commonwealth Electoral Amendment Ensuring Fair Representation of the Northern Territory Bill of 2020 is a bill that the Greens are very proud to support, and it goes to the ability of this chamber to represent its constituents um, and for the ability of the House to represent its constituents. Um, now, the reason for this bill is that in early July, the Electoral Commissioner determined that population changes in the Northern Territory um, meant that the electoral entitlement for the NT was for one lower house seat only. So if the parliament doesn't act, then this small change in relative population will lead to uh, the Northern Territory losing half of its representation in the House uh, and going from four federal representatives down to just three. 
the resulting lower house electorate would cover the entire Northern Territory and the Christmas and Cocos Islands. So it would be by far the largest electorate in the country by population at almost a quarter of a million uh, people. The Greens strongly believe that by halving the number of seats in the Territory, it would be a massive injustice to First Nations uh, people living in the Territory, who are frankly already unrepresented and un underserved by our parliamentary system. It would also lead to major underrepresentation for rural and remote communities across the Territory and the islands. The, these diverse um, and disparate communities already share one rural electorate, despite the diversity of issues that that electorate already has to cover. So to combine an already stretched electorate with uh, an urban centre would just further marginalise rural and remote issues. Now, this is, of course, the reason why we are in strong support of the bill. Now, there was a broad consensus expressed in the inquiry into this bill, um, those making submissions and those giving evidence that um, returning to just one member electorate would seriously diminish the representation for the people in the Northern Territory. And I note that the Territory is 27 per cent First Nations people, which is the highest um, proportion of any state or territory. Lingiari, which is the seat that would be abolished, uh, has the highest proportion of First Nations voters at about 40 per cent. And so its amalgamation would seriously and disproportionately impact the representation that First Nations people are able to get in this um, House and Chamber of Parliament, in this federal parliament. Now, I've already mentioned how the NT is huge in its geography and covers a disparate range of constituencies. Um, currently, the urban and industrial issues are concentrated in a seat around Darwin or Solomon, while the regional um, areas are mostly represented in Lingiari. So, as I've said, amalgamation into one seat, we fear, would give priority to those urban areas over those regional, remote um, and First Nations um, issues and voices. For example, in relation to fracking, which is, of course, quite topical, um, city voters who might have bought the spin that somehow there'll be some economic benefit flowing from gas, which frankly is dubious and disputed by the experts, they might vote differently to people in those regional and remote areas who will have to live with the impacts of a destroyed water table um, and other um, incursions onto their land. So it'll be very difficult for a representative to, to balance those um, competing interests and concerns. Now, of course, in order to represent an electorate properly, you should get around and visit the place. Um, and that's part of the reason why I'm um, dialing in remotely so that I can do that in the 14 days after this fortnight of sittings rather than being in um, an appropriate level of quarantine to, to keep my um, fellow Queenslanders safe. But the size of the NT, making it one seat, is just thoroughly impractical for the representatives to get around and actually listen to the community and then be able to represent those interests um, here in Parliament. And I want to note that the Northern Territory has already got a lower turnout in terms of um, federal voting uh, statistics than other states and territories. So if voters already um, feel unrepresented due to the size of the existing electorates, um, and then the further lack of an elected representative getting around to see them personally, well, there's a potential for even less engagement and even more disenfranchisement. Now, that would be a tragedy for our democracy. The fact that the NT population fluctuates with a clear margin of error and that the census data is sometimes unreliable given the transient nature of the population um, means that it's really preferable to have a guarantee of two seats rather than changing between one and two seats um, every few terms. Now, there's a whole range of ways that this can be achieved, and some of the submitters to this uh, bill inquiry went through them. Anthony Green proposes a, um, a harmonic mean apportionment. Um, it all gets very wonky and interesting. Um, we're very open to considering those uh, methods in future, but for now, um, we think this bill is a necessary safeguard to um, protect our democracy and to protect um, the interest of First Nations people being able to be represented properly um, in the House of Representatives and the Federal Parliament. And I mean, now is a crucial time in our relationship with First Nations people. Uh, the Greens, of course, believe that we need our treaty 
uh, treaty. We need truth. We need justice. We need healing. We need reparations. We need sovereignty acknowledged. All of those issues should be dealt with um, by this parliament and by our community. But if we are to start off by reducing representation of First Nations people in the federal parliament, then I think that sends absolutely the wrong message and could potentially set back progress on those other crucial issues of how we respect and acknowledge um, how First Nations peoples and their rights. Um, while we're on electoral reform, this bill um, is important, as I've said, and, and the time for dealing with these issues is now. But there's also a lot of other reforms that our democracy is crying out for. Uh, we need more diversity of representation in our chamber, and we need the voices of the community to be properly represented. Now, I've got a, a private member's bill of my own, which will hopefully come on for debate at some point um, this century, uh, which would remove the influence of private money on our democracy. And it would say that actually you shouldn't be able to buy influence um, and that particular industry should not be able to make massive donations that then buys tacit favours or tacit policy outcomes that suits their bottom line, while community interests and the public interest and the interests of the planet um, get put second, third or last. Um, we think that's a crucial electoral reform as well. It's long been the Greens' view that we should get dirty donations and their influence on our democracy just right out of the picture. Um, and so I'll be uh, hoping to bring that bill on at some point. It would cap donations from everybody to $1,000 uh, a year. That's individuals, that's, that's um, community groups, that's everybody, because we don't think that big money should be running our democracy. We think it should be about the public interest and the interest of the planet um, and the future. So that's, of course, the biggest electoral reform uh, that the Greens will continue to champion and to push for. And we hope to have some support for that, but we note that, sadly, uh, both of the big parties do accept very large corporate donations to the tune of, I think it's $100 million now um, since 2012. So sadly, we're not yet confident that that bill will have the numbers that it requires uh, to pass, but we live in hope. In terms of other reforms that are needed for our democracy to, to remain in this century, um, remote participation is, of course, at the top of the list. And I'm really pleased that here we are here and uh, things seem to be working. I haven't had my phone buzz to say that you can't hear me or see me or things aren't working. So I assume that all is tickety-boo. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. But it's six months too late. We've we've had uh, we've been in this global pandemic for six months now and really we should have seen this process expedited um, at the beginning of that time. Um, I'm glad we're here now, but it did take an awfully long time. Um, and let's hope that the system holds up for the coming fortnight. Um, in terms of other uh, reforms, parliamentary code of conduct and, of course, a, a federal corruption watchdog, which go hand in hand, are desperately needed. Um, I'll be speaking about the parliamentary code of conduct later today because the um, inquiry into my bill to set one up, uh, the report into that is, has, is being tabled this afternoon. Uh, but suffice to say, I think we need to make the parliament a more attractive workplace. Um, so that people actually want to, to enter politics and, um, and to seek to make change and to improve people's lives and, and work for the betterment of us all. And um, the way that they see many senators and members conducting themselves really doesn't endear the profession uh, to people that might be interested in, in a career in politics. So if we're talking about democratic reforms and making our chamber more representative, then things like parliamentary standards so that conflicts of interest are properly managed, so that people act in the public interest. Really, it's very basic stuff that should have been legislated um, an awfully long time ago. In terms of other democratic reforms, ensuring government decision making and advisory bodies have broader representatives is very crucial and very topical because we've seen the, um, the uh, COVID commission stacked with industry representatives who have vested interests in pushing particular industries or particular resources, even particular projects. And there are very lax conflict of interest rules in how to manage um, those flagrant uh, conflicts between what should be an advocacy for the public interest or a public commission and the private interests of the personnel that are on that commission. And again, uh, in this broader um, uh, context, 
of making our democracy work better, it's the community that needs to be represented, not people's private interests. So making sure that those government decision making or advisory bodies are better representative and have better conflict of interest rules is well overdue. Um, there's a whole lot of other uh, initiatives that we would love to see trialled as we take these tentative steps towards the 21st century in, in, our, um, in our kind of teenage democracy. And things like citizen initiated um, matters of public importance, citizens assemblies, particip participatory budget making, actually involving people in their democracy more systemically and more successfully would lead to better outcomes. We would all be better informed and the system would do its job better. Um, so we're really excited about the prospect of, of progress on those issues. Uh, we've learned to become very patient, so I'm not sure how long it will be until we see some real action on those things, but I'm proud to be in a party that's pushing those issues. And I know that there are many people um, in the chamber that agree on these issues, so there's, there's hope for reform. Um, these are the reasons why we support uh, broader democratic reform. And in this particular instance, we support this bill. And I want to pay tribute <clears throat> and credit um, to Senator McCarthy, who has really championed this issue and has done, um, as always, an excellent job on it. I acknowledge that this legislation would, um, would entrench malapportionment, but we think it's fair enough in this case. You can't have a single rep seat representing an entire territory where there's 27 per cent First Nations people and say that that's good and fair representation. Because there's been this slight change in the population numbers, that could potentially lead to um, a really unfair and I think undemocratic outcome. So we need this fixed. We've got the um, bill before us today to fix it. Uh, I don't think it's coming on for a vote. I, I, I hope I'm wrong about that. Um, we will certainly be supporting the bill if it does, and I do hope that um, the government take this on board and take the strong feedback of all of the submitters on board um, and the rights and wishes and desires of First Nations communities to be properly represented um, in this chamber and in the other chamber. So uh, with that, I conclude my remarks. It seems the tech has held up, so I'm grateful for that. And I say thank you to everyone who's been involved in getting these remote facilities set up. There's been a lot of people working very long hours. We're very grateful for that and we thank you for it. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you, Senator you Senator, Mr. President. Senator Farrell, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President. And uh, I rise uh, as uh, one of the uh, co-sponsors, um, <clears throat> along with uh, Senator McCarthy and Senators McMahon, McKenzie, Canavan, Davey and MacDonald to uh, support this uh, uh, legislation um, to uh, ensure appropriate uh, and fair representation for the people of the Northern Territory in the, uh, in the federal parliament. Um, I might uh, at the outset uh, start uh, by um, following on from the lead of uh, Senator McGrath, who congratulated uh, the uh, leader of the opposition uh, at last week's um, well, last weekend's uh, election in the Northern Territory. Uh, <clears throat> I'd also like to extend my congratulations to uh, the Chief Minister, uh, Mr. Gunner, who um, we we hope. <coughs> uh, in the most difficult of circumstances has um, been returned to majority government. I can see Senator Smith nodding there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> uh, but um, uh, no, congratulate uh, uh, Mr Gunner. He, um, I had the great privilege of working with him in the 1990s. Uh, when he was an official of the uh, Shop Assistance Union, that great union. Um, and uh, it uh, does appear that uh, at some time, uh, either today or tomorrow, when uh, the counting is completed, that uh, we will find that um, uh, he has been returned uh, with the majority uh, government in the Northern Territory and continue the terrific work that he's been uh, doing, particularly in the circumstances of the, uh, of the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> as I said, I'm a co-sponsor uh, of, uh, of this bill and uh, support 
uh, very much the uh, legislation uh, in terms of its um, extension to the Northern Territory or maintenance of the current uh, position. And I, and I note that one of the um, people who made a very clear um, submission to the inquiry into this bill was in fact the Leader of the Opposition uh, in the Northern Territory who made it very clear that uh, she would like to see um, the continuation of two seats for the Northern Territory. Uh, I am aware, uh, <coughs> Madam Acting Deputy President, that there are uh, other people who would like to speak on this uh, topic from the Northern Territory, so I am happy to uh, associate myself with the remarks of Senator McCarthy and uh, complete my, uh, my comments at that point. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator McMahon. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today strongly on behalf of Territorians in my support of the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment Bill 2020. I'm not surprised, reading through the submissions to the Joint Standing Committee inquiry on electoral matters, on this bill of the vocal opposition to the Australian Electoral Commission's move to reduce the Territory's lower house seats from two to one. Given the strong opposition from community groups, Indigenous land councils, political analysts such as Anthony Green, professors, the Northern Territory government, Territory opposition, federal members and senators in this place, I have to wonder why we allow a blunt mathematical equation on population to get it so wrong. And that leads me to the purpose of this bill. Through this bill, we are seeking to ensure a minimum of two seats for the Northern Territory. Let's not forget we only have, as a territory, two senators. So that's four representatives in total and it's proposed to go down to three. Since 2001, Territorians have been served by two members of parliament. Based on the Australian Bureau of Statistics data overlaid by an arbitrary Australian Electoral Commission formula, the Territory is set to lose a seat, and this would mean 250,000 Territorians will rep be represented by just one member of parliament. On the AEC's formula, I might add that doesn't include unenrolled voters. And at 31st of March, the Northern Territory government believed there are approximately 24,000 unenrolled voters in the territory. Many of the territory's unenrolled voters are indigenous. I myself, having just been through some of the gruelling remote area mobile polling, have seen firsthand how many people in remote communities are not enrolled. Without this bill, the Territory would then become the largest seat in the country, seeing an extra 30,000 people spread over an area more than 35,000 times larger than the electorate of Melbourne. Well, on the other hand, we have Tasmania, and I, I love my Tasmanian colleagues. But Tasmania is, as we've heard, guaranteed five seats regardless of its population. Five members in the House of Representatives with a population of about 535,000 people. And let's not forget, Tassie gets 12 senators. So for double our population, you have over four times our representation. And without this bill, Tassie would have over five times our representation. It doesn't sound fair, and it's not. But leaving fairness out of it for a second, if it is deemed that an MP can adequately represent a certain population, then why doesn't that apply in the NT? As Territorians, we like to think that we're different. But are we? Uh, an area of approximately 1.4 million square kilometres, population approximately 250,000, a population density of approximately 1.75 people per 100 square kilometres. 
less than two people per 100 square kilometres. It's currently the second largest division in Australia, behind Durack and WA, but let's not forget WA also has many more MPs and 12 senators. So we have Cosmopolitan, Darwin and Palmerston covered by the seat of Solomon. The rest of the NT is covered by the seat of Lingiari. This contains towns of Catherine, Tennant Creek, Alice Springs, Timber Creek, Pine Creek and so on. We also have reasonably large sized towns that are incredibly isolated, such as Groot Island sitting in the uh, Gulf and uh, Gove up on the tip of Arnhem Land, inaccessible by road for much of the year. We also have some of the most remote communities in Australia. Lingara, which is out in the Victoria River District, out towards Halls Creek in WA. I was there just last week. It's an eight-hour one-way trip to get to Darwin. Lingara had three voters last week, but those three people deserve representation. Let's not forget the NT also includes Christmas and Cocos Islands out in the Indian Ocean. You cannot even fly there from Darwin. You have to go via Perth or Malaysia. 2,000 people out in those territories. It, it takes an entire week to do a trip out there. Imagine that you have to travel to another state or overseas to visit your constituents. It's unimaginable for the rest of Australia. Territory is six times the size of Victoria and almost double the size of New South Wales. Not only that, as we've heard, the Territory is home to a culturally rich and diverse population, with 27 per cent of Australia's Indigenous population calling the Territory home. Roughly 40 per cent of the population of Lingiari is Indigenous. Most of these remote communities which contain our Indigenous population are only accessible by unsealed roads and impassable during the Territory's wet season. It makes the work of scheduling for a Territorian MP very challenging. In July, our government reaffirmed our commitment to ensure Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people overcome entrenched inequality through the national agreement and set 16 new targets across key challenges, including health, education, employment, justice and housing. At a time when we are seeking to elevate <clears throat> the voice of our First Nations people to address these issues, our Indigenous Territorians deserve effective and efficient representation. And this is best served by ensuring at least two MPs in the Territory. The seat of Solomon focuses on the Darwin-Palmerston areas. In that seat is the port of Darwin, the closest port to Southeast Asia. The port is vitally important not only to Australia's defence capabilities but for trade relationships with the rest of the world. The seat also contains major defence assets and is home to the US Marine Rotational Forces. Tourism, education and manufacturing are other important activities for this hub. As you can see, these two seats have very unique characteristics, opportunities and challenges, but both sharing the challenge of the tyranny of distance. Without this bill, there is no doubt Territory's strategic and economic importance will be undermined. And now, more than ever, in the light of COVID, this is not in Territorians' best interests and it's certainly not in our nation's best interests. COVID has seen a number of the Territory's key industries and businesses put at risk. The timing couldn't be worse, with an NT Labor government debt forecast to be $8.2 billion. The ramifications of this will see merit many Territorians seeking access to their local MP, whether that is to help locate opportunities for community funding grants, provide assistance to small business in accessing small business loans, 
or to help constituents deal with human services. Despite the challenges, we also need to be looking for the projects capable of ensuring economic recovery. In the Territory, we are blessed with many opportunities, from tourism, mining, gas, minerals, manufacturing and education, some of those opportunities. MPs are often the first go-to on these project proposals, and ensuring they are briefed helps them advocate successfully in Canberra. With just one MP, an MP who would undoubtedly spend more time travelling than meeting with Territory constituents, my fear is that the Territory's potential may never be realised, and our people will continue to be left behind, particularly Indigenous Territorians. In closing, I would like to particularly thank my co-sponsor, Senator McCarthy, for her strong advocacy on behalf of all Territorians and the contribution we have to this nation, and implore all of my colleagues to consider the role our MPs have in representing each and every part of their electorates in Canberra, and ask themselves, is giving 250,000 culturally, economically and geographically diverse Territorians just one MP fair? I hope the answer to that question is an unequivocal no. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McMahon. Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, Madam, uh, Madam Deputy President. Today I rise to stro strongly support this bill in the strongest possible terms. One vote, one value is an important principle in our democracy, and we know that periodic electoral redistributions take place to make sure that this principle is maintained. But it is not the only principle that is important in Australian democracy. And indeed, uh, given the growing population of the Northern Territory, uh, it is uh, the, the current electoral redistribution, should it go ahead in the Northern Territory, uh, the very principle of one vote, one value would be undermined because of the extraordinary number of people that would end up in uh, the, Northern, the one and only Lower House Northern Territory electorate. Our constitution enshrines minimum representation in the House of Representatives for each of our states. The low population of a state, it may fall. The number of seats in that state can never fall below five. Our founders knew that states have distinct interests and that those states must be represented not only in the Senate but also in the House of Representatives. And indeed, uh, as uh, the point that has just been made, states' interests are well served not only by the minimum of five lower house seats. But indeed, the fact that there are 12 senators for each state, a luxury that the Northern Territory does not enjoy. There are other principles that the Electoral Commission applies when redrawing electoral boundaries, and they include community interests within electorates, so that's an important principle as well. Our democ democracy recognises that people cast their votes according to what is important to them and their community. And the Electoral Commission recognises, and our Electoral Act is designed to recognise, that this can differ extremely widely between the city and the bush, between one part of the city and another, between communities built around manufacturing or around a service sector or agriculture. Democracy is how we negotiate all of those different values and different interests. And for that to work, Madam Deputy President, they have to be represented in both houses of our parliament. All of these important parts of making our democracy work will be disregarded if the Northern Territory has only one electorate. One single parliamentarian will represent nearly 250,000 Australians. 
it will be by far the largest electorate in Australia. On the figures for the redistribution from last year, the Northern Territory falls short of two seats by less than 5,000 people. If the Territory retains two seats, they will each have more electors than any of the five seats in Tasmania. What's more, the Northern Territory's Department of Treasury and Finance predicts by next year the Northern Territory's population will be more than 251,000 people. By the time uh, the election is held, it will have more than enough people to deserve two seats, even on the single criterion of population. If the Northern Territory loses a seat, then in that election one Northern Territory vote will have uh, one one-half value. That is an extraordinary over, uh, uh, way for the current uh, Electoral Act to override the principle of one vote, uh, one value. Here in our nation, we must look to principles of democracy. And if you see those future figures and those figures now, we are not even taking into account the significant barriers to enrolment in remote Indigenous communities. I know very clearly myself from experiences in the Kimberley that there are many more eligible voters uh, in many places around the country than are actually on the electoral roll. The Commonwealth Government doesn't do nearly enough work in remote communities of our country to get voters on the roll. This government makes it difficult for people who don't have ID, who move frequently, makes it difficult for them to stay on the roll, something that has a disproportionate effect on Australia's remote communities. It's certainly well within the bounds of possibility that if enrolment in remote areas matched the national average, the Northern Territory would be entitled to two seats right now. While I note that it is uh, based on population, we need also to look very clearly uh, at the enrolment levels of those communities. The representation of distinct interests of each of the jurisdictions that make up our federation is clearly being overridden by reducing the Northern Territory to one seat, and that must be prevented. Other members have made, um, uh, senators have made remark about the huge distances that uh, are covered in seats like Durack, and indeed the Northern Territory would have the largest seat in our federation. It is absolutely extraordinary that uh, this seat should be taken from them. I support the guarantee of a minimum number of seats to each state, regardless of population, and because I absolutely agree that properly representing a state's common interest in parliament and caucuses needs a baseline of the number of members. But we have not, and our democracy, democracy, democracy currently does not, extend that same principle to our territories, and it absolutely should. One of the reasons it absolutely should and absolutely must in the case of the Northern Territory is that is, it is by far very, a very distinct electorate compared to, uh, and territory compared to the rest of our nation, where we've got large numbers of suburban seats, uh, where we've got representation coming from each state that is made up of large numbers of suburban seats. Whereas in the Northern Territory, we essentially have a, a remote seat and uh, a city seat. And here we're expecting even them to be rolled together. Now the simple fact is there are not uh, enough uh, that we cannot countenance the idea of the Northern Territory and all those remote voters being bundled up together uh, with a city seat when their voices are so incredibly distinct. In what fundamental way is the Northern Territory different to a state? besides the administrative and legal accidents of history, or perhaps even, should I say, the racist accidents of history where the Northern Territory uh, has not 
he was not historically treated as a state, indeed because of its low population size, but indeed at a time when its population was not even counted. This is when the accidents of history actually occurred and the Northern Territory uh, what be became a territory. You know, at a time when uh, the, the, the human population, the Australian population of the Northern Territory uh, were not properly counted even as citizens. They may not have even been counted in um, a population uh, census at the time these administrative decisions were made. If we were forming the Australian Federation today, wouldn't the chief ministers of the territories be at the table with the premiers of the states? When our nation mobilised to combat COVID-19— Thank COVID -19, you, Senator Pratt. The time for this debate has expired and you'll be in continuation when the matter comes back before the par parliament. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of government business, and I call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day No. 1, National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Amendment Governance and Other Measures, Matters Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Uh, and just excuse me while I get my papers while the. because uh, I was on my feet for the previous bill. Um, Labor does not oppose this bill this afternoon, uh, but we. I just want to correct, uh, Chair, Madam President, can you just ensure that I've got the right bill yes, before me by repeating its the title? National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Amendment. That's fine. I do have the right one in front of me. Thank you very much, Madam President. Um, the bill amends the governance structures of the Australian Skills Quality uh, Authority, the National Vet Sector Regulator, and enhances information sharing arrangements between ASQA and the National Centre for Vocational Education and Research. Key amendments in this legislation before the chamber today revise ASQA's governance structure, replacing the existing Chief Commissioner, Chief Executive Officer, with two commissioners with a single independent statutory office holder, in this case a CEO. It establishes the National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Advi Advisory Council and the Advisory Council is intended to provide ASQA with access to expert advice regarding the functions of the regulator. So, On this side of the chamber in Labor, we know the value of TAFE and union representation. Their views need to be heard and considered when it comes to our vocational education and training sector. That's why uh, today in the Senate we'll seek to move amendments to ensure the public provider has seats at the table. We support a fair and considered approach to these reforms and we support changes that improve ASQA's capacity to ensure responsiveness to students, to communities and employers, but will reject changes that attempt to weaken ASQA's regulatory framework. We in this chamber need to ensure that the reforms to ASQA uh, audit processes don't allow any drop in the quality. In, past, in the past, we have seen this government be slow to act on quality issues. In our view, in Labor's view, this has done serious damage to the sector. So there is considerable need for reform. But more broadly, in the case of reform, this bill before us today is just another tweak from a third-term government who refused to deliver genuine reform that overhauls our vocational training sector. Today, the bill before us does not come close to fixing the mess that the Liberal government has made of Australia's TAFE and training system. In our nation, we've had very clearly a skills shortage that existed before COVID-19 hit. The coronavirus outbreak has highlighted that more than seven years of Liberal government has left Australia facing a crisis in skills and in vocational training. The most recent figures show a 73 per cent drop in the number of apprenticeships advertised. And indeed, uh, I have spoken to small businesses who say they've been struggling to keep their apprentices on. This government did offer a subsidy for apprentices. That's a step in the right direction, 
But this is a critical problem for our nation. Much more needs to be done to, uh, in offering uh, support to newly starting apprentices and trainees. If we as a nation fail on that score, we will have a much deeper and greater skills shortage for the years to come. We had a skill shortage before COVID-19 hit. The government spent seven years neglecting our TAFE and training system. It has spent seven years ignoring the vital role that TAFE plays in the growth of our young people and the vital role it plays in the growth of our economy. We have had seven years cutting funding from the sector while also underspending in the meagre amount the, the government promised to the vocational education and training sector. So, rebuilding our skills and training sector, it will be crucial and critical to getting our economy going again. We absolutely need to be properly funding our TAFE and apprenticeship program. We've seen $3 billion worth of cuts uh, in recent years to TAFE and to training. This government must restore the funding that they've cut. The government must invest in training the next generation of tradespeople in their areas. And we need them to take some responsibility to do that. We've seen a litany of skills vocational training failures under this government. More than seven years of Liberal government has left Australia facing a crisis in skills and vocational training. As we learned last year from the Federal uh, Education Department's own data, the Liberals have failed to spend $919 million of their own TAFE and training budget over the last five years. All this money is sitting in the government's bank account, and all in addition to the more than $3 billion already ripped out of our system. We have in our country TAFE campuses falling apart. We've got state governments closing campuses and ending courses. All the while, this money remains unspent. Why? Why? Because this government says there's been less demand than forecast. They say this every year since the Liberal Party came to office. I'm sorry to say, but this simply does not stack up when underemployment is near record levels. At the same time, employers are crying out in our country for skilled workers. So what's the result of this underspend? There are 140,000 fewer apprentices and trainees and a shortage of workers in critical services, including plumbing, carpentry, hairdressing and motor mechanics. In our country, the number of Australians doing an apprenticeship or traineeship is lower today than it was a decade ago. The Independent National Centre for Vocational Education Research it found recently that over the past year, 20 per cent fewer people were signing up to trade apprenticeships and traineeships. This was even more extreme under uh, a number of very essential trades. So Australians starting an apprenticeship or traineeship in construction, including carpentry, bricklaying and plumbing, this has dropped by an alarming 40 per cent. In some areas, there are more people dropping out of vocational courses than there are finishing them. This doesn't happen by accident. A $1 billion underspend from this Liberal government. It included incentives for business to take on apprenticeships, support to help people finish their apprenticeships and a fund designed to train Australians in areas of need. Well, the government's proposals to support education and tra uh, training in our country are simply not working. What does this bring us to? It brings us to, uh, in an era of rising youth unemployment, a skills crisis. We have simultaneously a crisis of youth unemployment and a crisis of skills shortages. Madam Deputy President, one of these is bad enough. But to be faced with both at the same time is hard to imagine, particularly at this time. But here we are in this point of time confronted with both. 
There's nearly a 10 per cent increase in the number of occupations facing skill shortages, while the Australian Industry Group says 75 per cent of businesses surveyed are struggling to find the qualified workers they need. There are almost 2 million Australians who are unemployed or underemployed. So we see businesses struggling to fill the skilled positions they have on offer. At the same time, we have young people desperate for work who can't fill those positions because they haven't been given the chance to gain the skills that those roles require. Why isn't the Morrison government training these people for jobs in industries where there's a shortage of workers? Why? Because this government, this Liberal government, has cut funding to TAFE and training. And even though this is the case, and it's plainly obvious that it is, the government still refuses to properly fund the sector. It refuses to give it the proper reform that it so desperately needs. Young people in our country have been very clear about what they need. They need a skills and training sector that is properly funded. They need that sector to be properly resourced. They need it to have educators who are properly trained and able to skill young people up as a pathway to meaningful employment. And this nation needs that now more than ever. This government has not delivered on a single one of those requests. We have in this government a Liberal government that has no plan to fix our nation's skills crisis. It doesn't care enough or have the capacity to do the hard work that needs to be done to build a better post-school education system. Our Prime Minister Scott Morrison has no plan to fix the skills crisis he has created. He has no plan to create more jobs or to lift wages for those who are unemployed. He has no skill, uh, he has no plan to create more jobs or to lift wages for those who are employed. As always, this Prime Minister would rather hide from problems than do the hard work that is needed to fix and resolve them. We have in our Prime Minister spin and deflection, bringing in marketing teams and celebrity ambassadors to distract from the real issues that confront our nation on skills. We have in JobMaker another marketing slogan with no substance. Job Trainer goes nowhere near replacing the funding the government has stripped out, and we still don't know what it will do. A government that is fiddling at the edges of our current system will not address the profound problems that undermine vocational education and training and, consequently, the productive performance and international competitiveness of our economy. Unlike Labor, this government does not understand the critical role of TAFE as a public provider, the value in skills and apprenticeships or the real uh, value of the hardworking and passionate public providers uh, in TAFE, our TAFE teachers. If we continue down this path, we will be as a nation severely jeopardising our future, our future economic growth. We will also undermine the opportunity of individual Australians to meet their full potential and, most importantly, compromise our ability as a nation to compete with the rest of the world using the skills, knowledge, discovery and invention of our people. We know that nine out of ten jobs created in the future will need a post-secondary school education, either TAFE or university. So we need to increase participation in both our universities and our educational vocational sector. We need to make sure our young people are prepared for the world of work, a world of work that we have all seen recently is changing so very quickly. If we do not value the role of appropriately funded vet sectors for the training, skills and apprenticeships they do provide, then so many Australians and its vital role in driving the economy uh, and enhancing the industry is overlooked. This is a third time government, a third term government that simply refuses to deliver genuine reform. 
genuine reform that overhauls this education, higher education sector and that properly funds both vocational training providers and our nation's universities to deliver the services that their students need. Just, Senator Pratt, you did note in your speech you were going to move amendments, but that's in the committee stage, is it? You're not moving second reading then? Okay, thank you. Senator Faruqi. Deputy President, I rise to make a contribution to the National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Amendment Governance and Other Measures Bill 2020. The bill makes substantial changes to the Australian Skills Quality Authority's governance structure, establishes the National Vocational Education and Training Regulatory Advisory Council, and revises arrangements for data sharing and access pertaining to the National Centre for Vocational Education Research. Um, the Greens will not oppose, oppose this bill, but we're not without concern. Any regulator should be empowered and resourced to do its job without interference from the government. And as I've said before in this chamber, ASQA's ability to operate effectively relies on having the resources um, that it needs and on having strong independence. The bill before us, like past changes to vocational education training regulation, is concerning is that it expands the scope of directions that the minister can give ASQA. We must not open the door to the kind of ministerial interference we saw in Minister Birmingham's Australian Research Council meddling recommendations, or the Prime Minister and former Minister Mackenzie's rotting of sports grants. This bill also continues the government's disquieting pattern of avoiding appropriate scrutiny of executive decisions in this chamber by adding to the number of non-disallowable legislative instruments under the Act. From a government that is allergic to scrutiny, with a history of mismanagement of vocational education and training, and utter disrespect for the public training system, they've worked systematically to undermine. Any such move is alarming. We'll be watching closely how these changes play out over the next few months as the government pursues its purported skills reform. The establishment of an advisory council in this bill is welcome though it is unsurprising from the Liberals that the sensible thing hasn't been done up front by making sure the voices of our public training providers and our trade unions are included in the Council. So we will join our Labour colleagues in supporting an amendment to that end. And I urge my crossbench colleagues to support us in this. It was extraordinary, I must say, to watch a Liberal Prime Minister attack the very vocational, educational and training system that they have created, and they have created this system by destroying TAFEs and public training in Australia with the help of the Prime Minister's state Liberal colleagues. And yet, the Prime Minister offered no new funding at the press club earlier this year. More than 4,000 words and not one single mention of TAFE, the bedrock of our training system. We need free TAFE and uni for all, and new investment to rebuild public delivered training in our TAFEs. Those would be the crucial first steps of any skills overhaul. Instead, all we got from the Prime Minister was hot air, a push to renegotiate funding without offering a single extra cent to the system he is underfunding, and all the language of competition and marketization that will rightly send a shiver down the spine of Australians who know public education and training are the closest thing we have to a ticket to a more fair and equal and just society. We saw that language again from the Productivity Commission's interim report that urges more of the same marketization that has led to the VET system into disarray and scandal, while suggesting that little priority to TAFEs is given and that state funding should be unwound. What's more, the total of government loans repaid to students who've been ripped off by a shonky for-profit VET providers has now surged past $1.2 billion. But the government is once again entertaining extending loan programs to private providers, the same kind of extension 
that got us in this mess in the first place. The importance of TAFE and the risk we run in neglecting it cannot be overstated. A report from the Australia Institute released on National TAFE Day this year tells us the system creates $90 billion in economic benefits annually and well-funded TAFE is essential for delivering the workforce needed for post-COVID reconstruction. Altogether, the benefits that come from TAFE are 16 times more than the investment. Like, how amazing is an investment that gives you 16 times more than you put in? That's our TAFEs, and that's why we must support them. These are enormous benefits for Australia, yet, as the author of the report, Alison Pennington puts it, that house is now crumbling from neglect and from polic this policy vandalism. The report also finds that the TAFE system increases employability and lowers unemployment. TAFE graduates enter the labor force with better employment pros prospects and skills. The increased labor force participation and employability of TAFE graduates corresponds to additional employment of 486 Housing. The report finds that the TAFE system promotes wider social benefits critical to addressing inequality. TAFE helps bridge access to further education and jobs pathways in regional areas and for special and at-risk youth groups. TAFE students are more likely to come from low-income households and identify as Aboriginal compared with the private vocational education and training providers. The lesson we should have learned once and for all in the debacle of the Labour Liberal VET loans program is that, as with all stages of education, vocational education and training has no place for private profit. The future of young people seeking training, and indeed the future of our country, needs to understand their skills, and it should, should not be the domain of the you know, privateers and the profiteers seeking to juice what they can from the taxpayer while meeting their minimum obligation to students and then banking the difference for their profits. Time and again, we've seen the exploitation resulting from that business model. Nearly 40% of young people don't have a job or enough hours of work. Youth wage growth is the flattest it has ever been. Those figures are only going to worsen, and enrollments in education and training are going to skyrocket as the economy continues to deteriorate. If we are to help them, and if we are to build a more socially and economically just society after the pandemic, we need massive investment in a Green New Deal, including making TAFE and uni free, and providing significant new government investment to make sure that we don't leave whole generations behind. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. I too rise to speak on the National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Amendment, Government and Other Matters Bill. Now, Australia's skills and education system ha has always been a very strong passion of mine. I've spent my working life getting people into work and having the right skills and training packages which respond to industry needs are a critical enabler of that. I've seen the life-changing impact that this government's focus on skills and training continues to have, and I'm proud to stand here on this side of the chamber to speak on this bill, which is another demonstration of how important this issue is to our economic agenda. Skills, education and training have never been more important to our nation than right now in this recovery phase of this challenge. Our national economy and the businesses within it uh, will continue to see significant upheaval. And I don't believe that there would have been another point in our recent history where the labour market in Australia has experienced such high level of fluidity. The ability of our skills and training systems to adapt to this environment to be able to respond to the rapidly changing needs of industry will be critically important as we recover. And this bill goes some of the way to addressing that. It is a critical piece of our economic response to this coronavirus challenge. 
because we know that skills and training will be crucial to Australia's economic recovery. And that is why that reform is a key pillar of the Morrison government's job maker plan. We know we need to move quickly to position the vet sector to support Australia's economic recovery. The jobs created as we come out of this crisis will not be the same as the jobs that were lost. And it's critical that Australians can access high quality and relevant training to reskill and upskill. The National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Amendment Government and other members other matters bill amends the National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Act 2011 to reform the governance structure of the Australian Skills Quality Authority. The main function of the bill will be to replace the current governance structure of, chief, of a chief commissioner and deputy commissioners and instead replace it with a CEO and advisory council. This will modernise the regulator so that it can take on a greater educative role and have a more effective regulatory approach. This bill also enables ASQA to engage external help as required and ramp up information sharing among other reforms. This means the organisation will be more adaptive and responsive to the needs of industry and demands of the broader Australian economy. As part of our recovery plan, the government has announced it will partner with states and territories to establish a $1 billion job trainer fund. This fund will rapidly provide around 340,700 additional training places that are free or low fee in areas of identified skills needs for job seekers and school leavers. We're not interested as a government in funding training for training's sake. We must always ensure that any funding is directed to training for jobs that exist, for jobs that are in need. And that's what this package is designed to do. We're not interested in just funding training for training's sake. We're not just going to fund underwater origami courses, courses that won't actually lead someone to a job. We're going to fund training that matches the needs of industry and matches the needs of employers. And Senator Faruqi said she, the Greens have a great opposition to funding private training providers. Well, I've just been through the Pilbara and I've met uh, businesses that are providing their own training. And guess what? Those businesses are the best people to be able to train people for their jobs. And we should be doing everything we can to support that, to just have the government provide the training when the industry know what they want and industry know what they need. That is something that I'm always going to support because we know that it yields even better results. So to access the job training job trainer funding, states and territories need to sign the Heads of Agreement for Skills Reform, which sets out immediate reforms to improve the vocational education and training sector and provides the foundation for long-term improvements. Now, I understand that there are discussions going on right now with the West Australian Government. While I'm not privy to those discussions, I know that my home state in particular is experiencing a lot of churn in critical sectors, some of which power the national economy. And I hope that they are able to conclude those negotiations uh, very soon so that we can get on with the task of providing necessary training to meet the needs of the jobs that are ahead of us. The priorities in the Heads of Agreement are all aimed at ensuring that the VET system is delivering for students and employers. Now, in addition to this, we have announced the $2.8 billion supporting apprentices and trainees measure, which commenced on the 2nd of April 2020. Now, most recent figures demonstrate the government has provided $462 million, over $462 million to support over 50,000 businesses employing more than 87,000 apprentices and trainees. This has been a game changer for the apprentices and the businesses which employ them. For us, there was no other option. It is absolutely critical to the success of our nation coming out of this pandemic that those who are completing their apprenticeship were able to continue to do so and that more should be taken on. Myself, I completed an apprenticeship between the years 96 and 99, and I'm so grateful that my employer stuck with me and gave me the opportunity to complete it. 
even though there were times where it was difficult for that employer and they could have easily have let me go because the business was, had went through some uh, structural change. But they stuck with me. And as a, now, as an adult, looking back on those years as a teenager, older teenager and young adult, I'm so grateful for the support that I was provided. And this government is working with industry, working with employers to ensure that they are able to keep their apprentices, even during this time, and encouraging more, more businesses to take on more apprentices, because we know that that is going to be critical for the future. So eligibility for the subsidy will be expanded to include medium-sized businesses with 199 employees or fewer or who had an, and, and who had an apprentice in place on 1 July 2020. The duration of the wage subsidy will also be extended by six months to cover wages paid up to March 2021. The JobKeeper payment will also support many apprentices and trainees to remain connected to their employer as a result of the pandemic. Substantial regulatory and fee relief has also been provided to vocational education and training sector. Fees charged by ASCA will be refunded or waived. This is important. These measures put some $100 million back into the cash flow of Australian education and training businesses so that this money can be used to retain employees, reshape education offerings and support domestic and international students. There will also be a six-month exemption from the, loans, uh, the loan fees associated with VET student loans in a bid to encourage full-fee paying students to continue their studies despite these difficult times. We are focused on delivering the skills for the future. We have the $585 million skills package designed to strengthen Australia's vocation, education and training system. We have $48.3 million uh, National Skills Commission, which provides independent, evidence-based advice on the labour market trends and industry-driven demand. Industry-led skills organisations are also preparing us for, for jobs of the future giving us information we need to see what skills are required, what type of qualifications will be most suited and how our education and training system should adapt for us to take full advantage of the next great industrial opportunities. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more that this government is doing to give Australians every possible opportunity to embark and, re and retrain for their career of choice. There is no doubt that the coronavirus challenge has changed the way Australians live, work and study. And the ramification of this change will exist for some time to come. And these measures will make sure that we as a nation are well prepared for the future. And I'm proud to be a member of this government which has prepared and which is future proofing our VET system. Those often those op opposite often like to forget, but we are paying to fix their failed VET fee help scheme. Since 2016, over 91,000 students have had their VET fee help loan debts of over $1.5 billion recredited by the Commonwealth. And Australians haven't forgotten what Labor did to the VET sector when they were last in government. Apprenticeships fell by 110 thousand between July 2012 and June 2013, after they ripped out 1.2 billion in employer incentives, the largest ever annual decline. And we're working with state and territories to reform the system and clean up the mess that was left by federal labour. The government is investing more in a better system to commit more funding. We need to have confidence in the VET system that will deliver what the economy needs. The coalition government is committed to ensuring that we are equipping Australians with the skills that they need for good, good, secure and long-term jobs. So I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Billick. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. No matter how many times I stand in this place and speak about the value of, sorry, oh, what did I say? Oh, I, look, uh, my apologies, Deputy President. I think you did say Deputy President. It's, it's fine, <laughs> Senator Billick. I know you're the Deputy President. I'm very pleased that you're the Deputy President. Thank you. 
As I said, no matter how many times I stand in this place and speak about the value of vocational education, I am yet to be assured that those opposite are actually listening, because their policies aren't demonstrating that they truly understand the importance and needs of the sectors. The Liberals have slashed funding to TAFE and training, <laughs> let apprentice numbers fall and presided over a national shortage of tradies, apprentices and trainees. And we're not just talking little cuts. The Liberals have cut TAFE and training by over $3 billion. I repeat that, $3 billion. We have in those opposite a third-term government who simply refused to deliver a genuine reform package that overhauls the vocational training sector. We need to stop the cuts to TAFE. We need to properly value the educational sector from early education right through school and tertiary education. And we need to recognise that education is something that benefits all of us, not just those who are studying. It's something that we need to invest in as a society for the benefit of society. We need to compete in this century with our partners and competitors overseas as the smart country, not via a race to the bottom on wages and conditions. Particularly in my home state of Tasmania, we have seen that there is a desperate, absolutely desperate need for more skilled workers across many sectors of the economy. Businesses need skilled workers to grow or even just to continue their operations. And skills training is especially important for young Tasmanians. I understand the importance of vocational education. While working for the Australian Services Union, I set up the first union job skills program, which obviously included a component of vocational education. I also represented the union on many industry training advisory boards. I know these kinds of training programs can transform the lives of young people. The youth employment rate in Tasmania is 15.1 per cent, and since March this year, 6,400 young people have lost their jobs. Upskilling young Tasmanians is a fantastic way to create jobs and employment opportunities. Tasmania Labor will take to the next Tasmania state election a policy that advocates for free TAFE and vet education, and I welcome that. The government cannot use COVID-19 as, as an excuse for reduced numbers of apprenticeships and trainees. There were certainly skill shortages long before COVID-19 hit. Much more needs to be done right now to support apprentices and trainees. The Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison government spent seven years neglecting our TAFE and training system. And in Tasmania, Tasmania, we need to train more Tasmanians because we don't have enough of the skilled workers we need. Many kinds of workers are still being allowed into Tasmania despite our border restrictions with claims that there are no suitably qualified Tasmanians available to fill these positions. And while I suspect that there are Tasmanians who could do the work if we look to find them, it still highlights the desperate need to significantly increase the number of people completing vocational education in Tasmania. We need real leadership and a real commitment in this sector. However, the bill before us today does not do that. It makes minor technical changes to the governance arrangements regarding vocational education. It's just another tweak from the third-term government who simply refused to deliver a genuine reform package that overhauls the vocational training sector. While Welcome and Labor won't oppose the bill, it is disappointing that the best the government can do is tinker around the edges in a sector which is struggling due to massive funding cuts. Madam Deputy President, this bill does not come close to fixing the mess the Liberal government has made of Australia's TAFE and training system. The National Vocational Education Training Regulatory Amendment to Governments and Other Matters Bill 2020 amends the government structures of the Australian Skills Quality Authority or ASQA, and enhances information sharing arrangements between ASQA and the National Centre for, for Vocational Education Research the NCVER. The legislation builds on the National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Amendment Bill 2019 and responds to the Braithwaite and Joyce reviews, both 
which called on ASQA to adopt a greater educative role alongside its regulatory role. The changes also respond to initial findings from the rapid review of ASQA's governance, culture and processes. Key amendments will revise ACWA's governance structure, replacing the existing Chief Commissioner or Chief Executive Officer and two Commissioners with a single independent statutory office holder, and establish the National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Advisory Council. The Advisory Council is intended to provide ASQA with access to expert advice regarding the functions of the regulator. Having been a member previously of many Tasmania advisory committee boards, I feel that an important feature of an advisory council is that it needs to take advice from a wide range of people, including those that have experience in or representing the sector. Labor knows the value of TAFE and union representation. Their views should be heard and considered when it comes to the VET sector. Labor's amendments will ensure the public provider has seats at the table, and I hope the crossbench will support our amendments. The reforms in this bill are needed, and we support a fair and considered approach to ASQA reforms. We will support changes that improve ASQA's capacity to ensure responsiveness to students, communities and employers, but will reject changes that attempt to weaken ASQA's regulatory framework. We need to ensure that reforms to ASQA audit processes don't allow any drop in the quality of training. In the past, we've seen this government slow to act on quality issues, and it has done serious damage to the sector. More than seven years of Liberal government has left Australia facing a crisis in skills and vocational training. And as we learned last year from the Federal Education Department's own data, the Liberals have failed to spend $919 million of their own TAFE and training budget over the past five years. These funds are just sitting in the government's bank account when it should be used to improve our TAFE system. This is, an in, addition, this is in addition to the more than $3 billion already ripped out of the system. State governments are closing campuses and ending co courses. TAFE campuses are falling apart and in desperate need of repair all while this funding remains unspent. The government claims that there has been less demand than forecast every year since the Liberal Party came to office. Well, this comment doesn't stack up when unemployment and underemployment are um, at near record levels at the same time employers are crying out for skilled workers. Under the Liberals, there are 140,000 fewer apprentices and trainees and a shortage of workers in critical services, including plumbing, carpentry, hairdressing and motor mechanics. Each of us rely on these services in our lives. We cannot simply close our eyes and wish for problems in the training sector to vanish. And there needs to be proactive government policies to turn things around. The number of Australians doing an apprenticeship or traineeship is lower today than it was a decade ago. The Independent National Centre for Vocational Education Research recently found that over the, past, over the past year, 20 per cent fewer people were signing up to trade apprenticeships and traineeships. This was even more extreme in a number of essential trades. Australians starting an apprenticeship or traineeship in construction, including carpentry, bricklaying, plumbing, dropped by an alarming 40 per cent. And in some areas, there are more people dropping out of vocational courses than finishing them. Now, that doesn't happen by accident. It's a consequence of this government's neglect, and that's just not good enough. We've got to do better. The Liberal government's almost $1 billion underspend includes incentives for businesses to take on apprenticeships, uh, apprentices, support to help people finish their apprenticeships, and a fund designed to train Australians in areas of need. We're simultaneously experiencing a crisis of youth unemployment and a crisis of skill shortages. One of these is bad enough, to be, but to be faced with both at the same time is pretty hard to imagine, especially when there's a solution, an easy solution, which features both better funding for training in the vocational education sector. But here we are, confronted with both. There's a nearly 10 per cent increase in the number of occupations facing skill shortages. While the Australian Industry Group says 75 per cent of businesses surveyed are struggling to find the qualified workers they need, 
there are almost two million Australians who are unemployed or underemployed. While businesses are struggling to fill the skilled positions they have on offer, we have young people desperate for work who can't fill these positions because they haven't been given the chance to gain the skills that the roles require. Why isn't the government training these people for jobs in industry where there's a shortage of workers? Because I'll tell you why. Because the Liberals have cut funding to TAFE and training. I don't know if it's ideological or if they're just short-sighted or, I don't know, maybe there's, they're a bit snobby and there's that stigma about university and, and um, vocational education. But the government refuses to properly fund the sector. They simply refuse to give the sector the proper reform that it so desperately needs. Young people have been clear with what they need. They need a skills training sector that is properly funded, properly resourced and has educators who are properly trained and able to skill these kids up as a pathway to meaningful employment. Why is this so hard for the government to understand? This government hasn't delivered on a single element of those requests. The Liberal government doesn't care enough or have the capacity to do the hard work that needs to be done to build a better post-school system. Scott Morrison has no plan to fix the skills crisis he created. He has no plan to create more jobs or to lift wages for those who are, who are employed. And we've seen a continuous attack on pay, condition and, and workers' rights from this government. As always, the Prime Minister would rather hide from problems than do the hard work needed to solve them. He would rather spin and deflect, bringing in marketing teams and celebrity ambassadors to distract from the real issue. Because we all know this Prime Minister is all about surface over substance. Job maker is another marketing slogan with no real substance. Job trainer goes nowhere near replacing the funding the government has stripped out, and we still, still don't know what it will do. Fiddling at the edges of the current system will not address the profound problems that undermine vocational education and training and consequently the productive performance and international competitiveness of our economy. Unlike Labor, the government obviously doesn't understand the critical role of TAFE as a public provider, the values in skills and apprenticeships or the value of the hard-working and passionate public TAFE teachers. If we continue down this path, we will severely jeopardise our future economic growth undermine the opportunity of individual Australians to meet their full potential and, very importantly, compromise our ability as a nation to compete with the rest of the world using the skills, knowledge, discovery and invention of our own people. We know that nine out of ten jobs created in the future will need a post-secondary school education, either TAFE or university. So we need to increase participation in both universities and our vocational education sector to make sure our young people are prepared for the world of work, which is changing ever so quickly. This third term government simply refuses to deliver a genuine reform package that overhauls the higher education sector and that properly funds both vocational training providers and universities to deliver the services that their students need. This government has spent seven years ignoring the vital role TAFE plays in the growth of our young people and the vital role it plays in the growth of our economy. It has spent seven years cutting funding while also underspending the meagre amount it promised the sector. Rebuilding our skills and training sector will be crucial to getting the economy going again, and the government needs to properly fund our TAFE and apprenticeship programs. We have seen $3 billion of cuts in recent years to TAFE and training, and as I said, Labor won't oppose this bill, but the government can and should be doing much, much more to reverse the dreadful effects its cuts have had on the TAFE and vocational education sector. The government must restore that funding that they've cut, and the government must invest in training the next generation of tradespeople in our country because a strong economy relies on a skilled workforce. Young Tasmanians, young Australians deserve this, and the wider Tasmanian and the wider Australian economy needs this, as does the rest of Australia. Thank you, Senator. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. 
Acting Deputy President, and it is a pleasure to rise in the Senate today to speak in favour of the National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Amendment, Governance and Other Matters Bill. Australia's vocational and education training sector, or the VET sector as we like to call it, provides students across the country with skills and hands-on training for skilled jobs that Australia needs. It's important that we continue to ensure we prioritise quality improvements for VET, including ensuring that regulation of the sector is reasonable, transparent and effective through the Australian Skills Quality Authority, or ASQA. With the onset of COVID-19, it's more important now than ever that we ensure our VET system is working for students, working for employers and working for the wider Australian community. The bill that we are discussing here today amends the National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Act 2011 to reform the governance structure of the Australian Skills Quality Authority. The bill will replace the current governance structure of ASQA from a Chief Commissioner and Deputy Commissioners to be replaced with a CEO and an Advisory Council. This will modernise the regulator so it can take on a greater educative role and have a more effective regulatory approach. A review announced by the Morrison government in October 2019 and recommendations from two previous independent reviews has informed the changes within the bill that we're discussing today. The amendments support consistent, fit-for-purpose and effective regulation and will enable stakeholder engagement in Australia's VET sector. The government believes this improved organisational structure will enable better regulatory decisions, better facilitate internal review and ultimately allow ASQA to be a fit-for-purpose regulator of the VET sector. And as I alluded to earlier, coming out of the coronavirus crisis, this is absolutely what we need to ensure that our VET sector is fit for purpose and strong and can serve the needs of the Australian economy. It is somewhat fitting that the Senate considers this legislation during National Skills Week. National Skills Week works to raise the profile and present prospective students with the benefits from undertaking vocational education and training. The career pathways for students undertaking VET are numerous, from cooking to mechanics to building and construction to engineering. Students are provided with the training and hands-on experience that they need for their chosen area of expertise. We know, Mr Acting Deputy President, that this virus has wreaked havoc on our economy and has cost so many Australians their job and their income. The Morrison government recognises the stress this unprecedented crisis has placed on Australian workers and their families, and we have acted to ensure we support Australians through this crisis through programs including JobKeeper, JobSeeker and providing targeted investment to stimulate economic recovery. We know that ensuring Australians are equipped with the right skills and training will be crucial for the next step of our economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. The jobs created as we move to a staged focus on recovery will be different to the jobs that were lost when the pandemic took hold. Skilled jobs in growth or expert areas like building and construction, agriculture, renewable energy development will be critical for our economic recovery and have the potential to place our country in a stronger position than when the crisis commenced. The government has announced it will partner with states and territories to establish a $1 billion job trainer fund. This fund will rapidly provide around 340,000 additional training places that are free or low fee in areas of identified skills need for job seekers and job leavers. We are absolutely taking this COVID-19 crisis seriously. We know that skills and training is going to be an incredibly important element of our recovery, and that is why we are making this investment. I also want to talk today, Mr Acting Deputy President, about skills and training in my own state of Tasmania, because just last week I had the pleasure of visiting the Huon Valley Trade Training Centre in Huonville. This is one of a number of centres I've visited across Tasmania, including the Sorrell Trade Training Centre, and I've been so impressed with the hands-on training and skills these centres are providing to its students. Trade training centres are specialised training facilities established in regional locations in Tasmania for both school students and adult community members to undertake accredited training in purpose-built facilities. The objectives, objectives of the trade training centres are to increase the proportion of students achieving a Year 12 or equivalent qualification, 
address national skill shortages in traditional trades and emerging industries by improving relevance and responsiveness of trade training programs in secondary schools, improve student access to industry standard trade training facilities, improve the quality of education offered to secondary students undertaking trade-related pathways, and assist young people to make a successful transition from school to work or further education and training. And one of the most important things I have observed about these trade training centres, particularly in, in Tasmania, is the alignment that they have with the local industry. These trade training centres are not uh, directing students into areas where they think there may not be a job at the end of it. Indeed, they're engaging with local employers, understanding what skills and training local employers will require from their future workforce, and ensuring that those uh, relevant training courses are available at the local trade training centre. It really is a case of linking local job requirements with the training institutions that are in that area. The feedback I've received from students at our trade training centres is overwhelmingly positive, with the students I've spoken to not only achieving great outcomes during their training, but feeling very positive about the prospect of going out and finding a job in the future once their training is complete. To learn and be able to apply hands-on skills in areas like building and construction to mechanics and cooking not only gets students excited about the skills they are learning, but excited about their future in the workforce. It is amazing to hear some of the stories coming out of trade training centres in Tasmania, positive stories where students are being recruited by local businesses for jobs and apprentices, and where students who may have seemed lost during their time in the traditional classroom discover their passion for cooking or building or working on cars. Indeed, many of the students that I've been speaking to recently are undertaking uh, multiple training qualifications because they're not necessarily sure of exactly what part of the workforce they want to go into, but they've had one experience, they've got one certificate, and they understand the value in having a multitude of skills. So they're building on what they're learning and trying to get a diverse understanding of relevant um, skills that they might need at some point in the workforce. So it's a very well-balanced education that these uh, kids are receiving at trade training centres. These are amongst some of the skilled jobs that we need for the future, and providing students with access to skills and training in these areas will ensure that they are ready for the workforce. Speaking of jobs for the future, Tasmania has an immense competitive advantage to other states when it comes to energy security. Our hydro and renewable energy sector is the envy of other states, and the potential to expand our renewable energy resource will require new and skilled workers to work on these nation-building projects. The proposed second interconnector across Bass Strait, Project Marinus, has been identified recently as one of the 15 major projects the Morrison Coalition government has given priority status. This project will enable another generation of hydroelectricity development and other energy developments, providing a huge economic and job creation boost for Tasmania. But again, we know that we are going to need skilled workers to undertake these projects. So to ensure we have the skilled workforce that we need, the Morrison government has committed $17 million through the Energising Tasmania project to equip Tasmanians with the skills to support the Battery of the Nation and Marinus Link initiatives. Energising Tasmania will deliver up to 2,500 fully subsidised training places, including traineeships, apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeships, in areas of identified skills need. The deal will ensure the assistance uh, of a, up to $1,000 per learner also available to cover costs associated with training, such as books and materials. Energising Tasmania is part of the Morrison government's $585 million delivering skills for today and tomorrow package. As I said, Mr Acting Deputy President, Marinus Link and Battery of the Nation are very exciting projects for Tasmania. Um, and I have spoken in this place many times before about just how excited I am as a Tasmanian that we are investing in these projects locally. But as I said, we know that we will need skills uh, within our workforce to, to do these projects, uh, and that's why this government has invested in uh, training locally to make sure that our local workforce is appropriately trained to deliver on these projects, being Marinus Link and Battery of the Nation. The Morrison government has also committed locally in Tasmania $7 million to assist in the construction of a new trades and water centre of excellence in the state south to support more Tasmanians to take up careers in trades and electrotechnology. 
This investment complements the $14 million already committed by the Gutwin Tasmanian Liberal government, which has been a champion of renewable energy development in the state alongside the coalition Morrison government. The campus in the south will expand its training platform to train students for building and construction, plumbing and water, refrigeration and air conditioning and smart building technology. So this is a very excitement, exciting investment in the south of Tasmania to make sure that our vet sector continues to be strong and continues to align with the skills that we know our workforce is going to need coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr Acting Deputy President, when I gave my first speech to this place, I referenced the fact that I'd stood for the Senate because I've seen too many Tasmanians have to leave our island for job opportunities. They don't feel that they have opportunities locally at home. Since the Morrison Coalition government has been elected, I've seen the change in uh, the culture of Tasmania. We are looking more to opportunities at home, and I certainly wouldn't want to see uh, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our local economy being that young Tasmanians feel that they, that they can't uh, have opportunities locally, that we go back to the dark old days where everyone used to leave our island for work. So I'm certainly glad to see this government taking seriously the issues of skills and training in our local areas, particularly in our regional areas to make sure that young people have the skills they need to be able to work locally so that we don't see another generation of Tasmanians leaving our island for work, to make sure that young Tasmanians can work at home if they want to. I certainly hope that COVID-19 hasn't completely railroaded our plans. I'm a proud Tasmanian. I want to see more opportunities for young Tasmanians at home. And I think strengthening our vet sector, like through the legislation that we are discussing here today, is a really important way to do that. I commend the bill to the Senate. Uh, thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And it seems appropriate to be talking about national vocational education uh, and training during uh, this National Skills Week. This is a chance for us to acknowledge just how important TAFE and training are for our communities. And right now, as we face a jobs crisis in this country, we must acknowledge that TAFE and training are a key part of getting our country back on track. But this bill uh, is just another tweak, and it's a tweak from a third-term government which has actually spent seven years undermining and underfunding our critical TAFE system. And while this bill largely implements the recommendations of independent reviews that have been supported by the sector, there are still some concerns. There remains uncertainty as to how some of the changes contained in this bill will work in practice. And this isn't helped by the lack of consultation that many stakeholders in the sector have reported on this bill. But let's look at the real issue here, which is this government's record of failure and neglect on skills and training. Seven years, three terms, three prime ministers, each of them just as responsible as the last for the skills crisis that Australia currently finds itself in a skills crisis that existed before the COVID-19 crisis, a skills crisis that will hold back Australia's economic recovery. Because in this country, we have a serious mismatch between the skills that workers have to offer and the skills that businesses need. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, more than two million people were unable to find enough work. And at the same time, businesses couldn't find workers with the skills that they needed. Well, that's got a whole lot worse. And today, now over 2.5 million Australians are unemployed or underemployed, a number that we know tragically is predicted to keep rising. And if you look at the government's own skills shortage list, you'll find that as a country, we're lacking people with the skills to become bakers, nurses, electricians, midwives, early childhood educators, teachers, and so many more. Employers are actually crying out for people for these roles. So why is it that so many children finishing school today cannot count 
on their government to deliver them the skills, training and education that are needed to fill those vacancies. These are core, essential jobs, and yet, as a country, we can't fill them. This is just one example of how the government can barely manage today's economy, let alone manage the recovery and the future that we need to grapple with right now. Because why do we have those skills shortages? Seven years of cuts, seven years of neglect. In Victoria, in my home state, we've seen the loss of 35,000 apprentices and trainees since the coalition came to government. 35,000. That's a loss of over a third of Victoria's apprentices and trainees. And across the nation, over 140,000 apprentices and trainees have been lost. The Liberals and Nationals have cut $3 billion from TAFE and training. And we've heard today that Treasury expects effective unemployment to reach 13 per cent by the end of the year. We currently have over one million Australians unemployed, the first time in Australia's history that that figure has been reached. And TAFE and training and apprenticeships are going to be crucial in ensuring that Australians have the skills for the jobs that become available as we recover from this recession. So we cannot afford for the Morrison government to continue down this path of cuts and of neglect of our public TAFE and training system, a path that will undermine our recovery, a path that will undermine the opportunity for so many Australians to get the education they need to secure the jobs that they need today and for the future. These cuts are locking Australians out of TAFE and training, and that is locking Australians out of jobs. And this is what it should be all about right now for this government, jobs, saving jobs, creating jobs, and making sure Australians have the skills to do those jobs. But at a time when unemployment and underemployment are at record levels, this government cannot tell us what their plan is for jobs. This government has no plan for our recovery. And right now, the government is far more interested in photo ops, another press release, uh, another press conference, another reactive announcement without the follow through, without the follow through of what is really needed. What is the job trainer program? What is it going to do to make up for seven years of cuts and neglect to TAFE and training? What is the home builder program? It's a program that is not building any homes. And the job maker program? Well, if someone in the government could tell us what that is, we would really appreciate it. It's another program, another slogan, another name, without a plan, without anything real that Australians can get behind to know that they are going to have good and decent and secure jobs uh, with the help of this government. This government is too busy announcing plans that are all talk and no substance, plans that are so light on detail they don't really make it past the 24 hours in the media. And when it comes to TAFE, training and skills, this government vacated the field when it came to power seven years ago. A government without a plan for education and skills, well, that is a government that is without a plan for the future. And right now, it screams of a government without a plan for our economic recovery either. Now, more than ever, we need a government that is serious about creating good, decent and secure jobs, one that provides Australians with the skills they need to do those jobs. No more non-plans, no more empty announcements, no more tweaks to legislation. We need a real plan for jobs, and we need it now. Unlike the Liberals, Labor understands the value of TAFE and training. We know that vocational education is a key part of Australia's recovery. We will always back a strong, comprehensive regulatory compliance and education framework for ASQA. We'll support a fair and considered approach to ASQA reforms. We'll support this bill. But this bill in the current environment is just more tweaks. More tweaks to a vocational training sector that needs a national plan and needs proper support <coughs> from this government. 
We know that we're going to need skilled workers to recover from this recession and that people desperately need good and secure jobs that are supported by quality training. The Labor team is focused on this and has always been focused on this. Last year, Labor leader Anthony Albanese announced our intention to establish Jobs and Skills Australia. And this is the type of reform we should be talking about right here, right now, today. An independent statutory authority that would provide a genuine partnership with business leaders, state and territory governments, unions and education providers bringing everyone together to make sure that workers have access to the skills and jobs that they need and that businesses have access to the skilled workers that they need, that they're seeking as well. This will be a model of genuine partnership and collaboration, investing in the skills of Australian workers. That is the sort of reform that we should be talking about here today in the middle of this crisis, in the Senate, in this parliament in the middle of the first recession in almost 30 years. And we need this kind of plan now more than ever as we look forward uh, to a recovery post COVID-19. On this side of the chamber, in the Labor team, we have a vision for decent and stable jobs that are supported by quality training. This is in Labor's DNA. We see education and training as an investment in our future, and we will always support hardworking Australians who want a quality education. We will always support good, secure jobs for all Australians. Thank you, Deputy President. Acting. Uh, thank you for that, Senator Walsh. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President, and I rise today uh, to speak on this bill. I do so uh, in the great pleasure that my good friend and colleague and minister, uh, Senator Michaelia Cash, is uh, in front of me in the chamber because no one is a greater advocate for jobs and particularly vet jobs in this place than Minister Cash. I have been lucky enough to be out and about with Minister Cash on a few occasions over the past couple of months. And one of the key focuses of our uh, visits together, particularly into regional WA, has been the needs of businesses in attracting and training high quality uh, vet graduates and apprentices. And it's great to see again through this measure the government building on the strong commitment we do have to making sure that our vet sector is as strong as possible. Now, no, nobody doubts. And, and, and nobody would argue, uh, certainly not Minister Cash, that there are some major challenges ahead of the skills sector, ahead of the uh, vet sector in the current circumstances. Uh, but the Australian government's commitment to a skilled economy to boost our economic recovery has never been stronger. In fact, it is one of the key ways in which we are going to be able to build our economy out of this pandemic-induced uh, uh, economic uh, uh, downturn and one of the ways we will be growing our economy into the future and making sure as many Australians as possible, all those Australians who want a job can get a job. We are contributing as a government an additional $2 billion, in fact, uh, to a new $2.5 billion job trainer package dedicated to reforming the vocational education and training sector and about keeping apprentices in jobs. Uh, $1 billion will be allocated to set up the Job Trainer Fund, with 50 per cent to be funded by the states and territories in recognition of the uh, economic benefits that flow to those states and territories from a strong job training sector. Uh, this will mean more Australians with access to free or low-cost training places, particularly in areas of need. Uh, and we certainly see that out and about in rural WA. A further uh, $1.5 billion will be allocated to expanding and extending the support of sp supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy, uh, which was first announced in March of this year. Uh, the package responds to the challenges of the labour market because, as I have said, of the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the next step on the sector reform process outlined by the Prime Minister as part of the government's jobmaker agenda. Skills reform and strengthening our vet sector is central to the government's jobmaker plan 
to support Australia's economic recovery and our future growth. growth. An unprecedented number of Australians are without work, many for the first time in their lives due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And on top of this, around 250,000 students will leave school at the end of this year. In that environment, obviously, it will be difficult for many of those students uh, or, or ex-students to find uh, employment immediately, in which case uh, particularly the VET sector will become increasingly important source of training opportunities. Now, as I've said, I've, I've, I have been out and about with the minister, Minister Cash, uh, over the last few months, and I just want to highlight a few of the, uh, a, a few of the, I guess, opportunities that are out there in regional Western Australia, in particular, but also some of the challenges we do face. Uh, most recently, I was at uh, a Bunbury Jobs Fair with Minister Cash. Now, the jobs fairs are an extraordinary opportunity, uh, and, and at that particular jobs fair. We saw the Chamber of Commerce from Kalgoorlie, the Kalgoorlie and Boulder Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, came down to Bunbury. Kalgoorlie has a particular challenge at the moment. They have a significant number of available places, of available employment opportunities, without the, the people willing to relocate to Kalgoorlie to take them up. So they are faced with a particular set of challenges, uh, quite ironic at a time when we're seeing, unfortunately, uh, the unemployment rate increasing. Uh, so uh, I, I do give a shout out to all those out there who can get to Kalgoorlie and uh, who have the skills required. Uh, and there's a lot of training available to upskill you into those jobs. But one of the great things we heard, Minister Cash and I heard at that jobs fair, was that from the previous jobs fair uh, in Kalgoorlie, a number of individuals had already entered full-time employment as a result of the jobs fair. So we are seeing actions linking individuals with training directly resulting in job outcomes for those individuals. And that is a, a, a key driver both of the future uh, economic growth we all want and need uh, to see Australia recover strongly from the pandemic. But it also gives those individuals hope, where hope and opportunity where they haven't necessarily been there before. So these job spheres are a great way of linking people up, not just with a job, but with training and a job. And that's one of the key things we do need to keep reminding all those people out there who do want a job, who are looking for an opportunity. Um, the program, the, the jobs fair program, is certainly a great credit. And, and obviously, these are challenging times for large events like that to proceed. I know the Minister's Department put an extraordinary amount of effort in making sure that the, the uh, event itself was COVID safe. Uh, uh, but you saw a large number of participating uh, uh, exhibitors uh, who had jobs or training on offer, but you also saw a large number of individuals who were keen to see what opportunities were out there, keen to talk about the potential work opportunities, the potential training opportunities that were available. Uh, and so even within the COVID safe requirements uh, that we are all currently living under, uh, we saw a large number of people turning out and uh, uh, learning about those opportunities, talking to businesses face to face, talking to training providers face to face. Uh, and we saw a, a large number of businesses. We saw uh, some Indigenous-owned cleaning businesses, for example, which had started up in the, in the last couple of years and had grown from strength to strength, from two employees to 20 employees in the space of a couple of years, one particular uh, business we met. Uh, this is the kind of activity we want to see in our economy, and we want to see the training available to uh, enable people who are currently unskilled or needing to reskill to enter those job opportunities and those growth opportunities. Uh, more recently, I was at DeRosa's Highway Motors in Waruna in the southwest of WA. Uh, Nick and his team operate one of the premier farm machinery dealers in the southwest of WA, servicing particularly dairy, beef, and sheep farmers, as well as orchardists in the district. Uh, Nick. Nick is a, one of those characters, one of those salt-of-the-earth characters from the bush. He's really passionate about giving local youth a go. He wants local youth 
to take up the opportunities that are available in his hometown. Uh, you know, this is a this is a business that has been located there. I don't say how long it's been there, but it's certainly been there for, for the vast majority of my life, driving up and down to uh, our own farm in Pemberton. We uh, passed the uh, De Rosas Highway Motors in Waruna on many, many hundreds of occasions, if not thousands, uh, and they are an institution in uh, that part of the world. And as I said, Nick is dedicated to giving those local kids a go in the mechanical apprenticeships. And one of the things I hear constantly throughout uh, regional Western Australia is the need for people to take up uh, those, those uh, mechanical, uh, particularly those mechanical apprenticeships, and to have opportunities in the vet sector to do things like uh, diesel mechanic training. Uh, AFTRI, another large farm machinery dealership throughout uh, the wheat belt of Western Australia, has a significant training program of its own. Uh, it, it has something like 25 apprenticeships ongoing at any, uh, in any given year. Uh, it, it, uh, it trains a lot of people in, the, in full knowledge that, it, that the skills are highly sought after. A lot of those young men and women will end up uh, being poached by the mines. Uh, that's the reality of the training they do, and they train more than they need on the basis that many of them will go elsewhere. That's great. That's great for those individuals. It's a great opportunity. And one of the uh, universal things I hear from those kinds of businesses who are putting that effort in to local training, both because it means they can continue to grow their own businesses, it means they can give locals an opportunity to get some high quality skills, and it gives those uh, young people an opportunity to develop a base of skills that allow them to move, to seek opportunities elsewhere to uh, advance their own uh, uh, life prospects by perhaps going to the mining industry for a few years before coming back to the wheat belt or perhaps going to the mining industry permanently. Uh, so we again we see some wonderful opportunities out there, some challenges, absolutely some challenges, but some wonderful opportunities out there for young Australians and Australians who are seeking to retrain. Uh, just finally on the situation in WA, I did just want to go back a couple of months now. Minister Cash and I did visit uh, John Fitzharding at uh, Dongara, Marine, Dongara Marine. Again, a wonderful success story in regional WA. This is a boat building company, been uh, building boats in Western Australia since 1975. Situated in uh, what is a tiny uh, coastal community of Dongara, uh, just south of Geraldton. Uh, it's a regional business that is absolutely punching well above its weight, uh, taking on a wide range of projects for both uh, the private sector and government cli clients. Uh, it's building, for example, six metre tenders for ecotourism in the Abrolhos region, uh, rigid inflatable machine uh, marine rescue vessels, uh, the 20 metre Berkeley class pilot boats in service in the Fremantle ports. Uh, now, this boat has been described by one uh, Fremantle pilot as the Rolls Royce of pilot boats. Uh, they were also involved in uh, building the new Trans Perth catamaran, the MV Trisha, which plies the uh, Swan River uh, just down from the CPO. If anyone is ever over in Western Australia, a bit hard these days, I know. But, uh, for us all to move around, but uh, the, um, the Swan River uh, Trans Perth cats are very well known uh, to all West Australians, are very much a feature of the city. And uh, the fact that that, uh, that that new vessel, the MV Trisha, was uh, built just north of Perth in a small regional town, I think, is a great credit to Dongara Marine and, and uh, John and his business partners who continue to support the opportunities for young local apprentices in that industry. And we saw, uh, Minister Cash and I saw when we were up there, uh, a number of young Australians who uh, were recently arrived in apprenticeships or just about to complete apprenticeships, again across a range of fields from boat building to uh, diesel mechanics. Uh, to uh, electrical engineering. So the opportunities are out there, particularly in the regions, and this government is committed to doing everything it can to support those opportunities. Um, 
it's a, it's a, it is a difficult time for those uh, who do not have a job, but I guess the key message from today is that the opportunities are out there. Uh, maybe you have to think a little bit differently about what those opportunities may be for you going forward, but when you see the number of people who go along to things like the jobs fairs in Kalgoorlie, in Bunbury, then you know that there are opportunities. There are opportunities for training, for jobs, and there are also many, many people who are out there seeking those opportunities. And I think that is a very positive thing for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Mr. Acting President, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I should say. I rise in support of the National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Amendment Bill 2020. Australia's vocational education and training sector is a vital driver of our economy. The VET sector provides education and training for key industries and services through a network of private and public registered training organisations. Having a high quality VET sector is fundamental in keeping our workforce skilled and our economy productive. However, due to the, to the debacle of Labor's VET fee help scheme, the quality and reputation of Australia's VET sector has taken a significant hit, when once it was regarded as among the best in the world. This bill comes as one more essential step in a long line of amendments brought by this Liberal National Government to repair the damage done by Labor and get the vocational education and training in Australia back on track. The bill deals specifically with the National VET Regulator, ASQA, making several changes and improvements to increase its efficiency and transparency in regulating the sector. You will recall, Acting Deputy President, that the VET Fee Help Scheme was first introduced in 2008 and operated as a HEX-type loan for vocational education students where the government paid tuition costs and students would start paying off their loan once their income reached a high enough threshold. At the time, the loans were quite limited and were not widely used, which led to a further overhaul of the scheme in 2012 by the Gillard Labor government. The revised version of the scheme dropped many of the earlier restrictions in an, in an attempt to open the scheme sorry, dropped by many of the earlier restrictions in an attempt to open the scheme to more students and trainees. This weakened the dam wall, so to speak, and opened a lucrative niche for a flood of private registered training organisations to move in and take advantage of the loan scheme as a government-funded cash cow, with little regard in many outcomes, in many cases for student outcomes. The RTOs maximised their profits simply by maximising their enrolments irrespective of the circumstances or background of the students they enrolled. By signing up as many students as possible, unscrupulous RTOs could quickly establish huge cash flows, as the government paid based on the number of student enrolments, regardless of whether the students finished the course, or were even qualified or were able to meet the requirements of the course. To rake in as much taxpayer money as possible, some RTOs went to great lengths to trick, coerce and bribe students into signing up for their courses. A common and quite blatant inducement adver advertised by RTOs was to offer free laptops or iPads simply for signing up to the course. In making their sales pitch, shonky trading providers would often deliberately target uninformed people, implying there were no upfront costs and misled them about their liability to pay fees and service a debt. Brokers were hired to recruit the most vulnerable people, including the old, unemployed, less educated and disadvantaged, using the marketing tactics of cold calling, handing out leaflets, setting up shopping centre booths and selling door to door. On top of this, many courses were of very poor quality and extremely overpriced. In one instance, an online business course from a private RTO 
with no reputation to speak of, cost a draw-dropping $8,000 more than a similar course offered by a prestigious Melbourne University. Yet the Gillard government just kept paying. No quality control, no audits, no checks and balances. Nothing. Labor just kept shoveling taxpayers' money out the door. This behaviour from RTOs was outrageously unethical and, due to the poor design of the scheme, was far too easy to get away with. The total value of loans jumped from $25.6 million in 2009 to $2.9 billion in 2015, and many of the students who receive these loans will never reach the income threshold meaning that the cost will be forever borne by hard-working Australian taxpayers. This catastrophe was entirely due to the Labor government's negligence and mishandling of the scheme. An audit of the scheme published in 2016 found that the government did not establish processes to ensure that all objectives, risks and consequences were managed in implementing the expanded scheme. In effect, Acting Deputy President, the quality and integrity of much of the available education and training was trashed in the name of expanding the sector. Labor's VET fee help scheme simply did not have an appropriate level of accountability and regulation to balance the systemic abuse risk that comes with such a scheme. There is invariably a great deal of risk involved when it comes to the government handing out so-called free money, and so strict regulation is needed to mitigate those risks. Legislation must always be designed to account for the lowest common denominator, with all contingencies provided for. Because if there is an opportunity for exploitation, there will always be someone out there to do it. Government should never be in such a hurry as to let enthusiasm for change take preeminence over accountability, transparency and due diligence when it comes to good and effective legislation. The Coalition has been working for several years to clean up the mess caused by the VET fee help scheme. Reform in this area has occurred incrementally and methodically to limit disruption to legitimate RTOs and to protect the many students who use the loan scheme. The point needs to be made that despite the financial abuses that occurred, unscrupulous RTOs only made up a relatively small portion of providers and students shouldn't suffer any further because of bad policy. Most significantly, in this process, Acting Deputy President, the VET fee help scheme was entirely scrapped in 2016 and replaced with a new system, the VET Student Loan Scheme, which is far better designed with stricter vetting and enforced loan caps. Today the government is introducing this bill in order to further improve the national VET regulator, ASQA, to keep RTOs in check so that widespread abuse of the system won't be possible in the future. Having an appropriately governed regulator means that skills training will be delivered in a more efficient manner. This is important, and high-quality sort of skills training needed to help us come out of the, with the best possible post-COVID workforce. The new governance structure within ASQA means that a CEO and advisory council will be able to take a greater educative role and have a more modern approach to regulating the VET sector. The new Expert Advisory Council means that those with best place to understand the nuances of this highly diverse sector are best positioned to help guide it into the future. Important privacy safeguards will be put in place to ensure that the data of vulnerable students is not shared inappropriately and will also help buttress the vulnerable against potential abuse like that which we saw under Labor. It is tremendously important to recognise at a time like this, skills and training are more important than ever. VET reform is a key pillar of the Morrison government's job maker plan. We know on this side of the chamber 
that all jobs are worth supporting, not just those of tertiary educated labour and green voters in the inner cities. We have announced the $2.8 billion to support apprentices and trainees since the COVID pandemic hit, and we will continue to keep pushing to ensure that vocational education has a strong backbone of funding and rigorous and appropriate oversight going forward. It is, it is and always will be core to our economy and should never be considered an afterthought. A stable, well-functioning vet sector that continues to turn out skilled, appropriately qualified workers is essential to Australian industry. It is essential to the strength of our economy and essential to the well-being of our society as a whole. This bill will make the necessary improvements needed for ASQA to fulfil an effective certification and oversight role, providing the checks and balances needed for the vocational education and training sector to flourish. A good and effective regulator was one of the key elements missing from Labor's Vet Fee Help Scheme. This was a vital missing ingredient that almost guaranteed that rampant misconduct and poor quality would infect many RTOs. With the passage of this bill, Acting Deputy President, ASQA will take a giant step forward to be the highly effective regulator that our vet sector needs. I commend the bill to the Senate. Uh, thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak about the National, Ed National Vocational Education and Training Regulation Regulator Amendment, Governance and Other Matters Bill 2020. I will be voting for this bill. Everyone knows that ASQA needs reform. Australia needs ASQA to be a cop on the beat. We've seen too much evidence of what happens without one. We've seen providers take our kids for a ride charging them tens of thousands of dollars for qualifications worth little more than the paper they're printed on. And some of those kids, by the way, are still waiting for their money back. So if someone could get onto that for about the third time since I've been in here. Some of these guys have been really, really ripped off our kids. So if we can get onto it, that'd be great. And it's about time the government started doing, um, started doing something uh, about that, that those qualifications, once again, are not worth the money that that paper is printed on. But the fact is that the government is tinkering at the edges here. What's new? They're doing the bare minimum they need to. What's new? It makes me sad to say, but they just don't care enough to make our TAFEs thrive. It's all just lip service. Our tradies and the people they work for need so much more. They need a vision. They need support from government to get kids trained up and into jobs that will rebuild our economy. Don't tell me we're going to start rebuilding our economy, our economy, we're going into manufacturing, we're going into infrastructure, when our kids out there have got no jobs, no apprentices, because the TAFEs are not up and running. This is the problem, and it's becoming a bigger problem. I've got people down there waiting 18 months in Tasmania to get new houses built, because we don't have qualified tradesmen and we don't have the apprentices, because we don't have the TAFEs open. That's the problem. And that's what the economists and the governments tell us we need to make our way out of this economic crisis. Everyone knows that construction, manufacturing and care work will get us through. That's what our economy and our people need, and they need it now. They needed it yesterday. But the question to the government is, how will we do that when our tastes are on their knees? They're on their knees, and they're sick of the lip service that's coming from the coalition. Absolutely had enough of it. The bill is a bit of nothing, basically. That's all it is. A bill of nothing. A waste of bloody time in this Senate chamber. Maybe the regulator's board's operations could be improved. But you know what else could be improved? Literally everything about the way we do trades and training in this country. Trades and training. That's my problem with this bill. It's a bit like fixing the roof when the foundations are already dodgy. What's the point? What's the point? We have states announcing record spending, spending on infrastructure, but we don't have the tradies to get it done. We don't have the tradies. How about that? That's what happens when you rely on uh, 
when you rely on all these four, five, sevens and everything else in the past, things are going to change. No one's changing with them. We're not changing in here. Still not ready to give our kids an opportunity through TAFE. Still not spending the money in there. And the TAFE, where our fire is, our paramedics, our aged care workers are trained. They're meant to be essential workers. But if these jobs are classed as essential, how come it's not essential to fix where they are being trained? How do you get training? How do you get them trained if you don't have the facilities who are not prepared to train them? And don't even start me on not having the teachers prepared to train them. Because you don't have that either. It is shameful. Here we go, the government once again making a big song and dance of their so-called job trainer program. Just a reworded something else. That's all it is. I'll tell you what, this government does slogans pretty well. But the trouble is you've been doing that well, these training people are now, they've caught up with what you're on to. Well, they're on to it. What I want to know is what is the government actually doing to make sure our kids can get a decent vocational educa education after school, after they're finished? How are we going to get those unemployed workers out there retrained and into a decent job? Our TAFE should be there to do that for people. Australians should be able to rely on their local TAFE to give them the skills they need to contribute to rebuilding our economy. But I'll tell you what these big, these big talkers have done so far. They've brought out our, their fancy marketing campaign to try and Order. hide— Order. Senator Lambie, you'll be in continuation when debate resumes, being 2 p.m. Um, Senator, move to questions without notice. Senator Wong. I seek leave to make a statement relating to shadow ministerial arrangements. Leave is granted. I thank the Senate. I advise that the opposition has made two changes affecting shadow assistant ministers. Ms Merrill Swanson, MP, has been appointed a shadow assistant minister for defence, replace, replacing the Honourable Dr Mike Kelly, AMMP. Senator Jenna McAllister has been appointed a shadow assistant minister for communities in the prevention of family violence, a new position in addition to her existing responsibilities in the portfolio of families and social services. The Honourable Linda Burney MP. I congratulate both Ms Swanson and Senator McAllister and seek leave to table the revised shadow ministry list and to have it incorporated into Sir Hansard. Leave is granted. Senator will move to questions. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Minister, on Friday you could not tell the Senate Select Committee how many aged care residents had passed away from COVID-19. Can the minister tell us today? How many residents of aged care facilities funded and regulated by the Morrison government has passed away since he failed to provide that answer? Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Gallagher, for the question. And can I, at the outset, express my sincere condolences to every resident's family who have lost a loved one during the pandemic into aged care? Can I also say that I should have had the data on Friday and I apologise for not having done that. To my colleagues who I have successfully uh, taken the attention of what it should be, which is our efforts to combat the virus, but also to the Senate, I should have had the information. And, uh, my, my fault, my responsibility, and I take full responsibility for not having that information available to me at the time. Mr President, sadly, uh, Nationally, since the commencement of the pandemic, there's 335 Australians who have passed away in residential and, um, and in home care. Um, Mr. President, uh, 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 there have been uh, seven home care recipients and 328 residential care uh, recipients who have passed away. Uh, it's an absolute tragedy. Every single one of those deaths is an absolute tragedy. Uh, and that's why this government's worked so hard since the beginning of the pandemic to put in place measures to firstly protect Australia through the National Health Pandemic Plan uh, and then the other measures that we've put in place which now total in excess of $1 billion to support the residential aged care sector to manage the virus uh, and to protect Australians. Uh, particularly those in residential aged care, because we know that they, in the sense of if they contract the virus, are the most vulnerable. So right from the outset, right, right from January, when we first started talking to the sector with respect to what they ought to be doing in preparation, uh, then with the National 
health pandemic plan that Order, we put Senator together Colbeck. in. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, can the minister tell us today how many residents of aged care facilities, funded and regulated by the Morrison government, have now contracted COVID-19? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so far across Australia, there have been 1,000. 761 residents of residential aged care facilities, residential aged care facilities uh, who have uh, contracted the virus. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Maria Vasilakis, who just celebrated her 81st birthday, died alone after contracting COVID-19 at St Basil's. Maria Rukavina, who tested positive after being hospitalised with long-standing skin infections, died alone in the Epworth Hospital. Her son Ivan had gone five days without getting an update on her condition. What does the minister have to say to the 335 families grieving the loss of a loved one about his failure to remember the number of older Australians in aged care who have died from COVID-19? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, as I said in my first answer, I offer my condolences, my sincerest condolences, and that of the government to every single one of those families who lost a loved one. It's a tragedy. Every single life that has been lost is an absolute tragedy. It's the tragedy of this wicked, wicked virus. Uh, and I offer my apology to them for not knowing the number, as I did in my primary answer. I should have had the information. I didn't, and I take full responsibility for that. I should have had that data. I apologise to those people who were who uh, I wasn't able to give that answer to. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Liberal and the Nationals government is supporting Victoria through its coronavirus second wave outbreak and driving health recovery in Victoria? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator McKenzie for the question. Mr. President, as we've seen over recent months, uh, supporting Victoria to suppress community transmission of COVID-19 is critical, not just to economic recovery, of course, but also to save lives. Sadly, as a result of the second wave of COVID-19, we have now seen over 517 Australians lose their lives. Uh, the Morrison government has stepped up our support to the Victorian government to assist them in combating the effects of COVID-19. The Australian government's Department of Health is assisting the Victorian Department of Health and Human Services to undertake contact tracing. Over 1,700 Australian defence personnel are currently deployed to Victoria to assist with contact tracing, testing, Victoria police checkpoints and logistics. The government has substantially increased dispatches of personal protective equipment PPE, from the national medical stockpile in July and August. Of the more than 66 million masks dispatched from the national medical stockpile to date, over 23 million masks have been dispatched to Victoria, including 9 million masks dispatched for Victorian aged care providers. The Australian government is dispatching 186,000 goggles from the national medical stockpile to assist Victorian general practitioners and allied health providers. Additionally, the Australian government has established 28 GP-led respiratory clinics in Victoria, providing free holistic care and testing for patients with respiratory illness. Respiratory clinics in Victoria have assessed more than 153,200 people and conducted now over 138,000 tests. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. As the second stage of lockdowns has placed additional strain on the mental health of Victorians, what support is the government providing to bolster mental health services? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. The Australian government is making a significant investment to support the mental health of all Australians, but indeed the mental health of Victorians. We are investing $26.9 million to create 15 mental health clinics across Victoria, nine in Melbourne and six in a Mackenzie in regional Victoria. We're investing $5 million to enhance digital and phone services for groups that are experiencing significant challenges during the restrictions that are now in place. 
$14.6 million to support mental health providers respond to increased demand in Victoria, including $5 million to support Headspace, $2 million to support the Kids Helpline, $2.5 million to support Lifeline and $2.5 million to support Beyond Blue. The impacts of the COVID-19 outbreak, physical distancing and isolation can make us feel anxious, stressed and worried. And our message to Australians is, if you are suffering, Order. we Senator can help Cash. you with the help Time you need. The has expired. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister please update the Senate on the state of the Australian response to COVID-19 and why it's still important for all Australians to remain vigilant and take precautions to stop the spread of COVID-19? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And our testing in Australia has now seen 5.7 million tests conducted across Australia. Of those, over 24,821 Australians have been diagnosed with COVID-19. And as I stated in my first answer, sadly, 517 Australians have lost their lives. Our tracing effort, though, has been critical in our response, and the COVID Safe app has now seen over 7 million downloads and is enabling us to trace, obviously, those cases. Uh, we are now at a very important moment nationally. In June and July, we saw positive signs of economic recovery in the states that have suppressed the virus. It is critical that we support Victoria to contain community transmission so that we can protect the lives of Australians and their livelihoods. The Victorian second wave has made it clear how we must all Order. follow Senator and observe Cash, time social the distancing has practices. Expired. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. How many aged care residential facilities are currently experiencing COVID-19 outbreaks? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Keneally, for the question. Currently, there are 120 six facilities in Victoria that have a COVID-19 outbreak. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Is that the national figure? Thank you, Mr. President. I note that wasn't the full answer to my question. I did ask for the national figure. Perhaps the minister could update that as he also answers how many aged care residential facilities have now recorded more than 100 cases. Senator Colbeck. Senator, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, uh, on the figures that I have, the only facilities with a current outbreak are in Victoria. So that is the national figure of facilities with a national outbreak. Um, and I don't have an individual breakdown of all facilities with me at question time here now. I'm very happy to bring back to you an answer to that question, but I don't believe there is any facility that has more than uh, 100 residents that are positive, uh, but I'll confirm that at the end of the question time for you. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate when the first outbreak at Epping Gardens Aged Care was first reported and how many COVID-19 cases have been re reported at that facility since? Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Mr. President. As I said, I don't have a detailed breakdown of every facility, the first date of um, the outbreak or the number of residents and staff who have tested positive. I'm happy to provide that information to the Senate at the end of order, question time. Point of order. On a point of order, Senator Keneally. Thank you. I appreciate the minister is attempting to answer the question. Could he, if he's going to take it on notice, could he confirm that the answer is 210 Senator cases? Senator Keneally, Senator Keneally, at please. That's, that, that's not a point of order at all. Sorry, Senator Cormann. That, that was just uh, my point. This was uh, absolutely not a point of order. This was a political point. If Senator Keneally has the answer at her fingertips, because she, of course, knows the question that she was going to ask. Why did she ask it if, uh, for, for, if, if not for anything other than just playing politics with what is a very serious issue? Order. You Senate. should be ashamed of yourself. Order. I will call Senator Wong when there's silence. Order. Sen Senator McGrath. Senator Wong. Uh, this is a very serious issue. This involves the deaths of too many Australians, uh, and it is entirely appropriate that the opposition 
ask this minister questions which go to his handling of this crisis. That is what the opposition is doing, and that is what the opposition will continue to do. Okay. Um, firstly, on the point of order, Senator Keneally, you know better that wasn't a point of order. I remind senators that when they rise on a point of order, they have to point to the standing order they believe is being breached. Um, it's not up to me or the chair to go to the motives of anyone seeking a, a, an answer to a question in question time. Um, I've allowed the two leaders to make observations on that point, and I urge senators to re remember the standing orders when they're asking, answering questions, and raising points of order. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, and as I said, um, there are 126 facilities in Victoria with an active case right now. I don't have a full list of all those 126 cases with me. But I have committed to getting back to Senator Keneally and the Chamber at the end of question time with the details that she's asked for. Order. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister update the Senate on what practical support Defence has been providing to states and territories to minimise the spread of COVID-19 and drive our health recovery? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patterson for the question and for his tremendous support for our troops in uh, Victoria at this time. I am so proud of the efforts of the Defence Department and also our ADF, uh, and they're also their family support during the COVID-19 pandemic. The ADF very quickly adapted and developed new business as usual uh, processes and practices during COVID-19. We did that to ensure defence keeps our people in Australia and also over 2,000 personnel deployed overseas to keep them safe, safe when on training exercises, when actually on uh, exercises on operational deployments and also on routine uh, postings. We did that to make sure that we adapted very early and then we now maintain the best possible health uh, protocols. Since February, under Operation COVID-19 Assist, Defence has been providing a wide range of support to all states and territories with their COVID-19 response. And Defence has demonstrated great capability and great agility uh, in that support. Providing support uh, has been in many forms, in traditional tasks such as planning, logistics and also in health support, but a number of new tasks such as contact tracing and also training to drive ambulances. Today, over 3,400 ADF members are supporting all states and territories uh, with their COVID responses. And throughout the pandemic, Defence has been posted to respond to requests for support again from all states and territories. Following the Prime Minister's offer to First Ministers, to all First Ministers on the 27th of March, uh, for, with assistance with the ADF for mandatory hotel quarantine, the ADF prepared 100 personnel in each large state and 50 in smaller states. The following day in New South Wales, ADF personnel began supporting the reception of international arrivals. And can I say to all colleagues here, we have much to be proud of in how our ADF has responded Order. to Senator Operation Reynolds, Bushfire Assist and COVID has expired. Assist. Expired. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I do. Uh, can the minister provide further detail on the support provided to authorities in my home state of Victoria? Senator Reynolds. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator Patterson. And yes, I can. Uh, our ADF personnel have been assisting Victorian authorities since the 23rd of March this year with its COVID-19 response. Uh, since then, we have supported 11 separate Victorian requests for assistance. Today, 1,700 defence personnel are deployed to Victoria to support its uh, latest efforts to get this next wave under control. Three, for example, 330 ADF personnel are supporting contact tracing uh, through data management, admin and logistics support and also door-knocking close contacts unable to be contacted by phone. 250 ADF personnel are, supported co are supporting COVID-19 testing right across the state of Victoria. Uh, 150 ADF personnel are supporting seven Victoria Police vehicle control points. And as I said, ADF are providing support in new ways, including doing training with Ambulance Victoria and also now doing a training and assistance to the Victorian Aged Care uh, Response Centre Again, Order. I Senator thank them all Reynolds. for their service. Time for the answer expired. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister also provide further detail on the support provided to Western Australian authorities? 
Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And yes, I can. Uh, the ADF has been providing critically important support to the West Australian government authorities since the 22nd of March this year. Since then, we have supported 10 separate WA requests for assistance, and today, 112 ADF personnel are on the ground in Western Australia. But at its peak, on the 22nd of April, the ADF had 326 personnel assisting uh, West Australian authorities with their COVID-19 response. Uh, this builds on the support the ADF had provided uh, earlier in March with the, to assist with the cruise ship disembarkation. And that assistance provided included uh, assistance with quarantine compliance checks and also a range of logistic support, including cargo transportation. And on the 3rd of August this year, we did agree to provide 50 ADF personnel to support WA authorities with hotel quarantine at five hotels, and we're now working with them on a new request. Order. Senator Reynolds. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to Senator Colbeck, the Minister for Aged Care and Seniors and Senior Australians. Minister, uh, through you, uh, Mr. President, um, on Friday, the government announced $171 million additional funding for aged care, while experts acknowledge that an, initial, initial, sorry, an additional investment of $3.5 billion is what's actually needed to improve hours of care and workforce conditions and address other aged care issues. Minister. Are you going to invest the $3.5 billion that's recommended to be needed to fix the aged care sector? The Minister for Senior Australians in Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. The, uh, and thanks, Senator Seward, for the question. The $171 million that we announced on Friday was a further contribution towards our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. That's what it was specifically targeted to do. It wasn't designed to fix the aged care sector. Different situation. Mr President, uh, uh, we are currently uh, in the middle of a royal commission into the aged care sector, which was given the task of forensically looking Order. at the entire aged care sector and then coming back to government with recommendations on what we should do uh, to improve the residential aged care sector in this country, in fact, including the home care sector. Uh, we are watching that process very closely. Uh, our officials engage with the Commission on a regular basis. They continue to issue papers, including one that they issued this morning with respect to quality indicators. Uh, and we will respond, as I have said and as the Prime Minister has said, to the Royal Commission. Uh, when it makes its recommendations. I acknowledge, the Prime Minister has acknowledged, uh, that's why we called the Royal Commission, that there are issues with residential and the aged care sector more broadly in this country. Clearly there are. That's why we called the Royal Commission. Uh, we look forward to its report when it reports on the 26th of February next year. Uh, and the objective that I have, and I know that the Prime Minister has, is for us to make a significant uh, response to that Royal Commission report in our budget next year. So that's the timeline that we have. We acknowledge that there's additional funding that's requ required for this sector, uh, and we've, we have, we have uh, invested significantly in this sector since uh, in the last two budgets, in excess of, say, $3 billion for 50,000 home care Time places. for the answer has expired. Senator see what a supplementary question. Thank you. On Friday at the COVID committee hearing into aged care, you said that no country in the world has avoided COVID-19 outbreaks in aged care facilities. Does that mean that Australia doesn't have to try harder to prevent further outbreaks? Minister, don't you agree that Australia should be aiming to do better than the UK, Canada and the US where so many people have died in aged care. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Mr. President, and thanks, Senator Seward, for the supplementary question. Uh, what I said was that where there has been significant community transmission, there has been COVID-19 outbreaks in residential aged care everywhere in the world. Uh, and with respect to your comments about a number of other countries, we actually are doing better than all of those significantly better than all of those. In fact, our circumstance with respect to infections in residential aged care as a, 
uh, number of residents and uh, or more deaths as a proportion of, of aged care places is 35 times better than the UK. It is 35 times Order. better than the UK. In fact, we're doing better than all of those Order. countries. Senator, we are I've one of the best Senator in the Colbeck, world I've got in respect Senator of Senator residential. Colbeck. Please resume your seat. I've got Senator Cormann on a point of order. Uh, th thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. On a point of order, uh, interjections are always disorderly, but they're particularly disorderly when they're complaining about a min minister answering the question that was asked in a way that is directly relevant to the question that in was asked. Interjections are always disorderly. I was calling the chamber to order, and I thank you for helping me remind the chamber, Senator Cormann. Senator Colbeck. Mr. Mr. President, and and. As I've said a number of times today, every single death in residential aged care is a tragedy. I again offer my condolences to every family who's lost a family member. That's why we have worked since Order. the outset Senator of Colbeck, this pandemic the to mitigate the opportunities for aid. Senator Seward, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. In August, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission undertook 74 spot checks in Victoria and 41 spot checks in New South Wales. Minister, through you, President, will you guarantee that the government will undertake an, an audit of every aged care facility in this country to ensure that they are fully prepared and we don't see the same sort of outbreaks that we have just seen in Victoria? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, throughout this pandemic, the government has continued to work with, closely with the residential aged care sector to provide them with information with advice, with funding, to assist them to mitigate the entry of uh, COVID-19 into residential aged care and to assist them to deal with it, if it does. We've done that on a consistent basis, and we will continue to do that. This morning we released the new March report, which I provided directly to every single aged care provider in the country. Uh, we've already implemented a lot of the learnings from new March in our response in Victoria. We continue to do that. And we continue to work with residential aged care providers across the country, including a decision out of National Cabinet last Friday, where we will be working through the Quality and Safety Commissioner with states to look to visit every provider, in, commencing in, Victoria, in Tasmania and Queensland, to ensure that their systems are up to speed. Uh, and if we find a, a, an Order, opportunity Senator for improvement, Colbeck, we'll time push for the for answer that. has expired. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. On 12 April, Minister Colbeck declared he had planned for, and I quote, worst case scenarios. Given 335 older Australians in aged care have now tragically died from COVID-19, does the minister believe Australia is now beyond the worst case scenario? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Wong, for the question. Uh, in the context of residential aged care nationally, uh, we, we are in a relatively good position, given that uh, nearly over 80 per cent of the facilities in this country haven't contracted a case of COVID-19. We've, we've been very fortunate. We have been very fortunate. Uh, well, Senator. Uh, thank you for the interjection, uh, but as I've said a number of times, every death of, from COVID-19 in an aged care facility, every death from COVID-19 is an absolute tragedy. Every death. And uh, I, I again offer my condolences to all of them. Uh, but th this government has, since January, worked extremely closely with the sector to provide it with the advice and the resources to assist it to manage the COVID-19 outbreak. Have we got it right all the time? No, we haven't. And I've acknowledged that. But we continue, as we learn about this virus, which didn't exist before November last year, as we learn more about the virus, we learn more about the way it spreads, and we learn more about the measures that we need to take, we continue to implement those. And we are still learning, Mr President. We are still learning. We are still talking to the AHPPC about what more what we might do. We are still discussing at national cabinet level what more we might do so that we can continue to provide quality care and protect senior Australians who are in residential aged care and home care from the scourge of this terrible virus, 
which, when it gets into that age cohort, has absolutely devastating results. And that's what we will continue to do. We will continue to invest, we will continue to learn, uh, and we'll continue to work closely with the sector as we've done right through the pandemic. Senator Wong, supplementary question. On the 7th of July, this minister declared that his aged care system had, and I quote, responded incredibly well. Incredibly well. Given that 335 Australians have now tragically died from COVID-19 in aged care, does he still believe the Morrison government has, re has responded incredibly well? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I said that the aged care sector had responded with uh, incredibly well, which is what was in the initial part of Senator Wong's question. Uh, and, and we've worked very closely and we've worked very hard, taking the advice of the medical professionals in the AHPPC to provide advice to the sector. Uh, and the subcommittees of the AHPP3, AHPPC, the CDNA, who have provided guidance updated now on three occasions to the sector. Uh, I think the sector have done well. We've been fortunate in this country. We've been extremely f fortunate that the front line of our defences, which were, the, which were closing our borders early, including to China, setting up our um, national COVID-19 health response, has been largely effective. We didn't expect that the systems in Victoria would fall down in the way that they did. But as, as that's occurred, Mr. President, as that's occurred, we've continued Order. to respond Senator Colbert, and to build time our for the response. answer has expired. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Today, the minister has dismissed concerns about his performance, saying that we're doing better than almost any other country. Dismissed concerns, saying that Australia is in a relatively good position. Isn't this just yet another example of the very arrogance and hubris in the Morrison government when it comes to aged care that the Royal Commission referred to? That the Royal Commission referred to arrogance and hubris. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And I completely reject the premise of the question from Senator Wong. She can try and verbal me, she can try and put words in my mouth, uh, but I don't have to accept it. We have continued, we have continued to work closely. Order, Senator Cormann, on a point of order. Uh, interjections are always You're reading my the mind, of the opposition should be aware of this, and it's, this is an issue that deserves to be treated uh, appropriately, and, and I, I would ask you to call Senator Wong to order. Interjections are always disorderly. I would add that, regardless of the matters being discussed, Senator, Senator Cormann. Uh, Senator Wong is interjecting even on the president. That is even yes. more disorderly, it's not, you, as you are speaking. We haven't been here for a while. It's not the best way to start a couple of weeks. I ask people to restrain their urge to interject, uh, as it's always disorderly. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. So, in, so in rejecting the premise of Senator Wong's question, uh, I note and I commit this government to continue to working with the sector, continuing to learn about the virus, continuing to take the health advice from the health professionals within the AHPPC and its subcommittees in the CDNA to ensure and, and continuing to invest where it is needed to ensure that senior Australians in residential aged care continue to uh, be protected from the virus. And we work with, yeah. we work with state governments on the public health response to ensure that we, re we reduce as much as possible the community transmission that is the source of infections. Thank you. And today being a day for firsts, I will be calling our first question virtually. Um, and I call Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. Can you hear me? It's all good, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Birmingham, representing the Minister for Energy. I commissioned the highly respected economist, Dr. Alan Moran, to review government economic and energy data and to calculate the true cost of climate policies and so-called renewable energy. He delivered his report to me last week, and a copy has been sent to every member of federal parliament, including Senator Birmingham and the Minister for Energy. Dr Moran's work cannot be sensibly refuted since he uses the government's own data that used to be published in a consolidated form until the cost of intermittent solar and wind energy sources became so embarrassingly and devastatingly high. Is the minister aware that the true cost of climate policies on households through electricity prices 
is a staggering $1,300 per household per year. The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Senator Ryan. And I, 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 um, Order. And, uh, and I thank uh, Senator Roberts for his uh, historic question, at least, in, uh, in that sense. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr President, um, in relation to, uh, to the report that uh, Senator Roberts references uh, by Dr Moran, I have not seen a copy of that report. It may well have been uh, sent to my office, and, uh, and uh, I and I'm sure the Minister for Energy uh, will find an opportunity to uh, review that work uh, at an appropriate time. Uh, in terms of the questions of energy prices, uh, Mr. President, uh, our government uh, is certainly determined to continue our work to reduce energy prices wherever we possibly can. Uh, since July last year, we put in place our price safety net to cap standing offer prices in the energy market. And for residential customers who were on the highest standing offers uh, before 1 July last year, uh, they could well be better off by up to $666 per annum in New South Wales, $590 in South Australia or $725 in, uh, in South East Queensland in Senator Roberts's home state. These reforms are making tangible differences to, uh, to household energy prices and are bringing them down. Our introduction uh, of a reference price uh, requiring retailers to advertise offers in a way that's transparent and easy to compare has, according to the ACCC, seen the cheapest market offer as at September last year, some $290 to $355 lower uh, in New South Wales, $262 lower in South East Queensland, $330 lower in South Australia. Indeed, average wholesale electricity prices as well in the national electricity market in the first quarter of this year were the lowest since the fourth quarter of 2016. Our reforms are making a difference in terms of energy price at the wholesale level and the retail level. Order, we will Senator continue Birmingham. To work to reduce um, before I call Senator Roberts, can I ask senators to maintain silence just until we get the volume levels right so we can all hear Senator Roberts um, ask this supplementary question? Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. Is the minister aware that the true cost of so called climate policies and renewable energy on household electricity bills is not the 6.5 per cent that government reports? It is a whopping and devastating 39 per cent. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. As I said in, uh, in my answer to the primary question, uh, I've not reviewed Dr Moran's uh, report and I'm not aware that, uh, that uh, Minister Taylor or his department have done so uh, either. Uh, our focus continues to be as a government to get uh, energy prices down whilst meeting our emissions reduction obligations, whilst also ensuring reliability in the energy markets. And uh, we are recording achievements across all of those three spheres in terms of meeting our emissions reduction obligations and commitments that we make as a country, uh, improving and delivering more reliability uh, in the energy grid uh, despite some of the challenges there have been previously. Uh, and as I was outlining before, getting prices down at a wholesale level, at a retail level, for households, for businesses. The ABS tells us we've seen reductions in the national average retail price over the last year. That benefits both households and businesses. And the AER has shown in a recent report that high standing offers have been eliminated. These are tangible differences Order. flowing through Senator in Birmingham. electricity bills for Australia. Time a for the answer has expired. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. On average, your government incentivises $8 billion of incentives each year for malinvestment in parasitic green energy projects. That results in a net loss of jobs in the economy. Analysis of Spain's experience indicates that with every green subsidised job, 2.2 real jobs are lost. With over 1 million Australians losing their job and unemployment rising due to COVID-19, shouldn't the government be stimulating job creation, not job losses? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. And uh, look, I, uh, I assure Senator Roberts, as I do uh, every member of this chamber and indeed every Australian, that our government is working as hard as we can uh, to create jobs uh, to help Australia out of the economic disaster created uh, by this pandemic. Uh, our work in terms of supporting and sustaining jobs throughout the pandemic through programs like JobKeeper uh, has been recognised as world-leading. Uh, our effort in terms of deploying other policies, such as the 
home builder program to head off potential declines in the construction industry, uh, our effort to support the creative arts sector uh, by attracting uh, more production into Australia and, uh, and supporting job generation and creation there. Our efforts in terms of skills investment uh, that Senator Cash is, uh, is leading to make sure that Australians who may not have work at present are able to retrain for the future is all about creating jobs and helping Australians to get back into the employment market Order, as Senator we recover. Birmingham. Senator Molan. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, Senator Payne. Uh, Senator Payne, through you, uh, Mr. President, the explosion in Beirut was a shocking and distressing event that, it's right, that has rightly mobilised the international community. Can the minister detail Australia's support to the people of Lebanon in the wake of the shocking explosion on the 4th of August? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Molan very much for, uh, for his question. Uh, many Australians have been deeply saddened by the catastrophic explosion uh, in Beirut, and our thoughts and sympathies go to all those affected by the tragedy, uh, both here and in Lebanon, and most particularly to the family and the loved ones of Australian toddler Isaac Ola, uh, who tragically died in the blast. Uh, soon after the explosion, Mr. President, uh, Australia was able to announce uh, uh, $5 million in humanitarian assistance, which is being provided through international organisations, uh, particularly the World Food Programme, the Red Cross, Red Crescent Movement and the United Nations Children's Fund. Uh, we have also delivered urgently needed humanitarian supplies pre-positioned at the UN Humanitarian Response Depot in Dubai and provided, to in, and provided those to NGO partners leading the response in Beirut. Uh, on Friday, the 14th of August, a Dubai-based uh, ADF C-130 delivered mobile warehouses to help replace critical storage facilities destroyed in the blast, and also shelter kits and tools for the uh, up to 300,000 people left homeless. And then last Friday, the ADF completed a second delivery of addition, additional shelter materials, and I acknowledge uh, the support of those personnel to affect uh, those deliveries. Those supplies were chosen after consultation with the humanitarian organisations that are leading the response in Beirut and certainly targeted to fill the gaps and meet the most urgent needs. Uh, we'll continue to work with other international donors on possible further support. And our support will be based, Mr President, on need, on our ability to provide assistance in a timely manner and also on what other countries are already doing uh, in the context of the, uh, of the international response in particular. Senator Molan, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline what support the government has provided to Australians affected by this tragedy? Senator Payne. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. The Australian Embassy itself in Beirut was significantly damaged uh, in the blast. Uh, fortunately, some minor, unfortunately, only minor injuries were uh, experienced by staff, and uh, we appreciate the support provided to them to, to address those injuries. Uh, I don't, however, underestimate, Mr. President, the psychological challenge that is uh, accompanied by the experience that those staff had, have had, and I acknowledge uh, the ambassador and her team for the very professional work that they are doing. They have been working constantly to help Australians, and we deployed additional staff as well to Beirut to assist in the response. Uh, our staff are providing consular assistance working actively to identify opportunities for Australians in Beirut to depart, uh, particularly in terms of the current incoming passenger restrictions, which does make that harder. Uh, they're providing many essential services, including the provision of emergency passports, and also continuing to make inquiries of local authorities. There are many dual nationals uh, always in, uh, in Beirut, in Lebanon more broadly, and for any further support that may be required to people in Order, those circumstances. Senator, Senator Mollen, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Australia's Lebanese community has, has responded with great humanity to the incident. How has the government been engaging with the Lebanese community? Senator Payne. Thank you very much. Mr. President, there has certainly been an outpouring of support from Australia's Lebanese community. Uh, it's admirable. It reminded us of the close relationship between our two countries, particularly uh, through the almost a quarter of a million Australians of Lebanese heritage. Uh, since the uh, explosion, the government has convened a series of, uh, of special teleconference meetings with leaders of the Le Australian Lebanese community. Uh, Minister Tudge and I attended one of those meetings, Minister Hawke uh, another. They've been very important chances to both convey our 
condolences, Mr. President, and to listen to the community's priorities uh, as they are um, applied here in uh, Australia and also for family and extended uh, um, co contacts in Lebanon. For any Australians who uh, wish to help, we do encourage them to provide a cash donation to trusted organisations that are delivering this urgently needed humanitarian assistance. Uh, we're working with the Lebanese community on the best mechanisms to uh, achieve this uh, and certainly thank them for the, commi for the commitment that they Order. are bringing to the task. Senator Payne. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian Senator Colbeck. Minister, who is responsible for aged care? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. The responsibility for uh, funding aged care, predominantly funding aged care, and and also the administrative oversight of the uh, of the aged care sector. The regulatory framework for the aged care sector rests with the Commonwealth Government. Senator Urquhart, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Last week, the Premier of Tasmania said aged care is, and I quote, very clearly a federal responsibility in terms of funding and regulation. Is Premier Gutwin, Gutwin right or wrong? Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, I think that Premier Gutwin's statement just agreed with the answer that I gave to the primary answer. Senator Urquhart, a final <coughs> supplementary question. Can the minister confirm the government's own document released in February made clear the Australian government is responsible for protecting aged care residents by establishing and maintaining infection control guidelines and enforcing health care safety and quality standards? Senator Colbeck. As I said, Mr President, and I thank Senator Urquhart for the question, uh, the Australian government's responsible for the primary funding of residential aged care and its regulation. Uh, that's, that's, that's a clear statement, and I agree with that uh, in the context of the question. We are at the moment. Order. Senator Wong, on a point of order. I, I, I'm happy to sit down if the minister is going to get to the point. I had a point on direct relevance because Senator Urquhart put directly to the minister whether or not the Australian government was responsible for protecting residents through infection control guidelines, health, health care safety and quality standards. But he may, Mr President, I'm happy to withdraw it if he's going to get to that I'm point. I'm listening to the answer. I, I have to admit at this point I'm in no way willing to rule it's not directly relevant 18 seconds in. I, I do consider the material he was talking about to be relevant, but I'll continue to listen. Senator Colbeck. One of the more preemptive points of order I've heard, Mr President. Um, Mr President, so the, the Australian government, the Australian government is responsible Order. for the primarily responsible for funding and and regulation of the aged care sector, and part of that regulatory process is uh, a number of uh, standards for which aged care providers are responsible to meeting, and, and that includes management of infection control and, and a range of other other measures. There's 44 items in the standards that have to be complied with. Uh, and, and we regulate and assess all aged care providers across the, across the country to ensure that they do meet those standards. Order, and of Senator course, Colbert, we have processes to deal with them if they don't. Has expired. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Rustin. The egregious decision in 2011 by former Labor Minister for Agriculture, Joe Ludwig, to shut down our live cattle export industry overnight caused extreme hurt across the industry. It decimated the viability of productive and profitable businesses and destroyed communities and families, particularly across my Northern Territory and Queensland. Can the minister please provide an update to the Senate on the status of the Brett Cattle Company legal case? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And can I thank Senator McMahon for her uh, question um, and recognising the, the long-standing interest that you've had in this particular industry well before your time in this place. Um, and as Senator McMahon rightly um, notes, the impact on live exporters of the decision by the former Labor government in 2010 to overnight ban live exports had a massive, massive impact on Australia, but it particularly had a massive impact on the families and the communities 
right across the nation um, who were directly involved in this industry. On the 22nd of July this year, the federal government has made the decision and announced the decision that it would not be appealing the federal court case, which ruled in favour of the Brett Cattle Company. Losses and damages will be appropriately determined by the court because we believe that the prolonged pain and hardship that has been caused to this industry has gone on long enough. Because on this side of the chamber, we believe that the industry deserves certainty, we believe it deserves our support going forward, and that certainty has been denied this industry for some time now. The livelihoods of producers were just basically cut off overnight. Um, and our focus from here on has to be on supporting our farmers, our exporters and the people that support that industry, um, who are an absolute integral part of the Australian economy and never more importantly than they are now, along with our resources sector as one of the key pillars to get Australia um, and to support Australia through the, the, the absolute pain and devastation of this current COVID crisis. $1.7 billion industry to, um, that supports our economy, over 10,000 jobs um, with industry and associated industry. We as a government are absolutely strongly committed to supporting and growing the value of agriculture, and that includes our live export industry. We have a very strong record of doing it, and we will continue to do it. Um, this was jeopardised. We're going to fix that problem now. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister please outline the support the Liberals and Nationals government is providing to our cattle producers, particularly as they continue to manage through or recover from drought, floods and the impacts of COVID-19? Senator Rustin. Very much, and thank you, Senator McMahon. Um, this government is absolutely 100 per cent committed to supporting our farmers, and that includes our live cattle producers. Um, this government has committed over $10 billion across the country to support uh, drought response and recovery and preparedness actions following the 2019 floods, uh, and we also committed $3.3 billion in additional support measures. The National Drought and Northern Queensland Flood Response and Recovery Agency made available $300 million in grants to support restocking and replanting as well as rebuilding on-farm infrastructure that was damaged. This funding is helping all agriculture, but particularly our cattle producers, to get back on their feet because we know when they're back on their feet they do great things for the Australian economy. We understand there will be another drought, Senator McMahon, which is why we put in place the Permanent Drought Fund so that we can provide $100 million a year during drought years to make sure that we're prepared and we're resilient to the impacts of droughts when they inevitably occur in the future. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister please outline to the Senate the importance of the live animal export industry to Australia and our efforts to ensure extremely high standards of animal welfare. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, live exports in this country are underpinned by very strong regulation that supports good animal welfare outcomes. We have a framework in place which focuses continually on making sure that we improve and to make sure that the industry meets the community's expectations. There are standards for things like vessel preparation, uh, sourcing, loading, onboard management uh, of livestock, making sure that things like ventilation, drainage, stock densities and the provision of food and water to, to our animals on these vessels is absolutely first class. We always make sure that there's an accredited stock person on board the ship and in many instances there's a veterinarian as well. Um, the framework also includes processes to investigate when a situation does occur uh, and there is an incident. But we need to remember the overwhelming number of voyages that leave Australia with live animals on board are undertaken without any incident at all. Um, the government absolutely condemns, absolutely condemns cruelty to animals, and that's why we're putting place Senator a world class. Senator Billick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Today, the Aged, Royal Care, the, the Aged Care Royal Commissioners, the Honourable Tony Pagone QC and Ms Linnell Briggs AO said, and I quote, had the Australian government acted upon previous reviews of aged care, the persistent problems in aged care would have been known much earlier and the suffering of many people could have been avoided. How many of the 335 aged care recipients who have died from COVID-19 would be alive if the minister had acted upon previous reviews? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbert. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I wouldn't like to speculate on that as a as a figure. Uh, one of the reasons that we called the Royal Commission, Mr. President, is that um, successive governments, and I think this has been uh, also stated by uh, commissioners, successive governments have have uh, not acted as they perhaps could have done with respect to aged care, uh, and there is and there is clearly work that needs Order. to be done, Mr. President. Order. And so, I, I, I don't seek, I don't, I don't seek to draw a correlation between those many reports that have been done into the aged care sector before I came to the portfolio. I don't seek to draw that correlation. I again offer my condolences to every single one of those. To, I, I offer my condolences to every single one of the families who have lost a loved one through COVID-19 to the Royal Commission, uh, to, to COVID-19, uh, Mr. President. I, but I don't seek to draw that correlation. The Royal Commission has. I acknowledge that, uh, but I don't seek to do that. Uh, but I, what I do say, Mr. President, is that from the Order. outset of this pandemic, from the outset of this pandemic, this government, through firstly its public health response through the National Health COVID-19 Response Plan and its engagement with the aged care sector have worked continuously to provide advice to the sector on how they can mitigate the entry of COVID-19 into aged care facilities and also, if it does, there, does, does get into, the sec into an aged care facility, to protect the residents within, within the facility and also the resources to do that. And we will continue to do that. We've learned a lot about this virus uh, over the last uh, 12 months. Uh, we will continue to learn because Order. there is still Senator more Colbeck, to learn. Senator time for the answer has expired. Senator Billick, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Council assisting the Aged Care Royal Commission said that, and I quote, neither the Commonwealth Department of Health nor the Aged Care Regulator developed a COVID-19 plan specifically for the aged care sector. How many of the 335 aged care recipients who have died from COVID-19 would be alive if the minister had planned to protect them. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I reject the premise of the question, uh, and I've, I've, I reject the premise of Senator Billick's question. Order. We have worked closely with the aged care Order, sector, Senator Watt. as we've learnt more about this virus, and we've continued to provide advice to the sector and the resources that they've required without limit, without Order. limit as, we've, as the pandemic has progressed. And we will continue to do that, Mr President. We will continue to do that. The Age PPC continues to provide advice. Uh, the, the CDNA continues to provide advice. And we have acted on the advice of the health professionals all the way through this pandemic and the resources that go with it, Mr. President, and the resources that go with it. Over $1 billion we've allocated to the aged care sector to support them and assist them to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic, which is racking the world. Senator Billick, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. 335 aged care recipients have died from COVID-19. How many more aged care residents have to die before the Prime Minister accepts full responsibility for keeping them safe. Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. And every single one of those 385, 35, every one of those 335 deaths is an absolutely is an absolute tragedy. Every single one of those deaths is a tragedy. Absolute tragedy. And again, my condolences to all of their families. We are dealing here, Mr President, with a global pandemic, where we have, in this country, through our whole of government response, through the COVID-19 health pandemic plan, done exceptionally well. But of course, we haven't, nobody is immune from the virus. None of us are immune from the virus. And until we get, if we get, a vaccine, then we will continue to be susceptible. Uh, and we will continue to do, as we have done all through the pandemic, 
everything that we possibly can to support this sector. Order, Senator Colbeck. Time for the answer has expired. Senator, order on my left. Order on my left. Senator Henderson. I thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is informing families at risk of violence about the support services that are available, especially during these difficult times resulting from COVID-19? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And can I thank Senator Henderson for her question and her ongoing interest uh, in um, making sure that we have the settings right to try and prevent domestic violence from happening before it even starts. Um, but the national campaign, Help Is Here, is a campaign that we launched in May this year. Uh, it's funded through the $150 million um, domestic violence uh, package that uh, was announced. Uh, this extra funding is absolutely directed in making sure that anybody who might be at risk of, uh, of domestic violence knows what support is available to them and where they're able to get those services. The Help Is Here campaign reaches Australians through a number of different ways. Uh, it's through the internet, in their homes, obviously on the television, but most importantly in places like shopping centres, uh, magazines and newspapers, where people who may actually be at greater risk are often by themselves. The main uh, two forms are through the 1800 Respect hotline and the dedicated men's line. The campaign uniquely uh, reflects the challenges of the coronavirus pandemic by recognising that during the pandemic, some people at risk of domestic violence may not be able to leave their house apart from perhaps to go shopping. The Help Is Here campaign aims to reach uh, victims of domestic violence and abuse through the restrooms in shopping centres to make sure that they know where they can ring if they need to get some help if they are finding themselves in difficult times. By directing people to the national hotlines uh, and through the partnership networks that we have, we provide assistance 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so people can know that they can go online or onto the phone and speak to a trained counsellor um, from these particular initiatives that are being funded. I also want to thank the private sector for coming on board with this particular initiative um, with the campaign for Help Is Here, Channel 7, the major supermarket chains, as well as Amazon. And can I also acknowledge the work of the states and territories to which we've provided $130 million to support them in their frontline service provision. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Minister, what evidence is available to demonstrate the campaign is reaching Australians at risk of violence and providing them with the necessary support and information services? Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I'm really pleased to say that the evaluation research results have shown that more than half Australians, when surveyed, had uh, recognised, remembered the campaign, and acknowledged that they had seen it. Uh, and this is really important because increased awareness means that people will know automatically uh, where they can get the support should they find themselves in need of it. Um, as an example, in the middle of this year, uh, the 1800 Respect hotline uh, had received um, 86,000 contacts in the three-month period leading up to the 30th of July 2020. In the same time last year, they had received around 55,000 um, calls in the same period, a significant increase. The men's line also indicated that they had received an increase in calls. Um, we know uh, that more Australians know there is support out there, and that is a good thing, because we want them to know that they are not alone and the support services are there for them if they find themselves in a situation of needing them. And I would encourage anybody who finds themselves in a difficult situation to reach out to one of these two Order. hotlines for Senator support. Senator Rustin. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. I thank you, Mr President. Minister, it is good to hear Australians are reaching out for help. Can you please explain how the government is ensuring that vulnerable communities are getting the support they need as part of this campaign? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, well, this campaign has targeted everybody who is in Australia. We want to try and reach them by as many different means as possible, whether it be through the internet, through normal uh, channels like television and radio, in shopping centres, magazines, newspapers. Uh, because we want them to know that the national, um, two national hotlines are available to them. But most importantly, um, to make sure that people who uh, don't speak English as their first language, uh, and also making sure that we reach out to our Indigenous Australians to make sure that our advice is provided in an appropriate way. 
Um, so for our vulnerable communities, uh, the campaign materials have been tailored. Uh, for instance, in cold communities, we've translated our advertising materials into 14 different languages so that the audiences will be able to get access to the Help Is Here information. Uh, we've also worked with Indigenous mentors and Indigenous domestic violence survivors to prepare for distribution appropriate material uh, for news outlets uh, and specifically with the channels um, of distribution that they're most likely to use. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on a notice paper. Well, Senator Colby. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. I committed during question time to provide some information for Senator Keneally with respect to um, Epping Gardens, and I just do want to confirm that there are 126 facilities in Australia with an active case. They are all in Victoria. Um, Epping Gardens, uh, from the information that I've been given, had its first indication of an outbreak on the 19th of July. Um, uh, and uh, these are DHHS figures, which actually count uh, contacts or um, that are not part of the facility, so they're not staff or residents. I indicated that I didn't think there were any with more than 100 resident out in, uh, residents in an outbreak. Epping Gardens, in fact, had 100 residents that were infected. It had 82 staff, uh, and uh, there are what DHS, DHHS uh, classify as 29 other. Now, I don't know what the other means at this point in time. That's a DHHS um, classification which we are working through the Victorian Aged Care Recovery Centre to properly define. We believe it means family members and other contacts of, um, uh, of the infection at the facility. Thank you, Minister. Are there any motions? Oh. You're not seeking the call. Okay. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Labor Senators today. Well, nothing worked well from the outbreak. I thought we were prepared. Nothing prepared us for what was to come. I couldn't believe this was happening in my country. These are just some of the words from the Commonwealth Review into the new March House COVID-19 outbreak released today. That outbreak happened in April, some four months ago, and 19 older Australians died. Before that, there were warnings from overseas about the devastating impact of COVID in, in aged care. The alarm bells were ringing, Madam Deputy President, but the Morrison government was not listening. Today's report on New March House confirms that as do the answers we heard from Senator Colbeck, that the aged care minister, Senator Colbeck, and the Morrison government did not have a plan in place to manage the COVID outbreaks in aged care in Australia. As we heard in question time today, 335 aged care recipients have passed away from COVID-19. There have been 1,761 COVID-19 cases in aged care. Each one of these numbers is a real person. It is somebody's mother or father. It is somebody's grandmother or grandfather. It is somebody's spouse, someone's life partner. These are some of Australia's most precious citizens. These are people who helped build the nation, who fought for it in several world wars, who worked and built communities, raised families, created jobs, were part of their church or their local service and organizations. And these older Australians are dying at home alone. They're dying in residential homes, aged care homes, alone. They are lucky if they get to hold the hand of a staff member in aged care. I mean, let's just imagine what kind of death we are talking about, because I sometimes think there is a perception that old people simply pass away. And perhaps that is a perception you could take from the lack of a response and a lack of a plan from the Morrison government. But old people don't just simply die. This is a highly contagious disease that attacks older Australians in residential aged care when there was not a plan in place to manage infection control, when there was not a plan in place to replace workforce when they got sick, when there was not a plan in place for protective equipment. And these older Australians who are vulnerable to this disease got sick and they're dying alone. And let's understand what kind of death that is. 
I heard one of the adult children of a woman who died in St. Basil's describe on, on radio that experience of having to watch his mother's death at a distance, of not being able to hold her hand or touch her. Can you imagine being in the last moments of your life and not being able to touch your children? Can you imagine watching your mother or father die just feet from you, maybe through a window, through a mask, and not being able to hug them in the last moments of their existence? Can you imagine your husband or your wife on their deathbed, and you can't even hold their hand in comfort. That's what kind of death this is. And we should not be surprised that our aged care homes were unable to cope with this, because if you look at the report handed down by the interim, the interim report handed down by the Royal Commission into Aged Care, that report is called neglect. It's not called compassionate care. It's not called preparedness. It's not called living with dignity in your old age. It is called neglect. Neglect. It talks about our senior citizens, our moms and dads, our grandparents and, grand and aunts and uncles in aged care homes with open sores and physical abuse and malnourishment, lack of infection control, whether we're talking about diarrhea or COVID-19. And I just want to pay tribute right here to the aged care frontline workers. I have met many of them. Many of them, they know, they're in my, I've met them and they're in tears, some of them, because they know they don't have the time or the resources or the support to give the care that they know that their residents need. And they're distressed too. They're on the front line of this outbreak too. The fact that we have a minister who hasn't engaged fully enough with this crisis in aged care from the handing down of a report called Neglect, through to last Friday when he didn't know the answers to basic questions, through to question time today. We need a plan and we need it today. We needed it yesterday, we need it tomorrow, we need it right now to look after our senior citizens in aged care. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. No one could help but be moved to think about how difficult it must be to be someone facing the end of their lives, unable to be with their families, unable to have the comfort and support of the people with whom they have travelled the journey of life. I can speak from experience. Um, early on during the aged care um, impacts of COVID-19, I lost my grandfather and it was very difficult not to be able to be with him in the last moments of his life. He's a man I loved. He immigrated to this country from Austria. He built a life here. He came with very few skills. He was a um, person who worked in the textile factories at the time he emigrated and by the time um, he finished his career he was a foreman at Kimberley Clark making the nappies that I suspect my children wore <laughs> um, for the many years of them being small and he was a thoroughly good man but he died alone. None of the criticisms that are being levelled by those opposite are, in a logical sense, truly connected to my experience of loss or the experience of loss that many other Australians have undergone in recent times, as we have all, as a nation, had to adapt to the difficulty of the restrictions that come with COVID-19. It's hard even now for people with a loved one in aged care not to be able to give them the usual support and care that they ordinarily uh, would give with love as an expression of gratitude for the many gifts that that older person has given throughout the course of their life. It remains difficult, but it's also reflective of the collective sacrifices that Australians from all walks of life are making as we attempt to get under control a virus that is ravaging the world 
It's ravaging people's health. It's ravaging our economy. And it's having knock-on consequences for communities everywhere. And so to acknowledge the hardship that comes from this difficult time is a very different thing to trying to pretend that this is all about the minister's um, role. The minister has stepped up enormously during a difficult time. There have been fast adaptations of a big industry to hardships that have been quite unprecedented. And those opposite who like to interject, um, you know, they like to make out they're a little bit holier than they are on the stuff. But this isn't just me talking. This isn't me. I, look, I take that interjection because we, we can't allow these kinds of misinformations to stand. Deputy Chief Medical Officer Dr Nick Coatsworth is on the record with this. He says, allegations that the government lacked urgency when helping aged care homes to battle coronavirus are insulting. Insulting, that's what you're doing. You're insulting the aged care workers who have tried so hard to adapt to the challenge of this time. And similarly, he has said, the first thing to say is that there were many words used in the Royal Commission witness statements that he was referring to there that don't reflect the totality of the government's response, both at federal and state level, to pre preventing deaths in aged care. And here's, here's the guts of it. This is a virus that disproportionately affects the aged in our community. That's not a statement of futility. That's a statement of fact. Now, that's a direct quote from him. You can, you can cast arrows at me all you like, but that is a statement of fact from a man of science who understands how viruses like this work. It's very easy to throw political arrows over this side and try and claim a scalp or two or try and string up a minister to blame, but ultimately this is the nature of the virus and we are doing everything that can possibly be done to get it under control so that people in our community, people like my family, don't have to experience the death of a loved Thank one Thank you, alone. Senator Stoker. Your time has expired. Senator Polly. Thank you, Deputy President. Four failed ministers in a third-term Liberal government. First appointment was the former Senator Mitch Fifield, had no interest at all in aged care. Then we had uh, Susan Lay, the current uh, minister who's back in the ministry, had no interest in aged care. Then we had Minister Ken Wright, who had no capacity to deliver anything in terms of reform of the aged care sector. And now we have Senator Colbeck. Well, what an embarrassment for this government. Aged care was always going to be in trouble when this virus hit this country. There is nothing new there because this government has not had a minister that was interested enough to make sure there were plans in place. This didn't suddenly hit Australia before anywhere else. This pandemic was known. And we already knew because we'd had 14 reports into the aged care sector during the terms of this government telling us each and every one of them the problems that we had through lack of resource, lack of training, lack of staff, lack of money. This Prime Minister when he was treasurer, ripped a billion dollars out of the aged care sector. He used the aged care sector as an ATM machine. No wonder the sector couldn't cope when the COVID-19 hit. Now there's fantastic staff and good providers in this sector, and I take my hat off to them each and every day when they're doing the best that they can. But for the Prime Minister to make a commitment after the last election that he was going to make aged care a priority, he is accountable and he must be held responsible for the issues and the crisis in the aged care sector now. But we know the Prime Minister. He doesn't want any accountability. He certainly doesn't want any transparency. And he's standing by his man. Well, this minister has failed older Australians miserably. Even today, 
in the chamber. He still couldn't get the figure right. He still couldn't get the figure correct. 385 older Australians, he said, died. The figure is 335. Now, he's a minister under pressure. We do understand that. We do. But older Australians and their family deserve so much more, so much more. We knew that this COVID-19, when it hit our shores, of course, older Australians, we know they're some of the most vulnerable in the community to be susceptible to this virus. But when a, a sector such as the aged care sector was already in crisis, this is a government who called a royal commission into its own failings. They already knew that the sector was in crisis and they did nothing about it. So to have a minister, a junior minister, being responsible for the aged care sector is unacceptable. When we were in last in government, and bearing in mind this is the third term of this government, we held aged care in the priority that it should be by having a cabinet minister. We have been calling on each and every Liberal government since then to elevate aged care into the cabinet, but they have failed to do that. What they have done is used it as a cash cow and ripped a billion dollars out by the Prime Minister when he held the portfolio of Treasury. We know they've been underfunding it. We know that there's been in excess of 14 reports since they've come to government, and each and every one of those has given us the warnings. There's red lights going flashing all the time. Not enough staff, not enough resources. Money being ripped out. It needs to be regulated. We need to have national training. We need to ensure that there's uniformity across this country. Now we have been told time and time again. Now they must have realised there were some issues when they called the Royal Commission. We've had the interim report, and what have we seen? No real action from this government. What they want to do is use that Royal Commission as an excuse. Well, the Australian people are not going to accept it. One of the good things about calling this Royal Commission was it got the media interested and the Australian people are interested. Now is the time for the Prime Minister Thank to step you, up Senator and Polly, to your act. Time has expired. Senator Carr. I beg your pardon, Senator Scar. <laughs> it's a big difference, Madam Deputy President. Absolutely. We're both nice guys but different philosophy. Uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, I know one of those 335 who have passed away in our residential aged care facilities. Uh, my great auntie Edie uh, passed away in New South Wales. She did not deserve to go the way she did, but she did, like another 334, and my thoughts and prayers are with every single family who has lost someone in these circumstances, whether or not in an aged care facility or otherwise. I would first like to compliment the minister on facing the dogged questioning from the opposition over the course of question time. Every single question was put to the minister during the course of question time, and he faithfully gave answers to each and every question. And he started his answer to the first question by noting his deep regret that last Friday he was not able to provide the figures which had been asked for. And I have no doubt, knowing the minister as I know him, that that apology was heartfelt, it was sincere, it was genuine and it was given with great dignity. Those listening to this debate would be excused for thinking that all of the responsibility with respect to aged care falls at the minister's feet. The answer is very, very different. I refer to the coronavirus disease 2019 COVID-19 outbreaks in residential care facilities national guidelines, which were adopted under the auspices of the Communicable Diseases Network Australia. And that document sets out the actual responsibilities for each of the stakeholders in aged care. And I just want to give a summary of those responsibilities, because if you were listening to this debate, you would think the sole person responsible was Minister Colbeck. And that is simply untrue. First, residential care facilities, and I quote from the guidelines, the primary responsibility of managing COVID-19 outbreaks 
lies with the residential care facilities in their responsibility for resident care and infection control. All residential care facilities should have access to infection control expertise, whether in-house or not, and outbreak management plans in place. And I'll repeat those words. The primary responsibility of managing COVID-19 outbreaks lies with the residential care facilities. And these are guidelines. These are guidelines that were accepted by the entire industry. These are the industry's guidelines. The primary responsibility lies with the residential care facilities. Then next, state, territory, departments of health. State, territory, public health sections in departments of health will act in an advisory role to assist residential care facilities to detect, characterise and manage COVID-19 outbreaks. This includes assisting facilities to confirm outbreaks, providing advice and obtaining testing samples, providing guidance on outbreak management, monitoring the severity of illness, and so it goes on. So those are responsibilities of the state, territory, departments of health. And I'll come to the Australian Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. Its responsibility is as the national regulator of aged care services. And then the Australian Government Department of Health for residential aged care facilities that receive funding from the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth will work collaboratively with the overall management of the response to support the viability and capacity of the residential care facilities to access services. And the Commonwealth Government, under the, under the leadership of the, of the Minister, Minister Colbeck, has been doing exactly that. It has provided an additional $1 billion in funding. Just as recently as last Friday, it provided over an additional $171 million. Those are the roles and responsibilities of each of the players, the stakeholders in the aged care facility. And that was aged care facilities. That was the uh, observation also in the independent review that was released today, the final report dated 20 August 2020, into the new March House COVID-19 outbreak. And that responsibility of the residential care facilities was front and centre in that report. Appendix 1 contained a summary of key learnings, 1 through to 20, 20 key learnings, covering a diverse range of subjects. It is simply disingenuous. It is quite reprehensible in some respects in the circumstances to try and apportion all the blame onto Minister Colbeck. Thank you, Senator Scar. Your time has expired. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. This government has left vulnerable older Australians at risk and exposed to a deadly virus. But first, because we are talking about real people here, not numbers in daily reports, let me acknowledge the sad news that we are hearing out of Victoria about the significant number of deaths in aged care facilities. Our thoughts must be with every single person who has lost a loved one during this pandemic, and particularly, particularly those families who have loved ones in aged care facilities, some who are deeply worried and not getting news in a timely manner the way that they should. And we know that it's been an incredibly difficult few weeks for some of those families and their loved ones in some of these aged care facilities, particularly in Victoria. These are some of the most vulnerable Australians, and they deserve a government with a plan to keep them safe. We know that the warning bells were ringing in March, but nobody in the government was listening. We know that 335 residents have passed away, and there are more than 1,300 active cases. And yet the minister and the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, continue, and we heard it again just a moment ago in the contribution from the senator opposite, continue to pass the buck and the blame. It has been a disgraceful exercise to witness. The Morrison government is in charge of aged care. The Morrison government regulates aged care. It funds aged care. The Morrison government has the legislation that determines the quality of aged care that older Australians get. If things are not working, if systems are not working, the Morrison government is ultimately responsible for this. The buck stops with Scott Morrison and with this minister, this man who does not seem to have any kind of real grasp on what his job actually is. 
We saw just last Friday that Minister Colbeck couldn't even answer basic questions when questioned by the Select Committee on COVID-19 inquiry into the Australian government's response to the pandemic. The Australian public was genuinely stunned that he was not across the most basic and tragic facts. And his performance in this place today has done nothing, absolutely nothing, to give Australians confidence that he knows what his job is, that he has the capacity to lead, to assert the right that these Australians have to quality care, to protection from infection from a deadly pandemic, to communicate with their families and loved ones, to be cared for by a workforce that is adequately trained, has secure work, is adequately pays and goes to work each day in conditions that are safe. It's time for Scott Morrison and his Minister for Aged Care to be honest. They knew aged care facilities would struggle to find staff during a coronavirus outbreak, but they did nothing. They knew about the potential for a withdrawal of uh, staff at an aged care home because of coronavirus, but they did not do enough to prepare for this. Scott Morrison said on 29 July the events that have tragically occurred in Victorian aged care homes could not have been anticipated or foreshadowed, but his government was repeatedly warned that it could happen. It happened at Earlhaven over a year ago. It happened at Dorothy Henderson Lodge and Newmarch House months ago. And we stand in this chamber today with still no answer to the question. Why did Scott Morrison and his minister um, Urquhart, not have a— Senator Urquhart, I do remind you to refer to those in the other place by the correct Apologies. Title. Why did the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, and this minister not have a proper plan to deal with the loss of workforce in aged care homes? It is also tragically clear that the Morrison government's surge workforce has been inadequate to deal with outbreaks of coronavirus. We also found out that the Morrison government has spent just half, just half of the money that it set aside for a surge workforce meant to assist aged care homes impacted by coronavirus. This is completely unacceptable. The minister says we're still learning and we're in discussions. He seems utterly incapable of the leadership required to acknowledge the damage this government has wrought in our aged care sector and how a pandemic has served to reveal and deepen and shatter the structural cracks that we are already undermining it. Yet Mr Morrison says he has the full confidence in this incompetent Thank you, minister. Senator Urquhart. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion, as moved by Senator Keneally, to take note of answers from Senator Colbeck be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Um, Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers to my questions of Senator Colbeck um, on aged care. And we had the minister talking as if just because other countries had had outbreaks of COVID in residential aged care that maybe, we, maybe it was inevitable that it would happen here. Well, it wasn't, and it shouldn't have been inevitable that it happened here if we had a system that was set up to actually function properly. The fact is, is that we have had 35 reports over the last 40 years, nearly a report a year, into the failures in aged care and how it should be fixed. And the fact is, despite the minister saying all the other countries are worse, the fact is, according to the Royal Commission into Aged Care, the very Royal Commission that this government called, Australia has one of the highest rates in the world of residential aged care deaths as a proportion of deaths from COVID-19. That is quite shocking. That is quite shocking to the families that have lost loved ones in residential aged care during this pandemic. For years, and years, people that know what they're talking about have been calling for reform in aged care and, in particular, significant investment of resources. So today we saw that Professor Polaris has called and said that we need an investment of at least $3.5 billion 
into residential aged care. And what do we hear from the minister in answer to my questions? Was we've got to wait for the Royal Commission. Well, the fact is that these things are happening right now. We have insufficient workforce right now. We have insufficient practices right now. We are not seeing clinical care addressed. Just last year, I tabled in this, uh, in this place the uh, Community Affairs Committee report into aged care and, clinic, and in particular the focus on clinical care and highlighted the problems with clinical care being provided in to residential aged care facilities. And I maintain that if we'd started addressing those clinical care issues, that that's one of the things that we should have been addressing, uh, we, or we wouldn't need to address so much now, because we would have those things in place and could have dealt with the infectious disease control. We are still not providing, and, and we still have seen that all workers in residential aged care have not completed the most up-to-date infectious disease control. How can this be happening in this country? How can this be happening? Why haven't we been investing the money in our workforce that so many reports have so clearly shown that we need? We need to significantly invest in our aged care workforce so that we're providing the level of care four hours, 18 minutes that is recommended that we provide. Why aren't we doing urgently across this country so that we don't see the tragedy that has been unfolding in Victoria happen anywhere else, that, heaven forbid, there should be an outbreak of COVID somewhere else. Unless we are making sure that every residential aged care facility has actually been audited. We cannot, we cannot assure the Australian public that people living in residential aged care are safe. What did our regulator of aged care do? The Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. They sent out a form for self-assessment by these residences. And now people out there may be shocked to learn that most of those residential facilities said, yes, we're prepared. Those in Victoria said, yes, we are prepared. And yet look at the tragedy that we are seeing unfold in Victoria. It shows very clearly that we need a much heavy-handed heavy -handed approach in, I hate to say, but we do, in the regulation of aged care in this country. We need to beef up our Aged Care Safety and Quality Commission. At the moment, they've only had an additional 13 staff. That is nowhere near enough to deal with the issues that we need to be dealing with. This country expected that our residential aged care facilities would keep people's loved ones safe would keep our older Australians safe, and it has, failed, it has failed enormously. What we are seeing in Victoria could roll out anywhere else in the country unless we actually step up our workforce in all residential aged care facilities. We make sure all our, our workers are supported, that they don't have to go begging for additional support. These things are urgent. They can't wait to the Royal Commission reports. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Seawitt to take note of answers by Minister Colbeck be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. It is with deep regret. Oh, we'll now move on, and there's a condolence motion. So. It is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 17th of July 2020 of Dominic John Foreman, a senator for the state of South Australia from 1981 to 1997. And I call the leader of the government in the Senate. Senator. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of former Senator Dominic John Foreman. I'm not sure you need. Leave. Yes, you do. Yes, leave is granted. I thank the Senate. I move that the Senate records its deep sorrow at the death on 17 July 2020 of Dominic John Foreman, former Senator for South Australia, places on record its gratitude for his service to the Parliament and, uh, and the nation, uh, and tenders its profound sympathy to his family in their bereavement. Um, Madam Deputy President, Dominic Foreman came uh, into the Senate in October 1980. As a strong voice and dedicated advocate for workers' rights, particularly those in the manufacturing industries, he was a true blue-collar worker who 
who spent much of his early working life in the automotive industry, first as an apprentice on the factory floor and then as a union official. He rose through the ranks of the Vehicle Builders Employees Federation of Australia to eventually serve as its president. Like so many on the other side of this chamber, Dominic worked within the trade union movement for many years before entering politics. He will be remembered for his dedication and passion for the automotive industry, his long and distinguished service to both the trade union movement and the Australian Labor Party, and his commitment to those he represented, the people of South Australia. Born on 6 August 1933 to George and Gertrude Foreman in the mid-north country town of Clare in South Australia, Dominic Foreman grew up on the family's vineyard as one of six children. Leaving school at 13, Dominic spent two years working in the family cafe on the main street of Clare before moving to Adelaide to work for white goods manufacturer Simpsons. In 1954, he joined General Motors Holden working as a welder on an assembly line at both the Woodville and Elizabeth plants. After a year with General Motors Holden, Dominic Foreman joined the Vehicles Builders Employees Federation, becoming a shop steward. He spent the next 15 years working through the ranks of the Vehicle Builders Employees Federation, serving as both uh, its State Secretary and eventually in 1979 be becoming its Australian President. During his service uh, as the Australian President of the Vehicle Builders Employees Federation, Dominic Foreman also served as President of the South Australian Trades and Labor Council and as State President of the ALP in South Australia. Clearly a very busy period uh, in uh, Dominic Foreman's life. But he still wanted to do more for his state, specifically for those working in the automotive industry. Less than 12 months later, he would get his opportunity. In 1980, uh, then Senator Rich uh, Bishop, a former minister in the Whitlam government, indicated his intention to retire. And with the support of his close friend and federal member for Port Adelaide, Mick Young, Dominic Foreman contested the Senate pre-selection, securing first position on the ILP Senate ticket. A fit within itself for a first-time Senate candidate. He was elected on the first count and remained a strong, in a strong position on the ILP ticket in South Australia in subsequent elections in 1983, 1987 and 1993. In his first speech, he highlighted the importance of the car industry in Australia, especially in his home state of South Australia. Dominic Foreman was passionate about workers' rights, industrial relations and upskilling Australia's youth to prevent unemployment. He was especially vocal in relation to the needs of young people in rural areas, recognising how important it is for young Australians to get a decent education. During his parliamentary service, Dominic Foreman retained his strong commitment to the automotive industry and to representing the rights of young workers. Uh, he ensured that he was always there as a strong voice whenever there was a motor industry issue on the table. It is also important to note and reflect on his long and distinguished service to the Australian Labor Party. Uh, Dominic Foreman joined the ILP in South Australia in uh, the early 1950s. He served on Labor State Executive in South Australia from 1975 to 1981, and in 1979, as I mentioned, was elected State President, serving for one year before entering this chamber as a Senator for South Australia. By all accounts, uh, even after leaving uh, the Senate in 1997, he remained a vocal supporter and a committed member of the Australian Labor Party. During his 16 years in Parliament, Dominic Foreman served on a number of Senate committees, but he was probably best remembered for his service in the Senate as both a government and opposition deputy whip. For over a decade, he served as a deputy whip, a role he thoroughly enjoyed and in which he performed extremely well. In 1997, Dominic Foreman was forced to retire from Parliament due to ill health. It is clear that he was highly regarded, trusted and respected uh, on both sides of politics. He was reliable and served this parliament with loyalty, devotion and integrity. Family was important to Dominic Foreman, like it is to all of us here. He was a loved and cherished father, grandfather and great-grandfather. It is to his family, on behalf of the Australian Government and the Senate, that I offer our deepest condolences. 
Dominic Foreman will be remembered for his long service to the Australian Labor Party, his commitment and love of the automotive industry, and his dedication to serving the interests of Australian workers and their families. Thank you, Senator Cormann. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Chair, and I thank uh, Senator Wong for allowing me to start the um, contribution of the Labor Party to uh, former Senator uh, Dominic uh, Foreman. Uh, Dominic uh, John Foreman died on the 17th of July 2020. Achieving that status as a Senate, Dominic was possibly one of the last of the blue-collar workers who toiled his way up through the trade union movement to be a shop steward, an organiser and secretary of the uh, Vehicle Builders Employees Federation of Australia. <coughs> being uh, almost uh, one of the last of the blue-collar workers to represent Labor in either House of the Federal Parliament or even in the House uh, of the State Parliament. Uh, Dominic John Foreman was born in Clare on the 6th of August 1933. Uh, he had one brother and four sisters. As a young man, Dominic worked in the uh, family restaurant in Clare but he was eventually educated in uh, Ross Trevor College, uh, which was uh, a considerable expense uh, for his family at that time. However, Dominic <coughs> was grateful for this. Um, Dominic went on to work as a welder. He worked at uh, General Motors Holden uh, and at the old Woodville plant that uh, has uh, long since uh, gone. <coughs> now a bunning store, if I'm uh, correct. Uh, Dominic uh, became a member of the Vehicle Builders Employees Federation and was an active trade unionist. Being a shop steward, he represented the union uh, to the membership and slowly but surely worked his way up through the trade union movement. Um, it was during this period, uh, 1976, when I first met uh, Dominic. Um, I was a young trade unionist myself. Uh, and uh, we would meet uh, after meetings of the uh, Trades and Labor Council in the basement of the uh, old uh, Trades Hall in South Terrace. Uh, my first recollection of uh, Dominic was of a quiet and humble man, and that recollection uh, never changed uh, throughout all the years that I uh, knew him subsequent to that. Uh, eventually he was an organiser with the VBEF, and uh, from that time became the state secretary of that organisation. He was a lifelong trade unionist uh, and through that became an active member of the Australian Labor Party. He made friends with a large number of other trade unionists, uh, but mainly uh, blue collar originated ones uh, of that particular gener generation. Uh, one of which was uh, the late Mick Young <coughs> and Dominic always was seen as part of uh, Mick's gang, and the two were inseparable until Mick's death in uh, 1996. Uh, <clears throat> Dominic was convinced by Mick uh, that he should seek a parliamentary career and was seriously considering the seat of Benython, which was going to be vacated by the then member Martin Nichols in 1977. <clears throat> However, uh, Mick Young prevailed upon Dominic to put his plans on hold uh, so that then Professor of uh, Flinders University, uh, Neil Blewett, uh, could take the seat. Uh, Blewett was seen as a prize catch for the Labor Party, and he would go on to be the architect of uh, Medicare and other things within the uh, Labor Party. Dominic was happy to stand aside in the interest of the Labor Party and the Labor movement as a whole. Uh, he eventually was pre-selected, number one, on the uh, ticket for the 1980 federal election to be a senator for South Australia and was duly elected, although he didn't take up his seat until July of 1981. <clears throat> he would then go on to be a federal senator until 1997. Uh, Dominic resigned his position in 1997 when the Labor Party uh, pre-selected John Quirk to fill the vacancy. Quirk was then a uh, state member of the South Australian uh, Parliament. <clears throat> and previously had worked for Dominic as a staffer and a speechwriter. In the Senate, uh, Dominic held a number of positions, including Chairman of the Joint Standing Committee on Public Works, the Senate Infrastructure Committee and other committee positions. Dominic was a very good committee performer and many projects in Australia would go through that rapid scrutiny 
and reporting process under his watchful eye. Dominic was married to uh, Maggie and uh, they had two, two children, Luke and Lindy, and in turn Luke and Lindy would provide many grandchildren and now great-grandchildren, all of whom uh, mourn the passing of Dominic. Uh, Dominic would marry Shirley in 1986 and they had a happy life together until Shirley's passing in April uh, uh, 2007. Dominic's parliamentary uh, career <coughs> was not without its ups and downs. There was a serious attempt to de-pre-select him in 1992 and give the seat to another sitting senator. The problem for the Labor Party was that in the next election during 1993, there were three sitting senators uh, with the prospect of only uh, returning two to Canberra. Dominic uh, faced the combined opposition of certain sections of the ALP uh, the then uh, South Australian Premier, John Bannon, uh, former Premier Don Dunstan, and others who were friendly to the other particular senator who was seeking to replace uh, Dominic up the ticket. <coughs> On the 2nd of February 1992, Dominic Foreman stared down the opposition and won the ballot uh, three to one and would go on to serve in the Senate until 1997. Dominic was a lifelong fan of Australian rules football uh, he played uh, with that great South Australian team, uh, West Adelaide, which I'm also a uh, <coughs> member, and he would have gone on to play uh, serious uh, league football, because <coughs> it was in my uh, uncle's uh, generation at uh, Joe Hepton's stall <coughs> at West Adelaide, uh, but was concerned that if he was injured, and then his young family would have to uh, survive without a, a breadwinner. <coughs> However, uh, this did not stop uh, Dominic from uh, being a strong supporter of Westies uh, through thick and thin uh, and through the many years, in fact I should say the very many years that they were in the, uh, in the wilderness. Um, <clears throat> one of his uh, Port Adelaide supporters makes this claim about him, <clears throat> which I have been unable to verify but which I'll, uh, I'll repeat. Um, they say he was initial, an initial supporter of the Adelaide Crows, but he changed his allegiance to Port Power because he believed it represented more of his trade, uh, trade union working class origins. Um, I don't personally believe that myself, but I'm told, I'm told this is true. Um, the passing of Dominic represents almost the end of the blue collar era within the Australian Labor Party. Dominic went from the tools on the floor through various levels of the trade union movement into parliament to represent working people of South Australia. He will be sadly missed. Thank you, Senator Farrell. <coughs> I ask honourable senators to join in a moment's silence to signify assent to the motion. The motion is now carried. And my apologies before, I was way too quick and I skipped over notices of motion to be given for another day. Sarah, uh, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I give notice that on Wednesday, the 26th of August, I shall move a motion relating to the consideration of legislation, namely the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Senator Seaway. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I withdraw general business notice of motions numbers. 710, 711, 712, 713 and 717. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, I withdraw general business notices of motion number 708 and 715 for today. Thank you. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Hanson Young. Th thank you, Madam Deputy President. Pursuant to Standing Order 78 1, uh, 
And also on behalf of Senators Kitching and Carr, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices for the next day of sitting to with I don't know why it's the next day of sitting. It's meant to be for today, so maybe I've been given the wrong advice from the clerk. Uh, Senator Hanson Young, uh, if you just paraphrase that to later today. Okay, to later today. Uh, proposing the disallowance of the Australian Postal Co Corporation Performance Standards Amendment 2020 Measures Number One Regulations 2020. Thank you. Thank uh, I call the clerk. Postponement notifications have been received as follows from Senator Hanson Young for business of the Senate Number One for today to the 31st of August, and. General Business Notice of Motion 718, standing in the name of Senator Waters, for today to the 31st of August. Thank you. Uh, Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, Madam uh, Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators from the 24th of August till the 3rd of September. Uh, Sorry, yes. To Senators Shikoni, Stirl, Kitching, Dodson, Alex Gallagher and Brown for personal reasons. And for Senator Mariel Smith from the 31st of August till the 3rd of September for personal reasons. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Um, Senator So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted as follows. For Senators Abetz, Hanson, MacDonald and Roberts from the 24th to the 27th of August 2020 due to COVID-19 travel restrictions and Senator Canavan for today for personal reasons. Thank you, uh, Senator Smith. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Dean Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you, Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion in relation to leave of absence for senators as well. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Seward. I seek leave for um, a le granting of leave of absence for Senator Waters. Senator Rice, Senator Steelejohn, Senator Wish Wilson, and Senator Denatali, um, for personal reasons. Thank you. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator Seward be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I remind senators that questions may be put on any proposal at the request of any senators. I'm just going to check out loud, given the number of withdrawals we've had. I think for formal business now we have two motions remaining, which are 714 and 716. I don't see any objections to those. Um, okay, so I think we'll move to uh, general business notice of motion number 714, standing in the names of Senator Faruqi and Senator Steelejohn. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 714 relating to JobKeeper payments before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the amended motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Faruqi. <coughs> I move the motion as amended. Thank you. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. Um, there again, as usual with Green's Please motions, there are. Leave. Sorry, I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Minute. Leave is granted. Thank you uh, for one minute. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Labor will be opposing this motion. Uh, there is large parts of it that we agree with, um, but again, we don't believe that. Um, you can deal with an issue like the economic response to COVID-19 and calling on the federal government to uh, make a whole range of additional payments by way of a formal motion in this place. It does not allow debate. Um, that is the point that we've been raising time and time again in this part of the program. Complex um, issues where there are a variety of opinions, whether you agree with them or not, deserve the ability to be debated in this place. Formal motions don't allow it. Um, so 
it's a very simplistic way of getting a video out, essentially. Um, and Labor, whilst we are sympathetic, as you know, to many of the issues raised in this motion, um, you cannot, by formal motion, determine the expenditure of billions and billions of dollars in relation to a very, very serious economic problem facing Thank this you, country. Senator Gallagher, your time has expired. I don't believe anyone else is seeking the call. So the question is that the motion as amended uh, put by Senator Faruqi in the names of Senator Faruqi and Steele John be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Okay, so with the concurrence of the chamber, we withdraw the um, need for a division, and we note um, the objections uh, to um, that motion being defeated um, by the Australian Greens. Thank you. So we will now move to the last motion, which is general business notice of motion number seven one six, standing in the name of Senator McAllister, Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 716 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunnian. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunnian. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The government has been clear and consistent. For Australia to continue to be secure and prosperous, we need to work cooperatively and constructively with international partners. But it must be on in rather our national interests, which means we must work with other countries and institutions, but we must indeed advocate for substantive reform where it is needed. It's appropriate for a country of Australia's size, its capability and its standing in the region to make an ongoing contribution to the maintenance and evolution of a rules-based international order. As COVID-19 has shown, multilateral institutions are, the most effective, are most effective when they are driven by and responsive to the interests of sovereign states that form them. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 716, standing in the name of Senator McAllister, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I think that concludes formal motions. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 16 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Keneally. Dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today I propose to move that in the opinion of the Senate the following is a matter of urgency. The need for the Senate to note a aged care is in crisis and as at the 23rd of August 2020, uh, small i, 1,745 COVID-19 cases had been recorded in aged care facilities. Um, small 2, 313 aged care residents had died. B, evidence to the Aged Care Royal Commission that Australia has one of the highest rates in the world of residential aged care deaths as a proportion of deaths from COVID-19. C, the federal government is in charge of aged care. It regulates aged care. It funds aged care. It has the legislation that determines the quality of aged care older Australians receive and its own document on the health response to COVID-19 in February clearly stated that it would be responsible for residential aged care facilities. D. The Morrison government has failed to plan to protect older Australians in aged care during the coronavirus pandemic, leading to unnecessary deaths. E. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, the Morrison government had been warned of widespread neglect in its aged care system and F, the Morrison government has let down hundreds of thousands of aged care residents and workers. Two, 
express its sympathy to the families of all those residents of aged care who have died as a result of the corona pandemic and three calls on the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, and the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck, to demonstrate leadership, stop seeking to deflect blame, take responsibility for the tragic unfolding in aged care. Beg your pardon for the tragedy unfolding in aged care. Um, is the proposal supported? Thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator McAllister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. In rising to speak, I wish to place on record my condolences to the families who are grieving. I also want to say that I am thinking of those who struggle today with this horrible disease, and I offer my support and solidarity to their families. The horror of COVID-19 has been made manifest inside Australia's aged care facilities. And older Australians have died alone and before their time and without loved ones. Staff have faced illness without the safety of protective equipment and families have lost the chance to say goodbye. The Prime Minister cannot control a pandemic or a global economic downturn, but he and his government are responsible for the federally funded aged care sector, and more should have been done. The neglect and negligence we have seen through the COVID-19 period is a continuation of the neglect and negligence that has been brought to the fore through the proceedings of the Aged Care Royal Commission. And older Australians deserve better than this. The government has squandered three terms, three terms worth of opportunities to fix the aged care sector. The problems have been known for some time. There have been countless reports over the last six years, most of which have been ignored. The failure of the, to act on these recommendations has helped exacerbate the current situation. And I note, Madam Acting Deputy President, you've taken the chair, that you made a damning submission to the Aged Care Rural Submission, stating that the failure of the Abbott government to act at that critical time in 2014 sowed the seeds of the predicament that the aged care sector is facing today. And you went on to say, in short, Prime Minister Abbott and those advising him in the coalition failed in their promise to reform aged care and simply opted for a shift that had no demonstrable positive outcome for the well-being of older Australians. Well, it's a very clear statement of the problem because moving the deck chairs didn't help at all. And she's not alone in thinking that this is so. The commissioners presiding over the Aged Care Royal Commission said today, had the Australian government acted on previous reviews of aged care, the persistent problems in aged care would have been known much earlier and the suffering of many people could have been avoided. Now, during question time today, the Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck, said that, in effect, he didn't seek to draw a connection between the failure to act on previous reviews and the problems being experienced now. Well, I think he should explain what he means by that. Is the minister seriously suggesting that there is no link? And what does that mean for the observations being made by the commissioners that preside over the Aged Care Royal Commission? Is he rejecting the conclusions of the commissioners, the commissioners tasked by his own account with sorting through the challenges in the sector. The failure to act on problems in this sector is not just historical. It has continued into the COVID period. Since Mr Morrison has become Prime Minister, another report has been delivered. The report by Professor Palaise, the chair of the government's Aged Care Workforce Strategy Task Force. Now, that's been sitting on the minister's desk for two years. It had 14 recommendations. Only one of those has been implemented, and that one only partially. All the government has done is establish a committee. Lethargy, indifference, a failure to learn from the mistakes of the past 
has characterised the government's approach to the aged care sector during COVID. It took until last Friday, six months into the pandemic, and after hundreds of aged care residents have died, for the government to announce an aged care advisory group. This is a clear failure to plan. The Council assisting the Aged Care Royal Commission said neither the Commonwealth Department of Health nor the Aged Care Regulator developed a COVID-19 plan specifically for the aged care sector. It's incredible. It is incredible that such a plan would not have been developed when everybody knew from the very beginnings of the outbreak of this pandemic that older people were the most vulnerable and the most likely to face mortality. The report from Newmarch House was released today. Issue after issue identified in that report as contributing to the tragic outbreak at Newmarch House was not addressed by the Morrison government in the critical weeks before COVID-19 hit Victorian aged care homes. For example, the report notes the impact of severely depleted staffing because of COVID-19 infections among staff and quarantine and the significant challenge that this posed to Newmarch House. But despite this, the PM and the Minister for Aged Care have continued to say that this issue could not have been anticipated in Victoria. It could have been anticipated because we'd seen it once before in New South Wales. The Royal Commission was told that Dorothy Henderson Lodge lost almost its entire workforce within the first 48 hours, and within a week of the outbreak at Newmarch House, it had lost 87 per cent of its existing workforce. The report on Newmarch House calls for an expansion of surge capacities. But just last week it was revealed that even now the Morrison government has only spent half the funding it committed to addressing that problem. The report also notes that infection prevention and control was a significant concern, but in the critical weeks before the Victorian outbreak, the Morrison government did no audit of nursing home stock of PPE, despite more than 1,300 providers requesting access to the national stockpile. Well, of course, these failures have had a cost. The Minister for Aged Care may not have remembered the number of people who have died in aged care facilities from COVID-19. Their families and their loved ones of those 313 older Australians will. Older Australians have borne the majority of the health consequences of this virus. Australia is recording one of the highest rates in the world of residential aged care deaths as a proportion of deaths from the coronavirus. Almost 2,000 cases have been recorded in facilities. Staff have been left to work in understaffed and under-resourced Melbourne aged care facilities, with one doctor saying, tonight I worked with three nurses who were all in tears at one stage or another. At times, we're significantly distressed and exasperated at the circumstances in which we found ourselves, where we are unable to provide the optimal care that we sought for a multitude of reasons. The Prime Minister's failure to take responsibility, to acknowledge the role of government in resolving this problem, the role of his government in resolving this problem, and provide the answers the public deserves has simply compounded the hurt. As one grieving son told The Guardian newspaper, I'm not grieving because an 84-year-old woman died, necessarily. It's painful. We miss our mum, but we have been in pain for years. For us, it was painful because there are no answers. The Prime Minister needs to provide answers to these families, but more importantly, he needs to take urgent steps to ensure that unnecessary deaths unnecessary illness, unnecessary anxiety and stress for families of people with loved ones in aged care does not occur again. Australians who have tragically been let down by Scott Morrison, Mr Morrison and his Minister for Aged Care deserve no less. The public needs to know that Mr Morrison has learnt from previous outbreaks and everything possible is now being done. Former US Vice President Hubert Humphrey once said that the moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in the dawn of life, the children, and those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, and those who are in the shadow of life, the sick.
Senator McAllister, I note you didn't move the motion at the beginning. Are you seeking to do so? I am. My apologies. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak on the matter of urgency regarding aged care raised by Senator Keneally. I noted Senator Colbeck's advice with sadness earlier today that there have been 335 COVID-19 related deaths in aged care. And I offer my sincere condolences to the families and loved ones of these 335 people who have lost their lives. Just 12 months ago, my mother was in an aged care facility in Launceston, and I was fortunate to be able to visit her frequently in her final months. And while I understand how hard it is to have a loved one in care, I cannot fathom how difficult it must be for those who cannot see their mothers or their fathers, their grandfathers, the grandmothers, aunts and uncles because of the COVID-19 restrictions. That is just a heartbreaking scenario. But I also want to wish and extend my sympathies to the Australians who are living with COVID-19 or who are currently in isolation due to the impact of COVID-19 on their communities. It is a difficult time. As we heard earlier today, the total number of active COVID-19 cases in the aged care sector nationally stands at 1,761 residents, including residential and in-home care. There are currently, and there are currently 126 aged care services with active cases. This government is determined to ensure that a safe environment exists in aged care facilities, as we all work together to contain the spread of COVID-19. There is no doubt that we are facing an extraordinary health challenge in containing this virus. We must work together to protect our most vulnerable people against it. Prime Minister Scott Morrison and Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Richard Colbeck, have made supporting aged care facilities to contain coronavirus their prime focus. The safety and wellbeing of aged care residents is our number one focus. Where there have been large clusters of community transmission, it has been very hard to keep COVID-19 out of aged care services. This, sadly, is what has happened in Victoria. Once the virus got into these facilities, the results were devastating, despite the efforts of staff in those facilities to adhere to the required infection controls and screening programs. But we are working hard to contain this virus. All Victorian aged care facilities with active COVID-19 cases are receiving support from both the Australian Department of Health and the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission to ensure residents continue to receive essential care. This support includes a single case manager for each facility, access to PPE, testing in the facilities themselves and access to additional staff as needed. In addition, and as we heard from the Minister for Defence during question time today, Ausmat has been deployed to Victoria to assist with managing the COVID-19 response, and ADF personnel are on site in some residential facilities, with additional clinical reserve staff available should they be needed. The ADF supported our health staff when there was a coronavirus outbreak in Tasmania's northwest earlier this year, for which we as a state are so grateful. Health staff from Tasmania have put up their hands to help Victoria in this time of need as have staff from Western Australia, the ACT and Queensland, and contact tracing staff have been brought in from New South Wales, South Australia and Queensland to assist. Our government has scaled up aged care support programs in Victoria and across Australia, recently committing an extra $171 million to boost the COVID-19 response plan in aged care. This brings the total of Commonwealth funding for the aged care sector to more, to more than $1 billion since this pandemic began. Infection control training programs, surge workforce staff and additional compliance by the Aged Care Commissioner and coordinated response centres will all benefit from this extra funding. The funding will provide $81 million for additional surge workforce and increased training for aged care workers, $8.4 million for supplementary payments to include quarantine costs and interstate staff, $50 million to account for additional demand for retention bonus measures. $9.1 million for the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre, established with the Victorian Government to boost their additional workforce while undergoing more training. This ensures a workforce that can quickly respond to outbreaks in other states. $12.5 million to support aged care residents and their families who have experienced a COVID-19 outbreak with grief and trauma support services. 
and more aged care quality and safety commission compliance and quality checks on aged care providers, specifically checking on preparations and responses to COVID-19 outbreaks. Other funding measures include $205 million to help residential aged care providers meet costs associated with COVID-19 and almost $48 million to extend the Business Improvement Fund for another year to help residential aged care providers in financial difficulty. Regional, rural and remote areas and those affected by bushfires have been prioritised for fund applications. We are also putting more funding into helping older Australians stay at home, including $59 million for meal delivery services like Meals on Wheels and $10 million for the Community Visitors Scheme to ensure those in aged care are not socially isolated due to visiting restrictions. Indigenous elders living in urban areas are also being supported with transport to medical appointments, welfare checks, meals and other measures to lessen the impact of isolation. Senator Keneally claims the Morrison government failed to plan to protect older Australians in aged care, but I would argue that this government has been preparing and planning its response to COVID-19 in res residential aged care since January this year. We have been working with the aged care sector and state and territory governments to build a strong but flexible response to this virus, incorporating lessons from our own successes and those of other countries as we go. Specific guidelines for COVID-19 were issued by the Communicable Diseases Network of Australia to the aged care sector on March 13 and have been updated twice since. These guidelines and response plan include infection control guidance designed specifically for residential aged care, COVID-19 training for the aged care workforce, visitation restrictions that keep residents safe but are also mindful of the need for those residents to remain safely connected to their family and community. Rapid provision of PPE, PPE, clinical expertise and additional skilled workforce to support care and contain transmission in the event of an outbreak. And COVID-19 pathology testing and access to telehealth to ensure residents continue to safely receive needed health care. This government is delivering record investment across the aged care system, with an estimated $25.4 billion forecast for 2022 to 23. By comparison, Labor's investment in aged care in 2012 to 13 was $13.3 billion. On average, that is an extra $1.2 billion in support for older Australians over the forward estimates each year. Making improvements to aged care for all senior Australians continue. Australians continues to be one of this government's key priorities. That is why the Prime Minister called a Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety. We are committed to providing senior Australians with support to live in their own homes for longer. New home care packages have increased from just over 60,000 under Labor in 2012-13 to more than 164,000 in 2022-23. This is an increase of more than 170%. And over that same period, funding will have increased by 258 per cent due to growth in high-level packages. The viability supplement to support services in rural and remote Australia has been increased by 30 per cent, as have the homelessness supplement. This government has also established a new independent aged care quality and safety commission, implemented new consumer-focused aged care quality standards and the aged care diversity framework introduced a new mandatory national quality indicator program and put a new single charter of aged care rights in place. But it is not just about investing in COVID-19 response. More aged care places and making the improvement, that, making the, and improving the framework around compliance within the aged care sector. This government has invested $185 million to support a medical researcher's future fund focused mission, with a focused mission on ageing, aged care and dementia. This fund will support older Australians to maintain their health and quality of life as they age so they can live independently for longer and access quality care when they need it. Reduction in risk prevention and tracking of dementia will benefit from a $21 million investment in 13 research projects. Dementia is Australia's second leading cause of death and something we are taking seriously. To this end, we have established the Specialist Dementia Care Program and provided more funding to support dementia behaviour management through advisory services and training for care workers. 
More funding has also been provided for aged care services for First Nations people, including grants for aged care providers delivering services to Indigenous people to help purchase equipment and undertake minor works, and $60 million has been allocated for grants, capital grants for infrastructure works in rural and remote areas. This government takes aged care seriously, and we will always protect older Australians. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Senator Askew. Senator Seawood. Yeah. I rise to express the Green support for this motion, the motion that calls on the government to demonstrate leadership, stop seeking to defect blame, take responsibility for the tragedy unfolding in aged care. We strongly support um, this motion. It is clear to us that the government does not have a coordinated, well-resourced national plan in place to protect older Australians from future COVID-19 outbreaks in aged care. And before I go any further, I would also like to extend my condolences and sympathy and support for all of those Australians who have lost loved ones, family members in aged care. We've just heard a list of the things that the government says it has done in aged care, but clearly it is not enough because we have lost 335 Victorians, older Australians, older Victorians in residential and, uh, care and home care during this latest outbreak of COVID in Victoria. It is clearly not enough. This government has failed to take accountability and in doing so failed older Australians and their families. It has apparently come as a surprise to the Prime Minister and the Minister that aged care is in fact a responsibility of the Commonwealth Government. The, gov the Commonwealth Government is the primary funder and regulator of the aged care system. The Department of Health is responsible for the operation of the Aged Care Act and the associated aged care principles. Today I would like to focus on how we could have avoided the scale and heartbreak of the COVID-19 outbreaks in, in residential aged care and what we need to be doing to make sure it doesn't happen elsewhere. Today, the minister said that the government is looking at the learnings from the new March House outbreak. But the changes being made, for example, around early identification of cases, facility management and surge workforce are all reactive, while very important, of course. They are not taking seriously enough the prevention of outbreaks in aged care facilities on a national level. And they must start putting in place preventative measures now. They can't wait till after the Royal Commission has reported, because this is happening now. Last week, at the Senate inquiry into COVID-19, the minister tried to pin problems in Victoria on the depletion of the workforce and not appreciating that a whole workforce would have to be moved. I strongly believe that that was flawed thinking, given the circumstances we are seeing. But I also believe that if we had had the adequate number of staff with the proper, proper staff ratios, if we had good clinical care measures in place in aged care that we not, would not have seen the scale of the issues that we have now. For years and years, workers in aged care, some of the providers, friends, families and loved ones, friends and family and loved ones of people in residential aged care have been raising the issue of workforce for years. We know that we needed to significantly increase the number of workers in aged care, both nurses and care workers. We've known for a long time that we needed to significantly improve the training and support for Thank you, the Senator Seawood. Senator Sheldon. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise today amidst the greatest public health crisis in several generations and speak to the matter of public urgency. As of yesterday, 335 Australian families have lost a loved one to COVID-19 in aged care in Australia. 
So many Australians failed by a Commonwealth government who failed to prepare and who failed to learn the lessons from overseas and from outbreaks like those ones at Dorothy Henderson Lodge and Newmarch House. Both in my home state of New South Wales, those nursing homes needed special planning, care as the virus bore down on us. While most of these victims of COVID-19 could not be with their loved ones, they did have tireless and selfless people by their side. I am talking of the 165,000 health workers in aged care who do the overwhelming majority of the work in our aged care homes and services. They are kind and patient people who feed our loved ones, keep them hydrated, turn them, bathe them and lift them so that they are comfortable and safe. They share their stories and quell their fears and take them outside for a precious hour of sunshine. I cannot say enough to applaud the hard work that they endeavour in doing. The measure of how we value aged care in this country has no more important indicator than how we value the health workers who are the care. Like truck drivers, cleaners, food delivery, postal and supermarket workers, health care workers in aged care are the front line of this pandemic. They are the quiet heroes. We dishonour them and we dishonour the older Australians they care for every day when we pay them so little and we deny them paid pandemic leave and we condemn them to such insecure and unfunded work. They deserve better than this. We are a country and we can do better than this. Acting Deputy President, the COVID-19 pandemic pulled back the curtain on a lack of funding and job insecurity in aged care that was already there. Years before COVID-19, unions had been warning about the staff cuts and underfunding of aged care. We should not be surprised that the pandemic took advantage of the systematic rundown downing of staff levels and of training. If Scott Morrison and his hapless aged care minister care to actually address the crisis in aged care, I invite them to listen to the aged care workers themselves. Aged care is complex and the long-term decline in funding and the lack of transparency and accountability in how $13 billion of taxpayers' money is spent will not be solved overnight. But there are some important steps that workers in aged care know the government and could and should take right now to address this crisis in aged care. Every worker needs paid pandemic leave. Every worker needs proper personal protective equipment and training on how to use it. And we need a trained and ready surge workforce. Every worker in the health and aged care sector needs access to paid pandemic leave because the virus does not care what kind of job you do or where you do it, regardless of where they work and what state they are in. The ACTU and unions like the Health Services Union that covers healthcare workers have been calling for universal paid pandemic leave. Many have trumpeted the Fair Work Commission recent decision to adjust the award granting paid pandemic leave for aged care workers. This is welcome news. But the problem is that only one in 10 workers are covered by that award in aged care. That means 90% of aged care workers who are covered by enterprise agreements may not be getting paid pandemic leave at all. Unless you're an aged care worker in Victoria, you are facing the prospect of losing income or losing your job if you have to self-isolate. The Health Services Union wrote to aged care providers around the country to ask them to do the right thing and offer paid pandemic leave to their staff. Now here's the results. Some employers, like Twilight Aged Care, have agreed to pass on the full two weeks to its 240 staff. Some employers, like Uniting Care, are paying only a few days. But the vast majority are determined to do nothing. 
Why won't the not-for-profit aged care chains like Witten and Mercy Health offer paid pandemic leave to their staff? Why are for the profit aged care operators like Regis effectively telling their staff that they choose between safety and paying their bills and feeding their kids? Apparently the cost of pandemic leave is too much even when stacked up against its real costs in stress, loss of livelihoods and loss of life. And this government, which despite Scott Morrison trying to pass the buck, has responsibility for aged care, has done nothing to expend, extend aged care pandemic leave to cover these most vulnerable of workers, these essential workers in aged care. The second thing that the government must do is mandate proper levels of personal protective equipment and training. This chamber may be shocked to hear that there is still no nationally mandated PPE used in aged care. How can we expect staff to manage complex infection control of patients and visitors with little or no training and often with highly limited access to PPE? Members have told the Health Services Union when questioned what employers were doing about PPE supplies, that care manager, one care manager said that they planned to make calico masks for staff. Another worker told the union that, as of last week, she was given only one mask for eight, her eight-hour shift in clear breach of infection control protocols. And where's the federal government? We know that prior to the outbreaks in Victoria, just one in five aged care workers had completed the government's training modules on how to use PPE. And this, week's, and this was weeks after the earlier outbreaks of Dorothy Henderson Lodge and Newmark. If they don't listen to our aged care providers, the Prime Minister and aged care minister could look at the final revelations in the final report of the Newmark House tragedy. Just last week we learned that as of now, the Morrison government has only spent half the funding committed to addressing this critical surge staffing, surge staffing problem. And now we have a growing crisis of worker fatigue and stress across the sector. As Health Services Union National President Gerard Hayes said, the chronic underfunding of aged care has created the perfect storm for the devastating effects of COVID-19 that we now see in Victoria and have witnessed at Newmark House in New South Wales. The bottom line is that even with a strategy to create a surge workforce, it will not solve the underlying problem, which is that 20 per cent of workers in aged care have at least two places of work because of their extremely low pay and zero-hour contracts in this sector. Honouring our older Australians means committing to providing decently paid and secure work for the people that rely on the most. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Hughes. You, Madam Acting Deputy President, the vulnerability of elderly Australians to COVID-19 is an emotional and tragic issue not lost on this government. Members from all sides of politics have shared stories with each other about the tragedy of COVID-19 deaths in our nursing homes. The extreme vulnerability of our elderly and infirm to this insidious virus has been evident both here in Australia and in other countries around the world where COVID-19 battles are raging. No one has yet executed the perfect solution. Ideally, we wouldn't lose a single life. Sadly, that's not been the case. We've witnessed multiple deaths at state-run nursing homes in Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria with one death reported in Tasmania. And whilst it angers me that Labor continues to politicise this horrendous situation, it does not surprise. Even when its own party has worked and sometimes failed to eliminate the tragedies of multiple deaths in aged care facilities in their states. These tragedies include the pain of families cut off from their loved ones. I haven't seen my own mother for close to six months. And while she really hasn't recognised me for the past few years, it was a treat to have her remember me recently during a FaceTime call arranged by her residential home. In fact, I've barely seen my father for six months 
due to the village where he lives independently but close to my mother, has been shut off to outside visitors. But it's for my father that I ache at the thought that he, though married to my mother for more than half a century, is forbidden to walk the corridor and hold her hand to ease her confusion. My heart aches for other families, desperate to see their loved ones as time runs out. Now's not the time for finger-pointing and cheap political point scoring. Now's the time for action and improvement. And that's why, since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've provided $1 billion to support seniors in aged care. Of that money, a quarter of a billion dollars has been provided to residential aged care providers for costs associated with COVID-19. And another half a billion dollars has been provided to assist with important measures, including $234 million provided for direct care. That money is for staff retention in both residential care and for those working to provide home-based aged care. $78 million has been provided to ensure the continuity of the aged care workforce through a temporary, temporary increase to the residential care subsidy. $26.9 million has been injected to boost the residential care and home care viability supplement and the residential care homeless supplement. $92 million has been provided to support home care and CHSP providers, and $12.3 million has been given to boost my aged care service. And we haven't forgotten the workers themselves, with unlimited assistance for those workers at COVID-19 affected facilities that includes extra staff that have been brought on. We've provided $101 million solely for preparedness measures to aged care providers to manage and prevent outbreaks through infection control training for their workforce, including the extra workers that have been brought on to help throughout the pandemic. The federal government has been writing the state's many checks. It's the one thing we can do, and we haven't shirked our responsibility on that front. Additionally, we've provided close to $60 million for meal delivery services, like Meals on Wheels, to support senior Australians in need of food or groceries. We've provided an additional $10 million for the Community Visitors Scheme to ensure, where regulations permit, that some Australians in aged care are not isolated due to visiting restrictions, like border closures. And we've even provided $9 million to support Indigenous elders living in urban areas to deal with the impact of isolation and transport to medical appointments. That money may also be utilised for welfare checks and even food where necessary. In Victoria, where local health officials have struggled to manage the death rate, we've now taken further measures with another $9 million provided to support a coordinated response between the Commonwealth and the Victorian government. We've extended the aged care COVID-19 preparedness measure, with $81 million provided for additional aged care workers and increased training. There's $8.4 million for supplementary payments to include quarantine costs and interstate staff. $1.5 million has been provided to ensure appropriate and regular communications from Health Direct to the families and loved ones of aged care res residents impacted by COVID-19. We and the public health officials have provided their best advice. Sadly, that advice hasn't always been a success. But of course, with 92 per cent of aged care facilities COVID-free, we keep working. Right now, in the aged care area, we're comparing favourably to other countries. But we're not infallible. We make the best decisions made on the best advice daily. An additional $12.5 million has been provided for grief and trauma support services to assist aged care residents and their families who have experienced a COVID-19 outbreak. That increase means that the government has provided more than $100 million for these services. Yet we're not just reacting. We are planning for the future. There's $9 million for the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission to continue its vital work supporting aged care providers across the country to prepare and respond to COVID-19 outbreaks. Then there's the funding to help aged care workers in hotspots. Whether they be aged care or residential care workers, this funding support their needs for self-isolation and, where necessary, alternative accommodation. The federal government has responded with additional funding for extra additional PPP equipment from the National Medical Stockpile 
providing Victorian aged care providers with five million more face masks and half a million face shields. As part of the strategy, the Commission will commence unannounced visits to monitor infections control and protection equipment protocols. Our government has made some very tough decisions, decisions that have impacted so many. We've instituted strong and often painful restrictions on visitations at aged care homes. We've provided emergency leave for aged care residents whose loving families want to look after them. We've temporarily removed restrictions on international students working in aged care, and we've provided additional flexibility to home care providers for personal monitoring services. These measures all complement the $1.1 billion we've spent on face masks and other protective measures Australia-wide. We're tackling isolation and loneliness in older Australians with close to $5 million for Friendline, a national telephone support for older Australians to expand the phone support services until 2024. There's $1 million for digital devices such as mobile phones and laptops for at-risk seniors. And there's also been the establishment of an older person's COVID-19 support line. And don't forget that there's other funding that impacts aged care with $100 million for a new COVID-19 telehealth consultation Medicare item. There's $25 million for home medicine services, $5 million to fast track the rollout of electronic prescribing across Australia, and $50.7 million for the expansion of a national triage phone line. But are we infallible? No. Our Prime Minister has said so today. He's tasked the Royal Commission into aged care to examine our, respo our response even as we act. Senator Keneally can thump the table and try and insist that we have no plan. I've just outlined our plan, and it's been outlined before. She's insulted healthcare workers and suggested they failed in their infection control measures. In fact, most of them have succeeded, with 92 per cent of aged care homes COVID-free. Her theatre to try and evoke emotions of a lonely death in aged care facilities is nothing short of embarrassing let alone insulting to the hard-working staff. Many of our own staff, our health workers and health bureaucrats, have suffered these very real situations. And whilst it's encouraging to think that Senator Keneally has been moved by stories that she's heard in the media, the government's far from being unaware or uncaring or even directly involved in these. We are working closely with our state counterparts to save lives. We're making decisions based on the best health advice that we can rely on. Perhaps the Labor Party should rethink the politicisation of this challenging issue. Their criticisms are unhelpful and capture their own state party members. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Griff. Acting Deputy President, I rise in support of this motion. The Morrison government has repeated the line that once a virus gets into the community, the consequences for aged care homes are inevitable. What an excuse. Inevitable as though there was no way the dire consequences and deaths in aged care could have been avoided or mitigated. I don't accept that, and Australians don't accept that, and the government certainly shouldn't accept that. It's one thing for the government to blame community transmission for the shocking death toll in aged care facilities. But it's another not to have properly planned for outbreaks. We saw what happened overseas. We saw what unfolded at the Dorothy Henderson Lodge and Newmarch House outbreaks in April. But did the government learn from those lessons, especially to expect the sudden departure of regular carers and nurses and to provide PPE training? Of course not. Seven months into the pandemic, the federal government's learnings have been slow and deeply disappointing. And I give my deepest condolences to the families of the 328 loved ones who have lost their lives in residential aged care because of COVID-19 and the seven people who contracted COVID-19 and passed away while receiving in-home care. The weaknesses in our aged care system have not been caused by the virus. They have been exposed in glaring focus. The minute we knew the virus was spreading, the federal government should have snapped to attention. The system was already broken. We don't need the Royal Commission to tell us that the current system, largely motivated by profit, is not fit for purpose, unless that purpose is to make money off our most vulnerable. Going forward, I hope the government realises that aged care can no longer be business as usual. Enough with the excuses. Government must act 
responsibly now. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, 335 aged care residents, 335 people, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, grandparents, friends. This is the number of aged care residents who have passed away due to coronavirus. And I want to pass on my condolences to their families at this time. I cannot begin to imagine how difficult it has been for families who haven't been able to visit and sit with their loved ones before they died. The stories we hear of spouses unable to hold their partner's hand one last time, the parents and grandparents unable to see their children and grandchildren in their final moments. It is an absolute tragedy and we are facing an aged care disaster. And we need real leadership, new leadership from the Morrison government to face this disaster. As the matter of public urgency states, evidence presented to the Aged Care Royal Commission shows that Australia has one of the highest rates in the world of residential aged care deaths as a proportion of deaths from COVID-19. This is a national crisis and a national shame. So where is the plan to deal with it? We knew this virus was highly infectious. We knew it was deadly, particularly for older people. We saw it happen in other countries first. But despite this highly infectious disease appearing, no plan was put in place for aged care by this government. No plan for infection control, no plan for personal protective equipment, no plan. And the alarm bells really rang back in April when the first aged care outbreaks occurred, but the lessons just weren't learned. And so history has repeated itself with the disease tragically spreading through aged care homes in Victoria. The new March House report confirms that this is the case, that despite issues being clearly identified as contributing to those early outbreaks, nothing was done to fix them. Issues with staffing levels due to quarantine requirements, issues with infection prevention and control, issues with serious shortages of PPE, issues with communication and confusion. But what did the government do to address these issues? What did the government do to address issues which they knew presented huge risks to aged care centres and to their residents? They only spent half of the funds they committed to addressing surge capacity for staffing. Only one out of five aged care workers had completed the Morrison government's training on how to correctly use PPE. They did no audit of PPE stock despite 1,300 aged care providers requesting access to the national stockpile. Why did the government not address these issues? The aged care workforce has been absolutely heroic during this time. They are dedicated, and I know that they are also devastated at the loss of life in aged care. They work hard every day caring for some of our most vulnerable Australians. But they are under-equipped, they are understaffed, and they are exhausted. So many are in low-paid and insecure jobs, and they deserve better and so do the older Australians and families who are relying on them. The aged care system is broken, and it has been for years. Inquiry and inquiry, report after report, review after review, all pointing to an aged care sector that was struggling to deliver for the older Australians that rely on it. So who is responsible for this? Is it the Liberal National Coalition that has been in government for seven years? Well, apparently not, according to the Prime Minister. Is it Senator Colbeck, the Minister for Aged Care? Apparently not. One of these numerous reports, a matter of care, specifically recommended sweeping action to ensure aged care workers had access to appropriate training. And today, the commissioners presiding over the Aged Care Royal Commission said, and I quote, that had the Australian government acted upon previous reviews of aged care, the persistent problems would have been known much earlier and the suffering of so many people could have been avoided. 
the suffering could have been avoided. But the Prime Minister and the Minister for Aged Care haven't listened. They sat on that report for two years, just like they sat on the lessons that could have been learnt earlier in the COVID crisis. And this is a gross abdication of responsibility. It is a gross demonstration of incompetence, and it is causing families pain, heartache and loss. Minister Colbeck, when answering questions on aged care in front of the COVID-19 inquiry, couldn't even answer how many Australians in aged care had died of COVID-19, how many active cases there were. He couldn't tell the inquiry if he'd briefed either the National Cabinet or the Federal Cabinet. There is a crisis in Australian aged care, and Cabinet may or may not have been briefed on it. And despite this, the Prime Minister and Minister Cormann have leapt to Minister Colbeck's defence. The same Prime Minister who's tried to say that his government is simultaneously somehow not responsible for aged care in Australia, but also prepared and has a plan in place. Well, which is it? Because Australians need to see this government step up and prevent more deaths from COVID-19 in our aged care system. Enough is enough. It's time to stop shifting the blame. It's time to stop avoiding responsibility. We need solutions, not excuses. Scott Morrison's government is responsible for aged care. It is responsible for making sure there's a plan to keep Australians safe in this COVID-19 crisis. And it's time that they discharged that responsibility. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator McLaughlin. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President for the call. I rise to speak uh, to a matter of urgency moved by Senator Keneally, uh, which concerns uh, and, and uh, incorporates some, in my view, unfair criticisms of the coalition government in relation to its response to the COVID-19 impact on the aged care sector. In particular, the motion calls on the Prime Minister and the Minister, Senator Colbeck, to demonstrate leadership and take responsibility. My response uh, to that call is that it has been answered, and it is being answered, and it will continue to be answered. Whilst I oppose the motion and strongly oppose it, I do join uh, the, uh, Senator Keneally in extending my sympathies to the families who have lost loved ones because of the virus. I know that I can be confident that every honourable senator in this place has, feels the same sentiment. The mover of this motion appears to have crafted their propositions based on articles that have appeared in The Guardian or, or media of similar disposition. The mover of the motion has failed to properly reflect on the incredible and Herculean efforts that have been undertaken by the coalition government to keep our aged safe. Aristotle said to avoid criticism, say nothing, do nothing and be nothing. The federal government, the coalition government, is a government of action in an environment that is difficult, challenging and ever-changing. While the motion is critical of the Prime Minister and Minister Colbeck, I praise them both. As the Prime Minister said, this has been my number one focus. This does not sound like a leader seeking to deflect blame or refusing to take responsibility. Rather, it is the opposite. The Minister, Senator Colbeck, has worked extremely hard and his endeavours have been extremely effective. It's difficult to think at this time of having a more capable and effective minister to face these challenges. To unfairly lay criticism on the minister is to ignore that the states also have a critical role to play in the movement of people in their jurisdictions, for they govern the public health laws that apply to these facilities. And also we must bear in mind the providers that have been supported by the federal government who also have a critical role to play. This is why the coalition government has chosen to work collaboratively and closely with the states and the providers and not seek, as Labor are doing today, to lay blame and sow discourse and disharmony. The Morrison government is scaling up its aged care support programs in Victoria and across Australia, with an additional $171.5 million to boost a new COVID response plan, which has been agreed by all states and territories. This brings the total Commonwealth funding to support the sector to more than a billion. This billion dollars is being used to support the sector, including directly and indirectly to providers, 
the sector overall and to support, importantly, residents and staff. For example, the federal and Victorian governments have established a dedicated Victorian aged care response centre in Melbourne to coordinate support to each aged care provider experiencing an outbreak. The federal government did understand the implications of the spread of COVID-19 could have on the aged care workforce. This is why it set out a plan in the early days to reinforce and repair the sector with intangible actions. This included providing critical information to providers and initially committing $101.2 million to help build capacity through a workforce surge program. The Morrison government is committed to providing an unlimited amount of surge workforce facilities during this outbreak. That is an incredible commitment by the Minister and the Prime Minister. It is worth noting, honourable senators, that the government is delivering also record investment in the aged care system over the forward estimates, from $13.3 billion in 2012-13 under Labor. It grows to $21.4 billion in 2019-20 to an estimate $25.4 billion in 2022-2023. This is, on average, $1.2 billion of extra support for older Australians each year over the forward estimates. I also point out to honourable senators that it is the Prime Minister, a Liberal Prime Minister, that called a Royal Commission into aged care and quality and safety. This is not the act of a government that is avoiding accountability or responsibility. Rather, this is a government that has no fear of accountability and seeks out responsibility and is driven to protecting the, the most vulnerable. Thank you, Senator McLaughlin. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to support Senator Keneally's motion. One might think that, uh, the first, that the lessons of the first wave of COVID-19 might have been learned to avoid the tragedies uh, we have seen in aged care in Victoria, but they weren't. But unfortunately, that's not surprising, and it's not surprising because governments have not paid enough attention to aged care events playing out every day in aged care, even prior to COVID-19. The system has been limping along for some time, with band-aids being applied, sometimes one on top of the other. The government needs to take charge of aged care, and they need to be doing so for the purposes of COVID-19, which is not uh, going away, or we can't be sure that it's going away anytime soon, but also for the long term. So, being a person who likes to put forward propositions, um, I, I say in the short term, one of the first things that needs to happen is we need to have focus on this issue, and that means a single Minister for Aged Care, not sharing other portfolios. And the, the Morrison government should move to have a Minister for Aged Care uh, solely uh, working uh, on that particular portfolio. We also need to have a COVID plan for residential aged care so everyone has a consistent understanding of the response and how to respond. And then, In the longer term, we need to address the whole issue of aged care, of course informed by things like the Royal Commission into Aged Care, Quality and Safety. Uh, nothing I say here is a criticism, a criticism of any of the workers involved. They have done their best under enduring uh, uh, circumstances. And finally, I just would also like to extend my condolences to those who have passed. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Roberts. I don't think we know can... that there are many grieving families, fearful families, and concerned families. I raise the fact that in my correspondence to both the Prime Minister and to the Premier of Queensland, I expressed concern over their use of insufficient and flawed modelling to lock us all away and cause untold damage to our economy, businesses and jobs. Their responses to my letters avoided addressing the real issues. Yes, if the federal government and state governments had learned, as I suggested in March, from nations like Taiwan and promptly adopted rigorous testing combined with strict isolation of their sick, aged and vulnerable, then many Australians could have stayed at work with minimal economic disruption and better health. My evidence, the difference is that Taiwan had a plan and relied on solid data. And as a result, 
Taiwan had seven deaths in the time we've had 517. They have a similar population to ours in terms of total population, yet they're under greater threat because of their highly densely populated country and they're closer to China. The Honourable John Hewson in the Sydney Morning Herald recently referred to, quote, planning or the lack of it has been the great failure of the Morrison government. It has been building over years of neglect and poor policy, but now it is being laid bare by both COVID-19 and the Royal Commission. Queensland's own Chief Health Officer, Dr Jeanette Young, has stated this past week that she is only looking at the health issues, Mr Acting Deputy President, and this is very concerning. Who is looking after the big picture for us all? What about mental health, economic health, jobs, families, businesses? The Queensland Premier referred us to the website location of her data. We checked. There's no relevant data. We, Premier, irresponsibly abdicating again, hiding behind the Chief Health Officer, abdicating her duties. The Morrison government and the Queensland government need to both step up and to demonstrate leadership and to tell the truth. And they need to show us the data and the plan across all aspects of managing our way out of this pandemic and the resulting recession. And in the process, ensuring security for all Australians. Thank you, Senator Roberts. The motion is that uh, the question is that the motion moved by Senator Keneally be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. We now move on to consideration of doc I'm very sorry, Senator Lambie. No, sorry, Mr. Um Acting, Acting Deputy President, I just seek leave to give a notice of motion to be moved tomorrow. Uh, leave is granted. There being no objection, we took that we missed the cutoff. Senator McAllister, and I wonder if this matter could be deferred just for a few moments to allow consultation on the actual motion and then we could come back to it. We'll, we'll move on to uh, consideration of documents, Senator Lambie, and then I'll give you the opportunity to speak to other senators and then, uh, based on those discussions, we'll come back to it. But I will now move to consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page five of today's order of business. We'll go through them in order. So we'll start with documents 1 to 5 on page 5. Anyone wish to address any of those? Okay. Document 6 to 12 on page 5. Order to General's reports. Senator Seward. I um I wish to take note of document 12, which is the Performance Audit Management of Australia Government's Lobbying Code of Conduct, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Senator Excuse Waters, me. are you seeking to speak to this document? Yes, I am, actually. I'm sorry for the confusion. I was hoping to um, defer a different document, but I'm very much happy to speak on this document, and I can do so fairly promptly. Uh, uh, if you're ready to go, I will give you the call, Senator Waters. Thank you very much. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Um, and I uh, rise digitally to take note of item 12, which is the ANAO follow-up performance audit on the lobbying code of conduct. Um, now, as people probably realise, the Australian uh, federal lobbying system is widely considered to be incredibly weak compared to international standards um, and to state and territory standards for that matter. And the system's made up of the lobbying code and the public lobbying register. Um, and it's been criticised as having only limited transparency and imposing rules that are relatively loose, uh, not comprehensively or independently policed and carry little serious punishment. That's why the ANAO looked into this two years ago um, they issued some recommendations that, um, in my words, not theirs, were ignored. Um, they've subsequently done a follow-up audit two years down the track to see if anyone took any notice of their recommendations first time around, um, and sadly the short version is no. Uh, so the ANAO found in June that the government does not adequately assess conflicts of interest risks or monitor compliance with the lobbyist code of conduct. Um, and frankly, the lack of transparency about who ministers are meeting with is staggering. And it's no wonder that the community uh, has lost confidence in 
uh, the impartiality of its representatives and thinks that uh, politicians are simply for sale to the latest person that took them out for lunch. Uh, I mean, it's almost gotten to the stage where the lobbyists might as well just be running the chamber to cut out the middle person. Um, and it's, it's incredibly disappointing because we have these uh, codes of conduct and registers and the ANAO has found that they are not properly enforced that in the handover between um, uh, PM and C to the Attorney General Department, who are now in charge of the lobbying code in the register, that there were a litany of bungles and a continued failure to advise anyone what the rules are and a failure to implement them. Um, so it's pretty tragic that it's taken two ANAO reports and still we have very little action from the government. Um, the ANAO use, for them, incredibly damning words, and they say that governance arrangements to oversee the implementation of the ANAO recommendation were limited in their effectiveness. There was no implementation planning in the transition from pm &C to Attorney-General. Um, the Attorney-General Department did not develop a strategy to raise awareness of the code. There were limited activities undertaken to inform lobbyists and government reps of their compliance obligations under the code. Um, the Attorney General's Department did not systematically assess risks to compliance with the code and did not advise government about the sufficiency of the current compliance framework. And lastly, they did not develop an evaluation for, uh, framework or performance measures. I mean, you, you could not get a more clear criticism of the administrative bungle that, uh, I mean, look, perhaps it's deliberate. We know this government aren't big fans of transparency um, and they are big fans of lobbyists. So, I mean, who knows? But we've had two ANAO reports now. The government needs to clean up its act. It needs to get rid of this revolving door between advisers and MPs and lobbyists. Um, and that's why the Greens have pushed for an awfully long time now to have a, a properly enforced lobbying code, to have a proper cooling off period for five years for former ministers before they go off and work for the people that they were meant to be regulating while they were sitting in the parliament. Um, to expand that cooling off period to other people uh, and to have a proper parliamentary standards commissioner that is actually responsible for enforcing rules like this. I think we all acknowledge that the community deserves better representation and that the people want their democracy back and they're sick of it being held hostage to big donors, to vested interests and to lobbyists. So. We've got a chance now. There's some clear directions and recommendations from the ANAO once more for reform. Uh, let's hope that this time they actually get the attention that they deserve. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Waters. Now, Senator Seawitt, did you seek leave to continue your remarks on this yes, document? Yes, Yes. Okay, there being no objection, leave is granted. Now, Senator Waters, did you also wish to uh, speak to one of the earlier documents? Did I miss something? I was hoping to seek leave to take note of item number 69. All right, um, we'll, we will just run time, through I'm them in to... order, but yeah, um, sure. we will just keep running through them in order, and once we get there, we'll see how we go. Okay, on page six, Auditor General's reports 13 to 15. Senator McCarthy. Um, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to take note of documents 16 down through to 23. So 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. And uh, I seek leave to continue my remarks. There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, in the government documents as listed on page six, is there any Further, Senator Seawitt. Thank you. I uh, wish to take note of item 28, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare 17th Biennial Report, and seek leave to continue my remarks. There being... oh, all of that bundle of documents there, sorry. Uh, yep, there being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. Senator McCarthy. Um, Mr Acting Deputy President, just confirming we are on page seven now. So we're not With quite government. on page seven yet, we're just finishing page six? Well, it's, uh, page, ah, it's just that apparently 28 have, is on page seven. Apparently so, I have an old yes, version. Yes, there has been a revised There's document. There's a revised yes. version, thank you very much. 
So, uh, well, let's just jump back to page six. Was there any further items on page six that anyone needed to address? Nope. Okay, page seven. We have done item 28. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, items number 26, 29, 31, 33, and 35. Uh, if I could take note and seek leave to continue my remarks. There being no objection, leave is granted. Any further items on that revised page seven? So we're in government documents, items 24 to 35. All right, we go to page eight, items 36 to 45. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, item 36 and item 41. To I seek leave to continue my remarks. There being no objection, leave is granted. Any further items required on that page? No. We shall go to responses to Senate resolutions on page 9, items 46, 47. All right. Uh, documents pursuant to continuing orders, items 48 to 52. Government responses to committee reports, items 53 to 56. And 57 and 58 on page 10. All right. Uh, reports and government responses. Uh, committee reports presented out of sitting, items 59 to 66. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of uh, item 59. Uh, that is uh, the uh, report uh, 9 of 2020 uh, from the Human Rights Joint Statutory uh, Committee. This report covers two highly draconian pieces of legislation which erode fundamental human rights in this country. Uh, those two bills are the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Amendment Bill 2020 and the Migration Amendment Prohibiting Items in Immigration Detention Facilities Bill 2020. The first of these bills will allow ASIO to detain and interrogate people as young as 14. Uh, that is, children, for politically motivated activities and to use tracking devices without a warrant issued by the courts. The second of those, uh, and many other uh, draconian elements. The second of uh, those uh, pieces of legislation will ban uh, detainees inside immigration detention facilities uh, from having access to a range of items, including mobile phones, and will allow, in fact, for a blanket ban to be put on mobile phones uh, in the possession of detainees inside immigration detention facilities. That bill will give uh, staff inside detention, immigration detention facilities greater powers with less oversight than police have when dealing with the general public. That bill is designed to silence the capacity of detainees to record and publish human rights abuses perpetrated against them and uh, will have a chilling effect on their capacity to participate in political debate in this country. Now, because this report con considers those two bills, which engage so many fundamental human rights, it beggars belief that the chair, along with government members of that committee, have once again chosen to ignore the independent legal advice received by the committee. Human rights are under sustained attack in Australia. We are the only liberal democracy in the world without a Charter of Rights or a Bill of Rights, which makes this committee one of the most important committees in the parliamentary system. The committee's job is to provide a technical assessment of whether legislation complies with Australia's international human rights obligations. It should never be run for political purposes. But unfortunately, the chair and Liberal National Party members of this committee are doing 
just that. The only reason for LNP members to so blatantly ignore the committee's independent legal advice is that they are embarrassed that the government holds human rights in such contempt. Australia is becoming a police state and a surveillance state, and the LNP members of this committee are aiding and abetting the government on that dangerous journey. They are doing so by masking the legitimate scrutiny of these bills, by ignoring the independent legal advice to this committee when it suits them, and thereby undermining the important role that the committee plays in scrutinising legislation. The blatant and rampant politicisation of this committee by the chair and other government members enables the ongoing erosion of rights and freedoms and liberties in Australia. It assists the government as it frog marches this country down the dangerous path towards authoritarianism and totalitarianism. This, Mr Acting Deputy President, is how fascism starts. Thank you, Senator McKim. Uh, so we're still on page 10, items 15. Senator McKim, are you seeking leave to continue? Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I do seek leave to continue my remarks. There have been no objection. Leave is granted. Okay, items 60 to 66. All right, we shall now move on. Senator Waters, I believe you wish to move a motion by leave. Uh, sorry, you wish to address a document by leave. Yes, I was hoping to seek leave to address item 69, which is a, a committee report into one of my private members' bills. Okay, they're not normally available for debate at this point, so I will just it's check nice and see much. if leave is granted. I'm waiting for some guidance. No, I'm sorry, Senator Waters. Leave has been denied. Senator Lambie. Great. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I seek leave to give notice of motion to be moved tomorrow. So is, if there being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I've given notice in the terms delivered to the table. The motion's moved in terms uh, Delivered to the table. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. Don't need. Just moving on. All right. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Um, we'll move on to ministerial statements. Minister. Thank you. I table documents relating to the order for the production of documents concerning the Water for Fodder program. No further ministerial statements. Any committee memberships? Uh, the president has received a letter requesting changes to the membership of a committee. Minister. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, I move uh, that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. A message has been received from the House of Representatives returning the Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures No. 2 Bill 2020 and informing the Senate that the House insists on disagreeing to the amendments made and insisted by the Senate. Minister. I move that consideration of the message in Committee of the Whole be made in order of the day for the next day of sitting. Uh, the motion is that the, uh, that the motion is the, the motion the question is that the motion agreed by the motion moved by Senator Sazelja should be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Again say no. The ayes have it. Clark, no. The 
The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the National Skills Commissioner Bill 2020. Okay. The clerk. Business of the Senate, order of the day, number one. Australian Postal Corporation Performance Standards Amendment 2020 Measures No. 1, Regulations 2020, Motion for Disallowance, Presumption of Debate. Senator McAllister. McAllister. Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, there's an important principle that not should be stated clearly at the outset of this debate. The government should not be using COVID-19 as a sneaky backdoor to cut services or implement pre-existing agendas. And Labor sends this message loud and clear. The postal service changes before Parliament began as an opportunistic cost and job cutting exercise. These changes do not arise from circumstances that are brought about by the pandemic, but instead were planned well before the pandemic and are attempted to be snuck through by the government at a time when people are looking to the government for trusted responses. These are not intended to be temporary changes, but permanent cuts that bypass normal consultation. The structural direction of the long-term agenda is outlined in a $1.3 million Boston Consulting Group report that was commissioned by the Finance Minister and handed to the government on 21 February. And we understand that that report proposes cuts to service standards, cuts to jobs and closures to post offices. The Secretary of the Department of Infrastructure and Communications has even revealed that the Cabinet has already resolved to continue the recommendations of the report prior to COVID-19 and indeed that that report did recommend cuts, cuts, cuts and closures. This is what Mr Atkinson, the Secretary, had to say. My recollection was that the report was commissioned by Cabinet to come back to Cabinet for consideration and it came back in its normal scheduled time and that just happened to be in COVID-19. That's pretty clear, isn't it? The government had been planning to consider recommendations to cut the postal service well before COVID-19. And the tricky foundation, and it is tricky, of this approach and the regulations that are before us have been clear by the number of untruths the government has felt compelled to tell to justify this position. First, they said Australia Post was going to go broke and would have to cut costs because of declining revenues. And they laid all that out in an article in The Australian on 31 March under the headline, Australia Post forced to slash costs as coronavirus hits revenues. And this story happened to be dropped on the very same day a formal request was made to shareholder ministers for the regulatory changes. Well, there's a problem with that story, quite a big problem. Overall revenues were going up. They were not going down, as asserted in the story, and the Senate has in fact learned that Australia Post was forecasting more revenue as a result of COVID, and this in fact is what occurred. Evidence to the Senate established that parcel volumes in April 2020 were 37.2% higher in April 2020 than they were in March. And it makes sense, doesn't it, if you thought about it for even a moment before you dropped your story to The Australian. Of course revenues would go up. Parcel volumes have gone through the roof, and Australia Post is the primary carrier of parcels in Australia. So once that narrative fell apart, they then tried to claim that address letter volumes had collapsed by 50 per cent. Mm -mm. In response to written questions on notice by Labor senators, Australia Post submitted uh, that address letter volumes went from 139 million in February 2020, before the pandemic, to 155 million in March, when the lockdown began. That's a 12 per cent increase. There's another misleading narrative taken apart by Senate scrutiny. Then, attempt three, the minister tried to claim that postal delivery workers were not busy enough and that through these regulations he was giving them work to do. Well, what a disrespectful and ignorant thing to say. Frontline postal workers have never been busy. That is a statement of fact. They are incredibly busy and they have been working endlessly for our communities throughout COVID, busier than ever. They deserve respect, not insults from an uninformed minister. 
The minister then wrote to a Senate committee and claimed that posties were previously dedicated to handling and delivering letters and that he was liberating them for redeployment to deliver parcels, and that is also not true. There is no such thing as a postie dedicated to delivering letters in Australia. Posties deliver parcels and letters, including essential medicines, and they've done so for years, every day of the week. And if the minister won't take advice from the representatives of workers, well, perhaps he should read what the Executive General Manager of Deliveries at Australia Post said to the Senate back in 2018. Mr Barnes said, today we see nearly 45 per cent of all parcels delivered by posties. So when you think of the context of the letters declining at 10 per cent per year, that's been a big boost for our posties in keeping them busier out there. And we expect to see that close to 50 per cent within a year and a half. The critical point is that when a postie visits your home five days a week, they're also carrying parcels with them five days a week too. So why would the government feel the need to make unnecessary and incorrect assertions that posties only carry letters? Well, the minister has used this language to imply that postal workers have less and less to do as letter volumes decline. But in fact, as letter volumes decline, postal workers deliver an increasing volume of small to medium sized packets and parcels. Finally, Australia Post wrote to members of parliament last week saying the alternate day delivery model was only just coming into effect on the 31st of August. Well, if the changes were so urgent, so urgent that the minister claims that he couldn't have even undertaken any consultation, why take four months to implement? Well, the answer is that the reduced delivery model was designed on the assumption that one in four postal workers would not have a job. We've had unions and postal workers give evidence to the Senate that postal workers across the country were being told that one in four wouldn't have a role. So Senator Green, my colleague, asked this question. Can I just be clear so this is understood? There's a document that you were briefed with that shows that Dan no longer has a round to perform. And what you're saying today is that information was not only briefed to you, it was also briefed to senior management and also out to workplaces. And the witness, Mr Murphy, says, correct. They were briefed at workplaces similar to Lizaro, that one in four posties no longer had a job to do. Senator Green goes on and asks the other witness to confirm, and Mr Morton says, yes, that was the briefing from our management at our delivery facilities. So once the government had to give up on the idea that in the middle of a pandemic they were going to implement massive job cuts at Australia Post, they were forced back to the drawing board and now tried to work out, spend months trying to figure out how to integrate the fourth postal worker into a model that was designed for three. Now this government has been making this up as they go along. The foundations of their arguments, their policy rationale, were dishonest to begin with. That's why they tried to use COVID-19 to bypass consultation with workers in the community. And this is a joke. And it's also not the standard that the community expects from their government at this critical time. We have a minister unwilling to be straight with the public. We have a $1.3 million review into Australia Post that the government refuses to release, and we have a government making it up as they go along. And the Labor Party will seek to disallow these regulations because the government needs to get a clear message. COVID-19 should not be used as a cover to sneak through existing agendas. It's an important principle and one that's at stake in a number of areas of public policy. Thank you. Do we have any other, are there any other speakers to uh, business of the Senate orders of the day number one? In that case, the uh, question is, Sorry, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Australia Post is not immune to the difficulties posed by a global pandemic. To support Australia Post to continue providing the postal services Australians need during the COVID-19 crisis, the government has granted it temporary regulatory relief until the 30th of June 2021. These changes provide Australia Post the flexibility to redeploy its workforce to manage the dramatic increase in parcel volume and decrease in letters accelerated as a result of COVID-19. Australia Post have committed that there will be no forced redundancies or across-the-board reductions in wages due to the temporary arrangements, and the government will review the changes before the end of the year.
So the question is that the instrument be disallowed. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells. No, this is a disallowance. Okay. Well, sorry, I'll just... Just stop the bells, the whips. Stop the bells, the whips okay. Can I just get an acknowledgement? Thank you. Question is that business of the Senate order of the day number one um, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Billick teller for the ayes, Senator Dean Smith teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 23, noes 27. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. I call the clerk. Business of the Senate, order of the day number three, a report from the Economic Legislation Committee on a bill. Senator Smith, are you uh, going to be tabling that report, or do we have the chair? Sorry, Senator Brockman. On behalf, uh, thank you, uh, Ma uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Economics Legislation Committee, I present the report of the Committee on the Banking Amendment Deposits Bill 2020 and documents presented to the committee. Uh, I would also seek leave to make a, a contribution. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted, Senator Rotman. Uh, I just uh, wish to make a few points. This is, this is a private senator's bill uh, from uh, the Pauline Hanson One Nation Party, Senator Roberts uh, being the initiator of this bill. And I do just want to make a couple of quick remarks on the report and some clarifications that need to be made. Um, this is to do with the so-called bail-in possibility uh, of banking institutions bailing in depositors. That it's gained uh, some order. Could, you just resume your seat? Could senators who are not uh, participating in this debate please leave the chamber or uh, sit in their seats quietly? Thank you. Senator Brockman. Uh, that, that has uh, gained some traction in the community. And I rise uh, this afternoon really to make one key point that there is, and the report makes clear, that there is no ambiguity. Uh, in need of rectification by this private senator's bill. Uh, it, is, it is not possible under current law and regulation for APRA to require banks to bail in deposit accounts. Uh, the Reserve Bank, APRA and Treasury all agree that the Banking Act does not imply that losses could be imposed on deposit holders or give APRA any additional powers that could be used to the detriment of retail depositors. Depositors are already safeguarded under a range of protections. The Financial Claims Scheme, uh, which, where the Treasurer may activate the scheme in the event that a bank fails. Upon activation, APRA provides depositors with access to their deposits within seven days up to a $250,000 cap. This covers around 99 per cent of deposit accounts in full uh, and around 80 per cent of household deposits by value. Uh, there is a depositors' preference system which applies to deposits above the FSC, FCS cap and means that in the event a bank fails, the claims of depositors ranks above all equity holders and creditors. And there are numerous layers of prudential regulation and interventions APRA can make to resolve financial institutions in distress such as recapitalisation, statutory management and the transfer of powers. Uh, much of this comes down to the question of what any other how the phrase uh, in the the uh, in the relevant laws any other instrument. Order, Senator Rotman. Point of order, Senator Rickman. I was just going out of the chamber. This um, bill is pursuant to the selection of bills. Um, I understand that leave was given, but normally we don't debate bills that are pursuant to selection of bills. So we would withdraw our support for leave. In that case, Senator Brotman, uh, you no longer have the call. Uh, we we'll return to leave. Government Business Orders of the Day. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number one, uh, National Vocational Education Training Regulator Amendment, Governance and Other Matters Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Thanks. Senator Lambie, you have the call. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. But I'll tell you what these big, big talkers have done so far. They've brought out a fancy marketing campaign to try and hide, hide that taken a sledge, to try and hide the fact that they've taken a sledgehammer to our tapes. And it's been happening for years under both majors. That's what you've been doing. You very quietly ripped four billion dollars out of tapes last year. That's our government. That's supposed that's supposed to be a party of a fair go. But apparently not for tradies and not for apprentices. No fair go for you guys. And the ALP, the supposed party of the worker, helped them do it. The hypocrisy of it drives me absolutely nuts and actually makes my blood boil. Just imagine what we could have done with that money. 
It could have gone desperately to needed upgrades to the equipment that we're training our kids on, or should be training our kids on. That money could have fixed the holes in the windows, the leaks in the roofs, the asbestos that's through those buildings. We could have used it to fund new courses so that students in the regions don't have to move away from home to get any choice in what they want to study. This is the situation that our TAFEs are in. This is the sad reality. They're getting by on the sniff of an oily rag. I still can't wrap my head around the fact that my local TAFE is training students on machines that date back to the Cold War. Yet these guys are still supposed to be able to go straight into a new job with new machines that actually work off IT systems, not something from the Cold War. That's what you're setting them up for. You're setting them up for failure. And the majors have been letting the TAFE struggle, struggle along for years to the point of there's no return. God forbid, God help our children that don't want to go to universities. And I'll tell you, there's a lot that don't. And yet now that they're in crisis, they turn around and expect TAFE to be able to put, help pull, pull us out of this. Well, you're kidding yourselves. You've absolutely trashed them. You've trashed them for our kids. You've trashed them for our apprentices and you've trashed them for the teachers that want to teach our kids. And you want to turn this around. We need to turn around before Christmas time. Come on, be realistic. Be honest with yourselves. You've gutted the sector, you've turned a blind eye and you've put us in this mess. And we aren't going to get out of it with a bunch of governance bills to make that tiny changes to the way the sector gets regulated. I mean, hello, you're shifting the deck chairs on the Titanic. Our TAFEs are sinking under a weight they were never going to be able to handle, and the people who need TAFE are being let down. My office got another email last week from another young apprentice, just one of many, who can't finish his degree because guess what? He can't access the teachers and the courses to finish and start working. He can't go any further with yeah. his apprenticeship. How many more students end up at university because they know they won't have the support that they need the TAFEs? Or the support, should I say, is no longer there? How many people are winding up on the dole queue because they can't get retrained? And yet the federal government, government announced they were fast-tracking 15 critical infrastructure projects, putting $1.5 billion, that's right, $1.5 billion into the economy in July. In the last two weeks, Queensland and Western Australia, my own home state of Tasmania, announced record spending on infrastructure. The government home builder program is rolling out now. It's supposed to keep the construction industry going. But will the sparkies, the chippies and the scaffies be there to make those renos happen? I don't think so. I don't think so. There's your problem. The follow through just isn't there. That's the problem with this whole government idea of yours. You are so out of touch. When it's election time, most politicians can't wait. Can't wait to get, get into some high, some high vis jackets. Let's be honest. You all love having cameras at your own high vis day. But when it comes to making sure our next generation of traders have the equipment, the facilities, and the teachers they need, you actually don't give us stuff. We need to get our tapes cranking for our kids. Not next year now. And if you haven't started already, you failed. So I guess you failed. And this is not just about our kids, it's not just about our tapes. This is for our, the hearts of our communities. This is for our economy. This is why we need this moving. Properly sourced, we could make our TAFEs what they were a generation ago, community hubs that offered our young people trade skills that will actually get them good jobs, supporting them and their families and their communities for years to come. Three generations of my family went through the Devonport TAFE. It got my mum off the factory floor, it got my son his tradie ticket, and it got me a business degree. It was a place where we went to find a new future. It was the heart of the community. Everyone keeps saying we're in this together, but are we? Are we really in this together or just more lip service? Because Australians who want to be able to upskill at their local TAFE, it sure doesn't feel like we're in this together. Devonport's TAFE is teaching student nurses on floorboards that let in paint fumes from the floor below. And you guys have been very aware of that. Your Tasmanian Liberal counterparts have been very aware of that and we're still nothing's being done. I raised this with you guys well over 10 months ago. You haven't been fixed. You're not showing any initiative. I can tell you that much. Order to Senator Lambie, just remind you to address your remarks through the chair. Deputy. 
We're teaching kids trades on equipment that's older than they are. Some of it was made during the Cold War. Our floors are rusted through and our roofs are falling in, and, and yet the coalition, the ones in government, are arguing over who is to blame. Great. You know, it doesn't matter how much TAFE costs if the qualification it offers isn't valued. I want TAFE valued. I want it honoured. I want it fixed. And yet you're all arguing that it's oh, the other guys who need to do something about it. Get real. Show some initiative. Just show some initiative. Make some good, solid decisions. Get in there and fix it. Instead of paying lip service, actually fix it. But I just don't want to know who to blame back collapsing trades and training sector. They're not interested. They don't care. They just don't care about that. But I just want a trades and training sector that isn't collapsing full stop. And let's be honest, that is what is happening wall to wall, floor to ceiling. It is crumbling in front of our eyes. And yet, you guys, the coalition, the government, you're arguing about how many commissioners should sit on a board of an, an, inf an effective regulator. Just another board sitting on top. Just another one that'll get nothing done. Just to make it look like you're actually achieving something. And that bothers me terribly. As soon as you can't get something right and you can't make it happen, you put a board. That's what you do. That's normal, the normal Liberal way. If you care about our trades, care enough to save them. Until then, spare us the speeches about how bad the other guys are. I won't waste a second arguing who's worst. I just want what's best because I, want, I went to TAFE like my mum, like my son, and I see what it did for my family and what it's done for the people in my part of town, what it did for my community, what that heart and soul meant when it was up and running and pumping at 110 per cent. I've seen how much that meant to our community and how much was achieved for our kids. And all I see now, it's got a boot on its neck and it's struggling. It is struggling to breathe and we've got the time in the Senate to give it some breathing space and some breathing room. But instead, we're spending hours debating who gets to be on a board of a regulator, getting to see overtime and no doubt paid an arm and leg to do what? To do what? To do what? Another regulator, another board. To do what? To do the job, apparently, that ministers on that side are not able to do. Because if you were, you wouldn't be paying your mates on top of you to try and get the job done, which they don't either. This is where parliament in this country has got to these days. A minister can't get the job. They pay their mates to do a board, and that's how it works. And quite frankly, you should be ashamed of yourselves. Because if that's what you're doing and that's what you are doing, you should not be a minister in this country. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And, uh, I rise to sum up the debate on the National Vocational Education and Regulator Amendment Governance and Other Matters Bill 2020, and I thank all senators for their contribution to the debate. Uh, delivering excellence in training lies at the heart of the coalition government's skills agenda, and that can only be achieved with a regulatory approach that is fair, transparent and effective, and with a regulator that continually evolves builds organisational capability and engages with the vocational education and training sector. This bill before the Senate ensures that the National Vet Regulator, the Australian Skills and Quality Authority, otherwise known as ASQA, has a more effective, modern and fit-for-purpose governance structure. It responds to both the Braithwaite and Joyce reviews, which called on ASQA to adopt a greater educative role and improve its regulatory approach. Further, it aligns with findings from the rapid review of ASQA's governance, culture and processes undertaken by regulatory experts. The government released the final rapid review report on 30 April 2020. The reforms before us will ensure that ASQA is well positioned to support the VET sector navigate the current COVID-19 environment and, more importantly, to guide the sector's recovery and regrowth once the pandemic abates. In this context, on 12 April 2020, the Australian Government announced measures that provide regulatory fee relief for the VET sector. Certain fees and charges between 1 January 2020 and 30 June 2021 will be waived, and relevant fees already paid will be reimbursed. This will assist the financial viability of registered training organisations supporting business operations during the pandemic and fostering recovery once travel and operational restrictions are relaxed. The revised governance model in the bill will also assist as it draws on best practice for Commonwealth regulators and will enable ASQA to better allocate and clarify operational roles and responsibilities and improve regulatory decision making. 
The existing three commissioner model will be replaced by a single agency head to be known as the CEO or the Chief Executive Officer of ASQA, who will lead ASQA's strategic direction and improve efficiency. Staffing reform at the top and working down, or starting reform at the top and working down, ensures a positive impact on the agency's culture and supports a revised and revitalised organisational structure anticipated as part of the agency reforms. Further, the bill establishes a statutory advisory council consisting of diverse, multidisciplinary experts who will provide ASCO with access to strategic guidance and direction. These appointments will be based on experience and or knowledge rather than representing particular stakeholder interests. It is critical that the independence and expertise of the council is maintained and that one stakeholder group is not preferenced over others. This mechanism for selecting the advisory council is based on recommendations from the rapid review and accords with best practice regulation in similar settings, thus ensuring the CEO of ASQA is provided with high quality, independent expert advice. Significant reform is anticipated in the VET sector over the coming years, and these changes will position the CEO to make the necessary changes to ASQA's internal practices, enhance its educative role and address future challenges. The information sharing provisions in the bill support the disclosure of data collected by the National Centre for Vocational Education Research to a range of bodies. It is the intention of the bill for the National Centre for Vocational Education Research to be able to disclose information to state and territory departments with responsibility for vocational education and training, even where they are also listed on the National Register as a registered training organisation. Enhanced information sharing helps governments and vocational education and training regulators so the diverse needs and requirements of all Australians are considered in policy, funding and regulation. This bill is further evidence of the government's commitment to vet sector reform. It is the next stage of measures that will strengthen ASQA to engage more effectively with stakeholders while continuing to improve its regulatory approach and enhance student outcomes. A strong national regulator supports access to quality, vocational education and training, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you. The question is that this bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Act 2011 and for related purposes. So I understand we do have amendments, so the uh, Senate will move into committee. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill will be taken as a whole? Yes. There being no objection, it is so ordered. So the question is the bill stand as printed. Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, although I should probably call you Chair. Even though we're in committee, it's slightly confusing part of the debate because, sure understandably, you, you don't come that. down to the normal, the normal spot in the in the in the in the chamber where we conduct our committee business. And indeed, I've taken the liberty of conducting my front bench duty from my own place in the chamber, just in the spirit of minimising moving around. Now it's my pleasure to rise this evening and move Labor's amendment that is uh, on sheet 8900. The purpose of our amendment is to ensure that there is TAFE, union and employer sector representation on ASQA's advisory council. Labor very much believes, and we look for the chamber's support on this issue, we very much believe that it is critical that there is a public provider at the table and that the legislation before us today should mandate that this is so. Given the important role uh, the, that this council will have in providing strategic advice about regulatory matters, it is indeed an imperative that the council represents a cross-section of the sector while also providing essential expertise. As the public sector provider, we know that TAFE plays an absolutely critical role and it should be properly represented on the Council. TAFE is the mainstay of our um, VET education across the country. 
We need strong institutions in the VET sector, and it is TAFE that provides that institutional strength. And indeed, TAFE should be directly uh, represented uh, on the ASQA Advisory Council. It is the pillar of quality in vocational education, and its advice and guidance will be invaluable to ASQA. So it does not benefit anyone in our nation to have the expertise of TAFE educators sidelined if, in the event that TAFE does not have a recognised seat at the table. Now, I, I understand TAFE appointments could be made, but they might come from a diversity of places, a diversity of tastes. But it's really important that someone uh, is seen to be seen to be mandated as a TAFE representative on ASQA. People in this sector can wear many hats, uh, and it's critically important, in my view, that TAFE uh, is formally recognised as being represented at the, uh, at the uh, ASQA Advisory Council. We also want an advisory council that is not unduly weighted to representing private providers. Uh, we very much believe that this could undermine ASQA's regulatory approach. Equally, I must say, trade union representation, balanced also by representation from employer groups, is vital. Uh, Labor understands this on both sides from hard-earned experience in the sector. Uh, the voice of trade unions, they work very hard uh, to understand and represent their professions that they represent uh, when it comes to uh, regulatory uh, advice and indeed on advice regarding uh, a, our skills agenda and ASQA. What's critically important here is that skills relate not just to the skills being taught today but to the existing skills of people who are already in the workforce, to those people who have already acquired that education. And as ASQA regulates, it needs to look not only to uh, the current and future skills, but it also needs to look uh, back to the skills uh, that people already hold and how they interface with each other. And trade unions are in an excellent position to assist in doing that. Industry, of course, is central to the operation of an effective skill formation system. Unions and employers have an important role in providing feedback and advice on the regulators' activities and rules, and we, we really want to see employers and industry directly represented on the Advisory Council of ASQA also. Union members, the workers are at the coalface of training, and they know all too well the system uh, and its problems. Uh, union representatives get these issues fed through to them, and so unions are indeed in a good place to be able to uh, contribute that uh, to ASQA. And indeed, trade unions, uh, through union representation through the ACTU and other employment groups, they're very good at triaging uh, the information from a diversity of points across unions. Just like employer representatives do, they can triage the information that comes across the sector up into the representative advisory council of ASQA. Unions have been at the forefront of developing occupational standards, career paths, safety and the quality of skills development in workplaces. And again, they deserve a place uh, at the table. Uh, I would like to say to the chamber and to the government to not have a voice of those at the coalface of work and training, that is, the people being trained, the people who hold qualifications that come from the sector, would diminish any work that ASQA did. And I commend Labor's amendment to the Senate. Senator Fruki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as I highlighted in my second reading speech, the Greens will be supporting Labor's amendment. Um, the amendment requires the minister to include representatives from TAFE, from unions and from employer groups on the advisory council that is established um, by this legislation. And this will make sure that the voices of our public training providers as well as our workers are heard in any VET policy that is made. Minister. Oh, thank you, 
Madam Acting or well, Madam Chair at the moment, um, the government will not be supporting the amendment uh, that has been moved by the opposition. Uh, the 2020 Rapid Review recommended that members of the Advisory Council be appointed based on their experience and or their knowledge, rather than representing a particular stakeholder interest. This approach is consistent with best practice settings uh, regulation in similar settings. The National Vet Regulator needs to be supported by experts to ensure continuous improvement, strategic advice and meaningful sector engagement. Choosing a representative from a stakeholder group, whether that stakeholder be a group be from an employer group um, or a TAFE, is no guarantee of individual experience or knowledge, as is envisioned by the legislation. The mechanism for choosing members outlined in the bill is appropriate and will lead to an independent skills-based advisory council with members who bring expertise across a range of disciplines. This will ensure that the CEO of ASQA is provided with high quality advice. No further questions. There being no further questions, the question is that the amendment be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Are those against say no. No. The noes have it. Is the division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. So the question is that the amendment, as moved by Senator Pratt on uh, number one on sheet 8900, revised, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Brockman as teller for the noes. Order. There being 24 ayes and 24 noes, the matter is negated. I'll just allow people to get back to their seats and we'll move to the next question. So the question now is that the bills stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. And the question is that uh, the bill now be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The question is that the bill now be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Report from the Committee of the Whole. The committee has considered the National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Amendment Governance and Other Matters Bill of 2020 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee now be adopted. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be now read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the National Vocational Education and Training Regulator Act 2011 and for related purposes. Government business order for day number two. Transport Security Amendment Testing and Training Bill 2019. Resumption of second reading debate. Senator Pratt. Thank you very much. Our Deputy President. The Labor Party supports a safe and secure transport section, sector in our nation. It needs to be managed by the right legislation and regulation to stay one step ahead of criminals and terrorists. We of course know the threats facing our transport sector are constantly evolving, and it's critical that we revise and refine our laws to keep Australia's transport sector one of the safest in the world. The safety and security of all Australians is paramount. We will always take the advice of our national security agencies in, uh, in the Labor Party. We will. Labor has, a consist Labor has a consistent track record of working cooperatively and in a bipartisan manner on all matters of national security, and of course the bill before the chamber today is no exception. So the bill today amends the Aviation Transport Security Act of 2004, that is the Aviation Act, and the Maritime Transport and Offshore Facilities Security Act of 2003, the Maritime Act to improve the effectiveness of screening at Australia's security controlled airports and security regulated ports. 
The bill before us, Madam Acting Deputy President, aims to improve transport security in two important ways. Firstly, we have a bill before us that clarifies the ability of aviation security inspectors to test aviation industry participants' security systems, including by specifically allowing inspectors to conduct system tests with the test pieces at locations beyond screening points in an airport terminal. And they'll be able to do this without the risk of committing an offence against other laws. For example, following the passage of the bill, aviation security inspectors will be able to expand their testing regimes to include air cargo examination and, importantly, catering facilities. The bill before us also establishes the framework needed to introduce a national standard of competency of aviation and maritime screening personnel. The thousands of security screeners who work hard at our airports uh, and seaports perform a vital role. And I personally, as I'm sure all uh, senators and staff in this place, are personally grateful for the work that they do keeping us safe in our skies. These people, uh, our security screeners, prevent weapons, firearms and explosives from making it onto an aircraft or cruise ships, ensuring we can all travel safely and secure, securely. And it's notable to me that uh, they do this largely uh, without discovering such items because they're there to make sure we're not carrying them, highlighting the significant role and importance of the screening role that they play, uh, meaning that in in the large part, people don't even attempt to get such items on board. Uh, and indeed, it means we're all happy to comply and participate uh, in such screening. In the context of uh, screening, the legislation ensures that the education, training and testing requirements for screeners will remain flexible, effective uh, and relevant in an increasingly complex security environment. It gives us the necessary framework so that screeners are well equipped to respond to threats uh, both now and into our future. The bill introduces measures allowing the Secretary of the Department of Home Affairs to prescribe the requirements associated with screeners' training, qualification and accreditation. This is with the aim of enabling screener requirements to be adapted efficiently and in response to rapid changes in the security environment. Uh, meaning that we will have a more flexible and agile workforce in responding to these issues. I'd like to draw particular attention to the important work of the Senate Scrutiny of Bills Committee in relation to this legislation. The original bill had a number of gaping holes which were identified by the committee. And uh, I'm sad really to say that they do speak to the lack of due diligence that has become commonplace under this Liberal National Government, uh, and it is particularly alarming to see these uh, issues arise within a security context. Firstly, the unamended legislation would have permitted an aviation security inspector to test an aviation industry participant security system, including by using an item, weapon or vehicle to test its detection. And of course, this means real weapons and therefore real explosives in, uh, uh, and, uh, in, detest in uh, testing the detection of such items. While the legislation notes that tests must be done in accordance with any requirements prescribed in regulations, we don't believe that delegated legislation should be used unless a sound justification is provided. And as no such justification has been provided, despite the Scrutiny of Bills Committee calling on the government to explain this lack of clarity in December, we are therefore within Labor moving an amendment today that seeks to prevent this legislation coming into force until the testing re requirements are prescribed via regulation. Second, the explanatory memorandum clearly states that any test pieces such as imitation firearms and simulated improvised explosion devices are designed to be inert and not to cause harm. However, as the Scrutiny of Bills Committee noted again, 
This requirement does not exist on the face of the primary legislation, and Labor believes that this must be uh, fixed. What kind of government, I ask the Chamber today, through you, Madam Acting Deputy President, forgets a requirement like this from the legislation? This is about keeping people safe in their workplaces and safe in our skies, plain and simple. Under what context or uh, position should people uh, who are testing the robustness of screening be asked to use uh, live ammunition, uh, live uh, firearms or, or uh, for example, real explosives? We appreciate that the government has heard Labor's members' urgent calls for the legislation to be amendment, amended and to provide assurance that live firearms or improvised explosion devices won't be used. We're pleased to say we will, of course, support this amendment to correct uh, this glaring oversight. Lastly, the legislation allows the secretary to determine training and qualification requirements for screening officers by legislative instrument. The secretary is, however, also empowered to exempt a class of screening officers from one or more of the requirements if exceptional circumstances exist. Now we acknowledge that there might be valid situations where exemptions might need to be applied. Labor does believe that the application of these exemptions must be reported transparently, and we thank the government in advance of their commitment to accurately and transparently answer questions in relation to these exemptions during Senate estimates. And I'd like to draw uh, Senator Cash's uh, um, attention to these remarks, uh, which was to say to the government, uh, we, uh, we uh, have very forthrightly argued that uh, any exemptions um, to the tra uh, training qualification requirements for screening officers, uh, that anyone who's exempted from that uh, that the government reports that transparently, and we're looking to the government to provide that information during Senate uh, estimates in relation to the use of any such exemptions. The Australian people put great trust in the parliament to ensure that we enact the right legislation to protect Australia's national security. We do this while also balancing any new laws with openness and transparency. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, it is with the spirit of continuing to build trust with the Australian people that Labor uh, will move these amendments. We welcome the amendments that the government will move today and we will support them as they go some way to fixing problems with the bill. In addition, we look to moving our own amendments to fully capture the re recommendations of the Scrutiny of Bills Committee and solve these issues in this very important bill. I have to say a lack of due diligence and accountability have been the calling card of the Morrison government. I commend the Scrutiny of Bills Committee for their work on this important piece of legislation. We used to be able to trust the Morrison government with our borders, but sadly it does not appear to be the case anymore. We saw uh, in March this year when Scott Morrison, Prime Minister Morrison said with the arrival of the Ruby Princess. He said the Australian government will also ban cruise ships from foreign ports uh, from arriving at Australian ports. The Prime Minister said on that same day there will be some bespoke arrangements that we will put in place directly under the command of the Australian Border Force to ensure that the relevant protections are put in place. Four days later, the Prime Minister, um, uh, four days later after the Prime Minister's remarks, on 19 March, the Ruby Princess was allowed to disembark in Sydney its 2,700 passengers. As we know, this included sick passengers allowed to spread across Australia and the globe. So this is despite banning cruise ships and putting border force in direct command with bespoke arrangements. We, our Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, did not stop one, that one boat that mattered. The boat that he promised uh, to stop, and Australians have lived with those consequences. Now, the Prime Minister has uh, made light of this by pointing 
to uh, the fact that the Commonwealth didn't have ultimate responsibility for these issues, and so he let himself off the hook. What does not let him off the hook is the fact that he made these very public undertakings to the Australian people. So I call on the Prime Minister in the context of this debate about safety and screening at our borders to put this debate also in the context of COVID-19 and call on the Prime Minister to apologise to the hundreds of Australians who have contracted COVID-19 because of the Ruby Princess, as well as the family members of Australians who have lost their lives. The Ruby Princess is a disaster which spread COVID-19 across Australia and the globe. It is responsible for over 1,000 cases of COVID-19, 30 tragic deaths, the North West Tasmanian outbreak, which included 11 deaths and uh, was 127 of the cases that I spoke about uh, before. So we cannot forget that allowing the Ruby Princess to dock in Sydney, despite the Prime Minister's undertakings that he would manage the situation, is a big human tragedy. Over 30 Australians have lost their lives as a result of it. Uh, in the short time that's available, I want to draw attention uh, to uh, issues around the Commonwealth and the ABF. When it comes to our borders, the buck should and does stop with the Commonwealth. No amount of buck posts passing by the Prime Minister or his ministers absolves them of this responsibility, uh, a responsibility which is outlined within the Constitution. We've also seen disasters in airplane arrivals uh, claiming asylum, with an absolute explosion of over 100,000 airplane arrivals in Australia claiming asylum. Uh, we've seen Peter Dutton's half a billion dollar paladin blunder, uh, and we've also uh, seen a litany of other home affairs failures. So today, in concluding uh, this debate, uh, I want to reflect on when we're looking at the standards of security uh, at our borders, where we're looking at training and testing and a robust system for doing that. It's right that we have a government that pays attention to those issues in the legislation uh, that's before us today. But we can see that there are holes in that legislation, significant holes that need to be uh, fixed by amendment today, and we can see a litany of other home affairs failures at Australia's borders. Senator Rice, remotely. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. It's really good to be here today to join this debate from my electorate office in Brunswick to speak to the Transport Security Amendment Testing and Training Bill 2019. I'm very glad that we've got the virtual parliament access working so I'm able to contribute to this, deba this debate. As Senator Dunningham noted in his second reading speech, this bill improves the effectiveness of screening at Australia's security controlled airports and security regulated ports. And we support that. And so the Greens will be supporting this bill. And I'll come to some specific comments about this bill later. But first, I want to take the opportunity, given we're talking about airports, to speak about the state of aviation in these difficult times that we're currently in. I mean, the COVID-19 pandemic is, of course, having massive impacts on our society. And my heart goes out to people who have lost loved ones, people who are still suffering with the illness, and people who are finding getting through this pandemic really, really tough. And in particular, COVID-19 has had and will continue to have significant impacts on our aviation sector from the people who would be employed doing these security checks at airports through to people who are employed in the airline industry. We've seen massive drop-offs in flights, and of course, one of our airlines is currently under administration. And it is a travesty that our government has refused to support Virgin. They should have taken meaningful action to support one of Australia's two largest domestic carriers during the crisis. Instead, they allowed it to go into administration and we still don't know what state it's 
Stoker, and uh, we will return uh, to Senator Rice uh, when we can. Senator Stoker. It's an excellent adaptation, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to speak in favour of the Transport Security Amendment Testing and Training Bill. Before the advent of COVID-19, 38 million people travelled through Australian ports, whether airports or marine ports, annually. Like the many Australians who work for our airlines, our airports, tourism operators and business travel companies, I'm really looking forward to seeing that level of movement and that kind of volume of passengers return once the restrictions we currently face are eased. So many livelihoods and indeed lives depend on Australia maintaining its reputation and its record for being one of the safest places in the world to travel. That's why, as technology develops and the risk landscape evolves, as those who would seek to do us harm come up with ever more creative ways to go about it, the coalition government is doing all that is necessary to maintain that reputation for being a secure, trusted destination. So, let me explain what this bill does to contribute to that important result for all Australians. The first thing it does, and this is quite significant, is to create powers for aviation security inspectors to engage in covert testing of aviation industry participants' security systems. Now, that's a whole lot of industry speak for saying that it's really important that people who work in particular, particularly aviation security, but it's also true of maritime security, are able to run tests. It's worth the carbon pollution of the flight. In the what would you like me to do about that, <laughs> Mr. Acting Deputy President? Continue. I, I, I think you should uh, continue, Senator Stoker, and okay. then we'll go back to Senator Rice. No problem. Um, so it's really important that people who are working in the security space in our airports are able to conduct tests that reflect um, the nature of the items that might want to be smuggled through our airports. Um, they need to be able to test the kinds of um, scenarios that might arise in the event of a terrorist scenario. And they need to be able to do it in a way that is real enough to equip the people working in these roles with the skills they need to be able to respond swiftly and with confidence in the event that the worst did happen. But the bill also makes for sensible precautions. It means that, um, for instance, the weapons that would be used in conducting these types of test scenarios are dummy ones. They're not actually live weapons, for instance. They aren't live bombs. Um, they're, they're dummy devices, but they're able to be used um, within airports and in um, mock-type scenarios to help the people who need to work in these environments using ever-evolving new technology to have the skills they need to be able to adapt when it really matters. Now, what pops to mind for many people when they hear that is, well, hold on, we've got plenty of laws in this country that say you can't have a bomb hoax at an airport. That itself is a crime. Um, and that is a good pickup by those people who notice it. And so one thing that this bill also does is to make it clear that when people who work as security officers engage in these uh, training exercises, or when training officers or inspectors um, come to airports and run these types of exercises and in doing so introduce items that look like they pose a serious threat and could be construed as a hoax, aren't actually to be liable under civil or criminal law for the fact of that um, mock scenario. So that's another important thing that the bill does. It also clarifies and um, aligns the legislative basis in a consistent way across the country for um, training and accrediting people in their qualifications for 
undertaking these important screening roles. Um, as I've mentioned, the, the shifting technology landscape is important in security screening, and so it's important that there are opportunities for people who have been doing this work for some time to access professional um, education that continues to update their skills as time passes. But it's also important to make sure that the training that people are receiving is um, sufficiently tailored to the nature of the work, not just, say, the kind of general security training that someone who might become a security guard at a nightclub, for instance, has undertaken. There is a different set of skills that's required at an airport, and so that is clarified by this bill. But so too is consistency among um, the different places in Australia to make sure that uh, we are making it easy for people who are working in this field to be able to have their qualifications recognised wherever they go. Finally, the bill also provides for the creation of legislative instruments like regulations to make provision for, I guess, the nuts and bolts of making this stuff happen. Uh, the provision of identity cards, for instance, for people who work in security screening roles. Uh, provision for what their uniform should be like so that people who undertake these roles can be easily identified, particularly in emergency. So these, these are, in, in broad terms, the goals of the legislation. And it might, in many ways, it's, it's a simple and somewhat unglamorous bill. Um, like a lot of the hard work of government, it's not necessarily shiny or the kind of thing that people want to have reported on the front page of the paper, but it really does matter because having security staff who are up to date with how to use the latest technology, able to identify up to date threats from those who would seek to do Australians harm and who are uh, at the top of their game because they are being regularly tested on their ability to implement those skills on the job, are people who are best placed to keep Australians safe when it matters most. And that's something that should give all Australians great confidence. I've said something about the covert security testing that will be facilitated by this bill. And it's, it's worth explaining the situations in which um, inspectors and testers will have the benefit of exceptions from criminal and civil liability for their activities in training people and testing people uh, to do this work well. And the circumstances in which a person would get that kind of an immunity are uh, where the test is first conducted in good faith. They're doing it for the right reasons in the course of their work, for instance. Um, the second criterion is that the test doesn't seriously endanger the health or safety of any person because it's important that both people at work and passengers don't have their experience become an unsafe one as a consequence of these activities. And finally, that it doesn't result in significant loss of or damage to property. Where those three criteria are met by a person who is helping with testing and training exercises, they'll get the benefit um, of that immunity from civil or criminal liability. And it is important that we give people who are engaged in this work the ability to go about their business knowing that they're not at risk of breaching other laws, like, for instance, the one I mentioned um, about there being bans on bomb hoaxes in our airports. When I go to the topic, though, of the training provisions of this bill, it's worth going back to 2016 where Mr Michael Carmody completed an inquiry into aviation and maritime transport security education and training in Australia. It had a look at all of the different types of training that were done in this area, the outcomes that were being achieved by the people who had undergone that training uh, when they were assessed, and the overall quality of the training options that existed in the aviation and maritime sectors. And he made a bunch of recommendations for its improvement. One of the things that that inquiry identified as being important was the need for um, clarity about what constitutes sufficient qualifications under national standards. So 
He suggested the introduction of standardised qualifications for people who undergo um, this type of work on a day-to-day -day basis, distinguishing it from other types of security laws. And he also highlighted the importance of there being national tests so that those people who are engaged in this work were reaching a consistent standard nationwide. He highlighted the need for ongoing on-the-job training and a continuing education and professional development program to be available for people who work in this area so that they can keep up with changes in terrorist tactics for those who um, are responsible for identifying them day to day. That's an important factor. And also for their ability to um, keep up with the technology that's being used to identify these items when they're on the job. So this bill, in, consistently with um, those recommendations, acts upon the suggestion that there should be a more specific security screening qualification. And it does introduce national minimum standards for on-the-job training and continuing professional development for screening officers. And it does bring in national competency testing for screening officers. Now, you might be thinking, well, what if you're someone who's been working in this field for many years and you've been doing it either with basic on-the-job training or on the basis of a more generalised security qualification? What does that mean for you? And that's a pretty fair question. Mr Acting Deputy President, the people who fall into that category will get recognition of um, those parts of their skill set um, that are relevant to their work. They will get um, accreditation that reflects the skill level they've reached. And they will also get the benefit of a 12-month period um, of transition, so that if there are little extra modules that they might need to pick up in order to make sure they're meeting the national standards, then um, they'll have some time to do that. So we don't want to be unreasonable um, when we're asking people, particularly in an industry that's facing some um, disruption at the moment, the 12-month period will make it much easier for people to adapt to this in their career. There's also something that can be said for um, the strength of the endorsement that this bill has got from parts of our community. Now, while the Department of Home Affairs has explained why this bill is necessary, um, I always think it's nice to be able to look to somebody beyond the department to see whether or not uh, it is getting the same kind of encouragement from elsewhere. And this bill received support from Dr John Coyne. From, he's the head of the Strategic Policing and Law Enforcement Program at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, um, an organisation that I really quite respect. Now, in the course of his submissions, Dr Coyne highlighted that the provision of explicit powers for security inspectors to conduct covert security systems would provide a much needed additional mechanism to maintain the security of Australia's aviation sector. He noted that as screening technology improves and terrorists innovate, the minimum level of training for screening officers must also increase if they are to continue to mitigate risks. So that's what we're doing. We're arming the people who every day in their work protect us by detecting threats, by managing risk, and who are really able to put themselves, they're willing to put themselves on the line every day as they go about making sure that they keep Australians who are travelling safe. As we give them the tools that they need to do their job well, it's important that we make sure that as a society we continue to look out for their interests by making sure they are at the top of their game and that we look out for Australians by equipping them to protect them as best as possible. We need to make sure it all works together to achieve something that really is quite big, and that is a safer Australian transport sector with flow-on benefits for trade, for travel, 
for business relationships and for Australia's attractiveness as a safe and fun place to visit and to do business. Thank you, Senator Stoker. Is leave granted for Senator Rice to resume her speech? Uh, leave is granted. Senator Rice. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I presume you can hear me again now. We can hear you beautifully, and you may start at the beginning if you wish. Okay, now I won't start from the beginning. I've been told approximately where I got up to. Um, the, the biggest issue was that I didn't know that I'd dropped out. Anyway, okay, so look, I heard from workers from the Transport Workers Union recently, and it was a privilege to hear from these extraordinary people about how they are speaking up, even as the government is refusing to back them. It's not just that the government has refused to back Virgin, they also haven't supported the Donata workers, who are a key part of the transport supply chain. If you've caught a flight in Australia, odds are good that a Donata worker has made that flight possible. Cleaning the flight that's so critical to keeping people safe, providing the catering, and they don't get the recognition or appreciation they deserve, but they make a crucial difference. But the government has failed them. So there's a significant work, amount of work to be done in the aviation sector, way beyond what we're considering tonight, that this government is failing to do, letting down Australian workers and Australians around the country. Aviation has been affected massively by the pa this pandemic. And the security screen that we're talking about tonight, those workers who are working there, it's going to be a long time before the same number of workers are back on the job as pre-pandemic. I mean, I'm here in my office in Melbourne, not in Canberra, obviously, because of the pandemic. I haven't flown for over six months, along with so many other frequent flyers, business people, people not flying around the country for tourism, or visiting loved ones. And even if we get a vaccine, aviation is not going to just snap back. And the fact that you know we are here tonight with this technology, as good as it, I hope it's continuing to be, using this technology, such it means that we are not all going to go back to flying at the drop of a hat. And we will consider whether flying interstate for a meeting is actually the best way to meet, or whether maybe a remote meeting or a video link actually would would, would suffice. And critically, should we be flying when there are other options of meeting which don't have the carbon pollution that a flight does? And in the environment when there's no carbon budget left, in that context, reducing flying makes an awful lot of sense. So we desperately need a plan for aviation for Australia, way beyond considering security arrangements such as we're considering tonight that takes account of the impact of this pandemic and the imperative to reduce our carbon pollution to zero. There is a future for aviation that navigates a path through these huge issues, but it needs to be explicitly identified and planned for. And that's what a government should be doing, developing such a plan in collaboration with workers, with businesses, with NGOs, with communities to ensure that workers are looked after, to ensure a future for aviation businesses, for airports, for the workers in security screening, that takes account of the essential transport that aviation provides in this far-flung country of ours. And we Greens, we will keep banging the drum about this because it's such a critical need. Having a plan for aviation would mean that we could see whether the actions that we are taking now in response to the pandemic are the appropriate ones, whether they do line up as being part of sensible, strategic, just, sustainable plan for the future for aviation. So in this context, let me now address some issues concerning the bill, in particular, that we are debating tonight. And the Greens support the steps that the government is taking here to improve airport security. I would reiterate, however, a number of concerns that we raised in additional comments to the committee report. The explanatory memorandum specifies that security testing changes will enable the government to meet recommendations accepted from the Inspector of Transport Security and the International Civil Aviation Organization to expand the scope of system tests to a wider range of security measures, but without providing any information of where these recommendations are from. 
And when the Rural, Regional Affairs and Transport Committee examined this bill, this report had not been published. An additional aspect in this bill, of course, is the fact that it will allow the Secretary of the Department to determine the training at all. We will create development in aviation in exactly the same way that this government addresses climate change, through technology. If it can be done, it will be done through technology and not by wishful thinking. And This is the approach I would recommend to Senator Rice to take in relation to she should look at the coalition's technology roadmap and apply that if she thinks that this is relevant in relation to this bill. Now, <clears throat> Senator Brockman, of course, brought up the subject of, a national, of national security. He was quite right to point this out. This is where national security in relation to aviation transport system, where the rubber hits the road. National security is not something which is conducted only by the military or by the police or home affairs. National security is something which everyone is responsible for and every element of the nation. National security applies to all of us. And I often say that security of the nation takes a whole nation. But in relation to this bill, where the rubber hits the road is where you can, uh, you can achieve security, yet at the same time still allow the nation to function still allow us to achieve prosperity through the market uh, and still allow us to progress in a number of different ways. Now, the reason that it takes a nation to secure a nation is because if we think that just one part of this nation will give us security, such as the military, uh, then we are going to forget that a critical part of national security is self-reliance. And self-reliance, of course, is the basis of our very sovereignty. Sovereignty is critical to us, and we are only really just learning and just being reminded by COVID of how incredibly important our sovereignty is. And sovereignty is not something which exists in one point in space. Sovereignty is something which you can have more of or less of in accordance with the forces that act on you as a nation. Now, the self-reliance self that we need doesn't just apply to manufacturers or weaponry or spare parts. It applies to the processes and the culture in your nation. As I said before, most Australians would be astonished to discover that we weren't doing the activities that are permitted by in this bill, that we weren't doing these activities. Uh, already. So uh, when you get down to the most detailed and the bottom level, national security depends on aviation screeners being very, very well trained and very, very capable. Now I speak about self-reliance, and self-reliance is critical in the manufacturing area in, in relation to defence, in relation to cyber and a thousand different areas. And self-reliance is that in this nation we must be able to do what we need, not what we would like to do. We don't need to do everything. If we did everything, we'd be like North Korea uh, and not trading with anyone, developing everything internally, and some people call that self-sufficiency. Where we are at the moment in relation to not just screeners at airports, not just manufacturing, where we are, we are at the moment is that market forces deliver prosperity. But isn't it strange that the market forces within the aviation industry have not delivered the kind of security that we are talking about in this particular bill? Only authorities or governments can deliver security, and that's what this bill is all about. Um, as I said before, a good report, a good bill. It's not revolutionary, but it is a good bill. You, this can be achieved without great disruption to what's going on and accommodating individuals. This bill is essential. It can be done safely, 
and it must be done given the importance of the aviation industry to us within an environment uh, replete with terrorism. We should do it now because uh, uh, we have a hiatus in the aviation industry where we can make change and when we come out of that change we should come out of the change roaring. We owe this to the travelling public and we owe this to the screeners, of course, who, who use this on a daily basis. And this is a very, very serious business and we must make it a safety business. Um, Madam Acting Deputy uh, uh, President, uh, I commend the bill uh, and I, uh, uh, I, I see the need for it and I think there is, uh, th there is uh, very, very good reasons for proceeding with it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Molan. I call the minister. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I rise to sum up the debate on the Transport Security Amendment Testing and Training Bill 2019. And I thank all senators uh, for their contributions to the debate. Australia's transport sector is one of the safest and most secure in the world. However, the sector remains an enduring target for terrorists, and we need to ensure that security arrangements remain robust and responsive in the face of an evolving threat environment. The Transport Security Amendment Testing and Training Bill 2019 amends the Aviation Transport Security Act 2004 and the Maritime Transport and Offshore Facilities Security Act 2003 to improve the effectiveness of screening at Australia's security-controlled airports and security-regulated airports. At ports. Security screeners perform a vital role in securing our airports and seaports. They prevent weapons such as firearms or explosives from making it onto an aircraft or cruise ship, ensuring that we can all travel safely and securely. The bill will establish the necessary framework to ensure that the education, training and testing requirements for screeners remain effective and flexible in an increasingly complex security environment now and into the future. The bill also provides appropriate legislative protection so that it is clear that aviation security inspectors may continue to undertake compliance activities across a range of relevant locations in order to protect against unlawful interference. The bill has been reviewed by the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee and the, standing, the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills. The Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee recommended that the bill be passed. In response to the advice of the Scrutiny of Bills Committee, I will be in the committee stage moving several relatively minor but important amendments to the bill, which I will address at that time. Uh, again, I thank all senators for their contribution to the debate, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Cash. The question is that this bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to transport security and for related purposes. Thank you. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. And the minister has the first amendment. Uh, thank you. And I table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to this bill, and I seek leave to move Government Amendments 1 to 7 on sheet SG 103. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Um, Madam Acting, uh, Deputy Pres or Madam Acting Dep Chair, uh, these amendments will make it clear that test pieces used by aviation security inspectors must be inert, and then in the performance of their duties, Aviation security inspectors must not endanger the health or safety of the public. The amendments that have been moved by the government will also insert a requirement that the number of exemptions granted by the Secretary of the Department of Home Affairs in relation to screener training and accreditation be published in that department's annual report. And as I said, uh, this bill was scrutinised by the Scrutiny of Bills Committee. Uh, the Scrutiny of Bills Committee made some recommendations, uh, and in relation to um, that advice, uh, these are the amendments, relatively minor but important amendments, that the government is moving to the bill. Thank you, Senator 
Cash. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Aye. And against say no. I believe the ayes have it. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Chair. Tonight, uh, Labor would like to note the Greens' amendments before the Chamber to improve transparent reporting. Labor very much agrees uh, and has asserted in uh, this debate that transparency is critically important. Labor, in our conversations with the government, we have been assured by the government that uh, officials will accurately and transparently transparently answer questions in relation to exemptions granted by the Secretary of the Department of Home Affairs during Senate estimates. And these are matters that I touched on in my second reading uh, speech. So can I ask the minister, please, if you can outline why estimates in this case is the appropriate forum to raise these matters? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Pratt, in response to the questions that you have raised, uh, which I understand is in relation to the amendments uh, that may or will be moved by the Australian Greens uh, tonight, um, the government amendments to the bill I am instructed include a requirement for the number of exemptions given to classes of screening officers issued by the Secretary to be reported in the department's annual report. Uh, reporting the number of exemptions given by the secretary is appropriate uh, for the annual report. The additional information that would be required uh, would require a level of detail to be included in the annual report uh, that is not appropriate. The additional information uh, being requested may be sensitive in nature and indicate a situation that may be subject to exploitation uh, by a person's intent on causing harm to the aviation or maritime industry. Um, should senators acquire the additional information proposed in the amendments, um, I am instructed that uh, you are correct. Senators will have the opportunity to ask the department during estimates hearings uh, throughout the year. But they, we won't, will obviously be opposing uh, what the Greens have put forward. Thank you, thank you Senator Mr. Pratt. Uh, and thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you for your uh, response that outlines the, that this information uh, will be reported in part in the annual report. Can I ask the minister to elaborate on, in the context of senators being able to ask questions about that report uh, in Senate estimates, can I ask about the nature of the information that will be made available? For example, will officials report the length of time that exemptions are applied to screening officers? Senator Cash. Thank you, uh, Senator Pratt. I'm instructed that we will be reporting the number of exemptions uh, that are granted by the Secretary each year in the department's annual report. And then in relation to the questions that senators may have at estimates, uh, the Senate, uh, those senators may ask those questions uh, at estimates and an answer may or may not be given, depending on what that question is. And I can't preempt what those questions are going to be. Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So can I ask in that context, um, given the Secretary does have the ability to exempt screening officials from training, I'm sure the minister would agree it is appropriate and it shouldn't go to the detail of the kind of national security matters that you're highlighting, uh, that the public understands how long an exemption is applied, uh, to whom it's been applied, uh, and perhaps who's exercised that exemption. For example, an exemption might apply um, uh, if you could characterise whether it, each exemption has to apply to an individual or it might be a whole class of, uh, of people uh, that carry that exemption over a particular period of time. So if you can outline for the Senate the kind of information that we should reasonably be able 
to ask. For example, um, we would want to know that it's not the same exemption being applied over and over again uh, as well. Senator Cash. Uh, and again, Senator Pratt, as I've stated, in terms of what will be reported in the department's annual report, uh, it is the number of exemptions um, given to classes of screening officers. In terms of the information that a senator uh, may elicit from the secretary um, at an estimates hearing, again, I can't preempt what that information would be, but a senator can certainly put a question to the secretary. Uh, if the secretary is able to answer that question, I'm sure that he would. Uh, and if there is not, he would state the grounds upon which he is unable to provide that information at that point in time. Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Minister. Now, we have had in the opposition assurances that officials will accurately and transparently answer questions in relation to exemptions. Uh, and now the minister seems to be indicating that it's really up to the secretary the extent to which they may choose to answer those questions. But in negotiations, you have, uh, the government has asserted that the secretary will be ready and willing to answer those questions. Uh, and so I'm very keen to hear from the government that you will be in a position to answer questions like how long the exemptions were in place for, uh, not just the class of people but the number of officers to whom that exemption applied uh, and whether it's being applied in the same circumstances over and over again. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And again, Senator Pratt, um, that is not what I said. I said, Senator, I can't preempt the questions that a senator may ask. Um, to the extent that the secretary is able to answer a question, um, other than say relying on a ground of national security or a ground that's set out, the questions that you have just put forward would be reasonable questions. Senator Pratt. Thank you. I'm, uh, thank you for acknowledging they would be uh, reasonable questions because that does uh, indicate. Uh, that, you know, that the kinds of questions we have in mind, that we will be able to access those answers. Um, could the minister outline the preparation officials will complete before each estimates to ensure the secretary and other witnesses <coughs> are able to answer such questions? For example, the annual report highlights the number of um, uh, exemptions uh, and, and, the, uh, and the classes of people, but clearly we're seeking now an undertaking from the government that the kind of information uh, that I've asked about will be available. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Pratt. Well, the normal preparation, I assume, would apply. Um, I can't speak on behalf of the secretary, uh, but certainly um, you have been around for a very long time and you would be aware that there is a provision whereby senators who have questions can provide those questions to the relevant department uh, in advance in anticipation of ensuring that information is readily at hand uh, on the day of the actual estimates hearing. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Uh, and so, in that sense, you've given us assurance that uh, that information uh, uh, we will have the opportunity to ask the department to prepare uh, information on questions along those lines uh, before estimates. Can I ask, in that context, what information, if any, will not be provided during estimates? Senator Cash. Uh, well, again, Senator Pratt, I am, we're dealing in hypotheticals here because I really don't know the nature of questions that may be asked at estimates. But certainly in relation to any estimates hearings, uh, there are grounds upon which an official can rely on in the event that uh, they believe they are unable to give an answer. That can then be challenged uh, by senators. Um, and there is then a procedure um, that, as you would be aware, uh, the senators are able to go down. Um, but certainly, um, in this respect, uh, one would believe that it would be national security. Senator Pratt. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Minister. <clears throat> In that context, uh, you are then therefore assuring us that questions like uh, whether an exemption is repeatedly applied, uh, that we should be able to get an answer uh, to that if the same circumstances are, 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 are envisaged for each exemption. Um, clearly, that wouldn't go necessarily to the security information behind that, but that we should be at liberty to know at least that the government is not relying on an exemption uh, in order to um, uh, continue to have untrained uh, personnel doing screening, uh, that you would be able to be clear in an answer that each exemption is, is used on uh, a unique and novel basis so that we can be clear that the exemptions aren't being renewed again and again. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And again, I've just been asked to clarify that it is the secretary that will be issuing the exemptions, not the government. Uh, but I would also say, again, Senator Pratt, um, it is, it, today is not estimates. Um, at the estimates hearing, I, I cannot anticipate the types of questions uh, that may be put by different senators, uh, but the normal rules of estimates would apply. Senator Patrick. On a similar line of questioning, uh, I heard in your statement that you said that it wouldn't be appropriate uh, for, the, the, for this information to be uh, in the annual report but that it would be appropriate to ask the questions at estimates. Uh, I'm just trying to understand what the difference is. In, in effect, this, uh, the legislation just becomes a question on notice uh, for which uh, the, the answer must be put in an, in an annual report. I'm, trying to, I'm struggling to find the difference between the two. Senator Cash. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator Patrick, I'll give you an example um, to, that would clarify the situation for you. Uh, so, as I'd already stated to Senator Pratt, the additional level of information uh, that we're referring to um, would require a level of detail to be included in the annual report that is not appropriate. The additional information being requested may be sensitive in nature and indicate a situation that may be subject to exploitation by persons intent on causing harm to the aviation or maritime industry. For example, an exemption may be given to a class of screening officers from a particular airport. Publication of this information may expose the aircraft or airport, uh, or sorry, the airport or air aircraft departing from that airport uh, to undue risk. In order to reduce the risk of information of this type being exploited, uh, we would obviously be unable to support the amendment that was being put forward by the Australian Greens. Um, as has been referred to by Senator Pratt. Senator Patrick. So just in relation to the questions that are in the Greens amendment, which of those would uh, cause a problem in respect of uh, the, the sorts of concerns that you just raised? So um, you know, the number of uh, exemptions granted, I understand that you indicate that that is uh, quite an acceptable question. So, in relation to their amendment B, C, and D, for example, are they uh, questions likely to give rise to a public interest immunity claim? Senator Cash. Uh, well, again, Senator Patrick, the position of the government is clear. Uh, the government amendments to the bill include a requirement for the number of exemptions given to classes of screening officers issued by the secretary to be reported in the department's annual report. Um, and it is the opinion of the government that reporting the number of exemptions given by the secretary is appropriate uh, for the annual report. But the additional information, um, as required by the Australian Greens, it is the position of the government it would require a level of detail to be included in the annual report. That is not appropriate. Senator Patrick. So again, I'm just trying to understand if these questions were asked at estimates, uh, would a public interest immunity be claimed by the minister? Senator Cash. Well, again, Senator Patrick, as I've said to uh, Senator Pratt, 
Um, I am unable to anticipate the questions that may be asked uh, by senators to the departmental secretary or the minister um, at estimates. However, to the extent that those questions are in order and the information is able to be provided in the normal course of events, I am instructed that, um, subject to the determination of the secretary, uh, that information would be provided. But as you uh, would know, Senator Patrick, um, there is a provision whereby an official at the table can rely on if they do not wish to provide that information. And there is certainly a process uh, that senators are able to undertake in the event that they do not accept the ground upon which the official has relied, all the way to a vote on the floor of the Senate to provide the information. Senator Patrick. Uh, yeah, so Minister, I'm not actually talking about a hypothetical question, so I'll just run through these one at a time. Uh, if it, it, at estimates, if a senator such as myself asked a question of an official or indeed the minister uh, or minister representing about the number of screening officers in the class of screening officers covered by each exemption, would I get an answer to that question or would the minister advance a public interest immunity? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Senator Patrick. I am instructed that the number would be fine. But any further information after that, um, at this point in time, I can't give you the answer. But I am instructed that the number would be fine. Senator Patrick. So going to questions uh, to, to item number C, um, it says uh, if I were to ask the number of requirements from which a class of screening officers is exempt under each exemption, would I get an answer or would I get a public interest immunity? Senator Cash. Senator Patrick, again, I am not the secretary or the minister at the table. Uh, you will be able to put the question, and if it is reasonable to give the answer, I think the government has made its position clear. The information would be provided. In the event that it is not reasonable, there is a process um, that can be followed by both the official at the table and then the relevant senators asking the question all the way to bringing the issue to the floor of the Senate for determination. Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you, Minister. Of course, I understand that process uh, quite well. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, this is the sort of thing at estimates where we get a, a question, a relatively simple question. Would, uh, and I've spelt out this question in detail, and I end up getting an answer that that uh, uh, that seeks to avoid actually answering the question. Exactly the sort of treatment we get at estimates. I'm, d I'm in a process now. Uh, and in fact, there's a motion that will come before the Senate in the next day or so, where officials refused to provide evaluation, uh, evaluation that had been obtained on uh, a water licence, evaluation that uh, itself stated that after 90 days it was no longer valid and gave cautions about relying on it after that time and uh, was denied to the Senate on order for production. Uh, and uh, questions on notice, and yet a citizen can get it under FOI. So uh, you have a track record, or, or the government has a track record, of, of being very cavalier in the way in which public interest immunities are advanced. And uh, the Senate is actually not very good at standing up for itself. And I say that regretfully. I refer you back to my first speech when I talked about the difficulties of. Uh, or, or the failures of the Senate to enforce these sorts of uh, the, these uh, sorts of uh, orders. So we have a shameful situation where a citizen, citizen can get an answer under FOI, but a, um, a senator cannot. In fact, an order of the Senate doesn't produce that answer. Um, so that's my concern. I'm, I'm actually trying to genuinely work out whether or not to support the Greens' motion. Um, uh, I, I would have thought that. Having looked at these, you uh, and you've stated, Minister, that you don't uh, want to support this particular amendment. I'm trying to understand where the offence lies or where the difficulty lies uh, in these very specific questions. They're not hypotheticals, and I simply want to know whether or not uh, uh, the the uh, the officials would answer. And I point out very very uh, specifically that it is not for an official to deny the answer to a question. Only a minister can do that. 
and you are representing the minister at this point in time in this chamber. Uh, any, does it, um, did the opposition wish to move their amendments? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I note that um, the government has undertaken to accurately and transparently answer questions in relation to exemptions granted by the secretary during estimates, and I look forward to um, uh, senators being able to follow that up at this time. Uh, as flagged in my second reading remarks, uh, Labor um, has indicated that we want to move amendments uh, where uh, pow certain powers are not to be exercised unless regulations prescribing requirements for conducting tests are already in force. Uh, and I therefore move amendments on sheet 8901. I take it, Senator Pratt, that you seeking leave to move those amendments. Is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Uh, Minister. Thank you. Uh, the government will be supporting the amendment moved by Senator Pratt on behalf of the opposition. The bill currently includes a provision that requirements may be prescribed in delegated legislation but does not mandate this. The proposal is that the powers to conduct system tests cannot be used unless requirements for the conduct of the tests are prescribed in the regulations. Transport security inspectors follow standardised policies and procedures when conducting system tests. Although tests need to vary between regulated entities, test types and locations, the amendment is worded in such a manner that it would not unduly impact on the ability to conduct covert system testing. Uh, and as I've said on that basis, the government will be supporting the amendment moved by the opposition. Thank you, Senator Cash. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. And against no, I think the ayes have it. Uh, I then have some amendments from the Greens, which I believe are meant to be moved by Senator Rice, and she's putting her hand up, so I assume she is available to speak to them. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy Chair. Um, yes, look, I wish to move my amendments on sheet 8881, and I seek leave to move amendments one and two together. Is leave um, granted? Look, I think leave is granted. Thank you. I, I thank Senators Pratt and Patrick for asking questions about these amendments because it's elicited from the Minister that I cannot see any reason why these amendments should not be supported. The Minister, basically these, amend, these amendments seek to um, reveal a uh, further amount of information where there are exemptions being granted to certain levels of training and qualifications that security officers are meant to have. And this legislation says that the security officers should have a level of training and a level of qualification, which is what we are supporting this bill on the basis that we have appropriately trained, appropriately qualified security officers. If there is a need to exempt officers from these requirements, well, then we need to know why. And we need to actually know more than just the number of exemptions, which is all the minister seems to be um, suggesting is required. And I'm sorry, it just does not wash to say that we can ask these questions of estimates. I mean, I have been in this Senate for six years and got quite a lot of experience in asking such questions of estimates. And I know what happens. I know that you have prevarication. You have things being taken on notice that you then get the response from in the week before the next estimate sessions. It can take, you know, a year longer to actually get a straight answer out of estimates if the government wants to hide the information. There are two ways. If the government is concerned about security implications or any other implications of, of revealing this information, there is a really good way that the government cannot be concerned, and that is actually to not have very many exemptions. I, I mean, I cannot basically see why these exemptions should be necessarily except in extreme circumstances. So the amendments that I'm moving is saying that not just do we need to know the number of exemptions that are granted, we need to know the number of screening officers in the class of screening officers covered by the exemption so we can see whether that number is a small or a large proportion. I mean, if it's only one out of 100 of those screening officers that are exempted from a need for training or qualifications, 
you would think, okay, maybe you know there are extenuating circumstance, circumstances. But if it's you know 80 out of 100, and if this is ongoing, well then that's something that we, the public, the community needs to know about, and certainly we in the Senate need to know about. We need to know the number of requirements from which a class of screening officers is exempt under each exemption. So we know whether it's just a small part of the requirements or whether it's all the requirements that are being waived. And we need to know the period for which this exemption is going to be enforced. Is it just for a short period, perhaps while the screening officer is actually doing their training? And perhaps, you know, there's a shortage of screening officers. They're, these people are doing their training at the same time they're on the job and the exemption will cease after a few months. Or is it an ongoing issue? These are all very reasonable and very important parts of, well, bits of information that is needed to make sure that the security regime that is being put in place is appropriate with appropriately trained um, officers who have got the appropriate skills and qualifications. And I, I listened very closely to the Minister as to why this amendment was not reasonable, and I'm afraid I was not convinced by her answer. I think it's um, essentially that there's just a reluctance to go into this level of detail. All we were told was that this level of detail is not appropriate. I'm sorry that is not good enough. Good legislation requires this level of detail being available to the public and to the Senate. And so these, this amendment will um, ensure that the level of information that the Senate needs, that the community needs, is published in the annual report and is available for everyone on a timely basis. Thank you. Senator Patrick. Yeah, just have a, a couple of questions in relation to the undertakings that have been provided by uh, the government in, uh, to, to Labor. Um, just to help me out, I'm just wondering how long an undertaking lasts for. Does it last until the end of the parliament? Does it last until a change of prime minister? Does it last until uh, a liberal government uh, leaves uh, uh, office and is, is replaced perhaps by the Labor Party uh, in government? Or is, is it uh, somehow enduring? How long does that undertaking to the Labor Party uh, last. Sorry. Senator Patrick. So I'm just wondering, maybe it's a bit like conventions, uh, where we have uh, convention, long-standing conventions, where um, uh, you know, the, the the courts accept uh, the exemptions, uh, the parliament accepts the exemptions. I'm thinking of things like cabinet in confidence as, an ex as, a, uh, as a convention, the convention of cabinet, which the uh, Morrison government has uh, just expanded quite dramatically to cover pretty much everything that COAG used to do under a veil of cabinet in confidence. There's an example of if undertakings are made or if convention or, or if something happens by way of convention, uh, it can be quickly overturned just at the will of, of the executive. I actually wonder why uh, the, the Labor Party might accept an undertaking rather than having something uh, uh, embedded in law. Um, uh, Minister, again, how long does the undertaking th that, uh, that you have provided the Labor Party last for? Minister. Senator Patrick, and my understanding is estimates occurs three times a year, and uh, you would have the opportunity to ask those questions three times a year. Senator Patrick. Yeah, so of course I can ask those questions at estimates. I can ask them in the chamber, uh, uh, but uh, you're doing exactly what officials often do, which is uh, answer a question that I didn't uh, that I didn't ask. So, to be very clear, my question is. How long does the undertaking that you have made to the government, to, sorry, to the opposition, last? Senator Patrick, I'm just wondering if this is uh, uh, the sort of answer that Labor are going to get when they get into uh, estimates and they ask a question and they get greeted with silence.
So the question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, any, I mean. Those against say no. No. I think the noes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. In lieu of uh, a division, I just seek leave to have uh, the Australian Greens senators uh, votes in favour of these amendments recorded in the hand side. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Senator Patrick. I ask uh, also uh, for leave of the chamber to uh, have my support for the Greens amendment, rec amendment recorded. You're seeking leave? Yeah, Is I'm leave seeking granted? leave. Leave's granted. The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Does that opinion say aye? Aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The question is the question now is that the bill be reported. Does that opinion say aye? aye. Those against say no. No, the ayes have it. Report from committee of the whole amendment bills. The committee has considered the transport security amendment. Testing and Training Bill 2019 and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. Uh, thank you. I move that the report of the committee be now adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be now read a third time. Those of, uh, sorry. Yep. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to transport security and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number three, Tertiary edu Education Quality and Standards Agency Amendment Prohibiting Academic Cheating Services Bill 2019, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Sorry, Senator Pratt. Senator um, Griff, sorry, had the, has, was standing first. Senator Griff. I, I seek leave to lodge a late notice of motion. Uh, is leave granted? Uh, your whip knows, actually. Okay, okay leave's granted. Thank Thank you. You. Uh, yeah, we might just get the clerk to read the uh, bill title again for clarity. Government Business Order of the Day number three, Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Amendment Prohibiting Academic Cheating Services Bill 2019, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Pratt. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Today, Labor supports this bill and the introduction of deterrence to academic cheating services in Australia's higher education system. The bill before us implements recommendations made by the Higher Education Standards Panel. And that panel concluded, inadequately constrained cheating activity has the potential to cause great damage to the domestic and international reputation of Australian higher education. Unfortunately, no Australian jurisdiction currently has offences aimed specifically at deterring or punishing organised cheating services. And we know that the higher education sector is critically important to Australia, and Labor will always support legislation that defends, that defends the sector's integrity. The bill before us, of course, creates an offence for providing, offering to provide or arranging for a third person to provide an academic cheating service to a student undertaking a higher education course in Australia. Commercial services will face both commercial and civil penalties, while services not operating commercially will face civil penalties. It also creates an offence for the publication or broadcasting of an advertisement for one of these cheating services. And you'll see this at section 114B. 
We have uh, expressed some concerns about the design of this offence, and we'll talk through them now. A person prosecuted for publishing an advertisement for an academic cheating service operating for a commercial purpose could face a potential jail term even if they are receiving no personal gain. So our concern among Labor is that this provision could unintentionally capture vulnerable students who are simply forwarding or sharing electronically an advertisement for commercial services. It could easily be disguised as something more innocent, and uh, the student may not be aware of exactly what they're sharing. It could be uh, advertised as some kind of academic support service, uh, whereas uh, embedded in it uh, is, in fact, a cheating service. So, as the explanatory memorandum acknowledges, these can be persuasive and sophisticated operations. These operations are aimed at vulnerable people, and these operations often try and portray themselves as being altruistic. We have alerted the minister to these serious concerns, and an addendum to the explanatory mem memorandum has indeed been tabled by the minister in the House. This addendum makes clear that the circumstances of which uh, Labor is concerned are not intended to be caught by this legislation. So, as I said, we very strongly support the deterrence uh, measures for academic cheating services, but we also want to make sure that the legislation does not implicate vulnerable students who have received no personal benefit from their uh, unintended uh, actions. Cheating services are very well known to target vulnerable students as part of their business model, and indeed there are a great many vulnerable students in our nation at the moment. We've got students who are away from home and family and separated from their usual support systems, and they can, as we know, be particularly vulnerable to rogue services like these. We know that the reputation of this sector is vitally important. And Unfortunately, our reputation has copped a severe battering uh, among international students this year. Sadly, we've seen international students lined up around the block, desperate for a free meal, with no support from this federal government. What are these people going to tell their friends and family about Australia when they get home? All of the, un all of the pressure that is upon them to uh, get good marks and pass, as well as uh, be able to support themselves uh, while they are here. We're talking about an industry that provides Australia with some of its most significant export income. It provides huge value to our nation's regional communities, and it is a sector that is absolutely critical to our nation's ongoing economic prosperity. But we have a government that is absolutely throwing this critical sector under the bus. We should be a nation that knows Australian universities are good for all of us. The minister acknowledged himself that productivity improvements in the sector can increase economic growth by some $2.7 billion a year. However, we have a government that is now sitting by and watching as universities shed jobs, close campuses and cut back on courses and degrees. We have a government that has gone out of its way to exclude universities from COVID support. We have a government that has repeatedly changed its policy to stop uni staff from accessing wage subsidies, hundreds of university jobs have in our country already gone, campuses have closed, and thousands more jobs are at risk. But most unfortunately, this is just the beginning of a sector-wide crisis. The impact of these losses on our nation's regional communities will be devastating. Universities support some uh, 14,000 jobs in country Australia, and they help underpin the economy in countless towns. We are looking across the board at tens of thousands of livelihoods being destroyed. 
Here we are talking about academics, tutors, admin staff, library staff, catering staff, ground staff, cleaners, security and so many others. All people with families, with bills to pay and commitments to meet. This government has gone out of its way to exclude these workers uh, from job seeker, uh, job keeper, I'm sorry, and I am extremely alarmed at the Prime Minister's determination to abandon them. Why has the, the, this government and this Prime Minister been so determined to abandon these workers? To me, it seems like a deliberate attack on Australian higher education. And the government's job ready graduate package, it will just make things worse for universities. Under this package, the sector will face an overall cut in government funding, a cut of almost $1 billion a year. So much for job ready graduate support. For students, this package means it will be harder and more expensive to go to Australia's universities. This has never been Labor's approach and it never will be our approach. Under Labor, we saw a boost in investment from $8 billion in 2007 to $14 billion in 2013. We've opened up the system, uncapped places and given an additional 190,000 students a spot at university. Labor's decisions were driven by our commitment to improving Australia's productivity and it was driven by our commitment to breaking down disadvantage and inequality in our education system. And indeed it succeeded. It succeeded in bringing new people to university, Indigenous enrolments up, more Australians with disability <coughs> entered the system, as did people from regional and remote areas. Education has helped create jobs, higher wages and a better quality of life for all Australians. These are the issues uh, and the guiding principles that should be at the heart of Australian education policy. It should be a vision of equity, productivity that is funded uh, and supported with strong resources. Unfortunately, this is not a vision that is shared by this government. It is uh, watching thousands of job go jobs go in the higher education sector. It is watching campuses close and it is making it harder and more expensive for students to go to university. And so while uh, we have this legislation before the chamber in relation to academic cheating, I would really like to draw the government's attention to the bigger picture in the state of Australia's higher educational institutions, both for Australian students and indeed for international students. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise on behalf of the Greens to speak to the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Amendment prohibiting Academic Cheating Services Bill 2019. This is indeed a serious issue, and I thank the stakeholders across the sector for the time that they've taken to engage with the bill throughout the process, and in recognition of the need for stronger protections against commercial contract cheating operations, the Greens will not oppose this legislation. But we do have deeply held concerns about the approach it takes to addressing academic issues within our universities and the impact the bill will have on students, their friends and families and academic communities. In the first instance, it's not at all clear that the threat of penalties like those contained in this bill effectively deter contract cheating operations. In 2019, research examining real incidences of contract cheating online, researchers from Melbourne and Toronto found that heavy penalties on contract cheating seem not to be limiting the impunity with which it occurs. They concluded, we do not think supply side approaches to the contract cheating problem are likely to have any significant positive effects. Even worse, they direct resources away from other approaches and they may have unintended negative consequences for students. And it is those negative consequences for students that I'm particularly concerned about. The first version of this bill needlessly exposed individuals such as family and friends of students to significant penalties, including jail time. 
Um, so I was glad to see that that revised after feedback from our office and many in the sector. I'm also pleased that our comments resulted in amendments to the definition of a cheating service, which lacked clarity and risk criminalizing or disrupting perfectly normal collegial behavior and collaboration to the detriment of students' learning. Unfortunately, the second version of the bill, the one that is before us today, still exposes individuals to civil penalties of more than $110,000. Whereas universities are not well placed to tackle large commercial providers of cheating services, they are best placed to identify and respond to inappropriate non-commercial assistance provided to students from peers or family and friends. This is not an issue we want universities to pass the buck to TEXA on, nor are these penalties remotely commensurate with the low-grade academic misconduct that universities should actually be resourced to deal with. As such, it remains completely inappropriate to expose individuals to the civil penalties this legislation has for commercial providers. I do note that there's been a lot of language from the minister and the department about the supposed target of this bill, not being students, their friends and families. And I hope that that is the case. But it's easy for us to guarantee this today by restricting the application of both the civil and criminal penalties in this legislation to commercial providers of cheating services alone. And I will be moving an amendment to that effect. The broader issue here, for which this government is as culpable as any other, is that decades of systematic underfunding of our universities has put them in a funding situation where it is easier to surveil and sanction students instead of supporting them. And in this, we are seeing a shameful tendency towards increasingly strict monitoring as an antidote to lack of meaningful connection between students and their teachers. This legislation's punitive response to academic misconduct reflects that. So too do the concerning reports of universities rapidly adopting exam surveillance software with little regard for the privacy implications or its impact on their students' learning experience. The use of this software must stop. More recently still, the government's craven plan to strip help loan support from students who fail more than half their subjects reflects their drive to police and punish where they should provide support and help. Blame for this should be laid squarely at the feet of successive governments whose cuts to funding have seen university class sizes grow and the quality time academics get to spend with their students diminish. If the government's cruel uni cuts and fee hikes get through, this situation will only worsen. There is no question about that. In my own experience as a university lecturer and course coordinator, I can frankly say that this legislation is no way to stop non-commercial participants in organized cheating. Why? because it does not and cannot address the underlying causes of students cheating. Let's not delude ourselves that these are simple cases of lazy students looking for a way to avoid the work on an, on an essay or an assignment. We know pressures like the financial consequences of failing a subject and academic requirements for visa retention are often present in cheating circumstances. This bill and the rest of the government's higher education policy settings do nothing to fix this. And that's not to mention the broader circumstances that are systematically denying students the opportunity to attend to their studies without worrying day to day about making ends meet, about putting food on the table, about having a roof over their heads. Even before the pandemic, it was all too common for students to work multiple jobs, live paycheck to paycheck, reliant on meager government support. Many often went hungry. All of these conditions have worsened during the pandemic, as the move to online learning has isolated students from opportunities to seek support and limited academics' ability to assist a student before they begin to engage in academic misconduct. My firm view is that academic integrity is best protected in the first instance by adequately 
funding education and training providers, where low student staff ratios allow staff to ensure integrity by developing an individual understanding of each student's abilities in order to detect and address issues before they become misconduct. And I talk this, I say this from experience, a number of years of experience. This approach comes with the benefits of improved educational outcomes. Instead of the attacks, they are suffering from those opposite at the moment. Our public universities and TAFE need substantial long-term increases in government funding to allow them to provide the best possible education. We know thousands of university staff have already lost their jobs and thousands more are set to lose their jobs just by the end of this year and who knows what's going to happen next year. And yet this government is set upon cutting further funding from universities and hiking fees for students. It's absolutely abhorrent and shameful. It is cruel and callous. The Greens will work to block these attacks at every turn and we will fight to see all students supported through free university and TAFE throughout their lives. Senator Marwan. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker. Um, I also rise to speak on the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency uh, Amendment Prohibiting Academic Cheating Services Bill 2019. Uh, we shouldn't have to do this, but of course we do, because human nature is what it is. Cheating services are a blight on our education system. There are criminals who are exploiting vulnerable students and undermining the integrity of our high-quality degrees. Cheaters should never prosper. And under our government, if you sell a cheating service to an Australian student, you will face two years imprisonment or fines of up to $100,000. This bill is aimed at commercial cheating services, not Senator Faruqi, at students who use them. Students who cheat will still be subject to their own institutions' academic integrity policies and sanctions, including any consequences that flow from those. After consulting with the sector, we have clarified the legislation to ensure parents and friends who might edit their child's essays or provide suggestions on how to improve an assignment will not be impacted. The national regulator will be given new powers to investigate and recommend prosecution of cheating service providers. The Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency will also be empowered to seek court injunctions to force internet service providers and search engines to block cheating websites. This bill amends the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Act of 2011, known as the TEXA Act, to make it an offence to provide, arrange or advertise academic cheating services to students studying with Australian higher education providers, whether the service is provided from within Australia or overseas. Criminal and civil penalties of up to two years jail and fines of up to 500 penalty units, around $100,000, will apply whether cheating service or advertising is, for, the commer is for, com for a commercial purpose. Civil penalties of up to 500 penalty units will apply whether cheating service is provided without remuneration. Strict liability will apply to the criminal, criminal offence of providing an academic cheating service in order to undermine services' tactics of disingenuous disclaimers regarding the purpose and use of their product. The Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency, or TEXA, will be appointed to enforce the new law with its powers to include monitoring, intelligence gathering, investigation and prosecution of identified offenders. TEXA will have additional powers to collect and disseminate information about cheating websites and their users to help institutions combat cheating activities on campus, but with safeguards to protect the unwarranted sharing of personal information about those who purchase cheating materials. TEXA will also have the ability to seek court injunction, injunctions to force internet service providers 
and search engines to block cheating websites. Uh, Madam Deputy uh, uh, Speaker, uh, I too, like Senator Pratt, would like to draw to the Chamber's notice the state of the tertiary education sector. What's this? Oh, no. Never, never. I've never seen so many people present. Uh, this bill really brings to light many different aspects of our tertiary education sector, not just its over-reliance on foreign students, remembering that the minister reminded the sector only recently that their primary function was to edu educate Australian students and anything else is up to them and is their responsibility. We fund the sector at record high levels. Commonwealth expenditure estimate, uh, is, uh, uh, estimates is to be more than $18 billion in 2020 and $19 billion next year. Several years ago, a vice-chancellor commented to me that the consequence of so many foreign students is that our universities have lost their Australianness, and that is my personal experience as well. Still developing is a story alleging today in our, th that far too uh, much openness is being provided in access to research by our universities. Australian national interests must come first, and universities, it seems to me, are losing popular support in Australia. And now for the regulator. The Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency is empowered to enforce the HES Act and framework, so taxpayers and students know publicly funded universities are carrying out their core mission to educate students. But surely freedoms are an integral part of quality and standards. The question I would need to ask is, is, Texas, is TEXA the problem or the solution? One TEXA chief commissioner some years ago had mentioned intellectual freedom at a Senate estimates inquiry when you, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, were questioned uh, questioned them on that occasion, but there's not much evidence of commitment to holding universities to their core mission of intellectual freedom and of academic freedom. We've had the French inquiry and now we are in, into another inquiry. A law requiring intellectual freedom is one thing, but enforcement is everything. I remember the appalling treatment of Geoffrey Blamey in 1984 at the University of Melbourne over the Hawke government's immigration policy, which it was alleged could threaten the country's social cohesion unless managed properly. As Janet Albrechtson said recently, he, uh, Blamey, was hounded off the campus as a racist. Blaney is not, is not a racist. He is Australia's finest historian. When I think of Australian universities today, I don't think of them as places of learning where intellectual freedom thrives. If that was the concept that drives our universities, a student guild running stalls for new students wouldn't dream of banning a right-wing Generation Liberty stall on the basis that its brand did not align with the guild's values, regardless of the spin. If intellectual freedom were taken seriously, our vice-chancellor would not put up with this rubbish on, his, on their campus, and neither would the regulator or our government. The Queensland University of Technology Student Guild refused to offer the group Generation Liberty a stall in the market week, which is held the week after the university's orientation week. But according to the Vice-Chancellor, Generation Liberty was wrongly advised that its application had been declined on the basis of its values. It might have been wrong, but it did occur, and if there was the culture of intellectual freedom, it would not have occurred. Professor Scheel corrected the record. Any assertion that I or the university have exercised bias or failed to protect free speech are factually incorrect, she said. Professor Scheel was backed by the Chief Commissioner of the Higher Education Regulator, the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency, who told a Senate Estimates Committee hearing that after investigating QUT's actions, it considered the matter closed. And of course, what about support for intellectual freedom in the Peter Ridd case, an academic who was sacked by James Cook University for challenging the quality of climate science, something which is still going on to this very day? 
My memory is that each publicly funded university must now include reporting on their approaches to supporting intellectual and academic freedom on campus. This bill before us today is not about removing public funds, it's about cheating. It's about uh, 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 cheating, uh, which is an aspect of uh, intellectual freedom that needs to be reinforced. But really, what about the regulator? The Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency is empowered to enforce the HES Act and the HES framework. So taxpayers and students know publicly funded universities are carrying out their core mission to educate their students. Perhaps the University of Queensland in particular might spend more time looking after their students rather than banning them in the way that Mr Drew Pavlou has been banned or the way that James Cook has appealed the decision against Mr Ridd, now waiting on a decision of that appeal. As one commentator said, even the university is, is embarrassed. An hour or so after the verdict, Chancellor Peter Varghese, a former secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, stepped into the role of video umpire. Mr Varghese said he was personally concerned about aspects of the finding and the severity of the penalty. In consultation with Vice-Chancellor Peter Hodge, who played no role in the disciplinary process, Mr Varghese said the Chancellor had convened an extraordinary meeting of the University of Queensland Senate next week to discuss the matter. Frank, robust debate serves the public interest. On contentious issues, robust argument is inevitable and helpful in arriving at the truth. Judge Vasta said last year, in the search for truth, it is an unfortunate consequence that some people may feel denigrated, offended, hurt or upset. It may not always be possible to act collegiately when diametrically opposed views clash in the search for truth. Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, uh, President, the bill gives effect to the advice of uh, this bill gives effect to the advice of the Higher Education Standards Panel that legislation is required to deter third-party academic cheating services. The panel found that the array of state, territory and Commonwealth laws relevant to cheating offences make it difficult to pursue legal solutions against providers of cheating services. The panel's advice was that additional legislative backing is needed to more effectively deal with such risks. The panel advocated modelling this on New Zealand's approach outlined in section 292E of the Education Act 1989 New Zealand. The panel recommended that legislation be aimed at those who provided cheating services and not at students who might use such services. Students who cheat remain subject to their institution's own academic integrity uh, policies, processes and sanctions. An exposure draft of the bill was publicly released on 7 April 2019 for comment. 46 submissions were received in response, which generally supported the need for the legislation, but raised concerns about some aspects of the bill. The bill, of course, was revised to take account of these issues. Madam Acting uh, Deputy President, uh, I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Molan. Senator Ayres. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I uh, want to make a few comments about this bill and then a few comments about higher education more broadly. And I can say that um, nothing illustrates how lost the coalition is on these issues more uh, fully than uh, the obscurantism of Senator Mullen's most recent comments on this issue. Um, the the bill, Labor will support the bill. Uh, Labor will support the bill because academic cheating is a blight on the Australian university sector. We'll support the bill uh, because of the potential damage uh, that cheating can do to individual university institutions and the overall reputation, uh, global reputation of Australian higher education. Uh, the government's had no concern with the global reputation of Australian higher education over the course of the last six months, but we will support the bill on that basis. 
Now, Labor did have some concerns about the design of some aspects of the offences set out in the bill. A person prosecuted for publishing an advertisement for an academic cheating service operating for a commercial purpose could face a potential jail term even if they are receiving no personal gain. And we on this side were concerned that that could capture vulnerable students who simply forward an advertisement to their friends, uh, even if they didn't understand the implications uh, of the advertisement or were unaware of exactly what they were sharing. And the government has made changes uh, by way of an addendum to the explanatory memorandum that does fundamentally deal with that issue. Cheating services target the most vulnerable students. They often target students who are here, international students, uh, who are at their most vulnerable, lonely, away from family and friends and home, and that is the cheating services business model. And the reputation of Australia's education sector is absolutely crucial. Well, over the last few months, enormous damage has been done to the reputation of Australia's university sector. We had a good global reputation as a provider of higher education services, uh, as universities that had deep research capability and the capacity to collaborate with international researchers in areas of great benefit to this country and great benefit to the globe. Well, the Morrison government's failure to deliver a higher education package and to support international students who have been stranded here has done enormous damage to not just the reputation of Australia's universities, but great damage to the reputation of Australia itself. I was walking through Haymarket some weeks ago and there was a food queue, some hundreds of students deep, a food queue of international students in one of our great capital cities. And apparently, people in the Morrison government think that that's okay. These students were Thai students, destitute, hungry, unable to provide for themselves, because this lot over here are more committed to the sort of obscurantist student politics that Senator Mullen was going through than actually delivering for Australia's universities and looking after these kids. I shouldn't call them kids, they're young adults. But their parents and the universities, and in fact their parents and the country, have entered into a solemn contract. Our universities get paid an enormous amount of money by international students, and the contract we should have with their parents and their families is yes, we will educate them, but also we will look after them. And what we've done as a country uh, is a disgrace, and it's caused enormous damage to our international reputation. More broadly, <clears throat> when most Australians saw the impact that the coronavirus crisis was having upon the teaching and research capabilities of our universities, they saw it as a crisis. Well, if you're in the far right of the Liberal Party or in the National Party, what those people saw was an opportunity. An opportunity to square off with their student polit political opponents, an opportunity to denigrate the, the capability, denigrate the people, uh, denigrate the hard work of tens of thousands of university lecturers and researchers, uh, and saw an opportunity to wreck these institutions that are so vital to our national progress and our prosperity. So what did we see? We saw an enormous effort to ensure that Australian university staff, particularly including casual staff, would be unable to access the JobKeeper provisions that were offered by the government to many millions of Australian workers. Why was it that Australian universities were specifically excluded by this government and that, as a consequence of that, many casual academics, 
many thousands of casual academics are destitute as a direct consequence of that decision, and that it will be harder for Australian universities to sustain their staff and to sustain their research and education capability through the crisis. Just when we need them most, just when we need our universities the most, the Morrison government is in there trashing the Australian university system. Beyond the JobKeeper package, you would think that a government that had the remotest care or concern for this vital set of national institutions and their research and their teaching capability would deliver a package to secure the future of those universities. There is no package. In fact, there's been a determined refusal to deliver a package that can support the sector. Now, there will be many tens of thousands of academics, casual staff and university support staff who lose their jobs. Uh, but the damage to Australia will be well beyond the economic effect and the effect on people's families of those job losses. I look across the state of New South Wales and look at the regional universities who have already started to announce many thousands of job cuts. Southern Cross University in the North Coast electorate of Page, the University of New England in Mr Joyce's seat uh, and Charles Sturt University, largely located in the seat of Calair, the seat currently occupied by Mr G. Now, when these universities have started to work their way through hundreds of staff cuts, thousands of lost student places and deep cuts to their research capability, I've been quite surprised by the response of what passes for the modern National Party. Mr Joyce supported the cuts. He thought that the cuts were a very good thing indeed and a rational response by the university. Most people in their electorates, when a local big employer makes cuts, usually they're opposed to them. Mr Joyce at the University of New England in Armidale, where he had a short career, he tells everybody anyway, as a bouncer at the Wickham Hotel, he supports cuts to that university. In Charles Sturt University, Mr G, who apparently has some ministerial responsibility in education, he's against them. His own government's delivering the cuts, he's against them. Uh, and at Southern Cross University, largely located in Lismore, some campuses spread across the North Coast, well, poor old Mr Hogan, the member for Page, nobody knows what he thinks. Uh, they, they rarely ever do. Uh, so there is a confused position. And the National Party, who should be standing up for regional universities. And when you look at the research capability of these universities, you look at what they actually engage their capacity in, it's issues like plant and animal breeding water security, uh, improvements to rural education, economics, in particular agricultural economics, community resilience in country towns. Well, Mr Joyce has got no regard for any of these things. Cut, cut, cut. That's all Mr Joyce understands and it's all that the coalition understands. They have truly lost their way in the way that they regard higher educa education institutions. There's a sort of unrestrained dopiness about the coalition's approach to all of these issues. The idea that instead of adopting a funding approach in universities that is all about the cost of delivery of courses, that the coalition would interfere in the process of how students were billed in their higher education fees in a sort of Venezuelan, North Korean way to try and shape the choices that young school leavers make is too dopey for words. The idea that young people who want to study 
arts or social sciences at university, when confronted with an increase in their fees, will choose to be dentists or scientists is too silly for words. But it, it weaved its way through the cabinet, it weaved its way uh, through the coalition party room. And what we're left now with is in universities that deliver science courses, they're suddenly having to work out how many staff they have to cut. Universities who deliver engineering courses are working out how many less courses in engineering they are going to deliver because your cuts on that side are going to make it harder for to them to deliver the very courses that you say that you're interested in more Australians studying. It is too dopey for words. And as we've turned our televisions on over the last six months, and the television stations have turned to experts to explain to the community what's going on with the COVID-19 pandemic, to explain to the community how the search for a new vaccine works, to explain to the community the things that they need to do to keep themselves and their families safe and their communities safe. Who's been on the television? University academics, public health economists in our universities. The community's lent on the university's capability at this time of crisis. But all Senator Mullen can talk about, <clears throat> and I think Senator Mullen accurately reflects the unrestrained dopiness that I talked about on these issues in the coalition party room, is a sort of gleeful excitement that universities are somehow losing support in the Australian community. I mean, what a witless, dopey thing to say. The, the education system, our higher education system, is a key national institution. But these guys are obsessed with the sort of student politics and maybe they were denigrated while they were student politicians by other student politicians. Most of us sort of got over it. Most of us sort of forgot about it. But these people bear a grudge from 1969 or wherever it was when they were last on a university campus. There is no censorship. There is no censorship on Australian university campuses. The only example that poor old Senator Mullen could drag out was that people were upset by what Geoffrey Blaney had to say in the 1980s. Well, they should have been, because Geoffrey Blaney was campaigning against Asian migration to Australia. I mean, does anybody seriously defend? Well, I think Geoffrey Blaney is a fine Australian historian, but he was dead wrong on that issue. He will always be dead wrong on that issue, and many thousands of Australian university students demonstrated against him. That's good. Debate, spirited debate. But if your conservative views have so corrupted your thinking, if your resentment about your university experiences have so damaged your thinking about this important national institution, if you can't get yourself beyond the bitterness and weird obscurantism of the approach espoused by people opposite, then you are going to continue to do enormous damage to these absolutely vital institutions and enormous damage to the Australian national interest. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Senator Griff. Acting uh, Madam Deputy President, Senator Alliance supports the intention of this bill, which is to prohibit academic cheating services. These services threaten the quality and integrity of the higher education sector, which has been a source of significant employment and export earnings. The bill does this by imposing penalties for providing or promoting cheating services. These penalties can be very severe—500 penalty units worth $105,000 and up to two years of imprisonment. The severity of these penalties is designed to act as a deterrent, and I am confident that they will have the desired effect. But we do not support the other offences created by the bill that which criminalises non-commercial cheating and also imposes a penalty of 500 penalty units. To be clear, non-commercial cheating refers to assistance from a friend or family member without a financial benefit, where the assistance forms a substantial part of the assessment. 
I think we can all agree that cheating is wrong and that it is desirable for students to act honestly and complete their work. But when a student is struggling and their mother ends up helping them with an essay, is it really appropriate to label that behaviour as unlawful and potentially impose a fine of as much as $100,000? Every university in the country already has rules against cheating. And for extreme cases, prosecutions can be brought with existing serious offences, such as fraud or dishonestly obtaining an advantage. So what is to be gained by the creation of this new offence? Certainly it does nothing to reduce commercial cheating services, which is the very point of this bill. The government may say that it has some deterrent value, but that assumes parents and siblings and neighbours and friends are aware that such an offence exists. There may be some media coverage on this measure if it passes into law, and so some people will become aware of it. But I imagine it will not be many, and so it will do little to change people's behaviour. The government's original proposal was for a civil penalty of 1,000 penalty units, more than $200,000. In response to stakeholder feedback, they acknowledged this was excessive and reduced the penalty to 500 units. But this is still excessive. Centre Alliance will be moving an amendment to the bill which removes the non-commercial offence. We believe this is a sensible, reasonable change that will not inhibit the government's efforts to crack down on commercial cheating services. Thank you, Senator Bird. Senator Rennick. President, I rise in support of the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Amendment Bill. Uh, before I uh, talk about the bill itself, I'd just like to rebut a couple of the points made by uh, Senator Ayres before. It's worth noting that students, when they come to this country, have to have sufficient funds for 12 months. That is a part of the contract. Uh, so I think the idea that somehow the federal government is ignoring the contract uh, was false. It's also worth pointing out that the federal government gives $17 billion in funding to higher education. Uh, there's a $70 billion uh, outstanding debt on higher education, and universities happen to have a tax-free status on profits earned from higher education. And as I pointed out in my maiden speech, there's over 700,000, or there were over 700,000 foreign students in this country who are allowed to work up to 20 hours a week. Uh, so they get very generous entitlements in this country, and you know those that demand or that extra supply in the labour market can actually push wages down for hard-working Australians. So I think the idea that you know, the federal government doesn't look after international students is absolutely wrong. And to come from a party that introduced the Dawkins reforms in 1990, which absolutely trashed higher education, uh, in 89 they brought in hex on teachers and nurses. The same years they introduced the uh, petroleum resource rent tax, which gave a 15 per cent uplift on foreign multinationals investing in oil and uh, uh, re uh, exploration in this country is a little bit hypocritical. And as for suppression of speech, I don't think Senator Molan was talking about Geoffrey Blaney back in the 60s. He was referring to Drew Pavlov today, who has very courageously stood up to uh, certain interests at the University of Queensland. He's been demonised, and I'm pleased to say, despite the fact that you know, many of us on the conservative side probably have different views to Drew, we are more than happy to stand up for freedom of speech, and we'll happily back Drew. <coughs> anyway, back to the bill itself. Sadly, it is becoming increasingly clear that education in Australia has been on the decline for the last past 20 years. Yeah, think Dawkins reforms. According to the 2018 PISA report, education standards in Australia had hit an all-time low, with maths falling below the OECD average and science being the lowest it has ever been. Teacher quality has also been called into question as school test results have fallen, with some citing low ATAR requirements for teaching degrees and poor university results as the culprits. However, there could also be more sin a more sin sinister factor at work here to explain falling academic standards among graduates, and that is cheating. <clears throat> it is becoming increasingly common for university students to hire cheating services to write their essays or sit their exams. This means that students are graduating without the necessary skills to succeed in the workplace and cheating providers are profiting from this breach in academic integrity. 
The Higher Education Standards Panel has advised that legislation is needed to address this growing problem and deter third-party academic cheating services. This bill is an amendment to the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Act 2011 that will make it illegal to provide third-party academic cheating services to students. In academic circles, this kind of cheating is called contract cheating, where a student outsources or contracts their work to someone else, and often in exchange for money. Contract cheating can take the form of a third party sitting a student's exam or, more commonly, the provision of bespoke essays or other academic material. Successful businesses have been set up to cater to this emerging market and are colloquially known as essay mills, referring to how they grind out essay after essay. According to Australian research from 2018, 2.2 per cent of students in Australia self-reported to be buying essays representing approximately 33,000 students. This puts conservative estimates for the market for cheating services in Australia between 10 to 23 million. These are alarming numbers and it's time the Australian government stepped in and did something about it. In 2014, there was significant cheating, a significant cheating scandal that erupted in the major universities of New South Wales where it was revealed that students were buying essays from the My Master Contract Cheating website. Up to 70 students were facing academic penalties or su suspension, and at least two were expelled. The My Master website was in Chinese, targeting international students, uh, and in 2014 had a turnover of $160,000. Antidotal evidence surrounding the My Master scandal, due to its publicity, revealed that the integrity and quality of Australian higher education was brought into question in the mind of foreign regulators. It is precisely situations like this that this bill aims to prevent by providing a strong deterrent and enforced by legislation to prosecute businesses like my master and prevent them from providing cheating services that erode academic standards and damage the reputation of Australian education in the process. The provision of academic cheating poses a real threat to academic integrity and the reputation of Australian higher education. Employers need to be confident that graduates of Australian universities and TAFE colleges are truly qualified for their jobs, especially when it comes to positions such as engineering or medicine where the consequences of incompetence are extremely high. By not submitting to an appropriate level of academic discipline and doing the work themselves, students fail to master the content and achieve the necessary skills to earn their degrees and sustain an effective a career. Further, and this is crucial, international education is Australia's largest service-based export industry contributing $35 billion to the national economy in 2018. Should the international reputation of Australian universities take a hit, even in part because of these cheating services, it will have a significant negative impact on Australia's economy. Passing this bill will send a message to international students, their parents, guardians, foreign governments and overseas employers that Australia takes its education standards seriously and is doing all it can do to maintain high levels of academic integrity. Currently, there is no direct law prohibiting contact cheating in Australia, contract cheating in Australia, sorry. Only indirect legislation by the states and territories in allied areas, which are often difficult to pursue and hard for a state or territory to justify in terms of cost. This bill will send the message that academic cheating is not only unethical but illegal in Australia and will make the consequences clear, commensurate and easier to prosecute. The Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency will be given the power to enforce the legislation through monitoring, intelligence gathering, investigating and prosecuting identified offenders to ensure the legislation's positive effect. Practically, TEQSA will be able to seek court injunctions to block cheating websites and their ability to be found on search engines. They will also educate students about the changes as well disseminate information 
to universities and overseas regulatory authorities about cheating websites and their users, while safeguarding the identity of students. The bill is designed to directly penalise third, party, third parties that operate cheating services rather than bring charges against the students themselves, who remain subject to their institution's academic integrity policies. Maximum criminal and civil penalty penalties will be two years in jail or up to $100,000 in fines. These penalties may seem harsh, but they must be harsh to be effective as a strong and comprehensive deterrent. To this end, even advertising cheating services qualifies as an offence under the proposed legislation. There is also the further point that some commercial cheating providers are so successful that fines may not be much more than an inconvenience. Therefore, the fines in such cases are higher and offences are subject to possible jail terms. After consulting with the sector, the government has clarified the legislation to ensure parents and friends who might edit their child's essay or provide suggestions on how to improve an assignment will not be impacted. Academic cheating, if allowed to flourish, will damage the reputation of Australia's higher education sector by degrading our academic institutions and placing future education exports, exports at risk. Exports that accounted for $35.1 billion and ranked as Australia's third largest prior to the devastating impact of the coronavirus pandemic. Going soft on cheating will almost certainly lead to a fall in academic and professional standards and impact Australia's ability to compete in the global marketplace. The consequences of academic cheating could also put the public at risk if graduates are not thoroughly qualified for their jobs. Cheating certainly carries significant personal risk for students who, if, if, if caught, risk their degree and, if not caught, they will be inadequate, inadequately prepared for the workplace and lack the necessary skills to excel fully in their careers. The bottom line is that this kind of third-party academic cheating is bad for students, bad for our institutions and bad for the economy, and it is in Australia's interests that we act now. I commend this bill to the Senate. Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise tonight to speak in support of the um, Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Amendment Prohibiting Academic Cheating Services Bill. Now, Australia is home to one of the best education systems in the world. And we all take pride in Australia having Australians having an equal opportunity to access quality tertiary education. The job of rebuilding our economy is now ahead of us. And the Morrison government is of course working hard to ensure that we have a skilled workforce to support the ever-changing needs of the market. And as the economy evolves, we need to ensure that we have a skilled workforce to support the changing nature of the market and to ensure that we're providing skilled workers and quality education, we must stamp out cheating services. Now, traditionally, uh, academic cheating involved uh, the simple task of uh, students copying from one another. But in this modern world, commercial cheating services have become sadly very common. The issue of commercial cheating services, or contract cheating as it's become known, came to the attention of the government in 2014 in the wake of media reports regarding the widespread use by students of a commercial cheating site known as My Master. The Minister for Education and Training at the time referred the matter to the TEQSA for investigation. And it would be, of course, remiss to suggest that all students uh, involved in these sorts of practices. In fact, the investigations uh, that have been undertaken show that there are um, some students who are more likely to engage in these behaviours than others, with the likelihood of cheating being, in fact, influenced by, uh, uh, surprisingly, Mr Acting Deputy President, gender, with more male students self-reporting uh, cheating than female students. Uh, age, younger students sometimes are more 
uh, prone, uh, linguistic back background and the use of technology are two of the other factors which are reported to, uh, to uh, uh, show some influence in, in whether or not students will conduct in this behaviour. But third party cheating typically involves the provision of academic material that is subsequently submitted by a student for assessment or a third party even impersonating a student in an exam or a, or a practical test. And it's disappointing that we do have uh, people who will rot the system. And unfortunately, the provision of these services has become more widespread through targeted promotions for cheating services, through uh, on-campus advertising, emails, social media and other uh, forms of promotion. Well, these targeted promotions are now being used to highlight the ease of access. And the minimal cost is also a feature as well as the low risk of detection. And in so doing, um, they do, of course, downplay the ethical dishonesty and the risk to the students' future study and career prospects, not to mention uh, the uh, overwhelming uh, undermining of the academic integrity of the system. Those engaged uh, in providing academic uh, cheating services are ultimately exploiting students and undermining the integrity of our high quality degrees. This bill aims to stop this. And the bill amends the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Act uh, to make it an offence to provide, arrange or advertise academic cheating services to students studying with an Australian higher education provider, whether the service is provided from within Australia or from overseas. And it also serves to add preventing and minimising uh, the use and promotion of academic cheating services to the responsibilities uh, of the Australian, Australia's higher education regulator, the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency, or the TEQSA, as it's been previously referred to. The bill will see commercial cheating services sold to Australian students face civil and criminal penalties of up to two years imprisonment and fines of up to 500 penalty points, which equates to around about $100,000 fine. And it does um, set a very uh, high um, threshold, and it's been done deliberately so, it's been set deliberately high, uh, to create a strong deterrent to those who seek to provide these services. And these penalties will apply where cheating services are for advertised for a commercial purpose, but the bill also introduces civil penalties of up to 500 penalty units which will apply when the cheating service is provided without remuneration. And the object of this is to stamp out third-party cheating that's occurred on an unpaid basis. And research has shown that a large portion of third-party cheating occurs, sadly, by family or friends or others in the community. And it's intended that strict liability will apply to the criminal offence of providing an academic cheating service. But to be clear, Mums and dads at home who help proofread or edit uh, a son or a daughter's essay or to give advice on to how to improve an assignment are obviously not intended to be captured by this bill. They won't be impacted. This decision has been made after significant consultation with the sector. It's designed to target commercial cheating services and, of course, not the students who use them. But just because the students are not covered doesn't mean they'll get off scot-free. Students who cheat, of course, still be subject to their institution's own academic integrity policies and sanctions, including the consequences that flow from those. It's important to reinforce for the students who are considering using such cheating services that getting a tertiary education is a privilege, not an entitlement. Our students should take the responsibility and the opportunity and privilege of getting a tertiary education seriously and respect the obligations that go with it. And, uh, such actions will ultimately call into question the integrity of our system and the qualifications earned. And of course, in some areas of study, such as the discipline of medicine, uh, there is a risk that uh, these sort of services may uh, irresponsibly put the lives of others at risk as a result of assumed knowledge and the possession of skills obtained during these courses, Mr Acting Deputy President. Cheaters should never prosper under this government. These cheating services are a blight on our education system. It's currently too easy for those who 
provide these services to prey on students. It must be remembered, of course, that students who use the services are often away from home, under pressure, under stress or having difficulty with their studies. Uh, and the provision of these services does uh, provide instruction that it's OK to buy an essay or have someone else take an exam for them. They're told by these service providers no one will find out or there's a minimal risk of detection and that there are no consequences if they do. And we know this is not the case. And if it were, we wouldn't be standing in this chamber speaking to the bill, which specifically targets this uh, easy way out. The Tertiary Education Quality Standards Agency will be appointed under this new law with powers to include monitoring, intelligence gathering, investigation and prosecution of identified offenders. Uh, this body will have the ability to seek injunctions and to force internet service providers and search engines to block cheating websites. They'll have additional power to collect and disseminate information about cheating websites and their users to help institutions combat cheating activities on campus, but of course with safeguards to protect the unwarranted sharing of personal information about those who purchase these services. The national regulator will be given powers to investigate and then to recommend prosecution of the providers. Now, the bill comes after consultation, as I said, with the sector and gives effect to the advice of the Higher Education Standards Panel that legislation was required to deter such services. And while many aspects of these services and the provision of same are already subject to criminal and civil penalties, for example, the offences of fraud, misrepresentation, dishonestly dealing with documents, they can often be difficult to pursue and provide very little deterrence in certain instances as um, there is no law often which explicitly outlies the provision of these services specifically. The Higher Education Standards Panel also found that the array of state, territory and commonwealth laws relevant to these offences makes it difficult to pursue legal solutions against the providers. And the panel's advice was that additional legislative backing is needed to more effectively deal with the risks. It's actually modelled on the uh, Education Act, the New Zealand Education Act and their approach. Um, the uh, legislation, Mr Acting Deputy President, comes with the support of Universities Australia, who have, uh, who have said uh, that Universities Australia thanks the Education Minister for taking a strong stance on the issue and for incorporating our feedback into the revised bill. The legislation now draws a distinction between commercial cheating services which face criminal penalties and civil penalties for people who help a student cheat without payment. To not stamp out cheating services poses a significant threat to the integrity and the reputation of our higher education system, both in Australia and internationally. And the bill uh, acts to ensure that our students are not taken advantage of and it also sends the message that third-party cheating is not just immoral. It doesn't just undermine the integrity of our education system and our society. It will now be illegal. And for these reasons, I commend the bill. Senator Carr. Thank you, Mr. Thank you President. The, the, this bill raises a number of issues, and it has, of course, a laudable aim to crack down on cheating services that exploit vulnerable students. It uh, is aimed at seeking to strengthen the integrity of our tertiary education system and as such uh, the while well, the Labor Party has pointed out there's some difficulties with this uh, and given that the debate has ranged very widely uh, I think it's fair to say it's the provisions of this particular amendment to, to the tertiary education quality and standards agency um, uh, is uh, is welcomed um, but uh, well, I want to concentrate more on the questions around the, our international reputation in terms of research. And I want to concentrate specifically on the question of the relationship between our research sectors and international students who are often the victims of these sort of cheating uh, arrangements. I'm particularly affected uh, by the concerns that have been raised by students from China. Now, fees paid by international students, especially those from China, have been used to cross-subsidise the funding of research in this country. And it's the lack of a secure funding research base which has seen so much of our university sector move into international education as a means of subsidising our research 
investments. And at the onset of the pandemic and the consequent decline in international student uh, numbers, we've seen this uh, question really brought to the fore. And funding for university research is now down some $4.7 billion this year. $4.7 billion of approximately $12 billion that universities spend on research. China is Australia's biggest source of international students. In 2018, the services export market to China was about $11.7 billion. Our economy is hugely dependent on our relationship with China. Now, in some quarters, particularly sections of the media, the university sector is singled out as the villain for cultivating this relationship. And they've called for a radical decoupling from China. Now, of course, it's not the, the criticism is not extended when it comes to other sections of Australian society, particularly in agriculture or in mining, in forestry or in fishery. You don't hear the suggestion that we should immediately cut off our relationships with the People's Republic of China. We hear nothing, for instance, of the $63 billion from the iron ore trade. It's tied directly to China. And for instance, in the period from 2016-17 to 2018-19, the value of Australian merchandise trade with China increased by 40 per cent. Iron ore was, of course, the most valuable part of that export. So what some call excessive dependence on China is not only a higher education characteristic. Yet the university sector is attacked for that dependence, while other sectors of the economy are not. And the reputations of highly regarded academics and university administrators are smeared because they have promoted engagement with China. There are suggestions that are somehow there's some disloyalty to Australia if these academics engage in research collaboration with China or if they encourage more Chinese students to come here. The former Vice-Chancellor of the University of Queensland, Professor Peter Toy, has in fact been referred to in The Australian as the China-friendly Vice-Chancellor, as if there's some offence in that. He's been attacked by Senator Patterson because the University of Queensland's decision to award him a performance payment. Now, this is irony upon irony, because Professor Hoy not only is a highly decorated, internationally recognised uh, scholar, he in fact played a leading role in the establishment of the new University Foreign Interference Task Force, which is to be set up within TEXA. He, of course, is criticised by Senator Patterson as one of the 16, on his basis of one of the 16 KPIs that uh, was awarding Professor Hoy for payment, concerned research collaboration with China, increasing the university's share of the Chinese student market. Professor Hoy, of course, was awarded his companion of the Order of Australia in 2019 on the Australia's Honour Day list, where it specifically referred to the fact that he was presided over the establishment of the Confucius Institute for the study of Chinese languages and culture at the University of Queensland. When that award was granted, it was presented amongst his achievements. The citation includes his role as a senior council executive member of the Hanban Office of the Chinese Language Council International since 2013. As Professor Hoy's critics suggested, somehow or another, that the Governor General made a mistake in awarding him the nation's highest honour. Professor Hoy was defended by the university's Chancellor, Mr Peter Varghese. Mr Varghese is a former Director General of the Office of National Assessments. He's keenly aware of what constitutes security risk and what does not. He's found nothing inappropriate in Professor Hoy's actions. 
and he has said that under Professor Hoy's leadership, the University of Queensland has risen from a global ranking of 90, where it has become vice chancellor in 2012, to the ranking of 55. That's why he received his performance payment. Now I understand that Professor Hoy's name has been linked to the possibility of him taking a vice chancellor's position in the city of Adelaide. I understand that that's actually welcomed by senior liberals, even if it is rejected by some of the fringe players within the Liberal Party. See, managing the relationship with China has to be a primary concern of whoever is the vice chancellor, whether it be at Adelaide or the University of Queensland. 63% of the University of Queensland international students actually come from China. They, in fact, provide some 20% of the university's revenue. Mr Varghese has said that the way to reduce that level of dependence is to actually seek greater diversity in students who come here. The wrong way would be to launch a sudden and disastrous decoupling from China. International student fees fund research in Australian universities, but the people who complain about their reliance on these fees have so far done nothing to provide a more secure basis of funding by the Australian government, where the funding should actually come from. Now, the Education Minister recently announced that he wanted to convene a group of vice chancellors to look for a solution to this crisis of funding within our research sector. Let's hope he finds one. Because what was missing from his announcement was any suggestion there should actually be an increase in funding. Now, the inconsistent we see in these proposed changes to domestic student fees can't inspire any confidence, certainly not from me. The suggestions Mr Tian's made in terms of making students more job ready by reducing funding for science. Of course, by at the same time suggesting that teaching humanities somehow or another is improper. The proposition is farcical. This is a government that does very little thinking about what the implications are of its higher education policies, but they seem quite happy to acquiesce to having our university scholars, our scientists, our researchers pilloried by its own backbenchers. Because it's easy to get a headline to inciting fear on for security breaches. Fear without substance. Now, it's the same tactics that are used against academics who engage in science collaboration with Chinese colleagues. And a notable example of that is in today's Australian. A report by Shari Markson and Kyla Kosatan named several. Australian Chinese academics who have had or are have appointments at Australian universities. They are also said to be beneficiaries of China's Thousand Talents program, which provides financial incentives for researchers abroad and in encourages them to do work in China. The journalists cite the FBI investigations into the program. And it's been alleged that there's been a transfer of intellectual property to China without the knowledge or permission of the universities employed by these uh, universities. But after insinuating that that's the case in Australia, Ms. Markson and Lorison hasten to say they're not actually suggesting that there had been any wrongdoing by academics here. You might be surprised to note that. You've got to read the articles carefully because it's said in a number of occasions in the paper this morning, in the Australian this morning, that there's no suggestion of wrongdoing or inappropriate action or a failure to meet disclosure requirements. In fact, the Australian goes on to suggest, well, in fact, what we've got here is lax regulation. 
that Australia, of course, which has stronger and tougher regulations than the United States, has allowed something to go wrong, the smear, of course, to be suggested. Now, we can find no evidence, no one has declared any evidence of any breach of the Defence Control Act. So what's the basis of the Australian story? Because it is, contains, yet again, nothing but smears and insinuations directed at people who, I repeat, the journalists themselves say, have done nothing wrong. It's become an all too familiar pattern for Ms Markson in reporting Australian research collaborations with China. The bigger picture is ignored. The fact is China is seeking to develop technological capabilities so that it can be a global leader in advanced manufacturing. It simply doesn't want to accept the old division of labour that has been assigned to it. So China, in its Made in China 2025 plan, which of course was announced in 2015, set about restructuring its economy. There have been investment increases in R&D in China of some 400 per cent. China is rapidly moving away from being chiefly a producer of low-cost mass market goods. Now, according to the highly reputable Leiden Science Index, 10 years ago, China had only one institution in the world's top 25 leading universities. Today, it has 13 in 10 years. It has a series of measures to attract talent, as do we, as does this country, as does the United States, as do the English, as do the Germans. It's a common feature of higher education around the world. Now, we shouldn't be naive. No one pretends there's no such thing as industrial espionage. But people who wish to make allegations of industrial espionage need to produce proof, not smears. And there is nothing resembling proof in today's reports in The Australian. More importantly than these confected fears is the question of what role Australia chooses to play in the historic transformation that is actually occurring in China. The continuing conflict between the United States and China is only intermittently a trade war. It has enormous capacity to do immeasurable damage to Australia's national interests. It's an underlying clash in a contest for technological supremacy. We have an opportunity here to actually participate for the benefit of Australia. Senator Chan, okay, time has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, there is quite a lot to unpack in this debate tonight, and I note that it has been uh, quite wide-ranging in uh, considering some broader issues facing our higher education sector, and particularly following uh, Senator Carr's contribution, the relationship that some of our universities have with China. Um, I disagree with Senator Carr's characterisation that people that question the relationship that our higher education institutions have with the Chinese Communist Party is fear-mongering. The numerous students on our university campuses who have spoken to me and other colleagues about their concerns about free academic inquiry on campus as well as the influence on the C of the CCP on university campuses completely flies in the face of that characterisation. And I find it regrettable that on an evening where we are meant to be talking about a quite straightforward piece of legislation in the form 
of the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency amendment prohibiting academic cheating services bill that we are coming into this chamber and engaging in this debate uh, about the relationship that our higher education institutions have in China with China uh, and characterising it in a way that people that question that relationship and just want some transparency of that relationship are fear-mongering. I find it really, quite frankly, disappointing, Madam Acting Deputy President. Mm -hmm. So I will get to the legislation that we have at hand now. Uh, as I said, that is the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Amendment prohibiting academic cheating services bill. And I think it's safe to say, Madam Acting Deputy President, that cheating has changed a little since I've been at university. Uh, ten years ago, when I was studying at university, you always heard these stories of some of the more creative ways that students had found to try and work their way around the system. Um, writing the answers to exam questions on pieces of clothing, which they would then remove uh, during the exam. Eating notes once they were caught with them uh, in the exam, or copying the text directly from Wikipedia, which when the hyperlinks showed up in the essay was sort of a bit of a giveaway. Um, but the advent of the internet and enhanced communications means that the art of cheating is now smarter and in many cases more commercial. Uh, back in the day, in terms of proving an offence of cheating, um, universities would have academic misconduct policies in place and disciplinary processes in place, and it was often contingent on finding the evidence and simply building a case that impropriety had occurred. But we know with, uh, from the reviews that have been discussed in the debate tonight undertaken by the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency, um, we know from these reviews that these policies and procedures uh, are perhaps not enough. And indeed, that is why we are in this debate tonight talking about this piece of legislation. And I think it's interesting to note the history of how we've come to this position, uh, because it, it is important to consider that universities are primarily responsible for uh, maintaining the integrity of their academic um, services, so to speak. But commercial cheating came to the attention of this government through the My Master scandal back in 2015, which, as we've heard tonight, was um, uh, an, an online uh, website through which students could obtain a pre-written essay. Following this coming to the government's attention, the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency investigated this issue on the recommendation of the government. They came up with a report that suggested, as I alluded to earlier, that a stronger response from the government was required to regulate the higher education sector to strengthen it so that this new commercialised form of cheating service couldn't occur. The minister then requested the Higher Education Standards Panel advise on options to deter commercial cheating based on those recommendations from the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency, which I'm going to refer to as TEXA um, for ease of pronunciation, and otherwise we're going to be here all night. Um, but I would like to read from the report on student academic integrity and allegations of contract cheating by university students undertaken by TEXA, just a short paragraph, because it really does go to um, where this issue has come from and why it's necessary for us to have this legislation in front of us tonight. Contract cheating, the report says. The purchase of another person's work to present as your own has a long history. Recently, the ready availability of sophisticated communication technology and the rise of social media have increased the opportunity to access and or repurpose another's work to present as your own. Availability of essay writing services is pervasive with both local and international websites advertising their services. A number of assessment strategies have been devised to minimise the opportunity for such fraudulent activity by students and, it, and to detect it when it occurs. However, it should be noted that the efficacy of such strategies has not been established and the favoured way to combat such behaviour is by the promotion of academic integrity in the student body. I mean, this report fundamentally goes to the reason um, the, the fundamentally explains how universities had these policies and processes in place and yet it wasn't actually uh, preventing this cheating from occurring, as we saw. 
um, with the My Master scandal back in 2015. So the natural question was asked, well, what more can be done? The legislation that we are discussing here tonight is what could be done. Cheating services, we know, Madam Acting Deputy President, are a blight on our education system. These are people exploiting vulnerable students and undermining the integrity of our high-quality degrees. And a lot of the government speakers tonight I have listened to have, um, have talked about the importance of maintaining the integrity of our degrees because uh, having a degree should be um, a, a worthwhile exercise and it should be a worthwhile commodity that should be preparing our students for the workplace. This bill that we're debating here this evening is aimed at commercial cheating services, not the students who use them. Students who cheat will still be subject to their institution's own academic integrity policies and sanctions, including any consequences that flow from those, like the ones I discussed earlier. The national regulator, TEXA, will be given new powers to investigate and recommend prosecution of cheating service providers. TEXA will also be empowered to seek court injunctions to force internet service providers and search engines to block cheating websites. This bill gives effect to the advice of the Higher Education Standards Panel that I referenced earlier that legislation is required to deter third-party academic cheating services. Like I said, in an instance where universities have policies and procedures in place and have embedded these policies and procedures in their teaching processes and yet this sort of systemic cheating is still occurring, we know that more needs to be done. The Higher Education Standards Panel found that the array of state, territory and Commonwealth laws relevant to cheating offences made it difficult to pursue legal solutions against providers of these cheating services. The panel's advice was that additional legislative backing is needed to more effectively deal with such risks. The panel advocated modelling this on New Zealand's approach, which is outlined in section 292E of the Education Act 1989, which is a piece of New Zealand legislation. The panel recommended that this legislation should be aimed at those who provide cheating services and not at students who might use such services. Like I said, students who cheat will remain subject to the institution's own policies and processes and sanctions if that is deemed appropriate in the, situ in the uh, individual situation. We have consulted broadly on this bill. An exposure draft was issued in early 2019 for comment. A number of submissions were received in response, in response which generally supported the need for the legislation and raised um, some small concerns around the bill. And the bill that we have in front of us this evening has been revised to take account of these. So what will this bill do? This bill amends the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Act 2011 to make it an offence to provide, arrange or advertise academic cheating services to students studying with Australian higher education providers, whether the services are pro provided from within Australia or overseas. Criminal and civil penalties of up to two years jail and fines of up to 500 penalty units will apply where the cheating service or advertising is for a commercial purpose. Civil penalties of up to 500 penalty units will apply where the cheating service is provided without remuneration. Strict liability will apply to the criminal offence of providing an academic cheating service in order to undermine services' tactics of disingenuous disclaimers regarding the purpose and use of their products. As I alluded to earlier, TEXA will be appointed to enforce the new law with its powers to include monitoring, intelligence gathering, investigation and prosecution, prosecution of identified offenders. TEXA will have additional power to collect and disseminate information about cheating websites and their users to help institutions combat cheating activity on campus, but with safeguards to protect the unwarranted sharing of personal information about those who purchase cheating materials. TEXA will have the ability to seek court injunctions to force internet service providers and search engines to block cheating websites, as I previously alluded to. And I think that last point around um, disseminating information about cheating websites is a really important one. Like I said, back in the day, um, when I was at university, cheating was still, let's call it paper-based. It was very much um, around you know, borrowing a student's notes and using another student's work to complete your essay or um, writing your own notes into an exam and taking them into an exam and relying upon them when you were completing an exam question. Um, the way that 
uh, that students uh, can access information now has completely changed not only the educational landscape generally, but of course um, the ways in which they can be preyed upon and the access potentially that they might have to services such as these that can provide essays uh, online. So I think the bill that we are discussing here tonight is an important one. It is important that we maintain the integrity of our higher education system. Uh, because the qualifications that result from it are only ever as, uh, as valuable as the integrity of the broader sector. So I certainly commend the bill to the Senate and I look forward to hearing the rest of the debate around this bill, which, as I mentioned in my opening statements, had been somewhat wide-ranging. Thank you. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, President. It is a great pleasure to rise and speak on the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Amendment prohibiting Academic Cheating Services Bill 2019. Madam Acting Deputy President, whether it's safeguarding against foreign interference and foreign influence, whether it's ensuring the integrity of university research, whether it's providing consistent academic standards, including for non-English speaking international students, or whether it's combating cheating in university exams, the integrity of our university sector is critical to the reputation of our graduates, the success of our businesses for which the graduates will go on to work, and the prosperity of our country. I don't think I can remember a time where the integrity of some universities has been so in the spotlight as now, and that is principally the reason that this bill is so important. And we just heard a very good contribution from Senator Chandler uh, in relation to the importance of the bill. Uh, but I would just briefly want to touch on the bill, and I want to make a couple of other comments about Senator Carr's contribution. The bill amends the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Act 2011, the TEXA Act, to make it an offence to provide, arrange or advertise academic cheating services to students studying with Australian higher education providers, whether the service is provided from within Australia or overseas. Uh, there are serious penalties in this bill for the provision of a cheating service. And we're not talking about incidental help or students giving a bit of you know, assistance here and there. We're not talking about parents or siblings uh, giving some helpful advice. We are talking about professional commercial cheating services which seek to undermine the very integrity of our universities. And that's why, Madam Acting Deputy President, there are criminal and civil penalties provided for in this bill for up to two years jail and fines of up to 500 penalty units around $100,000. That is how serious our government is treating this issue. Strict liability will apply to the criminal offence of providing an academic cheating service in order to undermine the services tactics of disingenuous disclaimers regarding the purpose and the use of the products. TEXA will be appointed to enforce the new law with its new powers to include monitoring, intelligence gathering, investigation and um, the prosecution of identified offenders. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, because I know we're about to go to an adjournment in a couple of minutes, I just want to uh, quickly just refer to Senator Carr's contribution. And I am concerned about his characterisations and the work of our government in ensuring the integrity of our university and our research sector. And I commend the, uh, the journalist who wrote the report in today's Australian newspaper because it shines a spotlight on what is a very serious issue, one that our government takes very seriously, and that is foreign interference and foreign influence in our universities. And we saw the disgraceful conduct of the University of Queensland in the way that it treated Drew Pavlou, disgraceful, appalling conduct when he dared to criticise the Chinese Communist Party. And of course, that was very much influenced because of the university's very close links 
um, with the CCP through the Confucius Institute. Uh, but again today we have seen more reports, concerning reports about the names of many dozens of academics in Australian universities who have been involved in a program called the Thousand Talents Program. And the, the report includes information that the names of these academics have been included in Chinese patent applications in a manner that may not only compromise the intellectual property of our universities. Of course, universities were, saying, were reported to have said they didn't even know about this in some cases, but also compromise our national security. Uh, in the very short amount of time I have left, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, these are issues we take very seriously. Uh, we must, at all stages, protect the integrity of our universities, and we're doing that, whether it's uh, through the Espionage and Foreign Interference Act, through the Foreign Influence Trans Transparency Scheme, our new electoral funding and disclosure reforms, and of course Senator through this Henderson. bill, and Senator I commend Henderson. this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it being 9.50 p.m., I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Senator McGrath. Oh, thank you, oh, sorry. Deputy President. Queensland, a perfect one day, paradise lost the next under Labor. <laughs> for, for almost one full year, 48 weeks, 335 days, the Queensland oh, yeah. Labor government has been spinning, reviewing, back paddling and tap dancing around a very simple question about the Paradise Dam fiasco in the Wide Bay Burnett. And that's a very simple question that the farmers and the graziers of the Wide Bay Burnett want to know. And that is, when will the Queensland Labor government safely restore Paradise Dam to its full capacity? Since the Labor government announced in September last year they would release thousands of megalitres of water in the middle of a drought by just flushing it out to sea, Farmers in the Wide Bay Burnett have suffered through 335 days of uncertainty, uncertainty of not knowing when the dam will ever be restored, not knowing whether the water that underpins thousands of jobs and millions of dollars of investment will be returned. The farmers in this region produce 75 per cent of Australia's sweet potatoes, more than half of Australia's macadamias. They grow chilies and strawberries and tomatoes and sugarcane and passion fruit. It's a cornucopia of all that is good for you. And at times this region produces 25 per cent of all of the fresh food grown in Australia. But Labor have smashed the, food, the fruit bowl that is the Wide Bay Burnett without care, without compassion and without common sense. And this is a very real, a very real serious issue. And yet we hear nothing from Labor's Premier. We hear nothing from her Agriculture Minister. We hear nothing from her Water Minister. In fact, the only recent information to be found is on Sunwater's Paradise Dam Facebook page. Sadly, it does not provide the certainty that farmers and graziers in the Wide Bay Burnett region desperately need. Sunwater have stated that long-term improvement works at Paradise Dam are likely to include several years of construction activities to 2025. To 2025. But even that work is dependent on the outcome of a business case being undertaken by Building Queensland. What the people of Queensland and the farmers in Bundaberg still haven't heard from this tired Labor government is what is their damn plan? How would Labor propose to plug the $2.4 billion economic hole that is going to be left in this region over the next 30 years if this dam is not fully restored? What is Labor's plan for jobs? What is Labor's plan for water? These are all questions that Queensland Labor have no answers for. Sadly, this is becoming a pattern for this tired, out-of-touch Labor government in Queensland. They have no plan to offer water security to our drought-ravaged farmers. This is a Labor government who are not only not building dams, they are tearing down existing dams. And a fun fact, Madam Acting Deputy President, of the 20 dams that have been built in Australia since 2003, 16 of those have been built in your home state of Tasmania. And the one dam that's been built in Queensland, well, Labor are tearing it down. And the only people who have a plan to address these important issues in Queensland are Deb Frecklington and the LNP. Local LNP MPs like Cole Boyce, David Batt and Steve Bennett, along with the federal members uh, Keith Pitt and Ken O'Dowd, have been fighting for their patch of paradise. And, and standing up for Paradise Dam and standing up for all those who depend on the water that is in Paradise Dam. Because Deb and her team know that water equals jobs. 
Deb and the LNP, they're going to build Bradfield 2.0, and they're going to set up the Queensland Dam Company. Queenslanders know they cannot afford another four years of labour. A Labor government who are using coronavirus as an alibi for their appalling economic uh, activity over the last few years. Queensland, which has had the highest levels of bankruptcies, the lowest, the lowest levels of business confidence. And we've got a state Labor government who are using coronavirus to hide their appalling economic record. A Labor government who are using base, grubby politics to divide communities along the borders of, of New South Wales and Queensland. Labor's Paradise Dam is Australia's largest and worst infrastructure fail. It is an Olympic gold medal, gold star, rolled gold, grand poo bar of a Labor stuff-up. And there's only 67 days to go to throw out Labor, who have ruled Queensland for 25 out of the last 30 years. Queensland, perfect one day, paradise lost next under Labor. Senator Ayres. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm not sure um, uh, what to say about that, but um, it would be good. Uh, yeah, well, perhaps there should be more of it. It probably, probably wouldn't do the Labor Party in Queensland any harm if you repeated it. Um, I, was, I was struck uh, today by, um, of all places on Sky News, of seeing the ACTU's uh, new advertisement that they've launched in the wake of the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Um, and it sets out very clearly who it is that Australian unions represent. And as the ad beautifully puts it, they represent ordinary mums and dads, sisters, brothers, aunts and uncles. And the ad quite appropriately puts the focus on many of those people who have worked through the pandemic, worked through the period when most Australians were required to be at home and indeed, as sadly as, as is the case in Victoria, are working through the pandemic as essential workers today. Working through the pandemic as essential workers this evening and when we all go to bed, many of those people will still be working to deliver safety and security and health services. Uh, to many, many millions of Australians. Those people should have a, a new place in our hearts. The nurses, the aged care workers, the teachers, the supermarket workers, the people who work in the supply chains, the people who work in the factories that are still operating, the mines that are still operating, the power stations that are providing us power, the childcare centres that are looking after our children, the doctors, the GPs, the surgeons, the hospital workers and the hospital orderlies, transport workers, truck drivers, taxi drivers. There should be a solemn contract between the people in this place and those people. You've looked after us during the pandemic. We will look after you. There should be an end to the industrial relations sort of quaint obsessions of those opposite. The people who recently, in the last few weeks remarkably, were still idolising poor old Margaret Thatcher, the treasurer of the country in the middle of a pandemic where government action couldn't be more important, idolising the woman who said that there is no such thing as society. The woman who sucked up to some of the worst characters uh, across the globe. The woman who brought gifts to General Pinochet after his conviction and supported that murderous regime, who supported ruthless paramilitary death squads in Northern Ireland. The woman who, more than any other leader in modern history, weakened Britain and trashed its institutions. That's not the pathway forward for us. You looked after us. We will look after you. In this place, we should listen to those workers, give them a real voice through their unions, value them with decent wages and good jobs. I was horrified—everybody here should be horrified to hear about casual workers in the aged care sector in order to make ends meet working two or three 
or four centres. That is unacceptable, uh, and it's caused more human misery than any other thing. And, and your failure—I'd stay quiet if I were you. You've had a pretty quiet day. You've, had a, pretty, you've had a pretty ordinary Order. day, and you're going to have a pretty ordinary fortnight. Order. The, the, the more damage through hypercasualisation in that sector, and in many other sectors of the Australian economy, has driven the pandemic more than any other factor in the labour market. Now, I want to draw this place's attention to the circumstances of some of these groups of workers. It's a company called Avato. It's the largest print and packaging company in the country, a merger of Hannon Print and PMP. A close work with their union over many decades, 850 workers, every state of the country except Tasmania. Uh, like many businesses, it has been hit hard by the coronavirus pandemic. In March, the union agreed to discuss cost-saving measures with the company. Uh, there's a long course of very cooperative industrial relations that's characterised the last 30 years of cooperation. On the day before their collective agreement expired, the company applied to have the agreement terminated. Now We know what that means for that group of people. Some of them have worked there for 10 or 20 or 30 years. And the purpose of the company terminating their collective agreement was in order to avoid their redundancy obligations to those workers. Some of those workers I met uh, when I went out to the factory the other day, they are owed, some of them, 50 weeks, some of them 100 weeks, some of them 150 weeks, some of them more. One of them said, Mr Grit, who works in Melbourne, I've been at the Clayton site for the past 23 years and have seen the highs and lows of the print industry. I'm the third generation of my family to be employed at the Clayton site. My grandmother, Joyce Grit, worked there for 31 years. His dad, Kevin Grit, worked there for 28 years. His mum, Lynn Grit, worked there for many, many years, and himself for 23 years. To all that service to that company, and the long tradition of service to that company by Australian workers in the western suburbs, in particular of Melbourne and Sydney, who built the company, who collaborated with the company, uh, they are now going to be left destitute because of a dishonest strategy from Avato. So, in the middle of a pandemic, we're supposed to be looking after these people. Um, and what have we got? A dishonest strategy to defraud them, effectively, of their redundancy entitlements. Now, I've met the family that's a very large shareholder in that business over many, many years in my industrial work, and traditionally their word was their bond. They operated in a straightforward way, and I don't understand why the Hannon family is allowing this operation to pursue the course of action that it has, their word should be their bond, the collective agreement should be honoured and not avoided, and if the company can't find its way to do the right thing, then the Minister for Industrial Relations and the Commonwealth should intervene to make sure that these people get every cent that is owed to them. There's been plenty more going on out there in workplaces across the country. Just today, 275 distribution workers at Officeworks went on strike. Sales at Officeworks, Officeworks has been a beneficiary of the pandemic as many Australians have set up home offices. Sales at Officeworks, uh, Officeworks have gone up by 27 per cent. Profits have increased by 41 per cent. Workers have worked through that whole period delivering goods to office work stores. Three positive coronavirus cases they've worked through and continued to work safely. Uh, instead uh, of offering a fair deal to this group, uh, they've been offered a wage increase below inflation, cuts to overtime penalties, 
Well, I'm pretty convinced that their union, the new United Workers Union, will see them through that process. But there's lots of employers out there who are not doing the right thing in Australian workplaces. Woolworths on the central coast of New South Wales locked out for many, many days. Uh, their union stood by them. They have recorded a very good outcome in their collective bargaining negotiations. And it's a credit to them and their union, the United Workers Union, that they and the union did something about it, did something about being locked out. When Australian workers and their unions stick together, there's nothing that they can't achieve. There are great signs for the United Workers Union and their progress uh, over, the, over the last few months and their new merger. Uh, and my old union, the AMWU, uh, is growing strength to strength. But we should have a commitment in this place to look at the faces of those workers who are in the ACTU ad, go to the workers who work in our aged care centres, in our hospitals, in our supermarkets, thank them for their work, but don't forget their work, and to deliver for them decent, fair incomes Order. and decent jobs in Time. the future. The contribution has expired. There being no others, the Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 12 noon.